This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Dittman, Liverpool, United Kingdom. Web address MercurialSpirit.co.uk. The Trumpet Major, being a tale of the Trumpet Major John Loveday a soldier in the war with Bonaparte, and Robert, his brother, first mate in the merchant service, by Thomas Hardy. Preface The present tale is founded more largely on testimony, oral and written, than any other in this series. The external incidents which direct its course are mostly an unexaggerated reproduction of the recollections of old persons well known to the author in childhood, but now long dead, who were eyewitnesses of those scenes. If wholly transcribed, their recollections would have filled a volume thrice the length of the trumpet major. Down to the middle of this century and later, there were not wanting, in the neighbourhood of the places more or less clearly indicated herein, casual relics of the circumstances amid which the actions move, our preparations for defence against the threatened invasion of England by Bonaparte. An outhouse door riddled with bullet holes, which has been extemporised by a solitary man as a target for firelock practice when the landing was hourly expected. A heap of bricks and clods on a beacon hill, which had formed the chimney and walls of the hut occupied by the beacon keeper, worm-eaten shafts and iron heads of pikes for the use of those who had no better weapons, ridges on the down thrown up during the encampment, fragments of volunteer uniform and other such lingering remains brought to my imagination in early childhood the state of affairs at the date of the war more vividly than volumes of history could have done. Those who have attempted to construct a coherent narrative of past times from the fragmentary information furnished by survivors, are aware of the difficulty of ascertaining the true sequence of events indiscriminately recalled. For this purpose, the newspapers of the date were indispensable. Of other documents consulted, I may mention, for the satisfaction of those who love a true story, that the Address to All Ranks and Descriptions of Englishmen was transcribed from an original copy in a local museum, that the hieroglyphic portrait of Napoleon existed as a print down to the present day in an old woman's cottage near Overcombe, that the particulars of the king's doing at his favourite watering place were augmented by details from records of the time. The drilling scene of the local militia received some additions from an account given in so grave a work as Gifford's History of the Wars of the French Revolution, London, 1817. But on reference to the history, I find I was mistaken in supposing the account to be advanced as authentic, or to refer to rural England. However, it does in a large degree accord with the local traditions of such scenes that I have heard recounted, times without number, and the system of drill was tested by reference to the army regulations of 1801 and other military handbooks. Almost the whole narrative of the supposed landing of the French in the bay is from oral relation as aforementioned. Other proofs of the veracity of this chronicle have escaped my recollection. Thomas Hardy, October 1895 End of Preface This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Dittman, Liverpool, United Kingdom. Web address MercurialSpirit.co.uk The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 1 What was seen from the window overlooking the down In the days of the high-waisted and muslin-gowned women, when the vast amount of soldiering going on in the country 
was a cause of much trembling to the sex. There lived in a village near the Wessex coast two ladies of good report, though unfortunately of limited means. The elder was a Mrs. Martha Garland, a landscape painter's widow, and the other was her only daughter, Anne. Anne was fair, very fair, in a poetical sense, but in complexion she was of that particular tint between blonde and brunette which is inconveniently left without a name. Her eyes were honest and inquiring, her mouth cleanly cut and yet not classical, the middle point of her upper lip scarcely descending so far as it should have done by rights, so that at the merest pleasant thought, not to mention a smile, portions of two or three white teeth were uncovered, whether she would or not. Some people said that this was very attractive. She was graceful and slender, and though but little above five feet in height, could draw herself up to look tall. In her manner, in her comings and goings, in her I'll do this or I'll do that, she combined dignity with sweetness as no other girl could do, and any impressionable stranger youths who passed by were led to yearn for a windfall of speech from her, and to see at the same time that they would not get it. In short, beneath all that was charming and simple in this young woman, there lurked a real firmness, unperceived at first, as the speck of colour lurks unperceived in the heart of the palest parsley flower. She wore a white handkerchief to cover her white neck, and a cap on her head with a pink ribbon round it, tied in a bow at the front. She had a great variety of these cap ribbons, the young men being fond of sending them to her as presents until they fell definitely in love with a special sweetheart elsewhere, when they left off doing so. Between the border of her cap and her forehead were ranged a row of round brown curls, like swallow's nests under eaves. She lived with her widowed mother in a portion of an ancient building, formerly a manor house, but now a mill, which, being too large for his own requirements, the miller had found it convenient to divide and appropriate in part to these highly respectable tenants. In this dwelling Mrs. Garland's and Anne's ears were soothed morning, noon and night by the music of the mill, the wheels and cogs of which, being of wood, produced notes that might have borne in their minds a remote resemblance to the wooden tones of the stopped diapason in an organ. Occasionally, when the miller was bolting, there was added to these continuous sounds the cheerful clicking of the hopper, which did not deprive them of rest except when it was kept going all night. And over and above all this, they had the pleasure of knowing that there crept in through every crevice, door and window of their dwelling, however tightly closed, a subtle mist of superfine flour from the grinding room, quite invisible, but making its presence known in the course of time by giving a pallid and ghostly look to the best furniture. The miller frequently apologised to his tenants for the intrusion of this insidious dry fog, but the widow was of a friendly and thankful nature, and she said that she did not mind it at all, being as it was, not nasty dirt, but the blessed staff of life. By good humour of this sort, and in other ways, Mrs. Garland acknowledged her friendship for her neighbour, with whom Anne and herself associated to an extent which she could never have anticipated when, tempted by the lowness of the rent, they first removed thither after her husband's death from a larger house at the other end of the village. Those who have lived in remote places where there is what is called no society will comprehend the gradual levelling of distinctions that went on in this case at some sacrifice of gentility on the part of one household. The widow was sometimes sorry to find with what readiness Anne caught up some dialect word or accent from the miller and his friends. But he was so good and true-hearted a man, and she so easy-minded, unambitious a woman, 
that she would not make life a solitude for fastidious reasons. More than all, she had good ground for thinking that the miller secretly admired her, and this added a piquancy to the situation. On a fine summer morning, when the leaves were warm under the sun, and the more industrious bees abroad, diving into every blue and red cup that could possibly be considered a flower, Anne was sitting at the back window of her mother's portion of the house, measuring out lengths of worsted for a fringed rug that she was making, which lay about three-quarters finished beside her. The work, though chromatically brilliant, was tedious. A hearth-rug was a thing which nobody worked at from morning to night. It was taken up and put down. It was in the chair, on the floor, across the handrail, under the bed, kicked here, kicked there, rolled away in the closet, brought out again, and so on more capriciously, perhaps, than any other homemade article. Nobody was expected to finish a rug within a calculable period, and the walls of the beginning became faded and historical before the end was reached. A sense of this inherent nature of worsted work, rather than idleness, led Anne to look rather frequently from the open casement. Immediately before her was the large, smooth mill-pond, over-full and intruding into the hedge and into the road. The water, with its flowing leaves and spots of froth, was stealing away, like time, under the dark arch to tumble over the great slimy wheel within. On the other side of the mill-pond was an open place called the Cross, because it was three-quarters of one, two lanes and a cattle drive meeting there. It was the general rendezvous and arena of the surrounding village. Behind this a steep slope rose high into the sky, merging in a wide and open down, now littered with sheep, newly shorn. The upland, by its height, completely sheltered the mill and village from north winds, making summers of springs, reducing winters to autumn temperatures, and permitting myrtle to flourish in the open air. The heaviness of noon pervaded the scene, and under its influence the sheep had ceased to feed. Nobody was standing at the cross, the few inhabitants being indoors at their dinner. No human being was on the down, and no human eye or interest but Anne's seemed to be concerned with it. The bees still worked on, and the butterflies did not rest from roving, their smallness seeming to shield them from the stagnating effect that this turning moment of day had on larger creatures. Otherwise, all was still. The girl glanced at the down and the sheep for no particular reason. The steep margin of turf and daisies rising above the roofs, chimneys, apple trees and church tower of the hamlet around her bounded the view from her position and it was necessary to look somewhere when she raised her head. While thus engaged in working, and stopping her attention, was attracted by the sudden rising and running away of the sheep squatted on the down, and there succeeded sounds of a heavy tramping over the hard sod which the sheep had quitted, the tramp being accompanied by a metallic jingle. Turning her eyes further, she beheld two cavalry officers on bulky grey chargers, armed and accoutred throughout, ascending the down at a point to the left where the incline was comparatively easy. The burnished chains, buckles, and plates of their trappings shone like little looking-glasses, and the blue, red, and white about them was unsubdued by weather or wear. The two troopers rode proudly on, as if nothing less than crowns and empires ever concerned their magnificent minds. They reached that part of the down which lay just in front of her, where they came to a halt. In another minute there appeared behind them a group containing some half-dozen more of the same sort. These came on, halted, and dismounted likewise. Two of the soldiers then walked some distance onwards together, when one stood still, the other advancing further and stretching a white line of tape between them. Two more of the men marched to another outlying point, where they made marks in the ground. Thus they walked about and took distances, 
obviously according to some preconcerted scheme. At the end of this systematic proceeding, one solitary horseman, a commissioned officer, if his uniform could be judged rightly at that distance, rode up the down, went over the ground, looked at what the others had done, and seemed to think that it was good. And then the girl heard yet louder tramps and clankings, and she beheld rising from where the others had risen a whole column of cavalry in marching order. At a distance behind these came a cloud of dust enveloping more and more troops, their arms and accoutrements reflecting the sun through the haze in faint flashes, stars and streaks of light. The whole body approached slowly towards the plateau at the top of the down. Anne threw down her work, and letting her eyes remain on the nearing masses of cavalry, the worsteds getting entangled as they would, said, "'Mother! Mother! Come here! Here's such a fine sight! What does it mean? What can they be going to do up there?' The mother, thus invoked, ran upstairs and came forward to the window. She was a woman of sanguine mouth and eye, unheroic manner, and a pleasant general appearance a little more tarnished as to surface, but not much worse in contour than the girl herself. Widow Garland's thoughts were those of the period. "'Can it be the French?' she said, arranging herself for the extremest form of consternation. "'Can that arch-enemy of mankind have landed at last?' It should be stated that at this time there were two arch-enemies of mankind, Satan, as usual, and Bonaparte, who had sprung up and eclipsed his elder rival altogether. Mrs. Garland alluded, of course, to the junior gentleman. "'It cannot be he,' said Anne. "'Ah, there's Simon Burden, the man who watches at the beacon. He'll know.' She waved her hand to an aged form of the same colour as the road, who had just appeared beyond the mill-pond, and who, though active, was bowed to that degree which almost reproaches a feeling observer from standing upright. The arrival of the soldiery had drawn him out from his drop of drink at the Duke of York, as it had attracted Anne. At her call he crossed the millbridge and came towards the window. Anne inquired of him what it all meant, but Simon Burden, without answering, continued to move on with parted gums, staring at the cavalry on his own private account with a concern that people often show about temporal phenomena when such matters can affect them but a short time longer. "'You'll walk into the mill-pond,' said Anne. "'What are they doing? You were a soldier many years ago and ought to know.' "'Don't ask me, Miss Anne," said the military relic, depositing his body against the wall one limb at a time. I were only in the foot, ye know, and never had a clear understanding of horses. I, I be an old man and of no judgment now. Some additional pressure, however, caused him to search further in his worm-eaten magazine of ideas, and he found that he did know in a dim, irresponsible way. The soldiers must have come there to camp. Those men they had seen first were the markers. They had come on before the rest to measure out the ground. He who had accompanied them was the quartermaster. And so you see they have got all the lines marked out by the time the regiment have come, he added. And then they will, well a dearie, who'd have supposed that Overcombe would see such a day as this? And then they will, then, ah, uh, uh, it's gone from me again, said Simon. Oh, and then they will raise their tents, you know, and pick at their horses. That was it. So it was. By this time the column of horse had ascended into full view, and they formed a lively spectacle as they rode along the high ground in marching order, backed by the pale blue sky and lit by the southerly sun. Their uniform was bright and attractive. White buckskin pantaloons three-quarter boots, scarlet chacos set off with laces, mustachios waxed to a needle-point, and above all those richly ornamented blue jackets mantled with the historic pelisse, 
that fascination to women and encumbrances to the wearers themselves. "'Tis the York's Hussars,' said Simon Burden, brightening like a dying ember fanned. "'Foreigners to a man, and enrolled long since my time, but as good hearty comrades, they say, as you'll find in the King's service.' "'Here are more and different ones,' said Mrs. Garland. Other troops had, during the last few minutes, been ascending the down at a remoter point, and now drew near. These were of different weight and build from the others, lighter men in helmet hats with white plumes. "'I don't know which I like best,' said Anne. "'These, I think, after all.' Simon, who had been looking hard at the latter, now said that they were the dragoons. "'All Englishmen, they,' said the old man. "'They lay at Budmouth Barracks a few years ago.' "'They did, I remember it,' said Mrs. Garland. "'And lots of the chaps about here listed at the time,' said Simon. "'I can call to mind that there was... "'Ah, uh, tis gone from me again. "'However, all that's of little account now.' The dragoons passed in front of the lookers, on as the others had done, and their gay plumes, which had hung lazily during the ascent, swung to northwards as they reached the top, showing that on the summit a fresh breeze blew. "'But look across there,' said Anne. There had entered upon the down from another direction several battalions of foot, in white kerseymere breeches and cloth gaiters, they seemed to be weary from a long march, the original black of their gaiters and boots being whitey-brown with dust. Presently came regimental wagons and the private canteen carts which followed at the end of a convoy. The space in front of the mill-pond was now occupied by nearly all the inhabitants of the village, who had turned out in alarm and remained for pleasure, their eyes lighted up with interest in what they saw for trappings and regimentals, war-horses and men, in towns and attraction, were here almost a sublimity. The troops filled to their lines, dismounted, and in quick time took off their accoutrements, rolled up their sheepskins, picketed and unbitted their horses, and made ready to erect the tents as soon as they could be taken from the wagons and brought forward. When this was done, at a given signal, the canvases flew up from the sod, and thenceforth every man had a place in which to lay his head. Though nobody seemed to be looking on but the few at the window and in the village street, there were, as a matter of fact, many eyes converging upon that military arrival in its high and conspicuous position, not to mention the glances of birds and other wild creatures, men in distant gardens, women in orchards and at cottage doors, shepherds on remote hills, turnip hoers in blue-green enclosures miles away, captains with spy-glasses out at sea were regarding the picture keenly. Those three or four thousand men of machine-like movement, some of them swashbucklers by nature, others doubtless of a quiet shopkeeping disposition, who had inadvertently got into uniform, all of them had arrived from nobody knew where, and hence were matter of great curiosity. They seemed to the mere eye to belong to a different order of beings from those who inhabited the valleys below, apparently unconscious and careless of what all the world was doing elsewhere. They remained picturesquely engrossed in the business of making themselves a habitation on the isolated spot which they had chosen. Mrs. Garland was of her festive and sanguine turn of mind, a woman soon set up and soon set down, and the coming of the regiment quite excited her. She thought there was reason for putting on her best cap, thought that perhaps there was not, that she would hurry on the dinner and go out in the afternoon, then that she would, after all, do nothing unusual, nor show any silly excitement whatever, since they were unbecoming in a mother and a widow. Thus circumscribing her intentions till she was toned down to an ordinary person of forty, 
Mrs. Garland accompanied her daughter downstairs to dine, saying, "'Presently we will call on Miller Loveday, and hear what he thinks of it all.'" End of chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Dittman, Liverpool, United Kingdom. Web address mercurialspirit.co.uk The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 2 Somebody Knocks and Comes In Miller Loveday was the representative of an ancient family of corn grinders, whose history is lost in the mists of antiquity. His ancestral line was contemporaneous with that of de Ross, Howard, and de la Zouche. But, owing to some trifling deficiency in the possessions of the House of Loveday, the individual names and intermarriages of its members were not recorded during the Middle Ages, and thus their private lives in any given century were uncertain. But it was known that the family had formed matrimonial alliances with farmers not so very small, and once with a gentleman tanner, who had for many years purchased after their death the horses of the most aristocratic persons in the county, fiery steeds that earlier in their career had been valued at many hundred guineas. It was also ascertained that Mr. Loveday's great-grandparents had been eight in number, and his great-great-grandparents sixteen, every one whom reached to years of discretion. At every stage backwards his sires and gammas thus doubled and doubled till they became a vast body of gothic ladies and gentlemen of the rank known as sirs or villains, full of importance to the country at large, and ramifying through the unwritten history of England. His immediate father had greatly improved the value of their residence by building a new chimney and setting up an additional pair of millstones. Overcombe Mill presented at one end the appearance of a hard-working house slipping into the river, and at the other of an idle, genteel place, half cloaked with creepers at this time of year, and having no visible connection with flower. It had hips instead of gables, giving it a round-shouldered look. Four chimneys with no smoke coming out of them, two zigzag cracks in the wall, several open windows, with a looking-glass here and there inside, showing its warped back to the passers-by, snowy dimity curtains waving in the draught, two mill doors, one above the other, and the upper enabling a person to step out upon nothing at a height of ten feet from the ground, a gaping arch vomiting the river, and a lean long-nosed fellow looking out from the mill doorway, who was the hired grinder, except when a bulging fifteen-stone man occupied the same place, namely the miller himself. Behind the mill door, and invisible to the mere wayfarer who did not visit the family, were chalked addition and subtraction sums, many of them originally done wrong, and the figures half rubbed out and corrected, noughts being turned into nines and ones into twos. These were the miller's private calculations. There were also chalked in the same place rows and rows of strokes, like open palings, representing the calculations of the grinder, who in his youthful ciphering studies had not gone so far as Arabic figures. In the court in front were two worn-out millstones, made useful again by being let in level with the ground. Here people stood to smoke and consider things in muddy weather, and cats slept on the clean surfaces when it was hot. In the large stubbard tree in the corner of the garden was erected a pole of larch fir, which the miller had bought with others at a sale of small timber in Dammer's Wood one Christmas week. It rose from the upper boughs of the tree to about the height of a fisherman's mast, and on the top was a vane in the form of a sailor with his arm stretched out. When the sun shone upon this figure, it could be seen that the greater part of his countenance was gone, and the paint washed from his body so far as to reveal that he had been a soldier in red before he became a sailor in blue. 
The image had, in fact, been John, one of our coming characters, and was then turned into Robert, another of them. This revolving piece of statuary could not, however, be relied on as a vane, owing to the neighbouring hill which formed variable currents of wind. The leafy and quieter wing of the mill-house was the part occupied by Mrs. Garland and her daughter, who made up in summer-time for the narrowness of their quarters by overflowing into the garden on stools and chairs. The parlour or dining-room had a stone floor, a fact which the widow sought to disguise by double carpeting, lest the standing of Anne and herself should be lowered in the public eye. Here now the midday meal went lightly and mincingly on, as it does when there is no greedy carnivorous man to keep the dishes about, and was hanging on the clothes when somebody entered the passage as far as the chink of the parlour door, and tapped. This proceeding was probably adopted to kindly avoid giving trouble to Susan, the neighbour's pink daughter, who helped at Mrs. Garland's in the morning, but was at the moment particularly occupied in standing on the water-butt and gazing at the soldiers with an inhaling position of the mouth and circular eyes. There was a flutter in the little dining-room. The sensitiveness of habitual solitude makes heart beat for the preternaturally small reasons, and a guessing of who the visitor might be. It was some military gentleman from the camp, perhaps. No, that was impossible. It was the parson. No, he would not come at dinner-time. It was the well-informed man who travelled with drapery and the best Birmingham earrings. Not at all. His time was not till Thursday at three. Before they could think further, the visitor moved forward another step, and the diners got a glimpse of him through the same friendly chink that had offered him a view of the garland dinner-table. "'Oh, it's only love day!' This approximation to nobody was the miller above mentioned, a hale man of fifty-five or sixty, hale all through, as were many in those days, and not merely veneered with purple by exhilarating victuals and drinks, though the latter were not at all despised by him. His face was indeed rather pale than otherwise, for he had just come from the mill. It was capable of immense changes of expression. Mobility was its essence. A roll of flesh forming a buttress to his nose on each side, and a deep ravine lying between his lower lip and the tumulus represented by his chin. These fleshy lumps moved stealthily, as if of their own accord, whenever his fancy was tickled. His eyes having lighted on the tablecloth, plates and viands, he found himself in a position which had a sensible awkwardness for a modest man, who always liked to enter only at seasonable times, the presence of a girl of such pleasantly soft ways as Anne Garland, she who could make apples seem like peaches, and throw over her shillings the glamour of guineas when she paid him for flour. "'Dinner is over, neighbour Loveday. Please come in,' said the widow, seeing his case. The miller said something about coming in presently, but Anne pressed him to stay, with a tender motion of her lips as it played on the verge of a solicitous smile without quite lapsing into one, her habitual manner when speaking. Loveday took off his low-crowned hat and advanced. He had not come about pigs or fowl this time. "'You have been looking out, like the rest of us, no doubt, Mrs. Garland, at the mampus of soldiers that have come upon the down. Well, one of the horse regiments is the, the dragoons, my son John's regiment, you know.' The announcement, though it interested them, did not create such an effect as the father of John, who seemed to anticipate. But Anne, who liked to say pleasant things, replied, The dragoons look nicer than the foot, or the German cavalry either. They are a handsome body of men, said the miller, in a disinterested voice. Faith, I didn't know they were coming, though it may be in the newspaper all the time. But old Derryman keeps it so long that we never know things till they be in everybody's mouth. This Derryman was a squireen living near, who was chiefly distinguished in the present warlike times by having a nephew in the yeomanry. "'We were told that the yeomanry went along the turnpike road yesterday,' 
said Anne. "'And they say they were a pretty sight, and quite soldierly.' "'Ah, well, they be not regulars,' said Miller Loveday, keeping back harsher criticism as uncalled for. But inflamed by the arrival of the dragoons, which had been the exciting cause of his call, his mind would not go to yeomanry. "'John has not been home these five years,' he said. "'And what rank does he hold now?' said the widow. "'He's trumpet major, ma'am, and a good musician.' The miller, who was a good father, went on to explain that John had seen some service too, when the regiment was lying in the neighbourhood, more than eleven years before, which put his father out of temper with him, as he had wished him to follow on at the mill. But as the lad had enlisted seriously, and as he had often said that he would be a soldier, the miller had thought that he would let Jack take his chance in the profession of his choice. Loveday had two sons, and the second was now brought into the conversation by a remark of Anne's that neither of them seemed to care for the miller's business. No, said Loveday in a less buoyant tone. Robert, you see, must needs go to sea. He is much younger than his brother, said Mrs. Garland. About four years, the miller told her. His soldier son was two and thirty, and Bob was twenty-eight. When Bob returned from his present voyage, he was to be persuaded to stay and assist as grinder in the mill, and go to sea no more. A sailor miller, said Anne. Oh, he knows as much about mill business as I do, said Loveday. He was intended for it, you know, like John. But bless me, he continued, I am before my story. I'm come here particularly to ask you, ma'am, and you, and my honey, if you will join me, and a few friends, at a little homely supper, that I shall gee to please the chap now he's come. I can do no less than have a bit of a randy, as the saying is, now that he's here safe and sound. Mrs. Garland wanted to catch her daughter's eye. She was in some doubt about her answer, but Anne's eye was not to be caught, for she hated hints, nods, and calculations of any kind, and in matters which should be regulated by impulse. And the matron replied, If so be tis possible, we'll be there. You will tell us the day? He would, as soon as he had seen son John. Twill be rather untidy, you know, owing to my having no woman folks in the house, and my man David is a poor dunder-headed feller for getting up a feast. Poor chap! His sight is bad, that's true, and he's very good at making the beds, and oiling the legs of chairs and other furniture, or I should have got rid of him years ago. You should have a woman to attend to the house, Loveday, said the widow. Yes, I should, but... Well, tis a fine day, neighbours. Hark! I fancy I hear the noise of pots and pans up at the camp, or my ears deceive me. Poor fellows, they must be hungry. Good day to you, ma'am and the miller went away. All that afternoon, Overcombe continued in a ferment of interest in the military investment, which brought the excitement of an invasion without the strife. There were great discussions on the merits and appearance of the soldiery. The event opened up to the girls unbounded possibilities of adoring and being adored, and to the young men an embarrassment of dashing acquaintances which quite superseded falling in love. Thirteen of these lads incontinently stated, within the space of a quarter of an hour, that there was nothing in the world like going for a soldier. The young women stated little, but perhaps thought the more, though, in justice, they glanced round towards the encampment from the corners of their blue and brown eyes in the most demure and modest manner that could be desired. In the evening, the village was lively with soldiers' wives, a tree full of starlings would not have rivalled the chatter that was going on. These ladies were very brilliantly dressed, with more regard for colour than for material. Purple, red and blue bonnets were numerous, with bunches of cock's feathers, and one had on an Arcadian hat of green sarsenet, turned up in front to show her cap underneath. 
it had once belonged to an officer's lady, and was not so much stained, except where the occasional storm of rain, incidental to a military life, had caused the green to run and stagnate in curious watermarks like peninsulas and islands. Some of the prettiest of these butterfly wives had been fortunate enough to get lodgings in the cottages, and were thus spared the necessity of living in huts and tents on the down. Those who had not been so fortunate were not rendered more amiable by the success of their sisters-in-arms, and called them names which brought forth retorts and rejoinders, till the end of these alternative remarks seemed dependent upon the close of the day. One of these new arrivals, who had a rosy nose and a slight thickness of voice, which, as Anne said, she couldn't help, poor thing, seemed to have seen so much of the world, and to have been in so many campaigns, that Anne would have liked to take her into their own house, so as to acquire some of that practical knowledge of the history of England, which the lady possessed, and which could not be got from books. But the narrowness of Mrs. Garland's rooms absolutely forbade this, and the houseless treasury of experience was obliged to look for quarters elsewhere. That night Anne retired early to bed. The events of the day, cheerful as they were in themselves, had been unusual enough to give her a slight headache. Before getting into bed she went to the window, and lifted the white curtains that hung across it. The moon was shining, though not as yet into the valley, but just peeping above the ridge of the down, where the white cones of the encampment were softly touched by its light. The quarter-guard and foremost tents showed themselves prominently, but the body of the camp, the officers' tents, kitchens, canteen and appurtenances in the rear, were blotted out by the ground because of its height above her. She could discern the forms of one or two sentries moving to and fro across the disk of the moon at intervals. She could hear the frequent shuffling and tossing of the horses tied to the pickets, and in the other direction the miles-long voice of the sea, whispering a louder note at those points of its length where hampered in its ebb and flow by some jutting promontory or group of boulders. Louder sounds suddenly broke this approach to silence. They came from the camp of the dragoons, were taken up further to the right by the camp of the Hanoverians, and further on still by the body of infantry. It was the tattoo. Feeling no desire to sleep, she listened yet longer, looked at Charles's wain swinging over the church tower, and the moon ascending higher and higher over the right-hand streets of tents, where, instead of parade and bustle, there was nothing going on, but snores and dreams, the tired soldiers lying by this time under their proper canvases, radiating like spokes from the pole of each tent. At last Anne gave up thinking, and retired like the rest. The night wore on, and except for the occasional All's well. of the sentries, no voice was heard in the camp or in the village below. End of chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Dittman, Liverpool, United Kingdom. Web address mercurialspirit.co.uk the Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 3 The Mill Becomes an Important Centre of Operations The next morning Miss Garland awoke with an impression that something more than usual was going on, and she recognised as soon as she could clearly reason that the proceedings, whatever they might be, lay not far away from her bedroom window, the sounds were chiefly those of pickaxes and shovels. Anne got up, and lifting the corner of the curtain about an inch, peeped out. A number of soldiers were busily engaged in making a zigzag path down the incline from the camp to the river head at the back of the house, and judging from the quantity of work already got through, they must have begun very early. Squads of men were working at several equidistant points in the proposed pathway, and by the time that Anne had dressed herself, 
each section of the length had been connected with those above and below it, so that a continuous and easy track was formed from the crest of the down to the bottom of the steep. The down rested on a bed of solid chalk, and the surface exposed by the roadmakers formed a white ribbon, serpenting from top to bottom. Then the relays of working soldiers all disappeared, and not long after a troop of dragoons in watering order rode forward at the top and began to wind down the new path. They came lower and closer, and at last were immediately beneath her window, gathering themselves up on the space by the mill-pond. A number of the horses entered it at the shallow part, drinking and splashing and tossing about. Perhaps as many as thirty, half of them with riders on their backs, were in the water at one time. The thirsty animals drank, stamped, flounced, and drank again, letting the clear, cool water dribble luxuriously from their mouths. Miller Loveday was looking on from over his garden hedge, and many admiring villagers were gathered around. Gazing up higher, Anne saw other troops descending by the new road from the camp, those which had already been to the pond making room for these by withdrawing along the village lane and returning to the top of the circuitous route. Suddenly the miller exclaimed, as in fulfilment of expectation, Ah, John, me boy, good morning! And the reply of, Morning, father, came from a well-mounted soldier near him who did not, however, form one of the watering party. Anne could not see his face very clearly, but she had no doubt that this was John Loveday. There were tones in the voice which reminded her of old times, those of her very infancy, when Johnny Loveday had been top boy in the village school, and had wanted to learn painting of her father, the deeps and shallows of the mill-pond being better known to him than to any other man in the camp, he had apparently come down on that account, and was cautioning some of the horsemen against riding too far in towards the mill-head. Since her childhood and his enlistment, Anne had seen him only once, and then but casually, when he was at home on a short furlough. His figure was not much changed from what it had been, but the many sunrises and sunsets which had passed since that day developing her from a comparative child to womanhood, had abstracted some of his angularities, reddened his chin, and given him a foreign look. It was interesting to see what years of training and service had done for this man. Few would have supposed that the white and blue coats similar to miller and soldier covered the forms of father and son. Before the last troop of dragoons rode off, they were welcomed into the body of Miller Loveday, who still stood in his outer garden, this being a plot lying below the mill tail and stretching to the water side. It was just the time of year when cherries are ripe, and hung in clusters under their dark leaves. While the troopers loitered on their horses and chatted to the miller across the stream, he gathered bunches of fruit and held them up over the garden hedge, for the acceptance of anybody who would have them. Whereupon the soldiers rode into the water, to where it had washed holes in the garden bank, and, reining their horses there, caught the cherries in their forage caps, or received bunches of them on the ends of their switches, with the dignified laugh that became martial men when stooping to slightly boyish amusement. It was a cheerful, careless, unpremeditated half-hour, which returned like the scent of a flower to the memories of some of those who enjoyed it, even at a distance of many years after, when they lay wounded and weak in foreign lands. Then dragoons and horses wheeled off as the others had done, and the troops of the German legion next came down and entered in panoramic procession the space below Anne's eyes, as if on purpose to gratify her. These were notable by their mustachios, and cues wound tightly with brown ribbon to the level of their broad shoulder-blades. They were charmed, as the others had been, by the head and neck of Miss Garland in the little square window overlooking the scene of operations, and saluted her with devoted foreign civility, and in such overwhelming numbers that the modest girl suddenly withdrew herself into the room, and had a private blush between the chest of drawers and the washing-stand. When she came downstairs, her mother said, 
I have been thinking what I ought to wear to Miller Loveday's tonight. To Miller Loveday's? said Anne. Yes, the party is tonight. He has been in here this morning to tell me that he has seen his son, and they have fixed this evening. Do you think we ought to go, mother? said Anne slowly, and looking at the smaller features of the window flowers. Why not? said Mrs. Garland. He will only have men there except ourselves, will he? And shall we be right to go along among them? Anne had not recovered from the ardent gaze of the gallant York Hussars, whose voices reached her even now in converse with Loveday. La, Anne, how proud you are, said Widow Garland. Why, isn't he our nearest neighbour and our landlord? And don't he fetch our faggots from the wood and keep us in vegetables for next to nothing? That's true, said Anne. Well, we can't be distant with the man. And if the enemy land next autumn, as everybody says they will, we shall have to depend upon the miller's wagon and horses. He's our only friend. Yes, so he is said Anne, and you had better go, mother, and I'll stay at home. They will all be men, and I don't like going. Mrs. Garland reflected. Well, if you don't want to go, I don't, she said. Perhaps, as you are growing up, it will be better to stay at home this time. Your father was a professional man, certainly. Having spoken as a mother, she sighed as a woman. Why do you sigh, mother? You are so prim and stiff about everything. "'Very well. We'll go.' "'Oh, no. I am not sure that we ought. I did not promise, and there will be no trouble in keeping away.' Anne apparently did not feel certain of her own opinion, and instead of supporting or contradicting, looked thoughtfully down, and abstractedly brought her hands together on her bosom, till her fingers met tip to tip. As the day advanced, the young woman and her mother became aware that great preparations were in progress in the miller's wing of the house. The partitioning between the love days and the garlands was not very thorough, consisting in many cases of a simple screwing up of the doors in the dividing walls, and thus when the mill began any new performances, they proclaimed themselves at once in the more private dwelling. The smell of Miller Loveday's pipe came down Mrs. Garland's chimney of an evening with the greatest regularity. Every time he poked his fire, they knew from the vehemence or deliberateness of the blows the precise state of his mind. And when he wound his clock on Sunday nights, the whir of that monitor reminded the widow to wind hers. This transit of noises was most perfect where Loveday's lobby adjoined Mrs. Garland's pantry, and Anne, who was occupied for some time in the latter apartment, enjoyed the privilege of hearing the visitors arrive and catching stray sounds and words without the connecting phrases that made them entertaining, to judge from the laughter they evoked. The arrivals passed through the house and went into the garden, where they had tea in a large summer-house, an occasional blink of bright colour through the foliage being all that was visible of the assembly from Mrs. Garland's windows. When it grew dusk, they all could be heard coming indoors to finish the evening in the parlour. Then there was an intensified continuation of the above-mentioned signs of enjoyment, talkings and haw-haws, runnings upstairs and runnings down, a slamming of doors and a clinking of cups and glasses, till the proudest adjoining tenant without friends on his own side of the partition might have been tempted to wish for entrance to that merry dwelling, if only to know the cause of these fluctuations of hilarity, and to see if the guests were really so numerous and the observation so very amusing as they seemed. The stagnation of life on the garland side of the party wall began to have a very gloomy effect by contrast. When about half-past nine o'clock, one of these tantalising bursts of gaiety had resounded for a longer time than usual, Anne said, "'I believe, mother, that you are wishing you had gone.' "'I own to feeling that it would have been very cheerful if we had joined in,' said Mrs. Garland, in a hankering tone. "'It was rather too nice in listening to you and not going. The parson never calls upon us except in his spiritual capacity.' Old Derriman is hardly genteel, and there's nobody left to speak to. 
Lonely people must accept what company they can get. Or do without it altogether. That's not natural, Anne, and I am surprised to hear a young woman like you say such a thing. Nature will not be stifled in that way. Song and powerful chorus heard through partition. I declare the room on the other side of the wall seems quite a paradise compared with this. Mother, you are quite a girl, said Anne, in slightly superior accents. Go in and join them by all means. Oh, no, not now, said her mother, resignedly shaking her head. It is too late now. We ought to have taken advantage of the invitation. They would look hard at me as a poor mortal who had no real business there, and the miller would say, with his broad smile, Ah, you be obliged to come round. While the sociable and unaspiring Mrs. Garland continued thus to pass the evening in two places, her body in her own house and her mind in the miller's, somebody knocked at the door, and directly after the elder Loveday himself was admitted to the room. He was dressed in a suit between grand and gay, which he used for such occasions as the present, and his blue coat, yellow and red waistcoat, with the three lower buttons unfastened, steel-buckled shoes and speckled stockings became him very well in Mrs. Martha Garland's eyes. "'Your servant, ma'am,' said the miller, adopting as a matter of propriety the raised standards of politeness required by his higher costume. "'Now, begging your pardon, I can't have this. "'Tis unnatural, for you two ladies should be biding here, "'and we under the same roof making merry without ye. "'Your husband, poor man, lovey pictures, that a would make to be sure, "'would have been in with us long ago if he had been in your place. "'I can take no nay from ye, upon my honour. "'You and Maidy Anne must come in, if it be only for half an hour.' John and his friends have got passes till twelve o'clock to-night, and saving a few of our own village folk, the lowest visitor at present is a very genteel German corporal. If you should hae any misgivings on the score of respectability, ma'am, we'll pack off the underbred ones into the back kitchen. Widow Garland and Anne looked yes at each other after this appeal. We'll follow you in a few minutes, said the elder, smiling, and she rose with Anne to go upstairs. "'No, I'll wait for ye,' said the miller doggedly, "'or perhaps you'll alter your minds again.' While the mother and daughter were upstairs dressing, and saying laughingly to each other, "'Well, we must go now,' as if they hadn't wished to go all evening, other steps were heard in the passage, and the miller cried from below, "'Your pardon, Mrs. Garland, but my son John has come to help fetch ye. Shall I ask him in till ye be ready?' "'Certainly. I shall be down in a minute,' screamed Anne's mother, in a slanting voice towards the staircase. When she descended, the outlet of the trumpet major appeared, halfway down the passage. "'There says John,' said the miller simply. "'John, you can mind Mrs. Martha Garland very well.' "'Very well indeed,' said the dragoon, coming a little further. "'I should have called to see her last time, but I was only home a week. How is your little girl, ma'am?' Mrs. Garland said Anne was quite well. She is grown up now. She will be down in a moment. There was a slight noise of military heels without the door, at which the trumpet major went and put his head outside and said, All right, coming in a minute, when voices in the darkness replied, No hurry. More friends, said Mrs. Garland. Oh, it's only Buck and Jones come to fetch me, said the soldier. Shall I ask him in a minute, Mrs. Garland, ma'am? "'Oh, yes,' said the lady, and the two interesting forms of Trumpeter Buck and Saddler Sergeant Jones then came forward in the most friendly manner, whereupon other steps were heard without, and it was discovered that Sergeant Master Taylor Brett and Farrier Extraordinary Johnson were outside, having come to fetch Messrs Buck and Jones, as Buck and Jones had come to fetch the Trumpet Major.' As there seemed a possibility of Mrs. Garland's small passage being choked up with human figures personally unknown to her, she was relieved to hear Anne coming downstairs. "'Here's my little girl,' said Mrs. Garland, and the trumpet major looked with a sort of awe upon the muslin apparition who came forward and stood quite dumb before her. 
Anne recognised him as the trooper she had seen from her window, and welcomed him kindly. There was something in his honest face which made her feel instantly at home with him. At this frankness of manner Loveday, who was not a lady's man, blushed, and made some alteration in his bodily posture, began a sentence which had no end, and showed quite a boy's embarrassment. Recovering himself, he politely offered his arm, which Anne took with very pretty grace. He conducted her through his comrades, who glued themselves perpendicularly to the wall to let her pass, and then they went out the door, her mother following with the miller, and supported by the body of troopers, the latter walking, with the usual cavalry gait, as if their thighs were rather too long for them. Thus they crossed the threshold of the mill-house, and up the passage, the paving of which was worn into a gutter by the ebb and flow of feet that had been going on there ever since Tudor times. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Four. Who were present at the Miller's Little Entertainment? When the group entered the presence of the company, a lull in the conversation was caused by the sight of new visitors, and, of course, by the charm of Anne's appearance, until the old man, who had daughters of their own, perceiving that she was only a half-formed girl, resumed their tales and toss-potting with unconcern. Miller Loveday had fraternized with half the soldiers in the camp since their arrival, and the effect of this upon his party was striking, both chromatically and otherwise. Those among the guests who first attracted the eye were the sergeants and the sergeant majors of Loveday's regiment fine hardy men, who sat facing the candles, entirely resigned to physical comfort. Then there were the other non-commissioned officers, a German, two Hungarians, and a Swede, from the foreign hussars, young men with a look of sadness on their faces, as if they did not much like serving so far from home. All of them spoke English fairly well. Old age was represented by Simon Burden the pensioner, and the shady side of fifty by Corporal Tullidge, his friend and neighbor, who was hard of hearing, and who sat with his hat on over a red cotton handkerchief that was wound several times round his head. These two veterans were employed as watchers at the neighboring beacon, which had lately been erected by the Lord Lieutenant, for firing whenever the descent on the coast should be made. They lived in a little hut on the hill, close by the heap of faggots, but to-night they had found deputies to watch in their stead. On a lower plane of experience and qualifications came neighbor James Comfort of the volunteers, a soldier by courtesy, but a blacksmith by rights. Also, William Tremlett and Anthony Cripplestraw of the local forces. The two latter men of war were dressed merely as villagers, and looked upon the regulars from a humble position in the background. The remainder of the party was made up of a neighboring dairyman or two and their wives, invited by the miller, as Anne was glad to see that she and her mother should not be the only women there. The elder Loveday apologized in a whisper to Mrs. Garland for the presence of the inferior villagers. But as they are learning to be brave defenders of their home and country, ma'am, as fast as they can master the drill, and have worked for me off and on these many years, I've asked them in and thought you'd excuse it. Certainly, Miller Loveday, said the widow. And the same of old Burton and Tullidge. They have served well and long in the foot, and even now have a hard time of it up at the beacon in wet weather. So, after giving em a meal in the kitchen, I just asked em in to hear the singing. They faithfully promised that as soon as ever the gunboats appear in view, and they have fired the beacon, to run down here first in case we shouldn't see it. Tis worth while to be friendly with em, you see, though their tempers be queer. Quite worth while, Miller, said she. Anne was rather embarrassed by the presence of the regular military in such force, and, at first, confined her words to the dairyman's wives she was acquainted with, and to the two old soldiers of the parish. "'Why didn't you speak to me afore, child?' said one of these, Corporal Tullidge, the elderly man with a hat, while she was talking to old Simon Burden. 
I met ye in the lane yesterday, he added reproachfully, but ye didn't notice me at all. I am very sorry for it, she said, but, being afraid to shout in such a company, the effect of her remark upon the corporal was as if she had not spoken at all. You was coming along with your head full of some high notions or other, no doubt, continued the uncompromising corporal in the same loud voice. Ah, tis young bucks that get all the notice nowadays, and old folks are quite forgot. I can mind well enough how young Bob Loveday used to lie in wait for ye. Anne blushed deeply, and stopped his too excursive discourse by hastily saying that she always respected old folks like him. The corporal thought she inquired why he always kept his hat on, and answered that it was because his head was injured at Valenciennes in July 93. We were trying to bomb down the tower, and a piece of the shell struck me. I was no more nor less than a dead man for two days. If it hadn't been for that and my smashed arm, I should have come home, none the worse for my five and twenty years' service. You have got a silver plate let in your head, haven't she, Corporal? said Anthony Cripplestraw, who had drawn near. I have heard that the way they mortised your skull was a beautiful piece of workmanship. Perhaps the young lady would like to see the place? Tis a curious sight, Mrs. Anne. You don't see such a wound every day. "'No, thank you,' said Anne hurriedly, dreading, as did all the young people of Overcombe, the spectacle of the corporal uncovered. He had never been seen in public without the hat and the handkerchief since his return in Ninety-Four, and strange stories were told of the ghastliness of his appearance bareheaded, a little boy who had accidentally beheld him going to bed in that state having been frightened into fits. "'Well, if the young woman don't want to see your head, maybe she'd like to hear your arm,' continued Cripple Straw, earnest to please her." Hey, said the corporal. Your arm hurt too, cried Anne. Knocked to a pummy at the same time as my head, said Tullidge dispassionately. Rattle your arm, corporal, and show her, said Cripple Straw. Yes, sure, said the corporal, raising the limbs slowly, as if the glory of the exhibition had lost some of its novelty, though he was willing to oblige. Twisting it mercilessly about with his right hand, he produced a crunching among the bones at every motion. Cripplestraw seeming to derive great satisfaction from the ghastly sound. How very shocking, said Anne, painfully anxious for him to leave off. Oh, it don't hurt him, bless ye, do it, corporal, said Cripplestraw. Not a bit, said the corporal, still working his arm with great energy. There's no life in the bones at all, no life in em, I tell her, corporal. None at all. They be as loose as a bag of nine pins, explained Cripplestraw in continuation. "'You can feel him quite plain, Mrs. Anne. "'If you would like to, he'll undo his sleeve in a minute to oblige ye. "'Oh, no, no, please not. I quite understand,' said the young woman. "'Do she want to hear or see him any more, or don't she?' the corporal inquired, "'with a sense that his time was getting wasted. "'Anne explained that she did not on any account, and managed to escape from the corner. "'End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Trumpet Major》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy》Chapter Five The Song and the Stranger The Trumpet Major now contrived to place himself near her, Anne's presence having evidently been a great pleasure to him since the moment of his first seeing her. She was quite at her ease with him, and asked him if he thought that Bonaparte really would come during the summer, and many other questions which the gallant dragoon could not answer, but which he nevertheless liked to be asked. William Tremlett, who had not enjoyed a sound night's rest since the first council's menace had become known, pricked up his ears at the sound of this subject, and inquired if any one had seen the terrible flat-bottom boats that the enemy were to cross in. My brother Robert saw several of them paddling about the shore the last time he passed the Straits of Dover, said the trumpet major, and he further startled the company by informing them that there were supposed to be more than fifteen hundred of these boats, and that they would carry a hundred men apiece, so that a descent of one hundred and fifty thousand men might be expected any day, as soon as Boney had brought his plans to bear. Lord, have mercy upon us, said William Tremlett. 
The night time is when they will try it, if they try it at all, said old Tullidge, in the tone of one whose watch at the beacon must, in the nature of things, have given him comprehensive views of the situation. It is my belief that the point they will choose for making the shore is just over there, and he nodded with indifference towards a section of the coast at a hideous nearness to the house in which they were assembled. Whereupon Fensible Tremlett and Cripple Straw of the locals tried to show no signs of trepidation. "'When do you think twill be?' said Volunteer Comfort, the blacksmith. "'I can't answer to a day,' said the corporal. "'But it will certainly be in a down-channel tide, and, instead of pulling hard against it, he'll let his boats drift, and that will bring him right into Budsmouth Bay. "'Twill be a beautiful stroke of war, if so be tis quietly done.' "'Beautiful,' said Cripple Straw, moving inside his clothes. "'But how if we should be all abed, Corporal? "'You can't expect a man to be brave in a shirt, "'especially we locals that have only got so far as shoulder firelocks.' "'He's not coming this summer. "'He'll never come at all,' said a tall Sergeant Major decisively. "'Loveday the soldier was too much engaged in attending upon Anne and her mother "'to join in these surmises, "'bestirring himself to get the lady some of the best liquor the house afforded,' which had, as a matter of fact, crossed the channel as privately as Bonaparte wished his army to do, and had been landed on a dark night over the cliff. After this he asked Anne to sing, but though she had a very pretty voice in private performances of that nature, she declined to oblige him, turning the subject by making a hesitating inquiry about his brother Robert, whom he had mentioned just before. "'Robert is as well as ever, thank you, Miss Garland,' he said." He is now made of the Brig Pewet, rather young for such a command, but the owner puts great trust in him. The trumpet major added, deepening his thoughts to a profounder view of the person discussed, Bob is in love. Anne looked conscious and listened attentively, but Loveday did not go on. Much? she asked. I can't exactly say. And the strange part of it is that he never tells us who the woman is. Nobody knows at all. "'He will tell, of course,' said Anne, in the remote tone of a person with whose sex such matters had no connection whatsoever. Loveday shook his head, and the tete-a-tete -tete was put to an end by a burst of song from one of the sergeants, who was followed at his end of the song by others, each giving a ditty in his turn, the singer standing up in front of the table, stretching his chin well into the air, as though to abstract every possible wrinkle from his throat, and then plunging into the melody." When this was over, one of the foreign hussars, the genteel German of Miller Loveday's description, who called himself a Hungarian, and in reality belonged to no definite country, performed at Trumpet Major Loveday's request the series of wild motions that he denominated his national dance, that Anne might see what it was like. Miss Garland was the flower of the whole company. The soldiers, one and all, foreign and English, seemed to be quite charmed by her presence, as indeed they might well be, considering how seldom they came into the society of such as she. Anne and her mother were just thinking of retiring to their own dwelling when Sergeant Stanner of the Nth Foot, who was recruiting at Bud's mouth, began a satirical song. When lawyers strive to heal a breach, and parsons practice what they preach, then little bony hill pounce down and marches men on London town. Roll it come, row rum, to lo lo rum, roll it come, row rum, to lo lay. When justices hold equal scales and rogues are only found in jails, then little bony hill pounce down and marches men on London town. Roll it come, row rum, to lo lo rum, roll it come, row rum, to lo lay. When rich men find their wealth a curse and fill therewith the poor man's purse, then little bony hill pounce down and march his men on London town. Roll it come, row rum, to lo lo rum, roll it come, row rum, to lo lay. Poor Stanner. In spite of his satire, he fell at the bloody Battle of Albura a few years after this pleasantly spent summer at the Georgian watering place, being mortally wounded and trampled down by a French hussar when the brigade was deploying into line under Beresford. While Miller Loveday was saying, well done, Mr. Stanner, at the close of the thirteenth stanza, which seemed to be the last, and Mr. Stanner was modestly expressing his regret he could do no better. A stentorian voice was heard outside the window shutter repeating, Roll it come, row rum, to lo lo rum, 
Rolicum roram to lo lay. The company was silent in a moment at this reinforcement, and only the military tried not to look surprised. While all wondered who the singer could be, someone entered the porch. The door opened, and in came a young man, about the size and weight of the Farnes Hercules, in the uniform of a yeomanry cavalry. "'Tis young Squire Derriman, old Derriman's nephew,' murmured voices in the background. Without waiting to address anybody, or, apparently, seeing who were gathered there, the colossal man waved his cap above his head and went on in tones that shook the window panes. When husbands with their wives agree, and maids won't wed from modesty, then little bony he'll pounce down and march his men in London town. Rolla come, ro rum, to lo lo rum, rolla come, ro rum, to lo lay. It was a verse which had been omitted by the gallant Stanner, out of respect to the ladies. The newcomer was red-haired and a florid complexion, and seemed full of conviction that his whim of entering must be their pleasure which, for the moment, it was. No ceremony, good men all, he said. I was passing by, and my ear was caught by the singing. I like singing. Tis warming and cheering, and shall not be put down. I should like to hear anybody say otherwise. Welcome, Master Derriman, said the miller, filling a glass and handing it to the yeoman. Come all the way from quarters, then. I hardly knowed ye in your soldier's clothes. You look more natural with a spud in your hand, sir. I shouldn't have known ye at all if I hadn't heard that you were called out. More natural with a spud? Have a care, Miller, said the young giant, the fire of his complexion increasing to scarlet. I don't mean anger, but, but, a soldier's honor, you know. The military in the background laughed a little, and the yeoman then for the first time discovered that there were more regulars present than one. He looked momentarily disconcerted, but expanded again to full assurance. "'Right, right, Master Derriman, no offense, "'twas only my joke,' said the genial miller. "'Everybody's a soldier nowadays. "'Drink a drop of this cordial, and don't mind words.' "'The young man drank without the least reluctance, and said, "'Yes, miller, I am called out. "'Tis ticklish time for us soldiers now. "'We hold our lives in our hands. "'What are those fellows grinning at behind the table? "'I say we do.' "'Staying with your uncle at the farm for a day or two, Mr. Derriman? "'No, no, as I told you, six miles off, billeted at Casterbridge. "'But I have to call and see the old, old gentleman?' "'Gentleman, no, Skinflint. "'He lives upon the sweepings of the Barton. <laughs> "'Ha, ha, and the speaker's regular white teeth "'showed themselves like snow in a Dutch cabbage. "'Well, well, the profession of arms makes a man proof against all that. "'I take things as I find them. "'Quite right, Master Derriman. Another drop?' "'No, no, I'll take no more than is good for me. No man should. So don't tempt me.' The yeoman then saw Anne, and, by unconscious gravitation, went towards her and the other women, flinging a remark to John Loveday in passing. "'Ah, Loveday, I heard you were come. In short, I come a purpose to see you. Glad to see you enjoying yourself at home again.' The trumpet major replied civilly, though not without grimness, for he seemed hardly to like Derriman's motion towards Anne. "'Widow Garland's daughter. Yes, tis, surely. You remember me. I have been here before. Festus Derriman, Yeomanry Cavalry.' Anne gave a little curtsy. "'I know your name is Festus. That's all. Yes, tis well known, especially latterly. He dropped his voice to confidence pitch. I suppose your friends here are disturbed by my coming in, as they don't seem to talk much?' I don't mean to interrupt the party, but I often find that people are put out by my coming among em, especially when I've got my regimentals on. La, and are they? Yes, tis the way I have. He further lowered his voice, as if they had been old friends, though in reality he had only seen her three or four times. And how did you come to be here? Dash my wig, I don't like to see a nice young lady like you in this company. You should come to some of our yeomanry sprees in Casterbridge or Shotsford for em. Oh, but the girls do come, though yeomanry are respected men, men of good substantial families, many farming their own land, and every one among us rides his own charger, which is more than these cussed fellows do, he nodded towards the dragoons. Hush, hush, why, these are friends and neighbors of Miller Loveday, and he is a great friend of ours, our best friend, said Anne with great emphasis, and reddening at the sense of injustice to their host. 
What are you thinking of talking like that? It is ungenerous in you. Ha, ha, I've affronted you. Isn't that it, fair angel, fair, what do you call it, fair vestal? Ah, well, would you was safe in my own house. But honor must be minded now, not courting. Rolla cum tolo lorum. Pardon me, my sweet. I like ye. It may be a come down for me, own and land, but I do like ye. Sir, please be quiet, said Anne, distressed. I will, I will. Well, Corporate Tullidge, how's your head? He said, going towards the other end of the room, and leaving Anne to herself. The company had again recovered its liveliness, and it was a long time before the bouncing Rufus, who had joined them, could find heart to tear himself away from their society, and good liquors, although he had had quite enough of the latter before he entered. The natives received him at his own valuation, and the soldiers of the camp, who sat behind the table, smiled behind their pipes at his remarks, with a pleasant twinkle of the eye which approached the satirical, John Loveday not being the least conspicuous in this bearing. But he and his friends were too courteous on such an occasion as the present to challenge the young man's large remarks, and readily permitted him to set them right on the details of camping and other military routine, about which the troopers seemed willing to let persons hold any opinion whatsoever, provided that they themselves were not obliged to give attention to it, showing, strangely enough, that if there was one subject more than another which never interested their minds, it was the art of war. To them the art of enjoying good company in Overcombe Mill, the details of the miller's household, the swarming of his bees, the numbers of his chickens, and the fatness of his pigs were matters of infinitely greater concern. The present writer, to whom this party has been described times out of number by members of the Loveday family and other aged people now passed away, can never enter the old living room of Overcombe Mill without beholding this genial scene through the mists of the seventy or eighty years that intervenes between then and now. First and brightest to the eye are the dozen candles, scattered about, regardless of expense, and kept well snuffed by the miller, who walks round the room at intervals of five minutes, snuffers in hand, and nips each wick with great precision, and, with something of an executioner's grim look upon his face, as he closes the snuffers upon the neck of the candle. Next to the candlelight show the red and blue coats and white breeches of the soldiers, nearly twenty of them in all, besides the ponderous derriman, the head of the latter, and indeed the heads of all who are standing up, being in dangerous proximity to the black beams of the ceiling. There is not one among them who would attach any meaning to Vittoria, or gather from the syllables Waterloo the remotest idea of his own glory or death. Next appears the correct and innocent Anne, little thinking what things time has in store for her at no great distance off. She looks at Derriman with a half-easy smile as he clanks hither and thither, and hopes he will not single her out again to hold a private dialogue with, which, however, he does, irresistibly attracted by the white muslin figure. She must, of course, look a little gracious now and again, lest his mood should turn from sentimental to quarrelsome, no impossible contingency with a yeoman soldier, as her quick perception had noted. Well, well, this idling won't do for me, folks, he said at last, to Anne's relief. I should not ought to have come in by rights, but I heard you enjoying yourselves and thought it might be worth while to see what you were up to. I have several miles to go before bedtime, and stretching his arms, lifting his chin and shaking his head, to eradicate any unseemly curve or wrinkle from his person, the yeoman wished them an off-hand good night, and departed. You should have teased him a little more, father, said the trumpet major dryly. You could soon have made him as crabbed as a bear. I didn't want to provoke the chap. T'wasn't worth while. He came in friendly enough, said the gentle miller, without looking up. I don't think he was over much friendly, said John. Tis as well to be neighborly with folks, if they be not quite unbearable, his father genially replied, as he took off his coat to go and draw more ale. This periodical stripping to the shirt sleeves being necessitated by the narrowness of the cellar and the smeary effect of its numerous cobwebs upon best clothes. Some of the guests then spoke of Festerman as not such a bad young man if you took him right and humored him. Others said that he was nobody's enemy but his own, and the elderly ladies mentioned in a tone of interest that he was likely to come into a deal of money at his uncle's death. 
The person who did not praise him was the one who knew him best, who had known him as a boy years ago when he had lived nearer to Overcombe than he did at present. This unappreciative person was the trumpet major. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Six. Old Mr. Derriman of Oxwell Hall. At this time in the history of Overcombe, one solitary newspaper occasionally found its way into the village. It was lent by the postmaster at Budsmouth, who in some mysterious way got it for nothing through his connection with the mail, to Mr. Derriman at the hall, by whom it was handed on to Mrs. Garland when it was not more than a fortnight old. Whoever remembers anything about the old farmer squire will, of course, know well enough that this delightful privilege of reading history in long columns was not accorded to the widow Garland for nothing. It was by such ingenuous means that he paid her for her daughter's occasional service in reading aloud to him and making out his accounts, in which matters the farmer, whose guineas were reported to touch five figures, some said more, was not expert. Mrs. Martha Garland, as a respectable widow, occupied a twilight rank between benighted villagers and the well-informed gentry, kindly made herself useful to the former as letter-writer and reader, and general translator from the printing tongue. It was not without satisfaction that she stood at her door of an evening, newspaper in hand, with three or four cottagers standing round, and poured down their open throats any paragraph that she might choose to select from the stirring ones of the period. When she had done with the sheet, Mrs. Garland passed it on to the miller, the miller to the grinder, and the grinder to the grinder's boy, in whose hands it became subdivided into half-pages, quarter-pages, and irregular triangles, and ended its career as a paper cap, a flagon-bung, or a wrapper for his bread and cheese. Notwithstanding his compact with Mrs. Garland, old Mr. Derriman kept the paper so long and was so cheery of wasting his man's time on a merely intellectual exercise that, unless she sent for the journal, it seldom reached her hands. Anne was always her messenger. The arrival of the soldiers led Mrs. Garland to dispatch her daughter for it the day after the party, and away she went in her hat and police, in a direction at right angles to that of the encampment on the hill. Walking across the fields for the distance of a mile or two, she came out upon the high road by a wicket gate. On the other side of the way was the entrance to what at first looked like a neglected meadow, the gate being a rotten one, without a bottom rail, and broken down palings lying on each side. The dry, hard mud of the opening was marked with several horse and cow tracks that had been half obliterated by fifty-score sheep tracks surcharged with the tracks of a man and a dog. Beyond this geological record appeared a carriage road, nearly grown over with grass, which Anne followed. It descended by a gentle slope, dived under dark-rinded elm and chestnut trees, and conducted her on till the hiss of a waterfall and the sound of the sea became audible when it took a bend round a swamp of fresh watercress and brooklime that had once been a fish-pond. Here the grey, weather-worn front of a building edged from behind the trees. It was Oxwell Hall, once the seat of a family now extinct, and, of late years, used as a farmhouse. Benjamin Derriman, who owned the crumbling place, had originally been only the occupier and tenant-farmer of the fields around. His wife had brought him a small fortune, and during the growth of their only son there had been a partition of the Oxwell estate, giving the farmer, now a widower, the opportunity of acquiring the building and a small portion of the land attached on exceptionally low terms. But two years after the purchase the boy died, and Derriman's existence was paralyzed forthwith. It was said that, since that event, he had devised the house and fields to a distant female relative, to keep them out of the hands of his detested nephew but this was not certainly known. The hall was as interesting as mansions in a state of declension usually are, as the excellent county history showed. That popular work in folio contained an old plate dedicated to the last scion of the original owners, 
from which drawing it appeared that in 1750, the date of the publication, the windows were covered with little scratches like black flashes of lightning, that a horn of hard smoke came out of each of the twelve chimneys, that a lady and a lapdog stood on the lawn in a strenuously walking position, and a substantial cloud and nine flying birds of no known species hung over the trees to the northeast. The rambling and neglected dwelling had all the romantic excellencies and practical drawbacks which such mildewed places share in common with caves, mountains, wildernesses, glens, and other homes of poesy that peoples of taste wish to live and die in. Mustard and cress could have been raised on the inner plaster of the dewy walls at any height not exceeding three feet from the floor, and mushrooms of the most refined and thin-stemmed kinds grew up through the chinks in the larder paving. As for the outside, nature, in the ample time that it had been given her, had so mingled her filings and effacements with the marks of human wear and tear upon the house that it was often hard to say in which of the two, or if in both, any particular obliteration had its origin. The keenness was gone from the mouldings of the doorways, but whether worn out by the rubbing past of innumerable people's shoulders and the moving of their heavy furniture, or by time, in a grander and more abstract form, did not appear. The iron stanchions inside the window panes were eaten away to the size of wires at the bottom where they settled into the stone, the condensed breathings of generations having settled there in pools and rusted them. The panes themselves had either lost their shine altogether or become iridescent as a peacock's tail. In the middle of the porch was a vertical sundial, whose gnomon swayed loosely about when the wind blew and cast its shadow hither and thither, as much as to say, Here's your fine model dial. Here's any time for any man. I am an old dial, and shiftiness is the best policy. Anne passed under the arched gateway which screened the main front. Over it was the porter's lodge, reached by a spiral staircase. Across the archway was fixed a row of wooden hurdles, one of which Anne opened and closed behind her. Their necessity was apparent as soon as she got inside. The quadrangle of the ancient pile was a bed of mud and manure, inhabited by calves, geese, ducks, and sow pigs surprisingly large, with young ones surprisingly small. In the groin porch some heifers were amusing themselves by stretching up their necks and licking the carved stone capitals that supported the vaulting, and went on to a second and open door, across which was another hurdle, to keep the livestock from absolute community with the inmates. There being no knocker, she knocked by means of a short stick which was laid against the post for that purpose. But, nobody attending, she entered the passage and tried an inner door. A slight noise was heard inside. The door opened about an inch, and a strip of decayed face, including the eye and some forehead wrinkles, appeared within the crevice. "'Please, I have come for the paper,' said Anne. "'Oh, is it you, dear Anne?' whined the inmate, opening the door a little further. I could hardly get to the door to open it, I am so weak. The speaker was a wizened old gentleman, in a coat the color of his farmyard, breeches of the same hue, unbuttoned at the knee, revealing a bit of leg above his stocking, and a dazzlingly white shirt frill to compensate for this untidiness below. The edge of his skull round his eye sockets was visible through the skin, and he had a mouth whose corners made towards the back of his head on the slightest provocation. He walked with great apparent difficulty back into the room, and following him. "'Well, you can have the paper if you want it, but you never give me much time to see what's in un. Here's the paper.' He held it out to her, but before she could take it he drew it back again, saying, "'I have not had my share of the paper by a good deal, what with my weak sight and people coming so soon for un. I am a poor put-upon soul. But my duty of man will be left to me when the newspaper is gone.' and he sank into his chair with an air of exhaustion. Anne said that she did not wish to take the paper if he had not done with it, and that she was really later in the week than usual, owing to the soldiers. Soldiers, yes, rot to the soldiers. And now hedges will be broke, and hen's nests robbed, and suckling pigs stole, and I don't know what all. Who's to pay for it, sure? I reckon that because the soldiers be come, you don't mean to be kind enough to read to me what I hadn't had time to read myself. She would read if he wished, she said. She was in no hurry. And sitting herself down, she unfolded the paper. Dinner at Carlton House? No faith, tis nothing to I. Defense of the country? Ye may read that if ye will. 
I hope there will be nobility in this parish or any wild work of that sort, for what would a poor old laminger like myself do with soldiers in his house, and nothing to feed him with? Anne began reading, and continued her task nearly ten minutes, when she was interrupted by the appearance in the quadrangle slew without of a large figure in the uniform of a yeomanry cavalry. "'What do you see out there?' said the farmer with a start, as she paused and slowly blushed. "'A soldier, one of the yeomanry,' said Anne, not quite at her ease. "'Scrouch it all, tis my nephew!' exclaimed the old man his face turning to a phosphoric pallor, and his body twitching with innumerable alarms as he formed upon his face a gasping smile of joy with which to welcome the newcoming relative. Read on, prithee, Miss Garland. Before she had read far, the visitor straddled over the door hurdle into the passage and entered the room. Well, Nunk, how do you feel? said the giant, shaking hands with the farmer in the manner of one violently ringing a handbell. Glad to see you. "'Bad and weakish, Festus,' replied the other, his person responding passively to the rapid vibrations imparted. "'Oh, be tender, please, a little softer. There's a dear nephew. My arm is no more than a cobweb. Ah, poor soul. Yes, I am not much more than a skeleton, and can't bear rough usage. Sorry to hear that, but I'll bear your affliction in mind. Why, you are all in a tremble, Uncle Benji.' "'Tis because I am so gratified,' said the old man. I always get all in a tremble when I'm taken by surprise by a beloved relation. Ah, that's it, said the yeoman, bringing his hand down on the back of his uncle's chair with a loud smack, at which Uncle Benji nervously sprang three inches from his seat and dropped into it again. Ask your pardon for frightening ye, uncle. Tis how we do it in the army, and I forgot your nerves. You have scarcely expected to see me, I dare say, but here I am. I'm glad to see ye. You are not going to stay long, perhaps? Quite the contrary. I am going to stay ever so long. Oh, I see. I am so glad, dear Festus. Ever so long, did ye say? Yes, ever so long, said the young gentleman, sitting on the slope of the bureau and stretching out his legs as props. I am going to make this quite my own home whenever I am off duty, as long as we stay out. And after that, when the campaign is over in the autumn, I shall come here and live with you like your own son, and help you manage your land and your farm, you know, and make you a comfortable old man. Ah, how you do please me, said the farmer, with a horrified smile, and grasping the arms of his chair to sustain himself. Yes, I've been meaning to come a long time as I knew you'd like to have me, Uncle Benji, and tisn't in my heart to refuse you. You always was kind that way. Yes, I always was. But I ought to tell you at once, not to disappoint you, that I shan't be here always, all day, that is, because of my military duties as a cavalryman. Oh, not always? That's a pity, exclaimed the farmer, with a cheerful eye. I knew you'd say so, and I shan't be able to sleep here at night sometimes for the same reason. Not sleep here o' oh, nights, said the old man, still more relieved. You ought to sleep here. You certainly ought. In short, you must. But you can't. Not while we are with the colors, but directly that's over, the very next day, I'll stay here all day and all night, too, to oblige you, since you ask me so very kindly. The thank thee, that will be very nice, said Uncle Benji. Yes, I knew twould relieve ye. And he kindly stroked his uncle's head, the old man expressing his enjoyment at the affectionate token by a death's head grimace. I should have called to see you the other night when I passed through here, Festus continued. "'But it was so late that I couldn't come so far out of my way. "'You won't think it unkind?' "'Not at all, if you couldn't. "'I shall never think it unkind if you really can't come, you know, Festy.' "'There was a few minutes' pause, and as the nephew said nothing, Uncle Benji went on. "'I wish I had a little present for ye, but as ill luck would have it, "'we have lost a deal of stock this year, and I have had to pay away so much.' "'Poor old man, I know you have. Shall I lend you a seven-shilling piece, Uncle Benji?' "'Ha, ha, you must have your little joke. Well, I'll think of that.' "'And so they expect Bonypart to choose this very part of the coast for his landing, eh? And that the yeomanry be to stand in front as the forlorn hope?' "'Who says so?' asked the florid son of Mars, losing a little redness. "'The newspaper man.' "'Oh, there's nothing in that,' said Festus bravely. The government thought it possible at one time, but they don't know. Festus turned himself as he talked, and now said abruptly, Ah, who's this? Why, tis our little Anne. 
he had not noticed her till this moment, the young woman having at his entry kept her face over the newspaper, and then got away to the back part of the room. "'And are you and your mother always going to stay down there in the mill-house, watching the little fishes, Miss Anne?' She said that it was uncertain, in a tone of truthful precision which the question was hardly worth, looking forcedly at him as she spoke. But she blushed fitfully in her arms and hands as much as in her face. Not that she was overpowered by the great boots, formidable spurs, and other fierce appliances of his person, as he imagined. Simply, she had not been prepared to meet him there. "'I hope you will, I am sure, for my own good,' he said, letting his eyes linger on the round of her cheek. Anne became a little more dignified, and her look showed reserve. But the yeoman, on perceiving this, went on talking to her in so civil a way that he irresistibly amused her, though she tried to conceal all feeling. At a brighter remark of his than usual, her mouth moved, her upper lip playing uncertainly over her white teeth. It would stay still. No, it would withdraw a little way in a smile. Then it would flutter down again, and so it wavered like a butterfly in a tender desire to be pleased and smiling, and yet to be also sedate and composed, to show him that she did not want compliments, and yet that she was not so cold as to wish to repress any genuine feeling he might be anxious to utter. "'Shall you want any more reading, Mr. Derriman?' she said, interrupting the younger man in his remarks. "'If not, I'll go homeward.' "'Don't let me hinder you longer,' said Festus. "'I'm off in a minute or two when your man has cleaned my boots.' "'You don't hinder us, nephew. "'She must have the paper. "'Tis the day for her to have un. "'She might read a little more "'as I've had so little profit out of in hitherto. "'Well, why don't ye speak? "'Will ye or won't ye, my dear?' "'Not to two, she said. "'Ho, ho, damn it, I must go then, I suppose,' said Festus, "'laughing, and unable to get a further glance from her, "'he left the room and clanked into the backyard "'where he saw a man. "'Holding up his hand, he cried, "'Anthony Cripplestraw!' Cripplestraw came up in a trot, moved a lock of his hair and replaced it, and said, "'Yes, Master Derriman.' He was old Mr. Derriman's odd hand in the yard and garden, and like his employer had no great pretensions to manly beauty, owing to a limpness of backbone and a specialty of mouth, which opened on one side only, giving him a triangular smile. "'Well, Cripplestraw, how is it to-day?' said Festus, with socially superior heartiness. "'Midland, considerin', Master Derriman.' And how's yourself? Fairish? Well, now, see and clean these military boots of mine. I'll cock my foot up on to this bench. This pigsty of my uncle's is not fit for a soldier to come into. Yes, Mr. Derriman, I will. No, tis not fit, Master Derriman. What stock has uncle lost this year, Cripple Straw? Well, let's see, sir. I can call to mind that we've lost three chickens, a tom pigeon, and a weakly suckling pig, one of a fair of ten. I can't think of no more, Master Derriman. Hm, not a large quantity of cattle, the old rascal. No, tis not a large quantity. Old what did you say, sir? Oh, nothing. He's within there. Festus flung his forehead in the direction of a right line, towards the inner apartment. He's a regular snitch one. He <laughs> he, fie, fie, Master Derriman, said Cripplestraw, shaking his head in delighted censure. "'Gentlefolks shouldn't talk so. "'And an officer, Mr. Derriman. "'Tis the duty of all cavalry gentlemen to bear in mind "'that their blood is a knowed thing in the country, "'and not to speak ill out. "'He's close-fisted. "'Well, master, he is. "'I own he is a little. "'Tis the matter of some old venerable gentleman to be so. "'We'll hope he'll treat you well in your fortune, sir. "'Hope he will.' "'Do people talk about me here, Cripple Straw? asked the yeoman, as the other continued busy with his boots. "'Well, yes, sir, they do off and on, you know. "'They says you be as fine a piece of cavalry flesh and bones "'as ever growed on fallow ground. "'In short, all owns you be a fine fellow, sir. "'I wish I wasn't no more afraid of the French than you be, "'but being in the locals, Master Derriman, "'I assure ye I dream of having to defend my country every night, "'and I don't like the dream at all. "'You should take it careless, Cripple Straw, as I do, "'and twould soon come natural to you not to mind at all.' "'Well, a fine fellow is not everything, you know. "'Oh, no. "'There's as good as I in the army, and even better. "'And they say that when you fall this summer, you'll die like a man. "'When I fall? "'Yes, sure, Master Derriman, poor soul of thee. "'I shan't forget ye as ye lie mouldering in your soldier's grave. "'Hey?' said the warrior uneasily. "'What makes him think I'm going to fall?' 
"'Well, sir, by all accounts, the yeomanry will be put in front.' "'Front? That's what my uncle has been saying.' "'Yes, and by all accounts, tis true. "'And natterly they'll be mowed down like grass, "'and you among em, poor young gallant officer. "'Look here, Cripplestraw, this is a regular foolish report. "'How can yeomanry be put in front? "'Nobody's put in front. "'We yeomanry have nothing to do with Bonaparte's landing. "'We shall be away in a safe place, guarding the possessions and jewels. "'Now, can you see, Cripplestraw, any way at all "'that the yeomanry can be put in front? "'Do you really think they can?' "'Well, master, I'm afraid I do,' said the cheering cripple straw. "'And I know a great warrior like you is only too glad of the chance. "'Twill be a great thing for ye, death and glory. "'In short, I hope from my heart you will, and I say so very often to folk. "'In fact, I pray at night for it. "'Oh, cuss you, you needn't pray about it. "'No, master Derryman, I won't. "'Of course my sword will do its duty. That's enough. "'And now be off with ye.' Festus gloomily returned to his uncle's room, and found that Anne was just leaving. He was inclined to follow her at once, but as she gave him no opportunity for doing this, he went to the window, and remained tapping his fingers against the shutter while she crossed the yard. "'Well, Nephi, you are not gone yet?' said the farmer, looking dubiously at Festus from under one eyelid. "'You see how I am, not by any means better, you see, so I can't entertain you as well as I would.' "'You can't, Nunk, you can't. I don't think you are worse. If I do, dash my wig. But you'll have plenty of opportunity to make me welcome when you are better. If you are not so brisk inwardly as you was, why not try a change of air? This is a dull, damp hole. "'Tis, Festus, and I am thinking of moving.' "'Ah, where to?' said Festus, with surprise and interest. "'Up into the garret in the north corner. There is no fireplace in the room, but I shan't want that, poor soul of me.' "'Tis not moving far. "'Tis not, but I have not a soul belonging to me within ten mile, "'and you know very well that I couldn't afford to go to lodgings that I had to pay for. "'I know it, I know it, Uncle Benji. "'Well, don't be disturbed. "'I'll come and manage for you as soon as ever this bony alarm is over. "'But when a man's country calls, he must obey, if he is a man.' "'A splendid spirit,' said Uncle Benji, with much admiration on the surface of his countenance. "'I never had it. How could it have got into the boy? From my mother's side, perhaps? Perhaps so. Well, take care of yourself, Nephi, said the farmer, waving his hand impressively. Take care. In these warlike times your spirit may carry ye into the arms of the enemy, and you are the last of the family. You should think of this and not let your bravery carry ye away. Don't be disturbed, uncle. I'll control myself, said Festus, betrayed into self-complacency against his will. At least I'll do what I can. But nature will out sometimes. Well, I'm off. He began humming Brighton Camp, and promising to come again very soon, retired with assurance, each yard of his retreat adding private joyousness to his uncle's form. When the bulky young man had disappeared through the porter's lodge, Uncle Benji showed preternatural activity for one in his invalid state, jumping up quickly without a stick, at the same time opening and shutting his mouth quite silently, like a thirsty frog, which was his way of expressing mirth. He ran upstairs as quick as an old squirrel, and went to a dormer window which commanded a view of the grounds beyond the gate, and the footpath that stretched across them to the village. "'Yes, yes,' he said in a suppressed scream, dancing up and down. "'He's after her. She've hidden.' For there appeared upon the path the figure of Anne Garland and, hastening on at some little distance behind her, the swaggering shape of Festus. She became conscious of his approach and moved more quickly. He moved more quickly still and overtook her. She turned as if in answer to a call from him, and he walked on beside her till they were out of sight. The old man then played upon an imaginary fiddle for about a half a minute, and, suddenly discontinuing the signs of pleasure, went downstairs again. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. CHAPTER Seven, HOW THEY TALKED IN THE PASTURES 
"'You often come this way?' said Festus to Anne, rather before he had overtaken her. "'I come for the newspaper and other things,' she said, perplexed by a doubt whether he were there by accident or design. They moved on in silence, Festus beating the grass with the switch in a masterful way. "'Did you speak, Miss Anne?' he asked. "'No,' said Anne. Ten thousand pardons. I thought you did. Now don't let me drive you out of the path. I can walk among the high grass and the guilty cups. They will not yellow my stockings as they will yours. Well, what do you think of a lot of soldiers coming to the neighborhood in this way? I think it is very lively, and a great change, she said with demure seriousness. Perhaps you don't like us warriors as a body. Anne smiled without replying. "'Why, you are laughing,' said the yeoman, looking searchingly at her, and blushing like a little fire. "'What do you see to laugh at?' "'Did I laugh?' said Anne, a little scared at his sudden mortification. "'Why, yes, you did. Why, yes, you know you did, you young sneerer,' he said like a cross baby. "'You are laughing at me. That's who you are laughing at. I should like to know what you would do without such as me if the French were to drop in upon ye any night. Would you help to beat them off?' she said. "'Can you ask such a question? What are we for? But you don't think anything of soldiers.' "'Oh, yes, she likes soldiers,' she said, especially when they come home from the wars covered with glory, though when she thought what doings had won them that glory, she did not like them quite so well. The gallant and appeased yeoman said he supposed her to mean chopping off heads, blowing out brains, and that kind of business, and thought it quite right that a tender-hearted thing like her should feel a little horrified. But, as for him, he should not mind another Blenheim this summer as the army had fought a hundred years ago, or whenever it was. Dash it, Whig, if he should mind it at all. Hello, now you are laughing again. Yes, I saw you. And the choleric Festus turned his blue eyes and flushed face upon her as though he would read her thoughts. Anne strove valiantly to look calmly back, but her eyes could not face his and they fell. You did laugh, he repeated. It was only a tiny little one, she murmured. Ah, I knew you did, thundered he. What was it you laughed at? I only thought that you were merely in the yeomanry, she murmured slyly. And what of that? And the yeomanry only seem farmers that have lost their senses. Yes, yes, I knew you meant some jeering o' that sort, Mistress Anne. But I suppose tis the way of women, and I take no notice. I'll confess that some of us are no great things, but I know how to draw a sword, don't I? Say I don't, just to provoke me. I am sure you do, said Anne sweetly. If a Frenchman came up to you, Mr. Derriman, would you take him on the hip or on the thigh? Now you're flattering, he said, his white teeth uncovering themselves in a smile. Well, of course I should draw my sword. No, I mean, my sword would already be drawn, and I should put spurs to my horse. Charger, as we call it in the army, and I should write up to him and say, No, I shouldn't say anything, of course. Men never waste words in battle. I should take him with the third guard, low point, then coming back to the second guard, but that would be taking care of yourself, not hitting at him. How can you say that? he cried, the beams upon his face turning to a lurid cloud in a moment. How can you understand military terms who have never had a sword in your life? I shouldn't take him with the sword at all he went on with eager sulkiness. I should take him with my pistol. I should pull off my right glove and throw back my goatskin. Then I should open my priming pan, prime, and cast about. No, I shouldn't, that's wrong. I should draw my right pistol, and, as soon as loaded, seize the weapon by the butt. Then, at the word, cock your pistol, I should... Then there is plenty of time to give words of command in the heat of battle, said Anne innocently. No, said the yeoman, his face again in flames. Why, of course, I'm only telling you what would be the word of command if— There now! You la— I didn't. Upon my word, I didn't. No, I don't think you did. It was my mistake. Well, then, I come smartly to present, looking well along the barrel, and fire. Of course, I know well enough how to engage the enemy. But I expect my old uncle has been setting you against me. He has not said a word, replied Anne, though I have heard of you, of course. What have you heard? Nothing good, I dare say, makes my blood boil within me. Oh, nothing bad, she said assuringly. Just a word now and then. Come now, tell me. There's a dear. I don't like to be crossed. It shall be a sacred secret between us. Come now. 
Anne was embarrassed, and her smile was uncomfortable. "'I shall not tell you,' she said at last. "'There it is again,' said the yeoman, throwing himself into a despair. "'I shall soon begin to believe that my name is not worth sixpence about here.' "'I tell you, t'was nothing against you,' repeated Anne. "'That means it might have been for me,' said Festus, in a mollified tone. "'Well, though, to speak the truth, I have a good many faults. Some people will praise me, I suppose. "'Twas praise? It was. "'Well, I am not much at farming, and I am not much in company, and I am not much at figures, but perhaps I must own, since it is forced upon me, that I can show as fine a soldier's figure on the esplanade as any man of the cavalry. "'You can,' said Anne, for, though her flesh crept in mortal terror of his irascibility, she could not resist the fearful pleasure of leading him on. "'You look very well, and some say you are—what? Well, they say I'm good-looking. I don't make myself, so tis no praise. Hello, what are you looking across there for?' "'Only at a bird I saw fly out of that tree,' said Anne. "'What, only at a bird, do you say?' He heaved out a voice of thunder. "'I see your shoulders a shaken, young madame. Now don't you provoke me with that laughing. By God, it won't do.' "'Then go away,' said Anne, changing from mirthfulness to irritation by his rough manner. "'I don't want your company, you great bragging thing. You are so touchy there's no bearing with you. Go away.' "'No, no, Anne, I am wrong to speak to you so.' I give you free liberty to say what you will to me. Say I am not a bit of a soldier or anything. Abuse me. Do now. There's a dear. I'm scum. I'm froth. I'm dirt before the besom. Yes. I have nothing to say, sir. Stay where you are till I am out of this field. Well, there's such command in your looks that I hadn't heart to go against you. You will come this way tomorrow at the same time? Now, don't be uncivil. She was too generous not to forgive him, but the short little lip murmured that she did not think it at all likely she should come that way tomorrow. "'Then Sunday,' he said. "'Not Sunday,' said she. "'Then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, surely,' he went on experimentally. She answered that she should probably not see him on either day, and, cutting short the argument, went through the wicket into the other field. Festus paused, looking after her and when he could no longer see her slight figure he swept away his deliberations, began singing, and turned off in the other direction. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy, Chapter 8 Anne Makes a Circuit of the Camp When Anne was crossing the last field, she saw approaching her an old woman with wrinkled cheeks, who surveyed the earth and its inhabitants through the medium of brass-rimmed spectacles. Shaking her head at Anne till the glasses shone like two moons, she said, "'Ah, ah, I zeed ye. If I had only kept on my short ones that I use for reading the collect and gospel, I shouldn't have zeed ye. But, thinks I, I be going out of doors, and I'll put on my long ones, little thinking would they show me. Ay, I can tell folk at any distance with these. Tis a beautiful pair for out of doors, though my short ones be best for close work, such as darning and catching fleas. That's true.' "'What have you seen, Granny Seymour?' said Anne. "'Fie, fie, Miss Nancy, you know,' said Granny Seymour, shaking her head still. "'But he's a fine young feller, and will have all his uncle's money when he's a-gone.' Anne said nothing to this, and, looking ahead with a smile, passed Granny Seymour by. Festus, the subject of the remark, was, at this time, about three-and-twenty, a fine fellow as to feet and inches, and of a remarkably warm tone in skin and hair, Symptoms of beard and whiskers had appeared upon him at a very early age, owing to his persistent use of the razor before there was any necessity for its operation. The brave boy had scraped unseen in the outhouse, in the cellar, in the woodshed, in the stable, in the unused parlor, in the cow stalls, in the barn, and wherever he could set up his triangular bit of looking glass without observation, or extemporize a mirror by sticking up his hat on the outside of window pane. 
The result now was that, did he neglect to use the instrument he had once trifled with, a fine rust broke out upon his countenance on the first day, a golden lichen on the second, and a fiery stubble on the third to a degree which admitted of no further postponement. His disposition divided naturally into two, the boastful and the cantankerous. When Festus put on the big pot, as it is classically called, he was quite blinded ipso facto to the diverting effect of that mood and manner upon others. But when he disposed to be envious or quarrelsome, he was rather shrewd than otherwise, and could do some pretty strokes of satire. He was both liked and abused by the girls who knew him, and, though they were pleased by his attentions, they never failed to ridicule him behind his back. In his cups, he knew those vessels, though only twenty-three, he first became noisy, then excessively friendly, and then invariably nagging. During childhood he had made himself renowned for his pleasant habit of pouncing down upon boys smaller or poorer than himself, and knocking their birds' nests out of their hands, or overturning their little carts of apples, or pouring water down their backs. But his conduct became singularly the reverse of aggression the moment the little boys' mothers ran out to him, brandishing brooms, frying pans, skimmers, or whatever else they could lay hands on by way of weapons. He then fled and hid behind bushes, under faggots, or in pits, till they had gone away, and on one such occasion was known to creep into a badger's hole quite out of sight, maintaining that post with great firmness and resolution for two or three hours. He had brought more vulgar exclamations upon the tongues of respectable parents in his native parish than any other boy of his time. When other youngsters snowballed him, he ran into a place of shelter where he needed snowballs of his own with a stone inside and used these formidable missiles in returning their pleasantry. Sometimes he got fearfully beaten by boys of his own age when he would roar lustily but fight on in the midst of his tears, blood, and cries. He was early in love and had at the time of the story suffered from the ravages of that passion thirteen distinct times. He could not love lightly and gaily. His love was earnest, cross-tempered, and even savage. It was a positive agony to him to be ridiculed by the object of his affections, and such conduct drove him into a frenzy of persisted in. He was a torment to those who behave humbly towards him, cynical with those who denied his superiority, and a very nice fellow to those who had the courage to ill-use him. This stalwart gentleman and Anne Garland did not cross each other's paths again for a week. Then her mother began as before about the newspaper, and though Anne did not much like the errand, she agreed to go for it on Mrs. Garland pressing her with unusual anxiety. Why her mother was so persistent on so small a matter quite puzzled the girl, but she put on her hat and started. As she expected, Festus appeared at a stile over which she sometimes went for shortness's sake, and showed by his manner that he awaited her. When she saw this she kept straight on, as if she would not enter the park at all. "'Surely this is your way,' said Festus. "'I was thinking of going round by the road,' she said. "'Why is that?' She paused, as if she were not inclined to say. "'I go that way when the grass is wet,' she returned at last. "'It is not wet now,' he persisted. "'The sun has been shining on it these nine hours.' The fact was that the way by the park was less open than by the road, and Festus wished to walk with her uninterrupted. "'But, of course, it is nothing to me what you do.' He flung himself from the stile and walked away towards the house. Anne, supposing him really indifferent, took the same way, upon which he turned his head and waited for her with a proud smile. "'I cannot go with you,' she declared decisively. "'Nonsense, you foolish girl. I must walk along with you down to the corner.' "'No, please, Mr. Derriman, we might be seen. Now, now, that shyness,' he said jocosely. "'No, you know I cannot let you. But I must.' but I do not allow it. Allow it or not, I will. Then you are unkind, and I must submit, she said, her eyes brimming with tears. Ho, ho, what a shame of me, my wig, I won't do any such thing for the world, said the repentant yeoman. Ha, ha, why, I thought your go-away meant come on, as it does with so many of these women I meet, especially in these clothes. Who was to know you were so confoundedly serious? As he did not go, Anne stood still and said nothing. I see you have a deal more caution and a deal less good nature than I ever thought you had, he continued emphatically. No, sir, it is not any planned manner of mine at all, she said earnestly. 
But you will see, I am sure, that I could not go down to the hall with you without putting myself in a wrong light. Yes, that's it, that's it. I am only a fellow in the yeomanry cavalry, a plain soldier, I may say, and we know what women think of such, that they are a bad lot, men you mustn't speak to for fear of losing your character, chaps you avoid in the roads, chaps that come into a house like oxen, daub the stairs with their boots, stain the furniture with their drink, talk rubbish to the servants, abuse all that's holy and righteous, and are only saved from being carried off by old Nick because they are wanted for bony. Indeed, I didn't know you were thought of so bad as that, said she simply. What? Don't my uncle complain to you of me? You are a favorite of that handsome old gaffer's, I know. Never. Well, what do we think of our nice trumpet, Major, hey? And closed her mouth up tight, built it up, in fact, to show that no answer was coming to that question. Oh, now come, seriously. Loveday is a good fellow, and so is his father. I don't know. What a close little rogue you are. There's no getting anything out of you. I believe you would say I don't know to every mortal question, so very discreet as you are. Upon my heart, there are some women who would say, I don't know to will ye marry me. The brightness upon Anne's cheek and in her eye during this remark showed that there was a fair quantity of life and warmth beneath the discretion he complained of. Having spoken thus, he drew a side that she might pass and bowed very low. Anne formally inclined herself and went on. She had been at vexation point all the time that he was present, from a haunting sense that he would not have spoken to her so freely had she been a young woman with thriving male relations to keep forward admirers in check. But she had been struck, now as at their previous meeting, with the power she possessed of working him up either to irritation or to complacency at will and this consciousness of being able to play upon him as upon an instrument disposed her to a humorous considerousness, and made her tolerate even while she rebuffed him. When Anne got to the hall, the farmer, as usual, insisted upon her reading what he had been able to get through, and held the paper tightly in a skinny hand till she had agreed. He sent her to a hard chair that she could not possibly injure to the extent of a pennyworth by sitting in it a twelve-month, and watched her from the outer angle of his near eye while she bent over the paper. His look might have been suggested by the sight that he had witnessed from his window on the last occasion of her visit, for it partook of the nature of concern. The old man was afraid of his nephew, physically and morally, and he began to regard Anne as a fellow sufferer under the same despot. After this sly and curious gaze at her, he withdrew his eyes again, so that when she casually lifted her own there was nothing visible but his keen, bluish profile as before. When the reading was about halfway through, the door behind them opened and footsteps crossed the threshold. The farmer diminished perceptibly in his chair and looked fearful, but pretended to be absorbed in the reading and quite unconscious of an intruder. Anne felt the presence of the swashing Festus and stopped her reading. "'Please, go on, Miss Anne,' he said. "'I am not going to speak a word.' He withdrew to the mantelpiece and leaned against it at his ease. "'Go on, do ye, Mady Anne,' said Uncle Benji, keeping down his tremblings by a great effort to half their natural extent. Anne's voice became much lower now that there were two listeners, and her modesty shrank somewhat from exposing to Festus the appreciative modulations which an intelligent interest in the subject drew from her when unembarrassed. But she still went on that he might not suppose her to be disconcerted though the ensuing ten minutes was one of disquietude. She knew that the bothering yeoman's eyes were traveling over her from his position behind, creeping over her shoulders, up to her head, and across her arms and hands. Old Benji, on his part, knew the same thing, and after sundry endeavors to peep at his nephew from the corner of his eye, he could bear the situation no longer. "'Do you want to say anything to me, nephew?' he quaked. "'No, uncle, thank ye,' said Festus heartily. I like to stay here, thinking of you and looking at your back hair. The nervous old man writhed under this vivisection, and Anne read on, till, to the relief of both, the gallant young fellow grew tired of his amusement and went out of the room. Anne soon finished her paragraph and rose to go, determined never to come again as long as Festus haunted the precincts. Her face grew warmer as she thought that he would be sure to waylay her on her journey home today. On this account, when she left the house, Instead of going in the customary direction, she bolted round to the further side, through the bushes, along under the garden kitchen wall, 
and through a door leading into a rutted cart track which had been a pleasant gravel drive when the fine old hall was in its prosperity once out of sight of the windows she ran with all her might till she had quitted the park by a route directly opposite to that towards her home why was she so seriously bent upon doing this she could hardly tell but the instinct to run was irresistible it was necessary now to clamber over the down to the left of the camp and to make a complete circuit round the ladder infantry cavalry sutlers and all descending to her house on the other side this tremendous walk she performed at a rapid rate never once turning her head and avoiding every beaten track to keep clear of the knots of soldiers taking a walk when she at last got down to the levels again she paused to fetch breath and murmured why did i take so much trouble he would not after all have hurt me as she neared the mill an erect figure with a blue body and white thighs descended before her from the down towards the village and went past the mill to a stile beyond over which she usually returned to her house here he lingered on coming nearer and discovered this person to be trumpet major loveday and not wishing to meet anybody just now anne passed quickly on and entered the house by the garden gate my dear anne what a time you have been gone said her mother yes i have been round by another road why did you do that anne looked thoughtful and reticent for her reason was almost too silly a one to confess well i wanted to avoid a person who is very busy trying to meet me that's all she said her mother glanced out of the window and there he is i suppose she said as john loveday tired of looking for anne at the stile passed the house on his way to his father's door he could not help casting his eyes towards their window, and, seeing them, he smiled. Anne's reluctance to mention Festus was such that she did not correct her mother's error. And the dam went on, "'Well, you're quite right, my dear. Be friendly with him, but no more at present. I have heard of your other affair, and think it is a very wise choice. I am sure you have my best wishes in it, and I only hope it will come to a point.' "'What's that?' said the astonished Anne you and mr festus dairyman dear you need not mind me i have known it for several days old granny seymour called here saturday and told me she saw him coming home with you across park close last week when you went for the newspaper so i thought i'd send you again to-day and give you another chance then you didn't want the paper and it was only for that he's a fine young fellow and he looks a thorough women's protector he may look it said anne he has given up the freehold farm his father held at pitscock and lives in independence on what the land brings him and when farmer derriman dies he'll have all the old man's for certain he'll be worth ten thousand pounds if a penny in money besides sixteen horses cart and hack a fifty cow dairy and at least five hundred sheep anne turned away and instead of informing her mother that she had been running like a doe to escape the interesting air presumptive alluded to merely said mother i don't like this at all End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of the Trumpet Major – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jack Farrell. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 9. After this, Anne would on no account walk in the direction of the hall for fear of another encounter with young Derriman. In the course of a few days, it was told in the village that the old farmer had actually gone for a week's holiday and change of air to the royal watering place near at hand at the instance of his nephew festus this was a wonderful thing to hear of uncle benjy who had not slept outside the walls of oxwell hall for many a long year before and anne well imagined what extraordinary pressure must have been put upon him to induce him to take such a step she pictured his unhappiness at the bustling watering place and hoped no harm would come to him she spent much of her time indoors or in the gardens, hearing little of the camp movements beyond the periodical ta-ta-ta-ta of the trumpeters, sounding their various ingenious calls for watch-setting, stables, feed, boot and saddle, parade, and so on, which made her think how clever her friend the trumpet-major must be to teach his pupils to play those pretty little tunes so well. 
On the third morning after Uncle Benji's departure she was disturbed as usual while dressing by the tramp of the troops down the slope to the mill-pond, and during the now familiar stamping and splashing which followed there sounded upon the glass of the window a slight smack, which might have been caused by a whip or switch. She listened more particularly, and it was repeated. As John Loveday was the only dragoon likely to be aware that she slept in that particular apartment, she imagined the signal to come from him, though wondering that he should venture upon such a freak of familiarity. Wrapping herself up in a red cloak, she went to the window, gently drew up the corner of the curtain, and peeped out, as she had done many times before. Nobody who was not quite close beneath her window could see her face, but as it happened, somebody was close. The soldiers whose floundering Anne had heard were not Loveday's dragoons, but a troop of the York Hussars, quite oblivious of her existence. They had passed on out of the water, and instead of them there sat Festus Derriman alone on his horse and in plain clothes, the water reaching up to the animal's belly, and Festus's heels elevated over the saddle to keep them out of the stream which threatened to wash rider and horse into the deep mill-head just below. It was plainly he who had struck her lattice, for in a moment he looked up and their eyes met. Festus laughed loudly and slapped her window again, and just at that moment the dragoons began prancing down the slope in review order. She could not but wait a minute or two to see them pass. While doing so, she was suddenly led to draw back, drop the corner of the curtain, and blush privately in her room. She had not only been seen by Festus Derriman, but by John Loveday, who, riding along with his trumpet slung up behind him, had looked over his shoulder at the phenomenon of Derriman beneath Anne's bedroom window, and seemed quite astounded at the sight. She was quite vexed at the conjunction of incidents, and went no more to the window till the dragoons had ridden far away, and she had heard Festus's horse laboriously wade on to dry land. When she looked out there was nobody left but Miller Loveday, who usually stood in the garden at this time of the morning to say a word or two to the soldiers, of whom he already knew so many, and was in a fair way of knowing many more, from the liberality with which he handed round mugs of cheering liquor whenever parties of them walked that way. In the afternoon of this day Anne walked to a christening party and a neighbor's in the adjoining parish of Springham, intending to walk home again before it got dark. But there was a slight fall of rain towards evening, and she was pressed by the people of the house to stay over the night. With some hesitation she accepted their hospitality, but at ten o'clock, when they were thinking of going to bed, they were startled by a smart rap at the door and on it being unbolted a man's form was seen in the shadows outside. "'Is Miss Garland here?' the visitor inquired, at which Anne suspended her breath. "'Yes,' said Anne's entertainer, warily. "'Her mother is very anxious to know what's become of her. She promised to come home.' To her great relief Anne recognized the voice as John Loveday's, and not in Festus Derriman's. "'Yes, I did, Mr. Loveday,' said she, coming forward. "'But it rained, and I thought my mother would guess where I was.' Loveday said, with diffidence, that it had not rained anything to speak of at the camp or at the mill, so that her mother was rather alarmed. "'And she asked you to come for me?' Anne inquired. This was a question which the trumpet-major had been dreading during the whole of his walk thither. "'Well, she didn't exactly ask me,' he said rather lamely, but still in a manner to show that Mrs. Garland had indirectly signified such to be her wish. In reality Mrs. Garland had not addressed him at all on the subject. She had merely spoken to his father on finding that her daughter did not return, and received an assurance from the miller that the precious girl was doubtless quite safe. John heard of this inquiry and having a pass that evening, resolved to relieve Mrs. Garland's mind on his own responsibility. Ever since his morning view of Festus under her window, he had been on thorns of anxiety, and his thrilling hope now was that she would walk back with him. He shifted his foot nervously as he made the bold request. Anne felt at once that she would go, 
there was nobody in the world whose care she would more readily be under than the trumpet majors in a case like the present he was their nearest neighbor's son and she had liked his single-minded ingenuousness from the first moment of his return home when they had started on their walk anne said in a practical way to show that there was no sentiment whatever in her acceptance of his company mother was much alarmed about me perhaps yes she was uneasy he said and then was compelled by conscience to make a clean breast of it i know she was uneasy because my father said so but i did not see her myself the truth is she doesn't know i am come anne now saw how the matter stood but she was not offended with him what woman could have been they walked on in silence the respectful trumpet major keeping a yard off on her right as precisely as if that measure had been fixed between them she had a great feeling of civility towards him this evening and spoke again i often hear your trumpeters blowing the calls they do it beautifully i think pretty fair they might do better said he as one too well mannered to make much of an accomplishment in which he had a hand and you taught them how to do it yes i taught them it must require wonderful practice to get them into the way of beginning and finishing so exactly at one time it is like one throat doing it all how came you to be a trumpeter mr loveday well i took to it naturally when i was a little boy said he betrayed into quite a gushing state by her delightful interest i used to make trumpets of papers elder sticks eltrot roots and even stinging nettle stalks you know then father set me to keep the birds off that little barley ground of his and gave me an old horn to frighten em with i learned to blow that horn so that you could hear me for miles and miles then he bought me a clarionet and when i could play that i borrowed a serpent and i learned to play a tolerable bass so when i listed i was picked out for training as trumpeter at once of course you were sometimes however i wish i had never joined the army my father gave me a very fair education and your father showed me how to draw horses or on a slate i mean yes i ought to have done more than i have what did you know my father she asked with new interest oh yes for years you were a little mite of a thing then and you used to cry when we big boys looked at you and made pig's eyes at you which we did sometimes many and many a time have i stood by your poor father while he worked ah you don't remember much about him but i do anne remained thoughtful and the moon broke from behind the clouds lighting up the wet foliage with a twinkling brightness and lending to each of the trumpet major's buttons and spurs a little ray of its own they had come to Oxwell village, and he said, Do you like going across or round by the lane? We may as well go by the nearest road, said Anne. They entered a gate, following a half-obliterated drive till they came almost opposite the rear of the hall, when they entered a footpath leading towards the downs. While hereabout they heard a shout or chorus of exclamation, apparently from within the walls of the dark buildings near them what was that said anne i don't know said her companion i'll go and see he went round some intervening buildings into a wilderness which had once been a flower garden crossed an orchard of aged trees and advanced to the wall of the house boisterous noises were resounding from within and he was tempted to go round the corner where the low windows were and look through a chink into the room whence the sounds proceeded it was the room in which the owner dined, traditionally called the Great Parlour, and within it sat about a dozen young men of the yeomanry cavalry, one of them being Festus. They were drinking, laughing, singing, thumping their fists on the tables, and enjoying themselves in the very perfection of confusion. The candles blown by the breeze from the partly opened window had guttered into coffin handles and shrouds and choked by their long black wicks for want of snuffing gave out a smoky yellow light one of the young men might possibly have been in a maudlin state for he had his arm round the neck of his next neighbour 
Another was making an incoherent speech to which nobody was listening. Some of their faces were red, some were sallow, some were sleepy, some wide awake. The only one among them who appeared in his usual frame of mind was Festus, whose huge burly form rose at the head of the table, enjoying with a serene and triumphant aspect the difference between his own condition and that of his neighbors. While the trumpet major looked, a young woman, niece of Anthony Cripplestraw, and one of Uncle Benji's servants, was called in by one of the crew, and much against her will a fiddle was placed in her hands, from which they made her produce discordant screeches. The absence of Uncle Benji had in fact been contrived by young Derriman, that he might make use of the hall on his own account. Crippled straw had been left in charge, and Festus had found no difficulty in forcing from that dependent the keys of whatever he required. John Loveday turned his eyes from the scene to the neighboring moonlit path where Anne still stood waiting. Then he looked into the room, then at Anne again. It was an opportunity of advancing his own cause with her by exposing Festus, for whom he began to entertain hostile feelings of no mean force. "'No, I can't do it,' he said. "'Tis underhand. Let things take their chance.' He moved away, and then perceived that Anne, tired of waiting, had crossed the orchard and almost came up with him. "'What is the noise about?' she said. "'There's company in the house,' said Loveday. "'Company? Farmer Derriman is not at home,' said Anne, and went on to the window whence the rays of light leaked out, the trumpet major standing where he was. He saw her face enter the beam of candlelight stay there for a moment, and quickly withdraw. She came back to him at once. "'Let us go on,' she said. Loveday imagined from her tone that she must have an interest in Derriman, and said sadly, "'You blame me for going across to the window and leading you to follow me.' "'Not a bit,' said Anne, seeing his mistake as to the state of her heart, and being rather angry with him for it. I think it was most natural, considering the noise." Silence again. "'Derriman is sober as a judge,' said Loveday, as they turned to go. It was only the others who were noisy. "'Whether he is sober or not is nothing whatever to me,' said Anne. "'Of course not. I know it,' said the trumpet major, in accents expressing unhappiness at her somewhat curt tone, and some doubt of her assurance. Before they had emerged from the shadow of the hall, some persons were seen moving along the road to the gate. Loveday was for going on just the same, but Anne, from a shy feeling that it was as well not to be seen walking alone with a man who was not her lover, said, "'Mr. Loveday, let us wait here a minute till they have gone in.' On nearer view the group was seen to comprise a man on a piebald horse, and another man walking beside him. When they were opposite the house they halted, and the rider dismounted, whereupon a dispute between him and the other man ensued, apparently on a question of money. "'Tis old Mr. Derriman come home,' said Anne. "'He has hired that horse from a bathing-machine to bring him. Only fancy!' Before they had gone many steps further the farmer and his companion had ended their dispute, and the latter mounted the horse and cantered away, Uncle Benji coming on to the house at a nimble pace. As soon as he observed Loveday and Anne, he fell into a feebler gait. When they came up, he recognized Anne. "'And you have torn yourself away from King George's Esplanade so soon, Farmer Derriman?' said she. "'Yes, faith, I couldn't bide at such a ruination place,' said the farmer. "'Your hand in your pocket every minute of the day. There's a shilling for this, half a crown for that.' If you only et one egg, or even a poor windfall of an apple, you've got to pay. And a bunch of radishes is a halfpenny, and a quarter of cider, a good tuppence three farthings at lowest reckoning. Nothing without paying. I couldn't even get a ride homeward upon that screw, without the man wanting a shilling for it, when my weight didn't take a penny out of the beast. I've saved a penn'orth or so of shoe leather, to be sure, but the saddle was so rough with patches that it took tuppence out of the seat of my best breeches. 
King George have ruined the town for other folks. More than that, my nephew promised to come there to-morrow to see me, and if I had stayed, I must have treated him. Hey, what's that? It was a shout from within the walls of the building, and Loveday said, Your nephew is here, and has company. My nephew here? gasped the old man. Good folks, will you come up to the door with me? I mean, he, he, just for company. Dear me, I thought my house was as quiet as that church. They went back to the window when the farmer looked in, his mouth falling apart to a greater width at the corners than in the middle, and his fingers assuming a state of radiation. "'Tis my best silver tankards they've got, that I've never used. Oh, tis my strong beer! Tis eight candles guttering away, when I've used nothing but twenties myself for the last half year." "'You didn't know he was here, then?' said Loveday. "'Oh, no,' said the farmer, shaking his head halfway. "'Nothing's known to poor I. There's my best rummers jingling as careless as if twas tin cups, and my table scratched, and my chairs wrenched out of joint. See how they tilt em on the two back legs, and that's ruin to a chair. Ah, when I be gone, he won't find another old man to make such work with, and provide goods for his breaking, and house-room and drink for his tear-brass set." "'Comrades and fellow-soldiers,' said Festus, to the hot farmers and yeomen he entertained within, "'as we have bowed to brave danger and death together, so we'll share the couch of peace. You shall sleep here to-night, for it is getting late. My scram-blue-vinnied gallicro of an uncle takes care that there shan't be much comfort in the house, but you can curl up on the furniture if beds run short. As for my sleep, it won't be much. I'm melancholy. A woman has, I may say, got my heart in her pocket, and I have hers in mine. She's not much to other folk, I mean, but she is to me. The little thing came in my way and conquered me. I fancy that simple girl. I ought to have looked higher, I know it. What of that? Tis a fate that may happen to the greatest men." "'Rush her name!' said one of the warriors, whose head occasionally drooped upon his epaulets, and whose eyes fell together in the casual manner characteristic of the tired soldier. It was really Farmer Stubb of Duddle Hull. Her name? Well, tis spelt A N. Uh, but by gad, I won't give ye her name here in company. She don't live in a hundred miles off, however, and she wears the prettiest cap ribbons you ever saw. Well, well, tis weakness. She has little, and I have much but I do adore that girl in spite of myself." "'Let's go on,' said Anne. "'Prithee stand by an old man that he's got into his house,' implored Uncle Benji. "'I only ask ye to bide within call. Stand back under the trees, and I'll do my poor best to give no trouble.' "'I'll stand by you for half an hour, sir,' said Loveday. After that I must bolt to camp. "'Very well. Bide back there under the trees,' said Uncle Benji. "'I don't want to spite him.' "'You'll wait a few minutes just to see if he gets in,' said the trumpet major to Anne as they retired from the old man. "'I want to get home,' said Anne anxiously. When they had quite receded behind the tree trunks, and he stood alone, Uncle Benji, to their surprise, set up a loud shout altogether beyond the imagined power of his lungs. "'Man a lost! Man a lost!' he cried, repeating the exclamation several times, and then ran and hid himself behind a corner of the building. Soon the door opened, and Festus and his guest came tumbling out upon the green. "'Tis our duty to help folks in distress,' said Festus. "'Man a lost!' "'Where are you?' "'Twas across there,' said one of the friends. 
"'Ah, twas here!' said another. Meanwhile Uncle Benji, coming from his hiding-place, had scampered with the quickness of a boy up to the door they had quitted and slipped in. In a moment the door flew together, and Anne heard him bolting and barring it inside. The revellers, however, did not notice this, and came on towards the spot where the trumpet-major and Anne were standing. "'Here's succour at hands, friends,' said Festus. "'We are all king's men. Do not fear us.' "'Thank you,' said Loveday. "'So are we.' He explained in two words that they were not the distressed traveller who had cried out, and turned to go. "'Tis she, my life, tis she,' said Festus, now first recognising Anne. "'Fair Anne, I will not part from you till I see you safe at your own dear door.' "'She's in my hand,' said Loveday civilly, though not without firmness. "'So it is not required. Thank you.' "'Man, had I but my sword!' "'Come,' said Loveday, "'I don't want to quarrel. Let's put it to her. Whichever of us she likes best, he shall take her home. Miss Anne, which?' Anne would much rather have gone home alone, but seeing the remainder of the yeomanry party staggering up, she thought it best to secure a protector of some kind. How to choose one without offending the other and provoking a quarrel was the difficulty. "'You must both walk home with me,' she adroitly said, "'one on one side and one on the other, "'and if you are not quite civil to one another all the time, "'I'll never speak to either of you again.' They agreed to the terms, and the other yeomen arriving at this time said they would go also as rear guard. "'Very well,' said Anne. "'Now go and get your hats, and don't be long.' "'Ah, yes, our hats,' said the yeomanry, whose heads were so hot that they had forgotten their nakedness till then. "'You'll wait till we've got em. We won't be a moment,' said Festus eagerly. Anne and Loveday said yes, and Festus ran back to the house, followed by all his band. "'Now let's run and leave em,' said Anne, when they were out of hearing. "'But we've promised to wait,' said the trumpet-major in surprise. "'Promise to wait?' said Anne indignantly. "'As if one ought to keep such a promise to drunken men as that. You can do as you like. I shall go.' "'It is hardly fair to leave the chaps,' said Loveday reluctantly, and looking back at them. But she heard no more, and flitting off under the trees was soon lost to his sight. Festus and the rest had by this time reached Uncle Benji's door, which they were discomforted and astonished to find closed. They began to knock and then to kick at the venerable timber, till the old man's head, crowned with a tasseled nightcap, appeared at an upper window followed by his shoulders, with apparently nothing on but his shirt, though it was in truth a sheet thrown over his coat. "'Fie, fie upon you for making such a hullabaloo at a weak old man's door,' he said, yawning. "'What's in ye to rouse honest folks at this time o' night?' "'Hang me! Why, it's Uncle Benji!' "'Ha, ha, ha!' said Festus. "'Nunk! Why, how's the devil this? "'Tis I, Festus, wanted to come in.' "'Oh, no, no, my clever man, whoever ye be,' said Uncle Benji, in a tone of incredulous integrity. "'My nephew, dear boy, is miles away at quarters and sound asleep by this time, as becomes a good soldier.' "'That story won't do to-night, my man, not at all.' "'Upon my soul, tis I,' said Festus. "'Not to-night, my man, not to-night. "'Anthony, bring my blunderbuss,' said the farmer, turning and addressing nobody inside the room. "'Let's break in the window-shutters,' said one of the others. "'My wig, and we will,' said Festus. "'What a trick of the old man!' "'Get some big stones,' said the yeoman, searching under the wall. "'No, forbear, forbear,' said Festus, beginning to be frightened at the spirit he had raised. "'I forget. We should drive him into fits, for he's subject to him, and then, perhaps, t'would be manslaughter. Comrades, we must march. No, we'll lie in the barn. I'll see into this. Take my word for it. Our honour is at stake.' Now let's back to see my beauty home. We can't, as we haven't got our hats, 
said one of the fellow troopers in domestic life, Jacob Noix, of Nether Moynton Farm. "'No more we can,' said Festus, in a melancholy tone. "'But I must go to her and tell her the reason. She pulls me in spite of all.' "'She's gone. I saw her flee across the nap while we were knocking at the door,' said another of the yeomanry. "'Gone?' said Festus, grinding his teeth and putting himself into a rigid shape. "'Then tis my enemy. He has tempted her away with him. But I am a rich man, and he's poor, and rides the king's horse, while I ride my own. Could I but find that fellow, that regular, that common man, I would—' "'Yes,' said the trumpet-major, coming up behind him. I, said Festus, starting round, I would seize him by the hand and say, Guard her, if you are my friend, guard her from all harm. A good speech, and I will, too, said Loveday heartily. And now for shelter, said Festus to his companions. Then they unceremoniously left Loveday without wishing him good night, and proceeded towards the barn. He crossed the field and ascended the down to the camp, grieved that he had given Anne cause of complaint, and fancying that she held him of slight account beside his wealthy arrival. End of chapter 9《Chapter 10 of the Trumpet Major》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 10 The Matchmaking Virtues of a Double Garden. Anne was so flurried by the military incidents attending her return home that she was almost afraid to venture alone outside her mother's premises. Moreover, the numerous soldiers, regular and otherwise, that haunted Overcombe and its neighborhood, were getting better acquainted with the villagers, and the result was that they were always standing at garden gates, walking in the orchards, or sitting gossiping just within cottage doors, with the bowls of their tobacco pipes thrust outside, for politeness' sake, that they might not defile the air of the household. Being gentlemen of a gallant and most affectionate nature, they naturally turned their heads and smiled if a pretty girl passed by, which was rather disconcerting to the latter, if she were unused to society. Every bell in the village had a lover, and when the bells were all allotted, those who scarcely deserved that title had their turn, many of the soldiers being not at all particular about half an inch of nose more or less, a trifling deficiency of teeth, or a larger crop of freckles than is customary in the Saxon race. Thus, with one and another, courtship began to be practiced in Overcombe, on rather a large scale, and the dispossessed young men who had been born in the place were left to take their walks alone, where, instead of studying the works of nature, they meditated gross outrages on the brave men who had been so good as to visit their village. Anne watched these romantic proceedings from her window with much interest, and when she saw how triumphantly other handsome girls of the neighborhood walked by on the gorgeous arms of Lieutenant Knockheel Man, Cornet Flitzenhart, and Captain Clasp and Kissen of the thrilling York Hussars, who swore the most picturesque foreign oaths, and had a wonderful sort of estate or property called the Fatherland in their country across the sea, she was filled with a sense of her own loneliness. It made her think of things which she tried to forget, and to look into a little drawer at something soft and brown that lay in a curl there, wrapped in paper. At last she could bear it no longer, and went downstairs. "'Where are you going?' said Mrs. Garland. "'To see the folks, because I am so gloomy.' "'Certainly not at present, Anne.' "'Why not, mother?' said Anne blushing with an indefinite sense of being very wicked. "'Because you must not. 
I have been going to tell you several times not to go into the street at this time of day. Why not walk in the morning? There's young Mr. Derriman would be glad to— Don't mention him, mother, don't. Well, then, dear, walk in the garden. So poor Anne, who really had not the slightest wish to throw her heart away upon a soldier, but merely wanted to displace old thoughts by new, turned into the inner garden from day to day, and passed a good many hours there, the pleasant birds singing to her, and the delightful butterflies alighting on her hat, and the horrid ants running up her stockings. This garden was undivided from love days, the two having originally been the single garden of the whole house. It was a quaint old place, enclosed by a thorn hedge, so shapely and dense from incessant clipping, that the mill-boy could walk along the top without sinking in, a feat which he often performed as a means of filling out his day's work. The soil within was of that intense fat blackness which is only seen after a century of constant cultivation. The paths were grassed over, so that people came and went upon them without being heard. The grass harbored slugs, and on this account the miller was going to replace it by gravel as soon as he had time. But as he had said this for thirty years without doing it, the grass and the slugs seemed likely to remain. The miller's man attended to Mrs. Garland's piece of the garden as well as to the larger portion, digging, planting, and weeding indifferently in both, the miller observing with reason that it was not worth while for a helpless widow lady to hire a man for her own little plot when his man, working alongside, could tend it without much addition to his labor. The two households were on this account even more closely united in the garden than within the mill. Out there they were almost one family, and they talked from plot to plot with a zest and animation which Mrs. Garland could never have anticipated when she first removed thither after her husband's death. The lower half of the garden, farthest from the road, was the most snug and sheltered part of this snug and sheltered enclosure, and it was well watered as the land of Lot. Three small brooks, about a yard wide, ran with a tinkling sound from side to side between the plots, crossing the path under wood slabs laid as bridges, and passing out of the garden through little tunnels in the hedge. The brooks were so far overhung at their brinks by grass and garden produce that, had it not been for their perpetual babbling, few would have noticed that they were there. This was where Anne liked best to linger when her excursions became restricted to her own premises, and in a spot of the garden not far removed the trumpet major loved to linger also. Having by virtue of his office no stable duty to perform, he came down from the camp to the mill almost every day, and Anne, finding that he adroitly walked and sat in his father's portion of the garden, whenever she did so in the other half, could not help smiling and speaking to him. So his epaulettes and blue jacket and Anne's yellow gypsy hat were often seen in different parts of the garden at the same time, but he never intruded into her part of the enclosure, nor did she into Loveday's. She always spoke to him when she saw him there, and he replied in deep, firm accents across the gooseberry bushes, or through the tall rows of flowering peas, as the case might be. He thus gave her accounts at fifteen paces of his experiences in camp, in quarters, in Flanders, and elsewhere, of the difference between line and column, of forced marches, billeting, and such like, together with his hopes of promotion. Anne listened at first indifferently, but knowing no one else so good-natured and experienced, she grew interested in him as in a brother. By degrees his gold lace, buckles, and spurs lost all their strangeness, and were as familiar to her as her own clothes. At last Mrs. Garland noticed this growing friendship, and began to despair of her motherly scheme of uniting Anne to the moneyed Festus, why she could not take prompt steps to check interference with her plans, arose partly from her nature, which was the reverse of managing, and partly from a new emotional circumstance with which she found it difficult to reckon, the near neighborhood that had produced the friendship of Anne for John Loveday, 
was slowly affecting a warmer liking between her mother and his father. Thus the month of July passed. The troop horses came with the regularity of clockwork twice a day down to drink under her window, and as the weather grew hotter kicked up their heels and shook their heads furiously under the maddening sting of the dunfly. The green leaves in the garden became of a darker dye, the gooseberries ripened, and the three brooks were reduced to half their winter volume. At length the earnest trumpet-major obtained Mrs. Garland's consent to take her and her daughter to the camp, which they had not yet viewed from any closer point than their own windows. So one afternoon they went, the miller being one of the party. The villagers were by this time driving a roaring trade with the soldiers, who purchased of them every description of garden produce, milk, butter, and eggs at liberal prices. The figures of these rural sutlers could be seen creeping up the slopes, laden like bees, to a spot in the rear of the camp where there was a kind of market-place on the greensward. Mrs. Garland, Anne, and the miller were conducted from one place to another, and on to the quarter where the soldiers' wives lived, who had not been able to get lodgings in the cottages near. The most sheltered place had been chosen for them, and snug huts had been built for their use by their husbands, of clods, hurdles, a little thatch, or whatever they could lay hands on. The trumpet-major conducted his friends thence to the large barn which had been appropriated as a hospital, and to the cottage with its windows bricked up, that was used as the magazine. Then they inspected the lines of shining dark horses, each representing the then high figure of two-and-twenty guineas purchase money. Standing patiently at the ropes, which stretched from one picket-post to another, a bank being thrown up in front of them as a protection at night. They passed on to the tents of the German Legion, a well-grown and rather dandy set of men, with a poetical look about their faces, which rendered them interesting to feminine eyes. Hanoverians, Saxons, Prussians, Swedes, Hungarians, and other foreigners were numbered in their ranks. They were cleaning arms, which they lent carefully against the rail when the work was complete. On their return they passed the mess-house, a temporary wooden building with a brick chimney. As Anne and her companions went by, a group of three or four of the hussars were standing at the door, talking to a dashing young man, who was expatiating on the qualities of a horse that one was inclined to buy. Anne recognized Festus Derriman in the cellar, and Cripplestraw, who was trotting the animal up and down. As soon as she caught the yeoman's eye, he came forward, making some friendly remark to the miller, and then turning to Miss Garland, who kept her eyes steadily fixed on the distant landscape till he got so near that it was impossible to do so longer. Festus looked from Anne to the trumpet-major, and from the trumpet-major back to Anne, with a dark expression of face, as if he suspected that there might be a tender understanding between them. "'Are you offended with me?' he said to her in a low voice of repressed resentment. "'No,' said Anne. "'When are you coming to the hall again?' "'Never, perhaps.' "'Nonsense, Anne,' said Mrs. Garland, who had come near and smiled pleasantly on Festus. "'You can go at any time, as usual.' "'Let her come with me now, Mrs. Garland. I should be pleased to walk along with her. My man can lead home the horse.' "'Thank you, but I shall not come,' said Anne coldly. The widow looked unhappily in her daughter's face, distressed between her desire that Anne should encourage Festus, and her wish to consult Anne's own feelings. "'Leave her alone, leave her alone,' said Festus, his gaze blackening. "'Now I think of it, I am glad she can't come with me, for I am engaged.' And he stalked away. Anne moved on with her mother young Loveday silently following, and they began to descend the hill. "'Well, where's Mr. Loveday?' asked Mrs. Garland. "'Father's behind,' said John. Mrs. Garland looked behind her solicitously, and the miller, who had been waiting for the event, beckoned to her. "'I'll overtake you in a minute,' she said to the younger pair, and went back, her color, for some unaccountable reason, rising as she did so. 
The miller and she then came on slowly together, conversing in very low tones, and when they got to the bottom they stood still. Loveday and Anne waited for them, saying but little to each other, for the rencounter with Festus had dampened the spirits of both. At last the widow's private talk with Miller Loveday came to an end, and she hastened onward, the miller going in another direction to meet a man on business. When she reached the trumpet major and Anne, she was looking very bright and rather flurried, and seemed sorry when Loveday said that he must leave them and return to the camp. They parted in their usual friendly manner, and Anne and her mother were left to walk the few remaining yards alone. "'There I've settled it,' said Mrs. Garland. "'Anne, what are you thinking about? I have settled in my mind that it is all right.' "'What's all right?' said Anne that you do not care for Derriman, and mean to encourage John Loveday. What's all the world so long as folks are happy? Child, don't take any notice of what I have said about Festus, and don't meet him any more. What a weathercock you are, mother! Why should you say that just now? It's easy to call me a weathercock, said the matron, putting on the look of a good woman, but I have reasoned it out, and at last, thank God, I have got over my ambition. The love days are our true and only friends, and Mr. Festus Derriman, with all his money, is nothing to us at all. But, said Anne, what has made you change all of a sudden from what you have said before? My feelings and my reason, which I am thankful for. Anne knew that her mother's sentiments were naturally so versatile that they could not be depended on for two days together, but it did not occur to her for the moment that a change had been helped on in the present case by a romantic talk between Mrs. Garland and the miller. But Mrs. Garland could not keep the secret long. She chatted gaily as she walked, and before they had entered the house she said, "'What do you think Mr. Loveday has been saying to me, dear Anne?' Anne did not know at all. "'Why, he has asked me to marry him.'" End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Trumpet Major》by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers.《The Trumpet Major》by Thomas Hardy.《Chapter Eleven: Our People Are Affected by the Presence of Royalty*. To explain the miller's sudden proposal, it is only necessary to go back to that moment when Anne, Festus, and Mrs. Garland were talking together on the down. John Loveday had fallen behind so as not to interfere with a meeting in which he was decidedly superfluous, and his father, who guessed the trumpet major's secret, watched his face as he stood. John's face was sad, and his eyes followed Mrs. Garland's encouraging manner to Festus, in a way which plainly said that every parting of her lips was tribulation to him. The miller loved his son as much as any miller or private gentleman could do, and he was pained to see John's gloom at such a trivial circumstance. So what did he resolve but to help John there and then by precipitating a matter which, had he himself been the only person concerned, he would have delayed for another six months? He had long liked the society of his impulsive, tractable neighbour, Mrs. Garland, had mentally taken her up and pondered her in connection with the question whether it would not be for the happiness of both if she were to share his home, even though she was a little his superior in antecedents and knowledge. In fact, he loved her, not tragically, but to a very creditable extent for his years, that is, next to his sons, Bob and John, though he knew very well of that ploughed ground appearance near the corners of her once handsome eyes, and that the little depression in her right cheek was not the lingering dimple it was poetically assumed to be, but a result of the abstraction of some worn-out nether millstones within the cheek by Rootle, the Budmouth man, who lived by such practices on the heads of the elderly. But what of that? When he had lost two to each one of hers, and exceeded her in age by some eight years? To do John a service, then, he quickened his designs, and put the question to her while they were standing under the eyes of the younger pair. 
Mrs. Garland, though she had been interested in the miller for a long time, and had for a moment now and then thought on this question as far as, suppose he should, if he were to, and so on, had never thought much further, and she was really taken by surprise when the question came. She answers without affectation that she would think over the proposal, and thus they parted. Her mother's infirmity of purpose set Anne thinking, and she was suddenly filled with a conviction that in such a case she ought to have some purpose herself. Mrs. Garland's complacency at the miller's offer had, in truth, amazed her. While her mother had held up her head and recommended Festus, it had seemed a very pretty thing to rebel. But the pressure being removed, an awful sense of her own responsibility took possession of her mind. As there was no longer anybody to be wise or ambitious for her, Surely she should be wise and ambitious for herself, discountenance her mother's attachment, and encourage Festus in his addresses, for her own and her mother's good. There had been a time when a love day thrilled her own heart, but that was long ago, before she had thought of position or differences. To wake into cold daylight like this, when and because her mother had gone into the land of romance, was dreadful and new to her and like an increase of years without living them. But it was easier to think that she ought to marry the yeoman than to take steps for doing it, and she went on living just as before, only with a little more thoughtfulness in her eyes. Two days after the visit to the camp, when she was again in the garden, Soldier Loveday said to her, at a distance of five rows of beans and a parsley bed, uh, "'You've heard the news, Miss Garland?' "'No.' said Anne, without looking up from a book she was reading. "'The King is coming to-morrow.' "'The King?' she looked up then. "'Yes, to Gloucester Lodge, and he will pass this way. He can't arrive till long past the middle of the night, if what they say is true, that he is timed to change horses at Woodyates Inn between Mid and South Wessex at twelve o'clock,' continued Loveday, encouraged by her interest to cut off the parsley bed from the distance between them. Miller Loveday came round the corner of the house. "'Have you heard about the king coming, Miss Mady Anne?' he said. Anne said that she had just heard of it, and the trumpet major, who hardly welcomed his father at such a moment, explained what he knew of the matter. "'And you will go with your regiment to Meaton, I suppose?' said old Loveday. Young Loveday said that the men of the German legion were to perform that duty, and, turning half from his father and half towards Anne, he added, in a tentative tone, that he thought he might get leave for the night, if anybody would like to be taken up to the top of the ridgeway, over which the royal party must pass. Anne, knowing by this time of the budding hope in the gallant dragoon's mind, and not wishing to encourage it, said, I don't want to go. The miller looked disappointed as well as John. Your mother might like to. Yes, I'm going indoors, and I'll ask her if you wish me to, said she. She went indoors, and rather coldly told her mother of the proposal. Mrs. Garland, though she had determined not to answer the Millen's question on matrimony just yet, was quite ready for this jaunt, and in spite of Anne she sailed off at once to the garden to hear more about it. When she re-entered she said, "'Anne, I have not seen the King or the King's horses for these many years, and I am going.' "'Ah, it is well to be you, mother,' said Anne, in an elderly tone. "'Then you won't come with us?' said Mrs. Garland, rather rebuffed. "'I have very different things to think of,' said her daughter, with virtuous emphasis, "'than going to see sights at that time of night.' Mrs. Garland was sorry, but resolved to adhere to the arrangement. The night came on, and it had been having gone abroad that the king would pass by the road, many of the villagers went out to see the procession. When the two love-days and Mrs. Garland were gone, Anne bolted the door for security, and sat down to think again on her grave responsibilities and the choice of a husband, now that her natural guardian could no longer be trusted. A knock came to the door. Anne's instinct was at once to be silent, that the comer might think the family had retired. The knocking person, however, was not to be easily persuaded. He had, in fact, seen rays of light over the top of the shutter, and, unable to get an answer, went on to the door of the mill, which was still going, the miller sometimes grinding all night when busy. The grinder accompanied the stranger to Mrs. Garland's door. "'The door is certainly at home, sir,' said the grinder. "'I'll go round to other side and see if she's there, Master Derriman.' 
I want to take her out to see the king, said Festus. Anne had started at the sound of the voice. No opportunity could have been better for carrying out her new convictions on the disposal of her hand. But, in her mortal dislike of Festus, Anne forgot her principles, and her idea of keeping herself above the love days. Tossing on her hat and blowing out the candle, she slipped out of the back door, and hastily followed in the direction that her mother and the rest had taken. She overtook them as they were beginning to climb the hill. "'What? You've altered your mind after all?' said the widow. "'How came you to do that, my dear?' "'I thought I might as well come,' said Anne. "'To be sure you did,' said the miller heartily. "'A good deal better than biding at home there.' John said nothing, that she could almost see through the gloom how glad he was that she had altered her mind. When they reached the ridge over which the highway stretched, they found many of their neighbours who had got there before them, idling on the grass border between the roadway and the hedge, enjoying a sort of midnight picnic, which it was easy to do, the air being still and dry. Some carriages were also standing near, though most people of the district who possessed four wheels, or even two, had driven into the town to await the king there. From this height could be seen in the distance the position of the watering-place, an additional number of lanterns, lamps, and candles having been lighted to-night by the loyal burghers to grace the royal entry, if it should occur before dawn. Mrs. Garland touched Anne's elbow several times as they walked, and the young woman at last understood that this was meant as a hint to her to take the trumpet-major's arm, which its owner was rather suggesting than offering to her. Anne wondered what infatuation was possessing her mother, declined to take the arm, and contrived to get in front with the miller, who mostly kept in the van to guide the other's footsteps. The trumpet-major was left with Mrs. Garland, and Anne's encouraging pursuit of them induced him to say a few words to the former. "'By your leave, ma'am, I'll, I'll speak to you on something that concerns my mind very much indeed.' "'Certainly. It is my wish to be allowed to pay my addresses to your daughter.' "'I thought you meant that,' said Mrs. Garland simply. "'And you'll not object?' "'I shall leave it to her. I don't think she will agree, even if I do.' The soldier sighed and seemed helpless. "'Well, I can but ask her,' he said. The spot on which they had finally chosen to wait for the king was by a field gate, whence the white road could be seen for a long distance northwards by day, and some little distance now. They lingered and lingered, but no king came to break the silence of that beautiful summer night. As half-hour after half-hour glided by and nobody came, Anne began to get weary. She knew why her mother did not propose to go back, and regretted the reason. She would have proposed it herself, but the mistress Garland seemed so cheerful and as wide awake as at noonday, so that it was almost a cruelty to disturb her. The trumpet-major at last made up his mind, and tried to draw Anne into a private conversation. The feeling which a week ago had been a vague and piquant aspiration was to-day altogether too lively for the reasoning of this warm-hearted soldier to regulate. So he persevered in his intention to catch her alone, and at last, in spite of her manoeuvres to the contrary, he succeeded. The miller and Mrs. Garland had walked about fifty yards further on, and Anne and himself were left standing by the gate. But the gallant musician's soul was so much disturbed by tender vibrations and by the sense of his presumption that he could not begin, and it may be questioned if he would ever have broached the subject at all, had not a distant church clock opportunely assisted him by striking the hour of three. The trumpet-major heaved a breath of relief. "'That clock strikes in G-sharp,' he said. "'Indeed, G-sharp,' said Anne civilly. "'Yes, tis a fine-toned bell. I used to notice that note when I was a boy.' "'Did you? The very same?' Yes, and since then I had a wager about that bell with the bandmaster of the North Wessex Militia. He said the note was G. I said it wasn't. When we found it G sharp, we didn't know how to settle it. It is not a deep note for a clock. Oh, no. The finest tenor bell about here is the bell of St. Peter's, Casterbridge, in E flat. Tum! That's the note. Tum! The trumpet-major sounded from far down his throat what he considered to be E-flat, 
with a parenthetic sense of luxury unquenchable even by his present distraction. Uh, "'Shall we go on to where my mother is?' said Anne, less impressed by the duty of the note that the trumpet major himself was. "'In one minute,' he said tremulously. Uh, "'Talking of music, I fear you don't think the rank of a trumpet major much to compare with your own?' "'I do. I think a trumpet major a very respectable man.' "'I am glad to hear you say that. It is given out by the King's command that trumpet majors are to be considered respectable.' "'Indeed. Then I am, by chance, more loyal than I thought for. "'I get a great deal a year extra to the trumpeters because of my position. "'That's very nice. "'And I am not supposed ever to drink with the trumpeters who serve beneath me.' "'Naturally.' "'And by the orders of the War Office I am to exert over them—' "'That's the Government's word. "'Exert over them full authority. "'And if anyone behaves towards me with the least impropriety "'or neglects my orders, he is to be confined and reported.' "'It is really a dignified post,' she said, "'with, however, a reserve of enthusiasm "'which was not altogether encouraging. "'And, of course, some day I, I, I shall—' "'stammered the Grigrub Dragoon— "'shall be in rather a better position than I am at present.' "'I am glad to hear it, Mr. Loveday.' "'And in short, Mistress Anne,' continued John Loveday, bravely and desperately, "'may I pay court to you in the hope that—no, no, no, don't go away. "'You haven't heard yet. "'That you may make me the happiest of men, not yet, "'but when peace is proclaimed and all is smooth and easy again. "'I can't put it any better, though there's more to be explained.' "'This is most awkward,' said Anne, evidently with pain. "'I, I cannot possibly agree. Believe in Mr. Loveday, I cannot. "'But there's more than this. "'You would be surprised to see what snug rooms "'the married trumpet and sergeant majors have in quarters. "'Barracks are not all. Consider camp and war. Uh, "'That brings me to my strong point,' exclaimed the soldier, hopefully. "'My father is better off than most non-commissioned officers' fathers.' "'and there's always a home for you at his house in any emergency. "'I can tell you privately that he has enough to keep us both, "'and if you wouldn't hear of barracks, well, peace once established, "'I'd live at home as a miller and farmer, next door to your own mother.' M m "'My mother would be sure to object,' expostulated Anne. "'No, she leaves it all to you.' "'What? You've asked her?' said Anne, with surprise. "'Yes, I, I thought it would not be honourable to act otherwise.' "'That's very good of you,' said Anne, her face warming with a generous sense of his straightforwardness. "'But my mother is so entirely ignorant of a soldier's life, and the life of a soldier's wife, she is so simple in all such matters, that I cannot listen to you any more readily for what she may say.' "'Then it is all over for me,' said the poor trumpet-major, wiping his face and putting away his handkerchief with an air of finality. Anne was silent. Any woman who has ever tried will know without explanation what an unpalatable task it is to dismiss, even when she does not love him, a man who has all the natural and moral qualities she would desire, and only fails in the social. Would-be lovers are not so numerous, even with the best women, that the sacrifice of one can be felt as other than a good thing wasted, in a world where there are few good things. "'You are not angry, Miss Garland,' said he, finding that she did not speak. "'Oh, no. Don't let us say anything more about this now.' And she moved on. When she drew near to the miller and her mother, she perceived that they were engaged in a conversation of that peculiar kind which is all the more full and communicative from the fact of definitive words being few. In short, here the game was succeeding, which with herself had failed. It was pretty clear from the symptoms, marks, tokens, telegraphs, and general by-play between widower and widow, that Miller Loveday must have again said to Mrs. Garland some such thing as he had said before, with what result this time she did not know. As the situation was delicate, Anne halted a while apart from them. The trumpet-major, quite ignorant of how his cause was entered into by the white-coated man in the distance, for his father had not yet told him of his designs upon Mrs. Garland, did not advance, but stood still by the gate as though he were attending a princess, 
waiting till he should be called up. Thus they lingered, and the day began to break. Mrs. Garland and the miller took no heed of the time, and what it was bringing to earth and sky so occupied were they within themselves. But Anne, in her place, and the trumpet major in his, each in private thought of no bright kind, watched to the gradual glory of the east through all its tones and changes. The world of birds and insects got lively. The blue and the yellow and the gold of Loveday's uniform again became distinct. The sun bored its way upwards. The fields, the trees, and the distant landscape kindled to flame. And the trumpet major, backed by a lilac shadow as tall as a steeple, blazed in the rays like a very god of war. It was half-past three o'clock. A short time after, a rattle of horses and wheels reached their ears from the quarter in which they gazed, and there appeared upon the white line of road a moving mass, which presently ascended the hill and drew near. Then there arose a huzzah from the few knots of walkers, watchers gathered there, and they cried, "'Long live King George!' The cortege passed abreast. It consisted of three travelling carriages escorted by a detachment of the German legion. Anne was told to look in the first carriage, a post-chariot drawn by four horses, for the king and queen, and was rewarded by seeing a profile reminding her of the current coin of the realm. But, as the party had been travelling all night and the spectators here gathered were few, none of the royal family looked out of the carriage windows. It was said that the two elder princesses were in the same carriage, but they remained invisible. The next vehicle, a coach and four, contained more princesses, and the third some of their attendants. "'Thank God I have seen my king,' said Mrs. Garland, when they had all gone by. Nobody else expressed any thankfulness, for most of them had expected a more pompous procession than the bucolic tastes of the king cared to indulge in. And one old man said grimly that that sight of dusty old leather coaches was not worth waiting for. Anne looked hither and thither in the bright rays of the day, each of her eyes having a little sun in it, which gave her glance a peculiar golden fire, and kindled the brown curls grouped over her forehead to a yellow brilliancy, and made single hairs, blown astray by the night, look like lacquered wires. She was wondering if Festus were anywhere near, but she could not see him. Before they left the ridge, they turned their attention towards the royal watering-place, which was visible at this place only as a portion of the sea-shore, from which the night mist was rolling back. The sea beyond was still wrapped in summer fog, the ships in the roads showing through it as black spiders suspended in the air. While they looked and walked, a white jet of smoke burst from a spot which the miller knew to be the battery in front of the king's residence, and then the report of guns reached their ears. This announcement was answered by a salute from the castle of the adjoining isle, and the ships in the neighbouring anchorage. All the bells in the town began ringing. The king and his family had arrived. End of chapter 11 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 12 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 12. How Everybody Great and Small Climbed to the Top of the Downs. As the days went on, echoes of the life and bustle of the town reached the ears of the quiet people in Overcombe Hollow, exciting and moving those unimportant natives as a groundswell moves the weeds in a cave. Traveling carriages of all kinds and colors climbed and descended the road that led towards the seaside borough. Some contained those personages of the king's suite who had not kept pace with him in his journey from Windsor. Others were the coaches of aristocracy, big and little, whom news of the king's arrival drew thither for their own pleasure, so that the highway, as seen from the hills about Overcombe, appeared like an ant walk a constant succession of dark spots creeping along its surface at nearly uniform rates of progress, and all in one direction. 
the traffic and intelligence between camp and town passed in a measure over the villagers' heads. It being summertime, the miller was much occupied with business, and the trumpet major was too constantly engaged in marching between the camp and Gloucester Lodge with the rest of the dragoons to bring his friends any news for some days. At last he sent a message that there was to be a review on the downs by the king, and that it was fixed for the day following. This information soon spread through the village and country round, and next morning the whole population of Overcombe, except two or three very old men and women, a few babies and their nurses, a cripple, and Corporal Tullidge, ascended the slope with the crowds from afar and awaited the events of the day. The miller wore his best coat on this occasion, which meant a good deal. An Overcombe man in those days would have a best coat and keep it as a best coat half his life. The Millers had seen five and twenty summers, chiefly through the chinks of a clothes box, and was not at all shabby as yet, though getting singular. But that could not be helped. Common coats and best coats were distinct species and never interchangeable. Living so near the scene of the review, he walked up the hill, accompanied by Mrs. Garland and Anne as usual. It was a clear day, with little wind stirring, and the view from the downs, one of the most extensive in the county, was unclouded. The eye of any observer who cared for such things swept over the wave-washed down, and the bay beyond, and the isle, with its pebble bank lying on the sea to the left of these, like a great crouching animal tethered to the mainland. On the extreme east of the maritime horizon, St. Aldhelm's head closed the scene, the sea to the southward of that point glaring like a mirror under the sun. Inland could be seen Badbury Rings, where a beacon had been recently erected, and nearer, Rainbarrow, on Egdon Heath, where another stood. Farther to the left, Bullbarrow, where there was yet another. Not far from this came Nuttlecombe Tout, to the west, Dogbury Hill, and black on near to the foreground, the beacon thereon being built of furze faggots thatched with straw, and standing on the spot where the monument now raises its head. At nine o'clock sharp the troops marched upon the ground, some from the camps in the vicinity, and some from quarters in the different towns round about. The approaches to the down were blocked with carriages of all descriptions, ages and colors, and with pedestrians of every class. At ten the royal personages were said to be drawing near, and soon after the king, accompanied by the dukes of Cambridge and Cumberland, and a couple of generals appeared on horseback, wearing a round hat turned up at the side with a cockade of military feather. Sensation among the crowd. Then the queen and three of the princesses entered the field in a great coach, drawn by six beautiful cream-colored horses. Another coach with four horses of the same sort, brought the two remaining princesses. Confused acclamations. There's King George. That's Queen Charlotte. Princess Elizabeth. Princesses Sophia and Melior, etc., from the surrounding spectators. Anne and her party were fortunate enough to secure a position on the top of one of the barrows which rose here and there on the down, and the miller, having gallantly constructed a little cairn of flints, he placed the two women thereon, by which means they were enabled to see over the heads, horses, and coaches of the multitudes below and around. At the march past the miller's eye, which had been wandering about for the purpose, discovered his son in his place by the trumpeters, who had moved forwards in two ranks and were sounding the march. "'That's John!' he cried to the widow. His trumpet sling is of two colors, do you see, and the others be plain. Mrs. Garland, too, saw him now, and enthusiastically admired him from her hands upwards, and Anne silently did the same. But before the young woman's eyes had quite left the trumpet major, they fell upon the figure of Yeoman Festus riding with his troop, and keeping his face at a medium between haughtiness and mere bravery. He certainly looked as soldierly as any of his own corps, and felt more soldierly than half a dozen, as anybody could see by observing him. Anne got behind the miller in case Festus should discover her, 
and regardless of his monarch, rush upon her in a rage with, "'Why the devil did you run away from me that night, eh, madam?' But she resolved to think no more of him just now, and to stick to Love Day, who was her mother's friend. In this she was helped by the stirring tones which burst from the latter gentleman and his subordinates from time to time. "'Well,' said the miller complacently, "'there's a few of more consequence in a regiment than a trumpeter. He's the chap that tells him what to do, after all, eh, Miss Garland?' "'So he is, Miller,' said she. "'They could no more do without Jack and his men than they could without generals.' "'Indeed they could not,' said Mrs. Garland again, in a tone of pleasant agreement with any one in Great Britain or Ireland. It was said that the line that day was three miles long, reaching from the high ground on the right of where the people stood to the turnpike road on the left. After the review came a sham fight, during which action the crowd dispersed more widely over the downs, enabling Widow Garland to get still clearer glimpses of the king and his handsome charger, and the head of the queen, and the elbows and shoulders of the princesses in the carriages, and fractional parts of General Garth and the Duke of Cumberland, which sights gave her great gratification. She tugged at her daughter at every opportunity, exclaiming, "'Now you can see his feather. There's her hat. There's Her Majesty's India muslin shawl,' in a minor form of ecstasy that made the miller think her more girlish and animated than her daughter Anne. In those military maneuvers the miller followed the fortunes of one man, Anne Garland of two. The spectators, who, unlike our party, had no personal interest in the soldiery, saw only troops and battalions in the concrete, straight lines of red, straight lines of blue, white lines formed of innumerable knee-breeches, black lines formed of many gaiters, coming and going in kaleidoscopic change. Who thought of every point in the line as an isolated man, each dwelling all to himself in the hermitage of his own mind? One person did, a young man far removed from the barrow where the Garlands and Miller Loveday stood. The natural expression of his face was somewhat obscured by the bronzing effects of rough weather, but the lines of his mouth showed that affectionate impulses were strong within him, perhaps stronger than judgment well could regulate. He wore a blue jacket with little brass buttons, and was plainly a seafaring man. Meanwhile, in the part of the plain where rose the tumulus on which the miller had established himself, a broad-brimmed tradesman was elbowing his way along. He saw Mr. Loveday from the base of the barrow and beckoned to attract his attention. Loveday went halfway down, and the other came up as near as he could. "'Miller,' said the man, "'a letter has been lying at the post office for you for the last three days. If I had known that I should see you here, I'd have brought it along with me.' The miller thanked him for the news, and they parted, Loveday returning to the summit. "'What a very strange thing,' he said to Mrs. Garland, who had looked inquiringly at his face, now very grave. "'That was Bud Mouth Postmaster, and he says there's a letter for me. Ah, I now call to mind that there was a letter in the cradle three days ago this very night, a large red one. But, foolish-like, I thought nothing of it. Who can that letter be from?' A letter at this time was such an event for Hamleteers, even of the miller's respectable standing, that Loveday thenceforward was thrown into a fit of abstraction which prevented his seeing any more of the sham fight, or the people, or the king. Mrs. Garland imbibed some of his concern, and suggested that the letter might come from his son Robert. "'I should naturally have thought that,' said Miller Loveday. But he wrote to me only two months ago, and his brother John heard from him within the last four weeks, when he was just about starting on another voyage. If you'll pardon me, Mrs. Garland, ma'am, I'll see if there's any overcombe man here who is going to Budmouth today, so that I may get the letter by night-time. I cannot possibly go myself. So Mr. Loveday left them for a while, and as they were so near home, Mrs. Garland did not wait on the barrow for him to come back, but walked about with Anne a little time, until they should be disposed to trot down the slope to their own door. 
they listened to a man who was offering one guinea to receive ten in case Bonaparte should be killed in three months, and to other entertainments of that nature, which at this time were not rare. Once, during their peregrination, the eyes of the sailor before mentioned fell upon Anne, but he glanced over her and passed her unheedingly by. Loveday the Elder was at this time on the other side of the line looking for a messenger to the town. At twelve o'clock the review was over, and the king and his family left the hill. The troops then cleared off the field, the spectators followed, and by one o'clock the downs were again bare. They still spread their grassy surface to the sun, as on that beautiful morning, not historically speaking so very long ago, but the king and his fifteen thousand armed men, the horses, the bands of music, the princesses, the cream-colored teams, the gorgeous centerpiece, in short, to which the downs were but the mere mount or margin, how entirely they have all passed and gone. Lying scattered about the world as military and other dust, some at Talavera, Albuera, Salamanca, Vitoria, Toulouse, and Waterloo, some in home churchyards, and a few small handfuls in royal vaults. In the afternoon, John Loveday, lightened of his trumpet and trappings, appeared at the old millhouse door and beheld Anne standing at hers. "'I saw you, Miss Garland,' said the soldier gaily. "'Where was I?' said she, smiling. "'On the top of the big mound, to the right of the king.' "'And I saw you lots of times,' she rejoined. Loveday seemed pleased. Did you really take the trouble to find me? That was very good of you. Her eyes followed you everywhere, said Mrs. Garland from an upper window. Of course, I looked at the dragoons most, said Anne, disconcerted, and when I looked at them my eyes naturally fell upon the trumpets. I looked at the dragoons generally, no, more. She did not mean to show any vexation to the trumpet major but he fancied otherwise, and stood repressed. The situation was relieved by the arrival of the miller, still looking serious. "'I am very much concerned, John. I did not go to the review for nothing. There's a letter awaiting for me at Budmouth, and I must get it before bedtime, or I shan't sleep a wink.' "'I'll go, of course,' said John. "'And perhaps Miss Garland would like to see what's doing there today?' Everybody is gone or going. The road is like a fair. He spoke pleadingly, but Anne was not one to assent. You can drive in the gig. Twill do Blossom good, said the miller. Let David drive Miss Garland, said the trumpet major, not wishing to coerce her. I would just as soon walk. Anne joyfully welcomed this arrangement, and a time was fixed for the start. End of chapter 12. Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter 13 of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. THE TRUMPET MAJOR by Thomas Hardy CHAPTER Thirteen, THE CONVERSATION IN THE CROWD In the afternoon they drove off, John Loveday being nowhere visible. All along the road they passed and were overtaken by vehicles of all descriptions going in the same direction, among them the extraordinary machines which had been invented for the conveyance of troops to any point of the coast on which the enemy should land. They consisted of four boards placed across a sort of trolley, thirty men of the volunteer companies riding on each. The popular Georgian watering place was in a paradoxism of gaiety. The town was quite overpowered by the country round, much to the town's delight and profit. The fear of invasion was such that six frigates lay in the roads to ensure the safety of the royal family, and from the regiments of horse and foot quartered at the barracks or encamped on the hills round about, 
a picket of a thousand men mounted guard every day in front of Gloucester Lodge, where the king resided. When Anne and her attendant reached this point, which they did on foot, stabling the horse on the outskirts of the town, it was about six o'clock. The king was on the esplanade, and the soldiers were just marching past to mount guard. The band formed in front of the king, and all of the officers saluted as they went by. Anne now felt herself close to and looking into the stream of recorded history, within whose banks the littlest things are great, and outside which she and the general bulk of the human race were content to live on as an unreckoned, unheeded superfluity. When she turned from her interested gaze at this scene, there stood John Loveday. She had had a presentiment that he would turn up in this mysterious way. It was marvelous that he could have gone there so quickly, but there he was, not looking at the king or at the crowd, but waiting for the turn of her head. "'Trumpet Major, I didn't see you,' said Anne demurely. "'How is it that your regiment is not marching past?' "'We take it by turns, and it is not our turn,' said Loveday. She wanted to know then if they were afraid that the king would be carried off by the first consul. Yes, Loveday told her, and his majesty was rather venturesome. A day or two before he had gone so far to sea that he was nearly caught by some of the enemy's cruisers. He is anxious to fight Boney single-handed, he said. What a good brave king, said Anne. Loveday seemed anxious to come to more personal matters. Will you let me take you round to the other side, where you can see better? he asked. The queen and the princesses are at the window. Anne passively assented. David, wait here for me, she said. I shall be back again in a few minutes. The trumpet major then led her off triumphantly, and they skirted the crowd and came round on the side towards the sands. He told her everything he could think of, military and civil, to which Anne returned pretty syllables and parenthetic words about the color of the sea and the curl of the foam, a way of speaking that moved the soldier's heart even more than long and direct speeches would have done. "'And that other thing I asked you?' he ventured to say at last. "'We won't speak of it.' "'You don't dislike me?' "'Oh, no,' she said, gazing at the bathing machines, digging children, and other common objects of the seashore as if her interest lay there rather than with him. "'But I am not worthy of the daughter of a genteel professional man. That's what you mean?' "'There's something more than worthiness required in such cases, you know,' she said, still without calling her mind away from surrounding scenes. "'Ah, there are the queen and princesses at the window.' "'Something more? Well, since you will make me speak, I mean the woman ought to love the man.' The trumpet major seemed to be less concerned about this than about her supposed superiority. "'If it were all right on that point, would you mind the other?' he asked, like a man who knows he is too persistent, yet who cannot be still. "'How can I say, when I don't know? What a pretty chip hat the elder princess wears!' Her companion's general disappointment extended over him almost to his lace and his plume. Your mother said, you know, Miss Anne. Yes, that's the worst of it, she said. Let us go back to David. I have seen all I want to see, Mr. Loveday. The mass of the people had by this time noticed the queen and princesses at the window and raised a cheer to which the ladies waved their embroidered handkerchiefs. Anne went back towards the pavement with her trumpet major, whom all the girls envied her. So fine-looking a soldier was he, and not only for that, but because it was well known that he was not a soldier from necessity, but from patriotism, his father having repeatedly offered to set him up in business, his artistic taste in preferring a horse and uniform to a dirty, rumbling flour mill was admired by all. She, too, had a very nice appearance in her best clothes as she walked along. The sarsenet hat, muslin shawl, and tight-sleeved gown being of the newest overcomb fashion that was only about a year old in the adjoining town and in London three or four. She could not be harsh to Loveday and dismiss him curtly, 
for his musical pursuits had refined him, educated him, and made him quite poetical. Today he had been particularly well-mannered and tender, so instead of answering, Never speak to me like this again, she merely put him off with a, Let us go back to David. When they reached the place where they had left him, David was gone. Anne was now positively vexed. "'What shall I do?' she said. "'He's only gone to drink the king's health,' said Loveday, who had privately given David the money for performing that operation. "'Depend upon it. He'll be back soon.' "'Will you go and find him?' said she, with intense propriety in her looks and tone. "'I will,' said Loveday reluctantly, and he went. Anne stood still. She could now escape her gallant friend, for, although the distance was long, it was not impossible to walk home. On the other hand, Loveday was a good and sincere fellow, for whom she had almost a brotherly feeling, and she shrank from such a trick. While she stood and mused, scarcely heeding the music, the marching of the soldiers, the king, the dukes, the brilliant staff, the attendants, and the happy groups of people, her eyes fell upon the ground. Before her she saw a flower lying, a crimson sweet William, fresh and uninjured. An instinctive wish to save it from destruction by the passenger's feet led her to pick it up, and then, moved by a sudden self-consciousness, she looked around. She was standing before an inn, and from an upper window Festus Derriman was leaning with two or three kindred spirits of his cut and kind. He nodded eagerly and signified to her that he had thrown the flower. What should she do? To throw it away would seem stupid, and to keep it was awkward. She held it between her finger and thumb, twirled it round on its axis and twirled it back again, regarding and yet not examining it. Just then she saw the trumpet major coming back. "'I can't find David anywhere,' he said, and his heart was not sorry as he said it. Anne was still holding out the sweet William as if about to drop it, and, scarcely knowing what she did under the distressing sense that she was watched, she offered the flower to Loveday. His face brightened with pleasure as he took it. "'Thank you indeed,' he said. Then Anne saw what a misleading blunder she had committed towards Loveday in playing to the yeoman. Perhaps she had sown the seeds of a quarrel. "'It was not my sweet William,' she said hastily. "'It was lying on the ground. I don't mean anything by giving it to you.' "'But I'll keep it all the same,' said the innocent soldier, as if he knew a good deal about womankind, and he put the flower carefully inside his jacket, between his white waistcoat and his heart. Festus, seeing this, enlarged himself wrathfully, got hot in the face, rose to his feet, and glared down upon them like a turnip lantern. "'Let us go away,' said Anne timorously. "'I'll see you safe to your own door, depend upon me,' said Loveday. "'But I had near forgot. There's father's letter that he's so anxiously waiting for.' Will you come with me to the post office? Then I'll take you straight home. Anne, expecting Festus to pounce down every minute, was glad to be off anywhere, so she accepted the suggestion, and they went along the parade together. Loveday set this down as a proof of Anne's relenting. Thus, in joyful spirits, he entered the office, paid the postage, and received the letter. It is from Bob, after all, he said. Father told me to read it at once, in case of bad news. Ask your pardon for keeping you a moment. He broke the seal and read, Anne standing silently by. He is coming home to be married, said the trumpet major without looking up. Anne did not answer. The blood swept impetuously up her face at his words, and as suddenly went away again, leaving her rather paler than before. She disguised her agitation and then overcame it, Loveday observing nothing of this emotional performance. "'As far as I can understand, he will be here Saturday,' he said. "'Indeed,' said Anne quite calmly. "'And who is he going to marry?' "'That I don't know,' said John, turning the letter about. 
The woman is a stranger. At this moment the miller entered the office hastily. Come, John, he cried. I have been waiting and waiting for that there letter till I was nigh crazy. John briefly explained the news, and when his father had recovered from his astonishment, taken off his hat, and wiped the exact line where his forehead joined his hair, he walked with Anne up the street, leaving John to return alone. The miller was so absorbed in his mental perspective of Bob's marriage that he saw nothing of the gaieties they passed through, and Anne seemed also so much impressed by the same intelligence that she crossed before the inn occupied by Festus without showing a recollection of his presence there. End of chapter 13 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 14 of The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 14. Later in the evening of the same day. When they reached home, the sun was going down. It had already been noised abroad that Miller Loveday had received a letter, and, his cart having been heard coming up the lane, the population of Overcombe drew down towards the mill as soon as he had gone indoors. A sudden flash of brightness from the window, showing that he had struck such an early light as nothing but the immediate deciphering of literature could require. Letters were matters of public moment, and everybody in the parish had an interest in the reading of those rare documents so that when the miller had placed the candle, slanted himself, and called in Mrs. Garland to have her opinion on the meaning of any hieroglyphics that he might encounter in his course, he found that he was to be additionally assisted by the opinions of the other neighbours, whose persons appeared in the doorway, partly covering each other like a hand of cards, yet each showing a large enough piece of himself for identification. To pass the time while they were arranging themselves, the miller adopted his usual way of filling up casual intervals, that of snuffing the candle. "'We heard you got a letter, Baster Loveday,' they said. "'Yes, Southampton, the 12th of August, dear father,' said Loveday. And they were as silent as relations at the reading of a will. Anne, for whom the letter had a singular fascination, came in with her mother and sat down. Bob stated in his own way that, had since landing taken into consideration his father's wish that he should renounce a seafaring life and become a partner in the mill, he had decided to agree to the proposal, and with that object in view he would return to Overcombe in three days from the time of writing. He then said, incidentally, that since his voyage he had been in lodgings at Southampton, and during that time had become acquainted with a lovely and virtuous young maiden, in whom he found the exact qualities necessary to his happiness. Having known this lady for the full space of a fortnight, he had had ample opportunities of studying her character, and, being struck with the recollection that, if there was one thing more than another necessary in a mill which had no mistress, it was somebody who could play that part with grace and dignity, he had asked Miss Matilda Johnson to be his wife. In her kindness, she, though sacrificing far better prospects, had agreed, and he could not but regard it as a happy chance that he should have found at the nick of time such a woman to adorn his home, whose innocence was as stunning as her beauty. Without much ado, therefore, he and she had arranged to be married at once, and at Overcombe, that his father might not be deprived of the pleasures of the wedding feast. She had kindly consented to follow him by land in the course of a few days, and to live in the house as their guest for the week or so previous to the ceremony. "'Tis a proper good letter,' said Mrs. Comfort from the background. "'I never heard true love better put out of hand in my life, "'and they seem nice and fond of one another.' "'You haven't known her such a very long time,' said Job Mitchell, dubiously. "'Oh, that's nothing,' said Esther Beach. "'Nato will find her way, very rapid when your time comes for it. "'Well, tis good news for ye, Miller.' "'Yes, sure, I hope tis.' said Loveday. 
without, however, showing any great hurry to burst into the frantic form of fatherly joy which the event should naturally have produced, seeming more disposed to let off his feelings by examining thoroughly into the fibres of the letter-paper. "'I was five years according my wife,' he presently remarked. "'But folks were slower about everything in them days. "'Well, since she's coming, we must make her welcome. Uh, "'Did any of you catch by my reading which day it is he means? "'What with making out the penmanship, "'my mind was drawn off from the sense here and there.' "'He says in three days,' said Mrs. Garland. "'The date of the letter will fix it.' "'On examination, it was found that the day appointed "'was the one nearly expired, "'at which the miller jumped up and said,' Then he'll be here before bedtime. I didn't gather till now that he was coming afore Saturday. Why, he may drop in this very minute. He had scarcely spoken when footsteps were heard coming along the front, and they presently halted at the door. Loveday pushed through the neighbours and rushed out, and seeing in the passage a form which obscured the declining light, the miller seized hold of him, saying, Oh, my dear Bob, then you are come. Scranchy old miller, don't quite pull my poor shoulder out of joint. Whatever is the matter? said the newcomer, trying to release himself from Loveday's grasp of affection. It was Uncle Benji. Oh, I thought was my son, faltered the miller, sinking back upon the toes of the neighbours who had closely followed him into the entry. Well, come in, Mr. Derriman, and make yourself at home. Why, you haven't been here for years. Whatever has made you come now, sir, of all times in the world? "'Is he in there with ye?' whispered the farmer, with misgiving. "'Who?' "'My nephew, after that maid that he's so mighty smit with.' "'Oh, no, he never calls here.' Farmer Derriman breathed a breath of relief. "'Well, I've called to tell ye,' he said, "'that there's more news of the French. "'We shall have em here this month, as sure as a gun. "'The gun boats be already nearly two thousand of em, "'and the whole army is at Boulogne. "'And, Miller, I know you to be an honest man.' Loveday did not say nay. "'Neighbour Loveday, I know you to be an honest man,' repeated the old squireen. Uh, "'Can I speak to ye alone?' As the house was full, Loveday took him into the garden, all the while upon tenterhooks, not lest Bonaparte should appear in their midst, but lest Bob should come while he was not there to receive him. When they got into a corner, Uncle Benjamin said, Miller, what with the French, and what with my nephew Festus, I assure ye my life is nothing but were it from morning to night. Miller Loveday, you're an honest man. Loveday nodded. Well, I, I've come to ask a favour, to ask if you will take charge of my few poor tittle title deeds and documents and such like, while I'm away from home next week, lest anything should befall me, and they should be stole away by Boney or Festus, and I should have nothing left in the whole wide world. I can trust neither banks nor lawyers in these terrible times, and I'm come to you. Loveday, after some hesitation, agreed to take care of anything that Derriman should bring, whereupon the farmer said he would call with the parchments and papers alluded to in the course of a week. Derriman then went away by the garden gate, mounted his pony, which had been tethered outside, and rode on till his form was lost in the shades. The miller rejoined his friends, and found that in the meantime John had arrived. John informed the company that after parting from his father and Anne, he had rambled to the harbour and discovered the Pewit by the quay. On inquiry, he had learned that she came in at eleven o'clock, and that Bob had gone ashore. "'Well, go and meet him,' said the miller. "'Tis still light out of doors.' So, as the dew rose from the meads and formed fleeces in the hollows, Loveday and his friends and neighbours strolled out, and loitered by the stiles which hampered the footpath from Overcombe to the high road at intervals of a hundred yards. John Loveday, being obliged to return to camp, was unable to accompany them, but Willow Garland thought proper to fall in with the procession. When she put on her bonnet, she called to her daughter. Anne said from upstairs that she was coming in a minute, and her mother walked on without her. What was Anne doing? Having hastily unlocked a receptacle for emotional objects of small size, she took thence the little folded paper with which we have already become acquainted, and, striking a light from her private tinder-box, she held the paper, and curl of hair it contained, in the candle till they were burnt. 
Then she put on her hat and followed her mother and the rest of them across to the moist grey fields, cheerfully singing in an undertone as she went, to assure herself of her indifference to circumstances. End of chapter 14 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 15 of The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 15 Captain Bob Loveday of the Merchant Service While Loveday and his neighbours were thus rambling forth, full of expectancy, some of them, including Anne in the rear, heard the crackling of light wheels along the curved lane to which the path was the cord. At once Anne thought, Perhaps that's he, and we are missing him. But recent events were not of a kind to induce her to say anything, and the others of the company did not reflect on the sound. Had they gone across to the hedge which hid the lane and looked through it, they would have seen a light cart driven by a boy beside whom was seated a seafaring man, apparently of good standing in the merchant's service, with his feet outside on the shaft. The vehicle went over the main bridge, turned in upon the other bridge at the tail of the mill, and halted by the door. The sailor alighted, showing himself to be a well-shaped, active, and fine young man, with a bright eye, an anonymous nose, and of such a rich complexion by exposure to ripening suns, that he might have been some connection of the foreigner who calls his likeness the portrait of a gentleman in galleries of the old masters. Yet in spite of this, and though Bob Loveday had been all over the world, from Cape Horn to Pekin, and from India's coral strand to the White Sea, the most conspicuous of all the marks that he had brought back with him was an increased resemblance to his mother, who had lain all the time beneath Overcombe church wall. Captain Loveday tried the house door. Finding this locked, he went to the mill door. This was locked also, the mill being stopped for the night. "'They're not at home,' he said to the boy. "'But never mind that. Just help to unload the things, and then I'll pay you, and you can drive off home.' The cart was unloaded, and the boy was dismissed, thanking the sailor profusely for the payment rendered. Then Bob Loveday, finding that he had still some leisure in his hands, looked musingly east, west, north, south, and Nadia, after which he bestirred himself by carrying his goods article by article round to the back door, out of the way of casual passers. This done, he walked round the mill in a more regardful attitude, and surveyed its familiar features one by one. The panes of the grinding-room, now, as heretofore, clouded with flour as with stale hoar-frost, the meal lodged in the corners of the window-sills, forming a soil in which lichens grew without ever getting any bigger, as they had done since his smallest infancy. The mosses on the plinth towards the river, reaching as high as the capillary power of the walls, would fetch up moisture for their nourishment. And the penned mill-pond, now, as ever, on the point of overflowing into the garden. Everything was the same. When he'd had enough of this, it occurred to Loveday that he might get into the house in spite of the locked doors, and by entering the garden, placing a pole from the fork of an apple-tree to the window-sill of a bedroom on that side, and climbing across like a Barbary ape, he entered the window and stepped down inside. There was something anomalous in being close to the familiar furniture without having first seen his father, and its silent, impassive shine was not cheering. It was as if his relations were all dead, and into their tables and chests of drawers left to greet him. He went downstairs and seated himself in the dark parlour. Finding this place, too, rather solitarily, and the stick of the invisible clock preternaturally loud, he unearthed the tinder-box, obtained a light, and set about making the house comfortable for his father's return, divining that the miller had gone out to meet him by the wrong road. Robert's interest in this work increased as he proceeded, and he bustled round and round the kitchen as lightly as a girl. David, the indoor factotum, having lost himself among the court pots of Budmouth, there had been nobody left here to prepare supper, and Bob had it all to himself. In a short time a fire blazed up the chimney, 
A tablecloth was found, the plates were clapped down, and a search made for what provisions the house afforded, which, in addition to various meats, included some fresh eggs of the elongated shape that produces cockerels when hatched, and had been set aside on that account for putting under the next broody hen. A more reckless cracking of eggs than that which now went on had never been known in Overcombe since the last large christening, and as Loveday gashed one on the side, another at the end, another long ways, and another diagonally, he acquired adroitness by practice, and at last made every son of a hen of them fall into two hemispheres as neatly as if they were opened by a hinge. From eggs he proceeded to ham, and from ham to kidneys, the result being a brilliant fry. Not to be tempted to fall to before his father came back, the returned navigator emptied the hole into a dish, laid a plate over the top, his coat over the plate, and his hat over his coat. Thus, completely stopping in the appetising smell, he sat down to await events. He was relieved from the tediousness of doing this by hearing voices outside, and in a minute his father entered. "'Glad to welcome you home, father,' said Bob, "'and supper is just ready.' "'Lord, Lord, why, Captain Bob's here,' said Mrs. Garland. "'And we been out waiting to meet thee.' said the miller, as he entered the room, followed by representatives of the houses of Cripplestraw, Comfort, Mitchell, Beach, and Snooks, together with some small beginnings of Fensible Tremlett's posterity. In the rear came David, and quite in the vanishing point of the composition, Anne the Fair. "'I drove over and was so was forced to come by the road,' said Bob. "'And we went across the fields, thinking you'd walk,' said his father." I should have been here this morning, but not so much as a wheelbarrow could I get for my traps. Everything was gone to the review. So I went too, thinking I might meet you there. I was then obliged to return to the harbour for the luggage. Then there was a welcoming of Captain Bob by pulling out his arms like drawers and shutting them again, smacking him on the back as if he were choking, holding him at arm's length so that he were of too large type to read close. All which persecution Bob bore with a wide, genial smile, that was shaken into fragments and scattered promiscuously among the spectators. "'Get a chair for him,' said the miller to David, whom they had met in the fields, and found to have got nothing worse by his absence than a slight slant in his walk. "'Never mind, I, I'm not tired. I, I've been here ever so long,' said Bob, and I—' But the chair having been placed behind him, and a smart touch in the hollow of a person's knee by the edge of that piece of furniture, having a tendency to make the person sit without further argument— Bob sank down dumb, and the others drew up other chairs at a convenient nearness for easy analytic vision and the subtler forms of good fellowship. The miller went about saying, David, the nine best glasses from the corner cupboard. David, the corkscrew. David, whisk the tail of thy smock frock round the inside of these cork pots afore you draw drink on em. They'd be an inch thick in dust. David, lower that chimney crook a couple of notches that the flame may touch the bottom of the kettle, and light three more of the largest candles. "'If you can't get the cork out of the jar, David, bore a hole in the tub of Hollands that's buried under the scroff of the fuel-house, do you hear? Dan Brown left em there yesterday as a return for the little porker I gied him.' When they had all had a thimbleful round, and the superfluous neighbours had reluctantly departed one by one, the inmates gave their minds to the supper which David had begun to serve up. "'What be you rolling back the tablecloth for, David?' said the miller. "'Maister Bob has put down one of the undersheets by mistake, "'and I thought you might not like it, sir, as this lady's present.' "'Faith, it was the first thing that came to hand,' said Robert. "'It seemed a tablecloth to me.' "'Never mind, don't pull off the things now he's laid em down. "'Let it bide,' said the miller. Uh, "'But where's Bido Garland and Maidy Anne?' "'They be here but a minute ago,' said David. "'Depend upon it, they've slinked off, cause they be shy.' The miller at once went round to ask them to come back and sup with him, and while he was gone, David told Bob, in confidence, what an excellent place he had for an old man. "'Here, Captain Bob, as I suppose I must call ye, I've worked for your father these eight and thirty years, and we've always got on very well together. Trust me with all the keys, lends me his sleeve waistcoat, and leaves the house entirely to me. Widow Garland next door to is just the same with me, and treats me as if I was her own child.' "'She must have married young to make you that, David.' "'Yes, yes, I'm years older than she. "'Tis only my common way of speaking.' 
Mrs. Garland would not come in to supper, and the meal proceeded without her. Bob, recommending to his father the dish he had cooked, in the manner of a householder to a stranger just to come. The miller was anxious to know more about his son's plans for the future, but would not for the present interrupt his eating, looking up from his own plate to appreciate Bob's travelled way of putting English victuals out of sight, as he would have looked at a mill on improved principles. David had only just got the table clear, and set the plates in a row under the bakehouse table for the cats to lick, when the door was hastily opened, and Mrs. Garland came in, looking concerned. I, "'I've been waiting to hear the plates removed, to tell you how frightened we are at something we hear at the back door. It, it seems like robbers muttering. But when I look out, there's nobody there.' "'Oh, this must be seen to,' said the miller, rising promptly. "'David, light the middle-sized lantern. I'll go and search the garden.' "'And I'll go too,' said his son, taking up a cudgel. "'Lucky I've come home just in time.' They went out stealthily, followed by the widow and Anne, who had been afraid to stay alone in the house under the circumstances. No sooner were they beyond the door, when, sure enough, there was the muttering almost close at hand, and low upon the ground, as from persons lying down in hiding. "'Bless my heart!' said Bob, striking his head as though it were some enemies. "'Why, it is my luggage! I quite forgot it!' "'What?' asked his father. "'My luggage! Really, if it hadn't been for Mrs. Garland, it would have stayed there all night. They, poor things, would have been starved. I've got all sorts of articles for ye. You go inside, and I'll bring em in. "'Tis parrots that you hear are muttering, Mrs. Garland. You needn't be afraid any more.' "'Parrots?' said the miller. "'Why, well, I'm glad tis no worse.' "'But how couldst forget so, Bob?' The packages were taken in by David and Bob, and the first unfastened were three unwrapped in cloths, which, being stripped off, revealed three cages, with a gorgeous parrot in each. "'This one is for you, father, to hang up outside the door and amuse us,' said Bob. "'He'll talk very well, but he's sleepy to-night. "'This other one I brought along for any neighbour that would like to have him. "'His colours are not so bright, but tis a good bird.' "'If you would like to have him, you are welcome to him,' he said, turning to Anne, who had been tempted forward by the birds. "'You've hardly spoken yet, Miss Anne, but I recollect you very well. How much taller you have got, to be sure!' Anne said she was much obliged, but did not know what she could do with such a present. Mrs. Garland accepted it for her, and the sailor went on, "'Now this other bird I hardly know what to do with, but I dare say he'll come in for something or other.' "'He's by far the prettiest,' said the widow. "'I would rather have it than the other, if you don't mind.' Oh, "'Yes,' said Bob, with embarrassment. "'But the fact is, that bird will hardly do for ye, ma'am. "'He's a hard swearer, to tell the truth, "'and I'm afraid he's too old to be broken of it.' "'How dreadful!' said Mrs. Garland. "'We could keep him in the mill,' suggested the miller. "'It won't matter about the grinder hearing him, "'for he can't learn to cuss worse than he do already.' "'The grinder shall have him, then,' said Bob. "'The one I have given you, ma'am, has no harm in him at all. "'You might take him to church of Sundays, as far as that goes.' "'The sailor now untied a small wooden box, "'about a foot square, perforated with holes. "'Here are two marmosets,' he continued. "'You can't see them to-night, but they are beauties of the tufted sort.' "'What's a marmoset?' said the miller. "'Oh, a little kind of monkey.' They bite strangers rather hard, but you'll soon get used to them. "'They're rubbed up in something, I declare,' said Mrs. Garland, peeping in through a chink. "'Yes, that's my flannel shirt,' said Bob apologetically. "'They suffer terribly from cold in this climate, poor things, and I had nothing better to give them. "'Well, now, in this next box I've got things of different sorts.' The latter was a regular seaman's chest and out of it he produced shells of many sizes and colours, carved ivories, queer little caskets, gorgeous feathers, and several silk handkerchiefs, which articles were spread out upon all the available tables and chairs, till the house began to look like a bazaar. "'What a lovely shawl!' exclaimed Widow Garland, in her interest for stalling the regular exhibition, by looking into the box at what was coming. "'Oh, yes,' said the mate, putting out a couple of the most bewitching shawls that eyes ever saw. "'One of these I am going to give to that young lady I am shortly to be married to, you know, Mrs. Garland. "'Has father told you about it? "'Matilda Johnson of Southampton, that's her name.' "'Yes, we know all about it,' said the widow. "'Well, I shall give one of these shawls to her, 
because of course I ought to. Of course, said she. But the other one I've got no use for at all, and, he continued looking round, w will you have it, Miss Anne? You refuse the parrot, and you ought not to refuse this. Thank you, said Anne, calmly, but much distressed. But really, I, I don't want it, and, and couldn't take it. But do have it, said Bob, in hurt tones, Mrs. Garland being all the while on tenterhooks, lest Anne should persist in her absurd refusal. "'Why, there's another reason why you ought to,' said he, his face lighting up with recollections. "'It never came into my head till this moment, that I used to be your beau in a humble sort of way. "'Faith, so I did. And we used to meet at places sometimes, didn't we? "'That is, when you were not too proud. "'And once I gave you, or somebody else, a bit of my hair in fun. "'It was somebody else,' said Anne quickly. "'Ah, perhaps it was,' said Bob innocently. But as you I used to meet, or, or try to, I'm sure. Well, I've never thought of that boyish time for years till this minute. I'm sure you ought to accept some one gift, dear, out of compliment to those old times. Anne drew back and shook her head, for she would not trust her voice. Well, Mrs. Garland, then you shall have it, said Bob, tossing the shawl to that ready receiver. If you don't, upon my life, I will throw it out to the first beggar I see. Now, Here's a parcel of cap ribbons of the splendidest sort I could get. Have these, do, Anne. Yes, do, said Mrs. Garland. I, I promised them to Matilda, continued Bob, but I'm sure she won't want them, as she's got some of her own, and I would have soon seen them upon your head, my dear, as upon hers. I think you'd better keep them for your bride, if you promised them to her, said Mrs. Mar Garland mildly. It wasn't exactly a promise, I just said— "'Till there's some cap rooms in my box, if you would like to have them. "'But she's got enough things already for any bride in creation. "'And now you shall have them. Upon my soul you shall, or I'll fling them down the mill-tail.' "'Anne had meant to be perfectly firm in refusing everything, "'for reasons obvious even to that poor waif, the meanest capacity. "'But when it came to this point she was absolutely compelled to give in, "'and reluctantly received the cap ribbons in her arms, blushing fitfully.' and with her lip trembling an emotion which she tried to exhibit as a smile. "'What would Tilly say if she knew?' said the miller slyly. "'Yes, indeed, and it is wrong of him.' Anne instantly cried, tears running down her face as she threw the parcel of ribbons on the floor. "'You better bestow your gifts where you bestow your... Love, Mr. Loveday, that, that's what I say.' And Anne turned her back and went away. "'I'll take them for her.' said Mrs. Garland, quickly picking up the parcel. "'Now that's a pity,' said Bob, looking regretfully after Anne. "'I didn't remember that she was a quick-tempered sort of girl at all. "'Tell her, Mrs. Garland, that I ask her pardon. "'But of course I didn't know she was too proud to accept the little present. "'How should I? "'Upon my life, if it wasn't for Matilda, I'd... "'Well, that can't be, of course.' "'What's this?' said Mrs. Garland, touching with her foot a large package that had been laid down by Bob unseen. "'That's a bit of backy for myself,' said Robert meekly. The examination of presents at last ended, and the two families parted for the night. When they were alone, Mrs. Garland said to Anne, "'What a close girl you are! I'm sure I never knew that Bob Loveday and you had walked together. You must have been mere children.' "'Oh, oh yes, we were.' said Anne, now quite recovered. It was when we first came here, about a year after father died. We did not walk together in any regular way. You know, I have never thought the love days high enough for me. It was only just nothing at all, and I had almost forgotten it. It is to be hoped that somebody's sins were forgiven her that night before she went to bed. When Bob and his father were left alone, the miller said, "'Well, Robert, what about this young woman of thine? "'Matilda, what's her name?' "'Yes, Father, Matilda Johnson. "'I was just going to tell you about her.' "'The miller nodded and sipped his mug. "'Well, she's an excellent body,' continued Bob. "'That can truly be said. "'A real charmer, you know. "'A nice, good, comely young woman. "'A miracle of genteel breeding, you know, and all that. "'She can throw her hair into the nicest curls, "'and she's got splendid gowns and head-clothes. In short, you might call her a land mermaid. She'll make such a first-rate wife as there never was. 
<laughs> no doubt she will, said the miller, for I have never known thee wanting in sense in a general way. He turned his cup round on its axis till the handle had travelled a complete circle. How long did you say in your letter that you'd known her? A fortnight. Not very long. It don't sound long, tis true, and twas really longer, twas fifteen days and a quarter. But hang it, father, I could see in the twinkling of an eye that the girl would do. I know a woman well enough when I see her. I ought to, indeed, having been so much about the world. Now, for instance, there's Widow Garland and her daughter. The girl is a nice little thing, but the old woman... Oh, no! Bob shook his head. What of her? said his father, slightly shifting in his chair. Well, she's... she's... I mean, I should never have chosen her, you know. She's of a nice disposition, and young for a widow with a grown-up daughter. But if all the men had been like me, she would never have had a husband. I like her in some respects, but she's a style of beauty I don't care for. Oh, if tis only looks you're thinking of, said the miller, much relieved, there's nothing to be said, of course. Well, there's many a duchess worse-looking, if it comes to argument, as you would find, my son, he added, with a sense of having been mollified too soon. The mate's thoughts were elsewhere by this time. As to my marrying Matilda, thinks I, here's one of the jerry gentilest sort, and I may as well do the job at once. So I chose her. She's a dear girl. There's nobody like her. Search where you will. How many did you choose her out from? inquired his father. Well, she was the only young woman I happened to know in Southampton, that's true. But what of that? It would have been this all the same if I'd known a hundred. Her father is in business near the docks, I suppose. Well, no, in short, I didn't see her father. Her mother? Her mother? No, I didn't. I think her mother is dead, but she's got a very rich aunt living at Melchester. I didn't see her aunt, because there wasn't time to go. But of course we shall know her when we are married. Yes, yes, of course, said the miller, trying to feel quite satisfied. And she will soon be here? Aye, she's coming soon, said Bob. She's gone to this aunt's at Melchester to get her things packed and such like, or she would have come with me. I am going to meet the coach at the King's Arms, Casterbridge, on Sunday at one o'clock. To show what a capital sort of wife she'll be, I may tell you that she wanted to come by the Mercury, because tis a little cheaper than the other. But I said, For once in your life do it well, and come by the Royal Mail, and I'll pay. I can have the pony and trap to fetch her, I suppose, as tis too far for her to walk. Of course you can, Bob, or anything else, and I'll do all I can to give you a good wedding feast. End of chapter 15 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 16 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Alana Jordan the Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 16 They Make Ready for the Illustrious Stranger Preparations for Matilda's welcome, and for the event which was to follow, at once occupied the attention of the mill. The miller and his man had but dim notions of housewifery on any large scale, so the great wedding cleaning was kindly supervised by Mrs. Garland. Bob, being mostly away during the day with his brother, the trumpet major, on various errands, one of which was to buy paint and varnish for the gig that Matilda was to be fetched in, which he had determined to decorate with his own hands. By the widow's direction, the old familiar incrustation of shining dirt, imprinted along the back of the settle by the heads of countless jolly sitters, was scrubbed and scraped away, the brown circle round the nail whereon the miller hung his hat, stained by the brim in wet weather, was whitened over. Tawny smudges of bygone shoulders in the passage were removed without regard to a certain genial and historical value which they had acquired. The face of the clock, coated with verdigris, as thick as a diacolon plaster, was rubbed till the figures emerged into day, while inside the case of the same chronometer, the cobwebs that formed triangular hammocks, which the pendulum could hardly wade through, were cleared away at one swoop. Mrs. Garland also assisted 
at the invasion of worm-eaten cupboards where layers of ancient smells lingered on in the stagnant air and recalled to the reflective nose the many good things that had been kept there the upper floors were scrubbed with such abundance of water that the old established death watches wood lice and flower worms were all drowned the suds trickling down into the room below in so lively and novel a manner as to convey the romantic notion that the miller lived in a cave with dripping stalactites they moved what had never been moved before the oak coffer containing the miller's wardrobe a tremendous weight what with its locks hinges nails dirt framework and the hard stratification of old jackets waistcoats and knee breeches at the bottom never disturbed since the miller's wife died and half pulverized by the moths whose flattened skeletons lay amid the mass in thousands it fairly makes my back open and shut said loveday as in obedience to mrs garland's direction he lifted one corner the grinder and david assisting at the others altogether speak when ye be going to heave now the pot covers and skimmers were brought to such a state that on examining them the beholder was not conscious of utensils but of his own face in a condition of hideous elasticity the broken clock line was mended the kettles rocked the creeper nailed up and a new handle put to the warming pan the large household lantern was cleaned out after three years of uninterrupted accumulation the operation yielding a conglomerate of candle snuffs candle ends remains of matches lamp black and eleven ounces and a half of good grease invaluable as dubbing for skitty boots and ointment for cartwheels everybody said that the mill residence had not been so thoroughly scoured for twenty years the miller and david looked on with a sort of awe tempered by gratitude tacitly admitting by their gaze that this was beyond what they had ever thought of mrs garland supervised all with disinterested benevolence it would never have done she said for his future daughter-in-law to see the house in its original state she would have taken a dislike to him and perhaps to bob likewise why don't ye come and live here with me and then you would be able to see to it at all times said the miller as she bustled about again to which she answered that she was considering the matter and might in good time he had previously informed her that his plan was to put bob and his wife in the part of the house that she mrs garland occupied as soon as she chose to enter his which relieved her of any fear of being incommoded by matilda the cooking for the wedding festivities was on a proportionate scale of thoroughness they killed the four supernumerary chickens that had just begun to crow and the little curly-tailed barrow pig in preference to the sow not having been put up fattening for more than five weeks it was excellent small meat and therefore more delicate and likely to suit a town-bred lady's taste than a large one which having reached the weight of fourteen score might have been a little gross to a cultured palate there were also provided a cold chine stuffed veal and two pigeon pies also thirty rings of black pot a dozen of white pot and ten knots of tender and well-washed chitterlings cooked plain in case she should like a change as additional reserves there were sweetbreads and five milts sewed up at one side in the form of a chrysalis and stuffed with thyme sage parsley mint groats rice milk chopped egg and other ingredients they were afterwards roasted before a slow fire and eaten hot the business of chopping so many herbs for the various stuffings was found to be aching work for women and david the miller the grinder and the grinder's boy being fully occupied in their proper branches and bob being very busy painting the gig and touching up the harness loveday called in a friendly dragoon of john's regiment who was passing by and he being a muscular man willingly chopped all the afternoon 
for a quart of strong, judiciously administered, and all the victuals found, taking off his jacket and gloves, rolling up his shirt-sleeves, and unfastening his collar in an honorable and energetic way. All windfalls and maggot-cored codlins were excluded from the apple pies, and as there was no known dish large enough for the purpose, the puddings were stirred up in the milking pail and boiled in the three-legged bell-metal crock, of great weight and antiquity, which every traveling tinker for the previous thirty years had tapped with his stick, coveted, made a bid for, and often attempted to steal. In the liquor line, Loveday laid in an ample barrel of Casterbridge strong beer. This renowned drink, now almost as much a thing of the past as Falstaff's favorite beverage, was not only well calculated to win the hearts of soldiers blown dry and dusty by residents in tents on a hilltop, but of any wayfarer whatever in that land. It was of the most beautiful color that the eye of an artist in beer could desire, full in body, yet brisk as a volcano, piquant, yet without a twang, luminous as an autumn sunset, free from streakiness of taste, but finally rather heady. The masses worshipped it. The minor gentry loved it more than wine. And by the most illustrious county families, it was not despised. Anybody brought up for being drunk and disorderly in the streets of its natal borough had only to prove that he was a stranger to the place and its liquor to be honorably dismissed by the magistrates as one overtaken in a fault that no man could guard against who entered the town unawares. In addition, Mr. Loveday also tapped a hogshead of fine cider that he had mellowing in the house for several months, having bought it of an honest down-country man, who did not color for any special occasion like the present. It had been pressed from fruit judiciously chosen by an old hand, Horner and Cleves apple for the body, a few Tom Putts for color, and just a dash of old five corners for sparkle, a selection originally made to please the palate of a well-known temperate earl, who was a regular cider drinker, and lived to be eighty-eight. On the morning of the Sunday appointed for her coming, Captain Bob Loveday set out to meet his bride. He had been all the week engaged in painting the gig, assisted by his brother at odd times, and now it appeared of a gorgeous yellow, with blue streaks and tassels at the corners, and red wheels outlined with a darker shade. He put in the pony at half-past eleven, and looking down at him from the door as he packed himself into the vehicle and drove off. There may be young women who look out at young men driving to meet their brides as Anne looked at Captain Bob, and yet we are quite indifferent to the circumstances, but they are not often met with. So much dust had been raised on the highway by traffic resulting from the presence of the court at the town further on, that brambles hanging from the fence and giving a friendly scratch to the wanderer's face, were dingy as church cobwebs, and the grass on the margin had assumed a paper-shaving hue. Bob's father had wished him to take David, lest, from want of recent experience at the whip, he should meet with any mishap, but picturing to himself the awkwardness of three in such circumstances, Bob would not hear of this, and nothing more serious happened to his driving than that the wheel marks formed two serpentine lines along the road during the first mile or two before he got his hand in, and that the horse shied at a milestone, a piece of paper, a sleeping tramp, and a wheelbarrow, just to make use of the opportunity of being in bad hands. He entered Casterbridge between twelve and one, and putting up at the old greyhound, walked on to the bow. Here, rather dusty on the ledges of his clothes, he stood and waited while the people in their best summer dresses poured out of the three churches round him. When they had all gone, and a smell of cinders and gravy had spread down the ancient high street, and the pie-dishes from adjacent bake-houses had all travelled past, 
he saw the mail coach rise above the arch of Gray's Bridge, a quarter of a mile distant, surmounted by swaying knobs which proved to be the heads of the outside travellers. "'That's the way for a man's bride to come to him,' said Robert to himself with a feeling of poetry. And as the horn sounded and the horses clattered up the street, he walked down to the inn. The knot of hostlers and inn-servants had gathered. The horses were dragged from the vehicle, and the passengers for Casterbridge began to descend. Captain Bob eyed them over, looking inside, looking outside again. To his disappointment, Matilda was not there, nor her boxes, nor anything that was hers. Neither coachman nor guard had seen or heard of such a person at Melchester, and Bob walked slowly away. Depressed by forebodings to an extent which took nearly a third of his appetite, he sat down in the parlour of the old greyhound to a slice from the family joint of the landlord. This gentleman, who dined in his shirt-sleeves, partly because it was August, and partly from a sense that they would not be so fit for public view further on in the week, suggested that Bob should wait till three or four that afternoon, when the road-wagon would arrive as the lost lady might have preferred that mode of conveyance. And when Bob appeared rather hurt at the suggestion, the landlord's wife assured him, as a woman who knew good life, that many genteel persons travelled in that way during the present high price of provisions. Loveday, who knew little of travelling by land, readily accepted her assurance and resolved to wait. Wandering up and down the pavement, or leaning against some hot wall between the wagon office and the corner of the street above, he passed the time away. It was a still, sunny, drowsy afternoon, and scarcely a soul was visible in the length and breadth of the street. The office was not far from All Saints Church, and the church windows being open, he could hear the afternoon service from where he lingered as distinctly as if he had been one of the congregation. Thus he was mentally conducted through the psalms, through the first and second lessons, through the burst of fiddles and clarionets which announced the evening hymn, and well into the sermon, before any signs of the wagon could be seen upon the London road. The afternoon sermons at this church being of a dry and metaphysical nature at that date, it was by a special providence that the wagon office was placed near the ancient fabric, so that whenever the Sunday wagon was late, which it always was in hot weather, in cold weather, in wet weather, and in weather of almost every other sort, the rattle, dismounting, and swearing outside completely drowned the parson's voice within, and sustained the flagging interest of the congregation at precisely the right moment. No sooner did the charity children begin to writhe on their benches, and adult snores grow audible, then the wagon arrived. Captain Loveday felt a kind of sinking in his poetry at the possibility of her for whom they had made such preparations being in the slow, unwieldy vehicle which crunched its way towards him. But he would not give in to the weakness. Neither would he walk down the street to meet the wagon, lest she should not be there. At last the broad wheels drew up against the curb, the wagoneer with his white smock frock and whip as long as a fishing line descended from the pony on which he rode alongside, and the six broad-chested horses backed from their collars and shook themselves. In another moment something showed forth, and he knew that Matilda was there. Bob felt three cheers rise within him as she stepped down, but it being Sunday, he did not utter them. In dress, Miss Johnson passed his expectations. A green and white gown, with long, tight sleeves, a green silk handkerchief round her neck, and crossed in front. A green parasol and green gloves. It was strange enough to see this verdant caterpillar turn out of a road wagon, and gracefully shake herself free from the bits of straw and fluff, which would usually gather on the raiment of the grandest travellers by that vehicle. 
"'But, my dear Matilda,' said Bob, when he had kissed her three times with much publicity, the practical step he had determined on seeming to demand that these things should no longer be done in a corner. "'My dear Matilda, why didn't you come by the coach, having the money for it and all?' "'That's my scrimping,' said Matilda, in a delightful gush. "'I know you won't be offended when you know I did it to save against a rainy day.' Bob, of course, was not offended, though the glory of meeting her had been less, and even if vexation were possible, it would have been out of place to say so. Still, he would have experienced no little surprise had he learnt the real reason of his Matilda's change of plan." That angel had, in short, so wildly spent Bob's and her own money in the adornment of her person before setting out, that she found herself without a sufficient margin for her fare by coach, and had scrimped from sheer necessity. "'Well, I have got the trap out at the Greyhound,' said Bob. "'I don't know whether it will hold your luggage and us, too, but it looked more respectable than the wagon on a Sunday. And if there's not room for the boxes, I can walk alongside.' "'I think there will be room,' said Miss Johnson mildly, and it was soon very evident that she spoke the truth, for when her property was deposited on the pavement, it consisted of a trunk about eighteen inches long, and nothing more. "'Oh, that's all,' said Captain Loveday, surprised. "'That's all,' said the young woman, assuringly. "'I didn't want to give trouble, you know, and what I have besides I have left at my aunt's.' "'Yes, of course,' he answered readily. "'and as it's no bigger, I can carry it in my hand to the inn, "'and so it will be no trouble at all.' "'He caught up the little box, "'and they went side by side to the Greyhound, "'and in ten minutes they were trotting up the southern road. "'Bob did not hurry the horse, "'there being many things to say and hear, "'for which the present situation was admirably suited. "'The sun shone occasionally into Matilda's face "'as they drove on, its rays picking out all her features to a great nicety. Her eyes would have been called brown, but they were really eel color. Like many other nice brown eyes, they were well shaped and rather bright, though they had more of a broad shine than a sparkle. She had a firm, sufficient nose, which seemed to say of itself that it was good as noses go. She had rather a picturesque way of wrapping her upper in her lower lip, so that the red of the latter showed strongly, whenever she gazed against the sun toward the distant hills she brought into her forehead, without knowing it, three short vertical lines, not there at other times, giving her, for the moment, rather a hard look. And in turning her head round to a far angle, to stare at something or other that he pointed out, the drawn flesh of her neck became a mass of lines. But Bob did not look at these things, which, of course, were of no significance, for had she not told him, when they compared ages, that she was a little over two-and-twenty? As nature was hardly invented at this early point of the century, Bob's Matilda could not say much about the glamour of the hills, or the shimmering of the foliage, or the wealth of glory in the distant sea, as she would doubtless have done had she lived later on. But she did her best to be interesting, asking Bob about matters of social interest in the neighborhood, to which she seemed quite a stranger. "'Is your watering place a large city?' she inquired, when they mounted the hill where the overcome folk had waited for the king. "'Bless you, my dear, no. "'Twould be nothing if it wasn't for the royal family— and the lords and ladies, and the regiments of soldiers, and the frigates, and the king's messengers, and the actors and actresses, and the games that go on. At the words actors and actresses, the innocent young thing pricked up her ears. Does Elliston pay as good salaries this summer as in— Oh, you know about it then? I thought— Oh, no, no. I have heard of Budmouth, read in the papers, you know— dear Robert, about the doings there, and the actors and actresses, you know. Yes, yes, I see. Well, I have been away from England a long time, 
and don't know much about the theater in the town, but I'll take you there some day. Would it be a treat to you? Oh, an amazing treat, said Miss Johnson, with an ecstasy in which a close observer might have discovered a tinge of ghastliness. You've never been into one, perhaps, dear. Never, said Matilda flatly. Whatever do I see yonder? A row of white things on the down? Yes, that's a part of the encampment, above the overcome. Lots of soldiers are encamped about here. Those are the white tops of their tents. He pointed to a wing of the camp that had become visible. Matilda was much interested. It will make it very lively for us, he added, especially as John is there. She thought so, too, and thus they chatted on. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Seventeen. Two Fainting Fits and a Bewilderment. Meanwhile, Miller Loveday was expecting the pair with interest, and about five o'clock, after repeated outlooks, he saw two specks the size of caraway seeds on the far line of ridge where the sunlit white of the road met the blue of the sky. Then the remainder parts of Bob and his lady became visible, and then the whole vehicle, and on, and he heard the dry rattle of the wheels on the dusty road. Miller Loveday's plan, as far as he had formed any, was that Robert and his wife should live with him in the mill-house until Mrs. Garland made up her mind to join him there, in which event her present house would be made over to the young couple. Upon all grounds he wished to welcome becomingly the woman of his son's choice, and came forward promptly as they drew up at the door. "'What a lovely place you've got here,' said Miss Johnson, when the miller had received her from the captain. "'A real stream of water, a real mill-wheel, and real fowls, and everything.' "'Yes, tis real enough,' said Loveday, looking at the river with balanced sentiments. "'And so you will say, when you've lived here a bit, as missus, and had the trouble of cleaning the furniture.' At this Miss Johnson looked modest, and continued to do so till Anne, not knowing they were there, came round the corner of the house with her prayer book in her hand, having just arrived from church. Bob turned and smiled to her, at which Miss Johnson looked glum. How long she would have remained in that phase is unknown, for just then her ears were assailed by a loud bass note from the other side, causing her to jump round. "'Oh, la, what dreadful thing is that?' she exclaimed, and beheld a cow of love days, of the name of Crumpler, standing close to her shoulder. It being about milking time, she had come to look up David and hasten on the operation. "'Oh, what a horrid bull! It did frighten me so! I hope I shan't faint,' said Matilda." The miller immediately used the formula which has been uttered by the proprietors of livestock ever since Noah's time. She won't hurt ye. Hush, Crumpler! She's as timid as a mouse, ma'am. But as Crumpler persisted in making another terrific inquiry for David, Matilda could not help closing her eyes and saying, Oh, I shall be gored to death, her head falling back upon Bob's shoulder, which— seeing the urgent circumstances, and knowing her delicate nature, he had providentially placed in a position to catch her. Anne Garland, who had been standing at the corner of the house, not knowing whether to go back or come on, at this felt her womanly sympathies aroused. She ran and dipped her handkerchief into the splashing mill-tail, and with it damped Matilda's face. But as her eyes still remained closed, Bob, to increase the effect, took the handkerchief from Anne and wrung it out on the bridge of Matilda's nose, whence it ran over the rest of her face in a stream. "'Oh, Captain Loveday,' said Anne, 
The water is running over her green silk handkerchief and into her pretty reticule. There, I didn't think so, exclaimed Matilda, opening her eyes, starting up, and promptly pulling out her own handkerchief, with which she wiped away the drops, and an unimportant trifle of her complexion, assisted by Anne, who, in spite of her background of antagonistic emotions, could not help being interested. That's right, said the miller, his spirits reviving with the revival of Matilda. The lady is not used to country life, are you, ma'am? I am not, replied the sufferer. All is so strange about here. Suddenly there spread into the firmament from the direction of the down, Ratata, ta 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 ta, ratata. Oh, dear, dear, more hideous country sounds, I suppose, she inquired with another start. Oh, no, said the miller cheerfully. "'Tis only my son John's trumpeter chaps at the camp of dragoons just above us, a blowing mess, or feed, or picket, or some other of their vagaries. John will be much pleased to tell you the meaning on it when he comes down. He's trumpet major, as you may know, ma'am. "'Oh, yes, you mean Captain Loveday's brother. Dear Bob has mentioned him. "'If you come round to Widow Garland's side of the house, you can see the camp.' said the miller. "'Don't force her. She's tired with her long journey,' said Mrs. Garland humanely, the widow having come out in the general wish to see Captain Bob's choice. Indeed, they all behaved towards her as if she were a tender exotic, which their crude country manners might seriously injure. She went into the house, accompanied by Mrs. Garland and her daughter, though before leaving Bob she managed to whisper in his ear, "'Don't tell them I came by wagon, will you, dear?' a request which was quite needless, for Bob had long ago determined to keep that a dead secret, not because it was an uncommon mode of travel, but simply that it was hardly the usual conveyance for a gorgeous lady to her bridal. As the men had a feeling that they would be superfluous indoors just at present, the miller assisted David in taking the horse round to the stables, Bob following, and leaving Matilda to the women. Indoors, Miss Johnson admired everything, the new parrots and marmosets, the black beams of the ceiling, the double corner cupboard with the glass doors, through which gleamed the remainders of sundry china sets acquired by Bob's mother in her housekeeping, two-handled sugar basins, no-handled teacups, a teapot like a pagoda, and a cream jug in the form of a spotted cow. This sociability in their visitor was returned by Mrs. Garland and Anne, and Miss Johnson's pleasing habit of partly dying whenever she heard any unusual bark or bellow added to her piquancy in their eyes. But conversation, as such, was naturally at first of a nervous, tentative kind, in which, as in the works of some minor poets, the sense was considerably led by the sound. "'You get the sea breezes here, no doubt?' "'Oh, yes, dear, when the wind is that way. "'Do you like windy weather?' "'Yes, though not now, for it blows down the young apples. "'Apples are plentiful, it seems.' You country folk call St. Swithin's their christening day if it rains? Yes, dear. Ah, me, I have not been to a christening for these many years. The baby's name was George, I remember, after the king. I hear the King George is still staying at the town here. I hope he'll stay till I have seen him. He'll wait till the corn turns yellow, he always does. How very fashionable yellow is getting for gloves just now. Yes, some persons wear them to the elbow, I hear. Do they? I was not aware of that. I struck my elbow last week so hard against the door of my aunt's mansion that I feel the ache now. Before they were quite overwhelmed by the interest of this discourse, the miller and Bob came in. In truth, Mrs. Garland found the office in which he had placed her, that of introducing a strange woman to a house which was not the widow's own, a rather awkward one, 
and yet almost a necessity. There was no woman belonging to the house except that wondrous compendium of usefulness, the intermittent maid-servant, whom Loveday had, for appearances, borrowed from Mrs. Garland, and Mrs. Garland was in the habit of borrowing from the girl's mother. And as for the demi-woman David, he had been informed as peremptorily as Pharaoh's baker that the office of housemaid and bedmaker was taken from him, and would be given to this girl till the wedding was over, and Bob's wife took the management into her own hands. They all sat down to high tea, Anne and her mother included, and the captain sitting next to Miss Johnson. Anne had put a brave face upon the matter, outwardly at least, and seemed in a fair way of subduing any lingering sentiment which Bob's return had revived. During the evening, and while they still sat over the meal, John came down on a hurried visit, as he had promised, ostensibly on purpose to be introduced to his intended sister-in-law, but much more to get a word and a smile from his beloved Anne. Before they saw him, they heard the trumpet major's smart step coming around the corner of the house, and in a moment his form darkened the door. As it was Sunday, he appeared in his full-dress laced coat, white waistcoat and breeches, and towering plume, the latter of which he instantly lowered, as much from necessity as good manners, the beam in the mill-house ceiling having a tendency to smash and ruin all such headgear without warning. "'John, we've been hoping you would come down,' said the miller, "'and so we have kept the tay about on purpose. "'Draw up and speak to Mrs. Matilda Johnson. "'Ma'am, this is Robert's brother.' "'Your humble servant, ma'am,' said the trumpet major gallantly. As it was getting dusk in the low, small-paned room, he instinctively moved towards Miss Johnson as he spoke, who sat with her back to the window. He had no sooner noticed her features than his helmet nearly fell from his head, his face became suddenly fixed, and his natural complexion took itself off, leaving a greenish-yellow in its stead. The young person, on her part, had no sooner looked closely at him than she said weakly, "'Robert's brother!' and changed color yet more rapidly than the soldier had done. The faintness, previously half-counterfeit, seized on her now in real earnest. "'I don't feel well,' she said, suddenly rising by an effort. "'This warm day has quite upset me.' There was a regular collapse of the tea party, like that of the Hamlet play scene. Bob seized his sweetheart and carried her upstairs, the miller exclaiming, "'Ah, oh, she's terribly worn by the journey. I thought she was when I saw her nearly go off at the blare of the cow. No woman would have been frightened at that if she'd been up to her natural strength. That, and being so very shy of men, too, must have made John's handsome regimentals quite overpowering to her, poor thing, added Mrs. Garland, following the catastrophic young lady upstairs, whose indisposition was by this time beyond question. And yet, by some perversity of the heart, she was as eager now to make light of her faintness as she had been to make much of it two or three hours ago. The miller and John stood like straight sticks in the room the others had quitted, John's face being hastily turned towards a caricature of Bonaparte on the wall that he had not seen more than a hundred and fifty times before. "'Come sit down and have a dish of tea, anyhow,' said his father at last. "'She'll soon be right again, no doubt.' "'Thanks, I don't want any tea,' said John, quickly. "'And, indeed,' He did not, for he was in one gigantic ache from head to foot. The light had been too dim for anybody to notice his amazement, and, not knowing where to vent it, the trumpet major said he was going out for a minute. He hastened to the bake-house, but David being there, he went to the pantry, but the maid being there, he went to the cart-shed. But a couple of tramps being there, he went behind a row of French beans in the garden, where he let off an ejaculation the most pious that he had uttered that Sabbath day. 
Heaven, what's to be done? And then he walked wildly about the paths of the dusky garden, where the trickling of the brooks seemed loud by comparison with the stillness around, treading recklessly on the cracking snails it had come forth to feed, and entangling his spurs in the long grass till the rowels were choked with its blades. Presently he heard another person approaching, and his brother's shape appeared between the stubborn tree and the hedge. "'Oh, is it you?' said the mate. "'Yes, I am taking a little air. "'She is getting round nicely again, "'and as I am not wanted indoors just now, "'I am going into the village to call upon a friend or two "'I have not been able to speak to as yet.' "'John took his brother Bob's hand. "'Bob rather wondered why. "'All right, old boy,' he said. "'Going into the village?' You'll be back again, I suppose, before it gets very late? Oh, yes, said Captain Bob cheerfully, and passed out of the garden. John allowed his eyes to follow his brother till his shape could not be seen, and then he turned and again walked up and down. End of chapter 17 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 18 of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 18 The Night After the Arrival. John continued his sad and heavy pace, till walking seemed too old and worn out a way of showing sorrow so new, and he leaned himself against the fork of an apple tree like a log. There the trumpet major remained for a considerable time, his face turned towards the house, whose ancient, many-chimneyed outline rose against the darkened sky and just shut out from his view the camp above but faint noises coming thence from horses restless at the pickets and from visitors taking their leave recalled its existence and reminded him that in consequence of matilda's arrival he had obtained leave for the night a fact which owing to the startling emotions that followed his entry he had not yet mentioned to his friends while abstractly considering how he could best use that privilege under the new circumstances which had arisen, he heard Farmer Derriman drive up to the front door and hold a conversation with his father. The old man had at last apparently brought the tin box of private papers that he wished the miller to take charge of during Derriman's absence, and it being a calm night, John could hear, though he little heeded, Uncle Benji's reiterated supplications to Loveday to keep it safe from fire and thieves. Then Uncle Benji left, and John's father went upstairs to deposit the box in a place of security, the whole proceeding reaching John's preoccupied comprehension merely as voices during sleep. The next thing was the appearance of a light in the bedroom which had been assigned to Matilda Johnson. This effectually aroused the trumpet major, and with a stealthiness unusual in him, he went indoors. No light was in the lower rooms, his father, Mrs. Garland, and Anne having gone out on the bridge to look at the new moon. John went upstairs on tiptoe and along the uneven passage till he came to her door. It was standing ajar a band of candlelight shining across the passage and up the opposite wall. As soon as he entered the radiance, he saw her. She was standing before the looking-glass, apparently lost in thought, her fingers being clasped behind her head in abstraction, and the light falling full upon her face. "'I must speak to you,' said the trumpet major. She started turned and grew paler than before, and then, as if moved by a sudden impulse, 
She swung the door wide open, and, coming out, said quite collectedly and with apparent pleasantness, "'Oh, yes, you are my Bob's brother. I didn't for a moment recognize you.' "'But you do now?' "'As Bob's brother.' "'You have not seen me before?' "'I have not,' she answered, with a face as impassable as Talleyrand's. "'Good God!' "'I have not,' she repeated. "'Nor any of the... the dragoons? Captain Jolly, for instance?' "'No.' "'You mistake. I'll remind you of particulars,' he said dryly. And he did remind her at some length. Never, she said desperately. But she had miscalculated her staying powers and her adversary's character. Five minutes after that she was in tears, and the conversation had resolved itself into words which, on the soldier's part, were of the nature of commands, tempered by pity, and were a mere series of entreaties on hers. The whole scene did not last ten minutes. When it was over, the trumpet major walked from the doorway where they had been standing and brushed moisture from his eyes. Reaching a dark lumber room, he stood still there to calm himself, and then descended by a Flemish ladder to the bakehouse instead of by the front stairs. He found that the others, including Bob, had gathered in the parlor during his absence and lighted the candles. Miss Johnson, having sent down some time before John re-entered the house to say that she would prefer to keep her room that evening, was not expected to join them, and on this account Bob showed less than his customary liveliness. The miller, wishing to keep up his son's spirits, expressed his regret that, it being Sunday night, they could have no songs to make the evening cheerful, when Mrs. Garland proposed that they should sing psalms, which— by choosing lively tunes and not thinking of the words, would be almost as good as ballads. This they did, the trumpet major appearing to join in with the rest, but as a matter of fact no sound came from his moving lips. His mind was in such a state that he derived no pleasure even from Anne Garland's presence, though he held a corner of the same book with her, and was treated in a winsome way which it was not her usual practice to indulge in. She saw that his mind was clouded, and, far from guessing the reason why, was doing her best to clear it. At length the Garlands found that it was the hour for them to leave, and John Loveday at the same time wished his father and Bob good night, and went as far as Mrs. Garland's door with her. He had said not a word to show that he was free to remain out of camp, for the reason that there was painful work to be done, which it would be best to do in secret and alone. He lingered near the house till its reflected window lights ceased to glimmer upon the mill pond, and all within the dwelling was dark and still. Then he entered the garden and waited there till the back door opened, and a woman's figure timorously came forward. John Loveday at once went up to her, and they began to talk in low yet dissentient tones. They had conversed about ten minutes and were parting as if they had come to some painful arrangement, Miss Johnson sobbing bitterly, when a head stealthily arose from the dense hedgerow, and in a moment a shout burst from its owner. "'Thieves! Thieves! My tin box! Thieves! Thieves!' Matilda vanished into the house, and John Loveday hastened to the hedge. "'For heaven's sake, hold your tongue, Mr. Derryman!' he exclaimed. "'My tin box,' said Uncle Benji. "'Oh, only the trumpet, Major!' "'Your box is safe enough, I assure you. It was only—' Here the trumpet major gave vent to an artificial laugh. "'Only a sly bit of courting, you know.' "'Ha, ha, I see,' said the relieved old squireen. "'Courting Miss Anne. Then you've ousted my nephew, Trumpet Major. Well, so much the better. As for myself, the truth on it is that I haven't been able to go to bed easy, 
for thinking that possibly your father might not take care of what I put under his charge, and at last I thought I would just step over and see if all was safe here before I turned in. And when I saw your two shapes, my poor nerves magnified ye to housebreakers and bonies, and I don't know what all. You have alarmed the house, said the trumpet major, hearing the clicking of flint and steel in his father's bedroom, followed in a moment by the rise of a light in the window of the same apartment. You have got me into difficulty, he added gloomily, as his father opened the casement. I am sorry for that, said Uncle Benji, but step back. I'll put it all right again. "'What, for heaven's sake, is the matter?' said the miller, his tasseled nightcap appearing in the opening. "'Nothing, nothing,' said the farmer. "'I was uneasy about my few bonds and documents, and I walked this way, miller, before going to bed, as I start from home tomorrow morning. When I came down by your garden hedge, I thought I saw thieves, but it turned out to be—to be—' to be, here a lump of earth from the trumpet major's hand struck Uncle Benji in the back as a reminder. To be the bow of a cherry tree waving in the wind. Good night. No thieves are like to try my house, said Miller Loveday. Now don't you come alarming us like this again, farmer, or you shall keep your box yourself, begging your pardon for saying so. Good night to ye. "'Miller, will ye just look, since I am here? "'Just look and see if the box is all right. "'There's a good man. "'I am old, you know, and my poor remains are not what my original self was. "'Look and see if it is where you put it. "'There's a good, kind man.' "'Very well,' said the miller, good-humoredly. Neighbor Love Day, on second thoughts, I will take my box home again after all, if you don't mind. You won't deem it ill of me. I have no suspicions, of course, but now I think on it there's rivalry between my nephew and your son, and if Festus should take it into his head to set your house on fire in his enmity, t'would be bad for my deeds and documents. No offense, Miller, but I'll take the box, if you don't mind. "'Faith, I don't mind,' said Loveday. "'But your nephew had better think twice before he lets his enmity take that color. Receding from the window, he took the candle to a back part of the room and soon appeared with the tin box. "'I won't trouble ye to dress,' said Derriman considerately. "'Let him down by anything ye have at hand.' The box was lowered by a cord, and the old man clasped it in his arms. "'Thank ye,' he said with heartfelt gratitude. "'Good night.' The miller replied and closed the window, and the light went out. "'There. Now I hope you are satisfied, sir,' said the trumpet major. "'Quite, quite,' said Derriman, and, leaning on his walking-stick, he pursued his lonely way. That night Anne lay awake in her bed, musing on the traits of the few friends who had come to her neighbor's house. She would not be critical, it was ungenerous and wrong, but she could not help thinking of what interested her. And were there, she silently asked, in Miss Johnson's mind and person such rare qualities as placed that lady altogether beyond comparison with herself? Oh yes, there must be for had not Captain Bob singled out Matilda from among all other women, herself included? Of course, with his worldwide experience, he knew best. When the moon had set, and only the summer stars threw their light into the great damp garden, she fancied that she heard voices in that direction. Perhaps they were the voices of Bob and Matilda taking a lover's walk before retiring. If so, how sleepy they would be next day, and how absurd it was of Matilda to pretend she was tired. Ruminating in this way, and saying to herself that she hoped they would be happy, Anne fell asleep. End of chapter 18 Recording by Roger Moline
Chapter 19 of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 19. Miss Johnson's behavior causes no little surprise. Partly from the excitement of having his Matilda under the paternal roof, Bob rose next morning as early as his father and the grinder, and when the big wheel began to patter and the little ones to mumble in response, went to sun himself outside the mill front, among the fowls of brown and speckle kinds which haunted that spot, and the ducks that came up from the mill tail. Standing on the worn-out millstone, inlaid in the gravel, he talked with his father on various improvements of the premises and on the proposed arrangements for his permanent residence there with an enjoyment that was half based upon this prospect of the future and half on the penetrating warmth of the sun to his back and shoulders then the different troops of horses began their morning scramble down to the mill pond and after making it very muddy round the edge ascended the slope again the bustle of the camp grew more and more audible and presently david came to say that breakfast was ready is miss johnson downstairs said the miller and bob listened for the answer looking at a blue sentinel aloft on the down not yet master said the excellent david we'll wait till she's down said loveday when she is let us know david went indoors again and loveday and bob continued their morning survey by ascending into the mysterious quivering recesses of the mill and holding a discussion over a second pair of birthstones which had to be redressed before they could be used again. This and similar things occupied nearly twenty minutes, and looking from the window, the elder of the two was reminded of the time of day by seeing Mrs. Garland's tablecloth fluttering from her back door over the heads of a flock of pigeons that had alighted for their crumbs. I suppose David can't find us, he said, with a sense of hunger that was not altogether strange to Bob. He put out his head and shouted, the lady is not down yet, said his man in reply. No hurry, no hurry, said the miller with cheerful emptiness. Bob, to pass the time, we'll look into the garden. She'll get up sooner than this, you know, when she signed articles and got a berth here, Bob observed apologetically. Yes, yes, said Loveday, and they descended into the garden. Here they turned over sundry flat stones and killed the slug sheltered beneath them from the coming heat of the day, talking of slugs in all of their branches, of the brown and the black, of the tough and the tender, of the reason why there were so many in the garden that year, of the coming time when the grass walks harboring them were to be taken up and gravel laid, and of the relatively exterminatory merits of a pair of scissors and the heel of the shoe. At last the miller said, Well, really, Bob, I'm hungry. We must begin without her. They were about to go in when David appeared with haste in his motions, and his eyes wider vertically than crosswise, and his cheeks nearly all gone. Master, I've been to call her, and as I didn't speak, I rapped, and as, as I didn't answer, I kicked, and not being latched, the door opened, and she's gone. Bob went off like a swallow towards the house, and the miller followed, like the rather heavy man that he was. That Miss Matilda was not in a room or a scrap of anything belonging to her was soon apparent. They searched every place in which she could possibly hide or squeeze herself, every place in which she could not, but found nothing at all. Captain Bob was quite wild with astonishment and grief. When he was quite sure that she was nowhere in his father's house, he ran into Mrs. Garland's and telling them the story so hastily that they hardly understood the particulars. He went on towards Comfort's house, intending to raise the alarm there, and also at Mitchell's, Beach's, Cripplestraw's, the Parsons, the Clerks, the Camp of Dragoons, the Hussars, and on through the whole county. But he paused and thought it would be hardly expedient to publish his discomfiture in such a way. If Matilda had left the house for any freakish reason, he would not care to look for her, and if her deed had a tragic intent, she would keep aloof from camp and village. In his trouble he thought of Anne. She was a nice girl and could be trusted. To her he went and found her in a state of excitement and anxiety which equaled his own. "'Tis so lonely to cruise here all by myself,' said Bob, 
disconsolately, his forehead all in wrinkles. And I thought you would come with me and cheer the way. Where shall we search? said Anne. Oh, in the holes of rivers, you know, and down wells and in quarries and over cliffs and like that. Your eyes might catch the loom of any bit of shawl or bonnet that I should overlook, and it would do me a real service. Please do come. So Anne took pity upon him and put on her hat and went, the miller and David having gone off in another direction. They examined the ditches of fields, Bob going round by one fence and Anne by the other, till they met at the opposite side. Then they peeped under culverts into outhouses, down old wells and quarries, until the theory of a tragical end had nearly spent its force in Bob's mind, and he began to think that Matilda had simply run away. However, they still walked on, though by this time the sun was hot and Anne would gladly have sat down. "'Now don't you think highly of her, Miss Garland?' he inquired, as the search began to languish. "'Oh, yes,' said Anne, "'very highly. "'She was really beautiful. "'No nonsense about her looks, was there? "'None. "'Her beauty was thoroughly ripe, not too young. "'We should all have got to love her. "'What can have possessed her to go away?' I don't know, and upon my life I shall soon be drove to say I don't care, replied the mate disparagingly. Let me pilot ye down over those stones, he added as Anne began to descend a rugged quarry. He stepped forward, leapt down, and turned to her. She gave him her hand and sprang down. Before he relinquished his hold, Captain Bob raised her fingers to his lips and kissed them. Oh, Captain Loveday, cried Anne, snatching away her hand in genuine dismay, while a tear rose unexpectedly in each eye. I never heard of such a thing. I won't go an inch farther with you, sir. It is too barefaced. And she turned and ran off. Upon my life, I didn't mean it, said the repentant captain, hastening after. I do love her best, indeed I do, and I don't love you at all. I am not so fickle as that. I merely just for the moment admired you as a sweet little craft, and that's how I came to do it. You know, Miss Garland, he continued earnestly and still running after her. Tis like this. When you came ashore after having been shut up in a ship for eighteen months, woman folks seem so new and nice that you can't help liking them. One and all in a body, and so your heart is apt to get scattered. And to yaw a bit. But of course I think of poor Matilda most, and shall always stick to her. He heaved a sigh of tremendous magnitude to show beyond the possibility of doubt that his heart was still in the place of that honor required. I am glad to hear that, of course. I am very glad, she said with a quick petulance, keeping her face turned away from him. And I hope we shall find her and that the wedding will not be put off and that you will both be happy. But I won't look for her any more. No, I don't care to look for her. And my headaches. I'm going home. And so am I said Robert promptly. No, no. Go on looking for her, of course, all the afternoon and all night. I'm sure you will, if you love her. Oh, yes, I mean to. Still, I ought to convey you home first? No, you ought not, and I shall not accept your company. Good morning, sir. And she went off over one of the stone stiles which the spot abounded, leaving the friendly sailor standing in the field. He sighed again, and, observing the camp not far off, thought he would go to his brother John and ask him his opinion on the sorrowful case. On reaching the tents, he found that John was not at liberty just at that time, being engaged in practicing the trumpeteers, and leaving word that he wished the trumpet major to come down to the mill as soon as possible, Bob went back again. "'Tis no good looking for her,' he said gloomily. "'She liked me well enough, but when she came here and saw the house,' and the place, and the old horse, and the plain furniture. She was disappointed to find us all so homely, and felt she didn't care to marry into such a family. His father and David had returned with no news. Yes, tis as I've been thinking, father, Bob said. We weren't good enough for her, and she went away in scorn. Well, that can't be helped, said the miller. What we be, we be, and have been for generations. To my mind, she seemed glad enough to get a hold of us. Yes, yes, for the moment, because of the flowers and the birds and what's pretty in the place, said Bob tragically. But you don't know, father. How should you know who have hardly been out of overcome in your life? You don't know what delicate feelings are in a real refined woman's mind. 
Any little vulgar action unreaves their nerves like a marline spike. And now I wonder, did you do anything to disgust her? Faith, not that I know of, said Loveday, reflecting. I didn't say a single thing that I should naturally have said on purpose to give her no offense. You was always very homely, you know, father. Yes, so I was, said the miller meekly. I wonder what it could have been, Bob continued, wandering about restlessly. You didn't go drinking out of the big mug with your mouth full or wipe your lips with your sleeve? That I'll swear I didn't, said the miller firmly. Thinks I, there's no knowing what I may do to shock her, so I'll take my solid vittles in the bakehouse and only crumb and a drop in her company for manners. You could do no more than that, certainly, said Bob gently. If my manners be good enough for well-brought-up people like the Garlands, they be good enough for her, continued the miller, with a sense of injustice. That's true. Then it must have been David. David, come here. How did you behave before that lady? Now, mind you, speak the truth. Yes, Mr. Captain Robert, said David earnestly. I assure ye, she was served like a royal queen, the best silver spoons we's put down, and your poor grand for silver tankit, as you seed, and the feather cushion for her to sit on. Now I've got it, said Bob decisively, bringing down his hand upon the window sill. Her bed was hard, and there's nothing shocks a true lady like that. The bed in that room always was as hard as the rock of Gibraltar. No, oh, Captain Bob, the beds were changed, wasn't they, master? We put the goose bed in her room and the flock one that used to be in there in yours. Yes, we did, corroborated the miller. David and I changed them with our own hands because they were too heavy for the women to move. Sure, I didn't know I had the flock bed, murmured Bob. I slept on, little thinking what I was going to wake to. Well, well, she's gone, and, search as I will, I shall never find another like her. She was too good for me. She must have carried her box with her own hands, poor girl. As far as that goes, I could overtake her even now, I dare say, but I won't entreat her against her will, not I. Miller loved Day and David, feeling themselves to be rather a desecration in the presence of Bob's sacred emotions, managed to edge off by degrees, the former burying himself in the most flowery recesses of the mill, his invariable resource when perturbed, the rumbling having a soothing effect upon the nerves of those properly trained to its music. Bob was so impatient that, after going up to her room to assure himself once more that she had not undressed, but had only lain down on the outside of the bed, he went outside of the house to meet John, and waited on the sunny slope of the down till his brother appeared. John looked so brave and shapely and warlike that, even in Bob's present distress, he could not but feel an honest and affectionate pride at owning such a relative. Yet, he fancied that John did not come along with the same swinging step he had shown yesterday, and when the trumpet major got nearer, he looked anxiously at the mate and waited for him to speak first. "'You know our great trouble, John,' said Robert, gazing stoically into his brother's eyes. Come and sit down and tell me all about it, answered the trumpet major, showing no surprise. They went towards a slight ravine, where it was easier to sit down than on the flat ground, and here John reclined among the grasshoppers, pointing to his brother to do the same. But do you know what it is, said Robert? Has anybody told ye? I do know, said John. She's gone, and I'm thankful. What, said Bob, rising to his knees in amazement? I'm at the bottom of it, said the trumpet major slowly. You, John? Yes, and if you will listen, I'll tell you all. Do you remember what happened when I came into the room last night? Why, she turned color and nearly fainted away. That was because she knew me. Bob stared at his brother with a face of pain and distrust. For once, Bob, I must say something that will hurt thee a good deal, continued John. She was not a woman who could possibly be your wife, and so she's gone. You sent her off? Well, I did. John, tell me right through, tell me. Perhaps I had better, said the trumpet major, his blue eyes resting on the far distant sea that seemed to rise like a wall as high as the hill they sat upon. And then he told a tale of Miss Johnson and the 
dragoons which wrung his heart as much in the telling as it did Bob's to hear, and which showed that John had been temporarily cruel to be ultimately kind. Even Bob, as excited as he was, could discern from John's manner of speaking what a terrible undertaking that night's business had been for him. To justify the course he had adopted, the dictates of duty must have been imperative. But the trumpet major, with a becoming reticence, which his brother at the time was naturally unable to appreciate, scarcely dwelt distinctly enough upon the compelling cause of his conduct. It would indeed have been hard for any man, much less so modest a one as John, to do himself justice in that remarkable relation when the listener was the lady's lover, and it is no wonder that Robert rose to his feet and put a greater distance between himself and John. And what time was it, he asked in a hard, suppressed voice. It was just before one o'clock. How could you help her go away? I had a pass. I carried her box to the coach office. She was to follow at dawn. But she had no money. Yes, she had. I took particular care of that. John did not add, as he might have done, that he had given her, in his pity, all the money he had possessed, and at present had only eighteen pence in the world. Well, it is over, Bob, so sit ye down and talk with me of old times, he added. Ah, Jack, it is well enough for you to speak like that, said the disquieted sailor, but I can't help feeling that it is a cruel thing you have done. After all, she would have been snug enough for me. Would I have never found this out about her? John, why did you interfere? You had no right to overhaul my affairs like this. Why didn't you tell me fairly all you knew, and let me do as I chose? You have turned her out of the house, and it's a shame. If she had only come to me, why didn't she? Because she knew it was best to do otherwise. Well, I shall go after her, said Bob firmly. You can do as you like, said John, but I would advise you strongly to leave matters where they are. I won't leave matters where they are, said Bob impetuously. You have made me miserable, and all for nothing. I tell you, she was good enough for me, and as long as I knew nothing about what you say of her history, what difference would it have made to me? Never was there a young woman who was better company, and she loved a merry song, as I do myself. Yes, I'll follow her. Oh, Bob, said John, I hardly expected this. That's because you didn't know your man. Can I ask you to do me one kindness? I don't suppose I can. Can I ask you not to say a word against her to any of them at the house? Certainly. The very reason why I got her off silently, as she has done, was because nothing should be said against her here, and no scandal should be heard of. That may be, but I'm off after her. Marry that girl I will. You'll be sorry. That we shall see, replied Robert with determination, and he went away rapidly towards the mill. The trumpet major had no heart to follow. No good could possibly come a further opposition. And there on the down he remained like a graven image till Bob had vanished from his sight into the mill. Bob entered his father's only to leave word that he was going on a renewed search for Matilda and to pack up a few necessaries for his journey. Ten minutes later he came out again with a bundle in his hand and John saw him go diagonally across the lower fields towards the high road. And this is all the good I have done, said John musingly, readjusting his stock where it cut his neck and descending towards the mill. End of chapter 19
to every conceivable surmise on the cause of Miss Johnson's disappearance that the human mind could frame, to which Annie returned monosyllabic answers, the result not of indifference but of intense preoccupation. Presently, Loveday, the father, came to the door. Her mother vanished with him, and they remained closeted together a long time. Annie went into the garden and seated herself beneath the branching tree, whose boughs had sheltered her during so many hours of her residence here. Her attention was fixed upon the miller's wing of the irregular building before her, than upon that occupied by her mother, for she could not help expecting every moment to see some one run out with a wild face and announce some awful clearing up of the mystery. Every sound set her on the alert, and hearing the tread of a horse in the lane, she looked round eagerly. Gazing at her over the hedge was Festus Derriman, mounted on such an incredibly tall animal that he could see to her very feet over the thick and broad thorn fence. She no sooner recognized him than she withdrew her glance, but as his eyes were fixed steadily upon her, this was a futile manoeuvre. I saw you look round, he exclaimed crossly. What have I done to make you behave like that? Come, Miss Garland, be fair. It's no use to turn your back upon me. As she did not turn, he went on. Well, now, this is enough to provoke a saint. Now, I tell you what, Miss Garland, here I'll stay till you do turn round, if it's all the afternoon. You know my temper. What I say, I mean. He seated himself firmly in the saddle, plucked some leaves from the hedge, and began humming a song, to show how absolutely indifferent he was to the flight of time. "'What have you come for, that you are so anxious to see me?' inquired Annie, when at last he had wearied her patience, rising and facing him with the added independence which came from a sense of the hedge between them. "'There, I knew you would turn round,' he said, his hot, angry face invaded by a smile in which his teeth showed like white, hemmed in by red edges. "'What do you want, Mr. Derriman?' said she. "'What do you want, Mr. Derriman? Now listen to that. Is that my encouragement?' Annie bowed superciliously and moved away. I have just heard news that explains all that, said the giant, eyeing her movements with somnolent irascibility. My uncle has been letting things out. He was here late last night and he saw you. Indeed he didn't, said Annie. Oh, now, he saw trumpet major Lafte quoting somebody like you in that garden walk and when he came you ran indoors it's not true and i wish to hear no more upon my life he said so how can you do it miss garland when i who have enough money to buy up all the love days would gladly come to terms with ye what a simpleton you must be to pass me over for him there now you are angry because i said simpleton i didn't mean simpleton I meant misguided, misguided Rosebud, that's it. Run off, he continued in a raised voice, as Annie made towards the garden door. But I'll have you yet, much reason you have to be, too proud to stay with me. But it won't last long, I shall marry you, madam, if I choose, as you'll see. When he was quite gone, and Annie had come down from the not altogether unrelished fear and excitement that he always caused her, she returned to her seat under the tree, and began to wonder what Festus Doryman's story meant, 
which from the earnestness of his tone did not seem like a pure invention it suddenly flashed upon her mind that she herself had heard voices in the garden and that the person seen by farmer derriman of whose visit and reclamation of his box the miller had told her might have been matilda and john loveday she further recalled the strange agitation of miss johnson on the preceding evening and that it occurred just at the entry of the dragoon till by degrees suspicion amounted to conviction that he knew more than any one else supposed of that lady's disappearance it was just at this time that the trumpet major descended to the mill after his talk with his brother on the down as fate would have it instead of entering the house he turned aside to the garden and walked down that pleasant enclosure to learn if he were likely to find in the other half of it the woman he loved so well yes there she was sitting on a seat of logs that he had repaired for her under the apple tree but she was not facing in his direction he walked with a noisier tread he coughed he shook a bow he did everything in short but the one thing that festus did in the same circumstances call out to her he would not have ventured on that for the world any of his signs would have been sufficient to attract her a day or two earlier now she would not turn at last in his fond anxiety he did what he had never done before without an invitation and crossed over into mrs garland's half of the garden till he stood before her when she could not escape him she arose and saying good afternoon trumpet major in a glacial manner unusual with her walked away to another part of the garden love day quite at a loss had not the strength of mind to persevere further he had a vague apprehension that some imperfect knowledge of the previous night's unhappy business had reached her and unable to remedy the evil without telling more than he dared he went into the mill where his father still was looking doleful enough what with his concern at events and the extra quantity of flour upon his face through sticking so closely to business that day well john bob has told you all of course a queer strange perplexing thing isn't it i can't make it out at all there must be something wrong in the woman or it couldn't have happened i haven't been so upset for years nor have i i wouldn't it should have happened for all i own in the world said the dragoon have you spoke to annie garland today or has any one been talking to her festus derriman rode by half an hour ago and talked to her over the hedge john guessed the rest and after standing on the threshold in silence a while walked away towards the camp all this time his brother robert had been hastening along in pursuit of the woman who had withdrawn from the scene to avoid the exposure and complete overthrow which would have resulted had she remained as the distance lengthened between himself and the mill bob was conscious of some cooling down of the excitement that had prompted him to set out but he did not pause in his walk till he had reached the head of the river which fed the mill stream here for some indefinite reason he allowed his eyes to be attracted by the bubbling spring whose waters never failed or lessened and he stopped as if to look longer at the scene it was really because his mind was so absorbed by john's story 
the sun was warm, the spot was a pleasant one, and he deposited his bundle and sat down. By degrees, as he reflected first on John's view and then on his own, his convictions became unsettled, till at length he was so balanced between the impulse to go on and the impulse to go back that a puff of wind either way would have been well nigh sufficient to decide for him. When he allowed John's story to repeat itself in his ears, the reasonableness and good sense of his advice seemed beyond question. When, on the other hand, he thought of his poor Matilda's eyes and her, to him pleasant ways, their charming arrangements to marry, and her probable willingness still, he could hardly bring himself to do otherwise than follow on the road at the top of his speed. This strife of thought was so well maintained that, sitting and standing, he remained on the borders of the spring till the shadows had stretched out eastwards and the chance of overtaking Matilda had grown considerably less. Still, he did not positively go towards home. At last, he took a guinea from his pocket and resolved to put the question to the hazard. Heads I go, tails I don't. The piece of gold spun in the air and came down, heads. No, I won't go after all, he said. I won't be steered by accidents any more. He picked up his bundle and switch and retraced his steps towards Overcombe Mill, knocking down the brambles and nettles as he went with gloomy and indifferent blows. When he got within sight of the house, he beheld David in the road. All right, all right again, Captain, shouted that retainer. A wedding after all. Hurrah! Ah, she's back again, cried Bob seizing David ecstatically and dancing round with him. No, but it's all the same. It's of no consequence at all, and no harm will be done. Maester and Mrs. Garland have made up a match and mean to marry at once, that the wedding victuals may not be wasted. They felt it would be a thousand pities to let such good things get blue we need for want of a ceremony to use them upon, and at last they have thought of this. Victuals? I don't care for the victuals, bitterly cried Bob, in a tone of far higher thought. How you disappoint me! And he went slowly towards the house. His father appeared in the opening of the mill door looking more cheerful than when they had parted. What, Robert, you have been after her? he said. Faith, then, I wouldn't have followed her if I had been as sure as you were that she went away in scorn of us. Since you told me that, I have not looked for her at all. I was wrong, father, Bob replied gravely, throwing down his bundle and stick. Matilda, I find, has not gone away in scorn of us. She has gone away for other reasons. I followed her some way, but I have come back again. She may go. Why is she gone? said the astonished miller. Bob had intended, for Matilda's sake, to give no reason to a living soul for her departure. But... He could not treat his father thus reservedly, and he told. She has made great fools of us, said the miller deliberately, and she might have made us greater ones. Bob, I thought thou hast more sense. Well, don't say anything against her, father, implored Bob. It was a sorry haul, and there is an end on it. Let her down quietly and keep the secret. You promise that? I do, laughed Ada Elder, remained thinking a while, and then went on. Well, 
what i was going to say is this i've hit upon a plan to get out of the awkward corner she has put us in what you'll think of it i can't say david has just given me the heads and do it hurt your feelings my son at such a time no i'll bring myself to bear it anyhow why should i object to other people's happiness because i have lost mine said bob with saintly self-sacrifice in his air well said answered the miller heartily but you may be sure that there'll be no unseemingly rejoicing to disturb ye in your present frame of mind all the morning i felt more ashamed than i cared to own at the thought of how the neighbours great and small would laugh at what they would call your folly when they knew what had happened so i resolved to take this step to stave it off if so be it was possible and when i saw mrs garland i knew i had done right she pitied me so much for having had the house cleaned in vain and laid in provisions to waste that it put her into the humour to agree we mean to do it right off at once afore the pies and cakes get mouldy and the black pot stale it was a good thought of mine and hers and i'm glad it's settled he concluded cheerfully poor matilda murmured bob there i was afraid it would hurt thy feelings said the miller with self-reproach making preparations for thy wedding and using them for my own no said bob heroically it shall not it will be a great comfort in my sorrow to feel that the splendid grub and the ale and your stunning new suit of clothes and the great tablecloths you have bought will be just as useful now as if i had married myself poor matilda but you won't expect me to join in you hardly can i can shear off that day very easily you know nonsense bob said the miller reproachfully i couldn't stand it i should break down deuce take me if i would have asked her then if i had known it was going to drive thee out of the house now come bob i'll find a way of arranging it and sobering it down so that it shall be as melancholy as you can require in short just like a funeral if thou wilt promise to stay very well said the afflicted one on that condition i'll stay End of chapter. Chapter Twenty One of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Twenty One. Upon the hill he turned. Having entered into this solemn compact with his son, the elder loved action was to go to Mrs. Garland and ask her how the toning down of the wedding had best be done. It is plain enough that to make merry just now would be slighting Bob's feelings, as if we didn't care who was not married, so long as we were. But then, what's to be done about the victuals? Give her dinner to the poor folk, she suggested. We can get everything used up that way. That's true, said the miller. There's enough of them in these times to carry off any extras whatsoever. And it will save Bob's feelings wonderfully. And they won't know that the dinner was got for another sort of wedding and another sort of guests, so you'll have their good will for nothing. The miller smiled at the subtlety of the view. That can hardly be called fair, he said. Still, I did mean some of it for them, for the friends we meant to ask would not have cleared all. Upon the whole, the eyes him well, particularly when he noticed the forlorn look of his sailor son as he walked about the place, and pictured the inevitable jarring effect of fiddles and tambourines upon Bob's shattered nerves at such a crisis, even if the notes of the former were dulled by the application of a mute, and Bob shut up in a distant bedroom, a plan which had at first occurred to him. 
he therefore told Bob that the surcharged larder was to be emptied by the charitable process above alluded to, and hoped he would not mind making himself useful in such a good and gloomy work. Bob readily fell in with the scheme, and it was at once put in hand, and the tables spread. The alacrity with which the substituted wedding was carried out seemed to show that the worthy pair of neighbours would have joined themselves into one long ago, had there previously occurred any domestic incident dictating such a step as an apposis expedient, apart from their personal wish to marry. The appointed morning came, and the service quietly took place at the cheerful hour of ten, in the face of a triangular congregation, of which the base was the front pew and the apex the west door. Mrs. Garland dressed herself in the muslin shawl like Queen Charlotte's that Bob had brought home, and her best plum gown, beneath which peeped out her shoes with red rosettes. Anne was present, but she considerately could toned herself down so as not too seriously to damage her mother's appearance. At moments during the ceremony she had a distressing sense that she ought not to be born, and was glad to get home again. The interest excited in the village, though real, was hardly enough to bring a serious blush to the face of coyness. Neighbours' minds had become so saturated by the abundance of showy military and regal incident lately vouchsafed to them, that the wedding of middle-aged civilians was of small account, excepting in so far that it solved the question whether or not Mrs. Garland would consider herself too genteel to mate with a grinder of corn. In the evening Loveday's heart was made glad by seeing the baked and boiled in rapid process of consumption by the kitchen full of people assembled for that purpose. Three quarters of an hour were sufficient to banish for ever his fears as to spoilt food. The provisions being the cause of the assembly and not its consequence, it had been determined to get all that would not keep consumed on that day, even if highways and hedges had to be searched for operators. And in addition to the poor and needy, every cottager's daughter known to the miller was invited, and told to bring her lover from camp, an expedient which, for letting daylight into the inside of full platters, was among the most happy ever known. While Mr. and Mrs. Loveday, Anne, and Bob were standing in the parlour discussing the progress of the entertainment in the next room, John, who had not been down all day, entered the house and looked in upon them through the open door. "'How's this, John? Why didn't you come before?' "'I had to see the captain and, and other duties.' said the trumpet major, in a tone which showed no great zeal for explanations. "'Well, come in, however,' continued the miller, as his son remained with his hand on the doorpost, surveying them reflectively. "'I, I cannot stay long,' said John, advancing. "'The route is come, and we are going away.' "'Going away? Where to?' "'To Exembury. "'When?' "'Friday morning.' "'All of you?' Uh, "'Yes, some to-morrow, and some next day. "'The, the king goes next week.' "'I am sorry for this,' said the mirror, not expressing half his sorrow to, by the simple utterance. "'I wish you could have been here to-day, since this is the case,' he added, looking at the horizon through the window. Mrs. Loveday also expressed her regret, which seemed to remind the trumpet-major of the event of the day, and he went to her and tried to say something befitting the occasion. Anne had not said that she was either sorry or glad, but John Loveday fancied that she had looked rather relieved than otherwise when she heard his news. His conversation with Bob on the down made Dob Bob's manner, too, remarkably cool, notwithstanding that he had, after all, followed his brother's advice, which it was as yet too soon after the event for him to rightly value. John did not know why the sailor had come back, never supposing that it was because he had thought better of going, and said to him privately, "'You didn't overtake her?' "'I didn't try to,' said Bob. "'And you're not going to?' "'No, I shall let her drift.' "'I'm glad indeed, Bob, you have been wise,' said Bob John heartily. Bob, however, still loved Matilda too well to be other than dissatisfied with John and the event that he had precipitated, which the older brother only too promptly perceived, and he made his stay that evening of Shin. Before leaving he said with some hesitation to his father, including Anne and her mother by his glance, "'Do you think to come up and see us off?' The miller answered for them all, and said that of course they would come. "'But you'll step down again between now and then?' he inquired. "'I'll try to,' he added after a pause. "'In case I should not, remember that Trevally will sound at half-past five. We shall leave about eight. 
"'Next summer, perhaps, we shall come and camp here again.' "'I hope so,' said his father and Mrs. Loveday. There was something in John's manner which indicated to Anne that he had scarcely intended to come down again, but the others did not notice it, and she said nothing. He departed a few minutes later, in the dusk of the August evening, leaving Anne still in doubt as to the meaning of his private meeting with Miss Johnson. John Loveday had been going to tell them that on the last night, on a special privilege, it would be in his power to come and stay with them until eleven o'clock. But at the moment of leaving he abandoned the intention. Anne's attitude had chilled him and made him anxious to be off. He utilised the spare hours of that last night in another way. This was by coming down from the outskirts of the camp in the evening and seating himself near the brink of the mill-pond as soon as it was quite dark, where he watched the lights in the different windows, till one appeared in Anne's bedroom, and she herself came forward to shut the casement with the candle in her hand. The light shone out upon the broad and deep mill-head, illuminating to a distinct individuality every moth and gnat that entered the quivering chain of radiance stretching across the water towards him, and every bubble or atom of froth that floated into its width. She stood for some time looking out, little thinking what the darkness concealed on the other side of that wide stream, till at length she closed the casement, drew the curtains, and retreated into the room. Presently the light went out, upon which John Loveday returned to camp and lay down in his tent. The next morning was dull and windy, and the trumpets of the Enth sounded reveille for the last time on Overcombe Down. Knowing that the dragoons were going away, Anne had slept heedfully, and was at once awakened by the smart notes. She looked out of the window, to find that the miller was already astir, his white form being visible at the end of his garden where he stood motionless, watching the preparations. Anne also looked on as well as she could through the dim grey gloom, and soon she saw the blue smoke from the cook's fires creeping fitfully along the ground, as it had done during the fine weather season. Then the men began to carry their bedding to the wagon, others to throw all refuse into the trenches, till the down was lively as an ant hill. Anne did not want to see John Loveday again but hearing the household astir, she began to dress at leisure, looking out at the camp the while. When the soldiers had breakfasted, she saw them selling and giving away their superfluous crockery to the natives who had clustered round, and then they pulled down and cleared away the temporary kitchen constructed when they came. A tapping of tent-pegs and wriggling of picket-posts followed, and soon the cones of white canvas, now almost become a component part of the landscape, fell to the ground. At this moment the miller came indoors, and asked at the foot of the stairs if anybody was going up the hill with him. Anne felt that, in spite of the cloud hanging over John in her mind, it would ill become the present moment not to see him off, and she went downstairs to her mother, who was already there, though Bob was nowhere to be seen. Each took an arm of the miller, and thus climbed to the top of the hill. By this time the men and horses were at the place of assembly, and, shortly after he reached at level ground, the troops slowly began to move forward. When the trumpet-major, half buried in his uniform, arms, and horse furniture, drew near to the spot where the Lovedays were waiting him past, his father turned anxiously to Anne and said, "'You will shake hands with John?' Anne faintly replied, "'Yes,' and allowed the miller to come forward on his arm to the trackway so as to be close to the flank of the approaching column. It came up, many people on each side grasping the hands of the troopers in bidding them farewell, and as soon as John Loveday saw the members of his father's household, he stretched down his hand across his right pistol for the same performance. The miller gave his, then Loveday gave hers, and then the hand of the trumpet major was extended towards Anne. But as the horse did not absolutely stop, it was a somewhat awkward performance for a young woman to undertake, and more on that account than on any other. Anne drew back, and the gallant trooper passed by without receiving her adieu. Anne's heart reproached her for a moment, and then she thought that, after all, he was not going off to immediate battle, and that she would in all probability see him again at no distant date, when she hoped that the mystery of his conduct would be explained. Her thoughts were interrupted by a voice at her elbow. "'Thank heaven he's gone! Now there's a chance for me!' She turned 
and Festus Derriman were standing by her. "'There's no chance for you,' she said indignantly. "'Why not?' "'Because there's another left.' The words had slipped out quite unintentionally, and she blushed quickly. She would have given anything to be able to recall them. But he heard, and said, "'Who?' Anne went forward to the miller to avoid replying, and Festus caught her no more. "'Has anybody been hanging around Overcombe Mill except Loveday's son, the soldier?' he asked of a comrade. "'His son, the sailor,' was the reply. "'Oh, his son, the sailor,' said Festus slowly. "'Damn his son, the sailor!' End of chapter 21 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 22 of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 22. The Two Households United. At this particular moment, the object of Festus Derriman's fulminate as a rival Bob, after abstractly watching the soldiers from the front of the house till they were out of sight, had gone within doors and seated himself in the mill-parlour, where his father found him, his elbows resting on the table, and his forehead on his hands, his eyes being fixed upon a document that lay open before him. "'What art perusing, Bob, with such a long face?' Bob sighed, and then Mrs. Loveday and Anne entered. "'Tis only a state paper that I fondly thought I should have a use for.' he said gloomily, and looking down as before, he cleared his voice, as if moved inwardly to go on, and began to read, in feeling tones, from what proved to be his nullified marriage licence. Timothy Titus Philemon, by permission Bishop of Bristol, to our well-beloved Robert Loveday of the parish of Overcombe, bachelor, and Matilda Johnson of the same parish, spinster, greeting. Here Anne sighed, but contrived to keep down her sigh to a mere nothing. "'Beautiful language, isn't it?' said Bob. "'I was never greeted like that afore.' "'Yes, I've often thought it very excellent language myself,' said Day. "'Come to that. The old gentleman will greet thee like it again any day for a couple of guineas,' said the miller. "'That's not the point, father. He never could see the real meaning of these things.' "'Well, then he goes on.' Whereas ye are, as it is alleged, determined to enter into the holy estate of matrimony. But why should I read on? It all means nothing now, nothing, and the splendid words are all wasted upon air. It seems as if I had been hailed by some venerable hoary fit, and had turned away, put the helm about, and wouldn't hear. Nobody replied, feeling probably that sympathy could not meet the case, and Bob went on reading the rest of it to himself, occasionally heaving a breath like the wind in a ship's shrouds. "'I wouldn't set my mind so much upon her, if I was thee,' said his father at last. "'Why not?' "'Well, folk might call thee a fool, and say thy brains were turning to water.' Bob was apparently much struck by this thought, and instead of continuing the discourse further, he carefully folded up the licence, went out, and walked up and down the garden. It was startlingly apt what his father had said, and worse than that, what people would call him might be true— and the liquefaction of his brains turn out to be no fable. By degrees he became much concerned, and the more he examined himself by this new light, the more clearly did he perceive that he was in a very bad way. On reflection he remembered that since Miss Johnson's departure his appetite had decreased amazingly. He had eaten in meat no more than fourteen or fifteen ounces a day, but one-third of a quartern pudding on an average— in vegetables only a small heap of potatoes and half a york cabbage, and no gravy whatever, which, considering the usual appetite of a seaman for fresh food at the end of a long voyage, was no small index of the depression of his mind. Then he had wait once every night, and on one occasion twice. While dressing each morning since the gloomy day, he had not whistled more than seven bars of a hornpipe without stopping and falling into thought of a most painful kind and he had told none but absolutely true stories of foreign parts to the neighbouring villagers when they saluted and clustered about him, as usual, for anything he chose to pour forth, except that story of the whale whose eye was about as large as the round pond in Derriman's Ulysse, which was like tempting fate to set a seal for ever upon his tongue as a traveller. 
all this innovation, mental and physical, had been produced by Matilda's departure. He also considered what he had lost of the rational amusements of manhood during these unfortunate days. He might have gone to the neighbouring fashionable resort every afternoon, stood before Gloucester Lodge till the King and Queen came out, held his hat in his hand, and enjoyed their Majesty's smile at his homage all for nothing. Watch the picket mounting, heard the different bands strike up, observe the staff, and above all, have seen the pretty town girls go trip, trip, trip along the esplanade, deliberately fixing their innocent eyes on the distant sea, the grey cliffs, and the sky, and accidentally on the soldiers and in himself. "'I'll raise her up my image,' he said. "'She shall make a fool of me no more.' And his resolve resulted in conduct which had elements of real greatness. He went back to his father, whom he found in the mill-loft. "'Tis true, father, what you say,' he observed. "'My brains will turn to bilge-water, or I think of her much longer. "'By the oath of a navigator, I wish I could sigh less and laugh more. "'She's gone. Why can't I let her go and be happy? "'But how begin?' "'Take it careless, my son,' said the miller, "'and lay yourself out to enjoy snacks and cordials.' "'Ah, that's a thought,' said Bob. "'Bucky is good for it, so are spirits, "'though I don't advise thee to drink neat.' "'Bucky, I'd almost forget it,' said Captain Loveday. "'He went to his room, hastily untied the package of tobacco "'that he had brought home, and began to make use of it in his own way, "'calling to David for a bottle of the old household mead "'that had lain in the cellar those eleven years.' He was discovered by his father, three-quarters of an hour later, as a half-invisible object behind a cloud of smoke. The miller drew a breath of relief. "'Why, Barb,' he said, "'I thought the house was afar.' "'I'm smoking rather fast to drown my reflections, father. "'Tis no use to chore.' To tempt his attenuated appetite, the unhappy mate made David cook an omelette and bake a seed-cake, the latter so richly compounded that it opened to the knife like a freckled buttercup. With the same object, he stuck night-lines into the banks of the mill-pond, and drew up next morning a family of fat eels, some of which were skinned and prepared for his breakfast. They were his favourite fish, but such had been his condition that until the moment of making this effort he had quite forgotten their existence at his father's back door. In a few days Bob Loveday had considerably improved in tone and vigour. One other obvious remedy for his dejection was to indulge in the society of Miss Garland, love being so much more effectually got rid of by displacement than by attempted annihilation. But Loveday's belief that he had offended her beyond forgiveness, and his ever-present sense of her as a woman who by education and antecedents was fitted to adorn a higher sphere than his own, effectually kept him from going near her for a long time, notwithstanding that they were inmates of one house. The reserve was, however, in some degree broken by the appearance one morning, later in the season, of the point of a saw through the partition which divided Anne's room from the Loveday half of the house. Though she dined and supped with her mother and the Loveday family, Miss Garland had still continued to occupy her old apartments, because she found it more convenient there to pursue her hobbies of woolwork and of copying her father's old pictures. The division wall had not, as yet, been broken down. As the saw worked its way downwards under her astonished gaze, Anne jumped up from her drawing, and presently the temporary canvassing and papering which had sealed up the old door of communication was cut completely through. The door burst open, and Bob stood revealed on the other side, with the saw in his hand. "'I beg your ladyship's pardon,' he said, taking off the hat he had been working in, as his handsome face expanded into a smile. "'I didn't know this door opened into your private room.' "'Indeed, Captain Loveday.' "'I'm putting down a division on principle, as we are now one family. "'But I really thought the door opened into your passage.' "'It don't matter. I can get another room.' "'Not at all. Father wouldn't let me turn you out. I'll, I'll close it up again.' But Anne was so interested in the novelty of a new doorway that she walked through it, and found herself in a dark, low passage which she had never seen before. "'It leads to the mill,' said Bob. "'Would you like to go in and see it at work? Oh, "'But perhaps you have already.' "'Only into the ground floor.' "'Come all over it. 
I am practising as grinder, you know, to help my father. She followed him along the dark passage, in the side of which she opened a little trap, when she saw a great slimy cavern, where the long arms of the mill-wheel flung themselves slowly and distractedly round, and splashing water-drops caught the little light that strayed into the gloomy place, turning it into stars and flashes. A cold, mist-laden puff of air came into their faces, and the roar from within made it necessary for Anne to shout as she said, "'It is dismal! Let us go on!' Bob shut the trap, the roar ceased, and they went on to the inner part of the mill, where the air was warm and nutty, and pervaded by a fog of flour. Then they ascended the stairs, and saw the stones lumbering round and round, and the yellow corn running down through the hopper. They climbed yet further to the top stage, where the wheat lay in bins, and where long rays, like feelers stretched in from the sun through the little window, got nearly lost among cobwebs and timber, and completed their course by marking the opposite wall with a glowing patch of gold. In his earnestness as an exhibitor, Bob opened the bolter, which was spinning rapidly round, the result being that of a dense cloud of flour rolled out in their faces, reminding Anne that her complexion was probably much paler by this time than when she had entered the mill. She thanked her companion for his trouble, and said she would now go down. He followed her with the same deference as hitherto, and with a sudden and increasing sense that of all cures for his former unhappy passion, this would have been the nicest, the easiest, and the most effectual, if he had only been fortunate enough to keep her upon easy terms. But Miss Garland showed no disposition to go further than accept his services as a guide. She descended to the open air, shook the flower from her like a bird, and went on into the garden amid the September sunshine, whose rays lay level across the blue haze which the earth gave forth. The gnats were dancing up and down in airy companies, the nasturtium flowers shone out in groups from the dark hedge over which they climbed, and the mellow smell of the decline of summer was exhaled by everything. Bob followed her as far as the gate, looked after her, thought of her as the same girl who had half encouraged him years ago, when she seemed so superior to him, though now they were almost equal, she apparently thought him beneath her. It was with a new sense of pleasure that his mind flew to the fact that she was now an inmate of his father's house. His obsequious bearing was continued during the next week. In the busy hours of the day they seldom met, but they regularly encountered each other at meals, and these cheerful occasions began to have an interest for him quite irrespective of dishes and cups. When Anne entered and took her seat she was always loudly hailed by Miller Loveday as he wetted his knife but from Bob she condescended to accept no such familiar greeting, and they often sat down together as if each had a blind eye in the direction of the other. Bob sometimes told serious and correct stories about sea captains, pilots, boatswains, mates, able seamen, and other curious fauna of the marine world, but these were directly addressed to his father and Mrs. Loveday, and being included at the clinching point by a glance only. He sometimes opened bottles of sweet cider for her, and then she thanked him, but even this did not lead her and cut. One day, when Anne was paring an apple, she was left at the table with the young man. "'I've made something for you,' he said. She looked all over the table. Nothing was there save the ordinary remnants. "'Oh, I don't mean that it is here. It's out by the bridge at the mill-head.' He arose and Anne followed with curiosity in her eyes, and with her firm little mouth pouted up to a puzzled shape. On reaching the mossy mill-head she found that he had fixed it the keen, damp draught which always prevailed over the wheel, an aeolian harp of large size. At present the strings were partly covered with a cloth. He lifted it, and the wires began to emit a weird harmony which mingled curiously with the plashing of the wheel. "'I made it on purpose for you, Miss Garland,' he said. She thanked him very warmly, for she had never seen anything like such an instrument before, and it interested her. "'It was very thoughtful of you to make it,' she added. "'How came you to think of such a thing?' "'Oh, I, I don't know exactly,' he replied, as if he did not care to be questioned on the point. "'I've never made one in my life till now.' 
Every night after this, during the mournful gales of autumn, the strange mixed music of water, wind, and strings met her ear, swelling and sinking with an almost supernatural cadence. The character of the instrument was far enough removed from anything she had hitherto seen of Bob's hobbies, so that she marvelled pleasantly at the new depths of poetry this contrivance revealed as existent in that young seaman's nature, and allowed her emotions to flow out yet a little further in the old direction, notwithstanding her late severe resolve to bar them back. One breezy night, when the mill was kept going into the small hours and the wind was exactly in the direction of the water-current, the music so mingled with her dreams as to wake her. It seemed to rhythmically set itself to the words, Remember me, think of me. She was much impressed. The sounds were almost too touching. And she spoke to Bob the next morning on the subject. How strange it is that you should have thought of fixing that harp where the water gushes, she gently observed. It affects me almost painfully at night. You are poetical, Captain Bob, but it is too, too sad. I'll take it away, said Captain Bob promptly. It certainly is too sad, and I thought so myself. I myself was kept awake by it one night. How came you to think of making such a peculiar thing? Well, said Bob, it's hardly worth saying why. It's not a good place for such a queer, noisy machine, and I'll take it away. On second thoughts, said Anne, I should like it to remain a little longer, because it sets me thinking. Of me? he asked with earnest frankness. Anne's colour rose fast. Well, yes, she said, trying to infuse much plain matter-of-fact into her voice. Of course I am led to think of the person who invented it. Bob seemed unaccountably embarrassed, and the subject was not pursued. About half an hour later he came to her again with something of an uneasy look. "'There was a little matter I didn't tell you just now, Miss Garland,' he said, "'about that harp thing, I mean. "'I did make it, certainly, but it was my brother John who asked me to do it, "'just before he went away. "'John's very musical, as you know, and he said it would interest you. "'But as he didn't ask me to tell, I did not. "'Perhaps I ought to have, and not have taken the credit to myself.' "'Oh, it is nothing,' said Anne quickly. "'It is a very incomplete instrument, after all, "'and it will just as well for you to take it away as you first proposed.' He said that he would, but he forgot to do it that day, and the following night there was a high wind, and the harp cried and moaned so movingly that Anne, whose window was quite near, could hardly bear the sound with its new associations. John Loveday was present to her mind all night as an ill-used man, and yet she could not own that she had ill-used him. The harp was removed next day. Bob, feeling that his credit for originality was damaged in her eyes by way of recovering it, set himself to paint the summer-house which Anne frequented, and when he came out he assured her that it was quite his own idea. "'It wanted doing, certainly,' she said in a neutral tone. "'It is just about troublesome.' "'Yes, you can't quite reach up. That's because you're not very tall, is it not, Captain Loveday?' "'You never used to say things like that.' "'Oh, I don't mean that you are much less than tall. "'Shall I hold the paint for you to save you stepping down?' "'Thank you, if you would.' She took the paint-pot, and stood looking at the brush as it moved up and down in his hand. "'I hope I shall not sprinkle your fingers,' he observed as he dipped. "'Oh, that would not matter. You do it very well.' "'I'm glad to hear that you think so. "'But perhaps not quite so much art is demanded to paint a summer-house as to paint a picture?' Thinking that, as a painter's daughter and a person of education superior to his own, she spoke with a flavour of sarcasm, he felt humble and said, "'You did not use to talk like that to me.' "'I was perhaps too young then to take any pleasure in giving pain,' she observed daringly. "'Does it give you pleasure?' Anne nodded. "'I liked to give pain to people who have given pain to me,' she said smartly without removing her eyes from the green liquid in her hand. "'I ask your pardon for that. I, I didn't say I meant you, though I did mean you.' Bob looked and looked at her side face till he was bewitched into putting down his brush. "'It was that stupid forgetting of ye for a time,' he exclaimed. 
"'Well, I, I hadn't seen you for so very long. Consider how many years.' "'Oh, dear Anne,' he said, advancing to take her hand, "'how well we knew one another when we were children. "'You was a queen to me then, and so you are now, and always.' "'Possibly Anne was thrilled pleasantly enough "'at having brought the truant village lad to her feet again, "'but he was not to find the situation so easy as he imagined, "'and her hand was not to be taken yet. "'Very pretty,' she said, laughing, "'and only six weeks since Miss Johnson left.' "'Zones don't say anything about that,' implored Bob. "'I swear that I never, never deliberately loved her. "'For a long time together, that is. It, "'It was a sudden sort of thing, you know. "'But towards you, I have more or less honoured and respectfully loved you, "'off and on, all my life. "'There, that's true,' Anne retorted quickly. "'I am willing, off and on, to believe you, Captain Robert, "'but I don't see any good in your making these solemn declarations.' "'Give me leave to explain, dear Miss Garland. "'It is to get you to be pleased to renew an old promise, made years ago, that you'll think of me.' "'Not a word of any promise will I repeat. "'Well, well, I won't urge you to-day. "'Only let me beg of you to get over the quite wrong notion you have of me, "'and it shall be my whole endeavour to fetch your gracious favour. "'Anne turned away from him and entered the house.' Whither, in the course of a quarter of an hour, he followed her, knocking at her door, and asking to be let in. She said she was busy, whereupon he went away, to come back again in a short time, and receive the same answer. "'I have finished painting the summer-house for you,' he said through the door. "'I cannot come to see it. I shall be engaged till supper-time.' She heard him breathe a heavy sigh, and withdraw, murmuring something about his bad luck in being cut away from the starn like this. But it was not over yet. When supper-time came and they sat down together, she took upon herself to reprove him for what he had said to her in the garden. Bob made his forehead express despair. "'Now I, I beg you this one thing,' he said. "'Just let me know your whole mind. Then I shall have a chance to confess my faults and mend them, or clear my conduct to your satisfaction.' She answered with quickness, but not loud enough to be heard by the old people at the other end of the table. "'Then, Captain Loveday, I will tell you one thing, one fault, that perhaps should have been given more proper to my character than to yours. You are too easily impressed by new faces, and that gives me a bad opinion of you. Yes, a bad opinion.' "'Oh, that's it,' said Bob slowly, looking at her with the intense respect of a pupil for a master, her words been spoken in a manner so precisely between jest and earnest that he was in some doubt how they were to be received. Impressed by new faces. Hmm. It is wrong, certainly, of me. The popping of a cork and the pouring out of strong beer by the miller with a view to giving it a head were apparently distractions sufficient to excuse her in not attending further to him. And, during the remainder of the sitting, her gentle chiding seemed to be sinking seriously into his mind. Perhaps her own heart ached to see how silent he was, but she had always meant to punish him. Day after day, for two or three weeks, she preserved the same demeanour, with a self-control which did justice to her character. And on his part, considering what he had put up with, how she eluded him, snapped him off, refused to come out when he called her, refused to see him when he wanted to enter the little parlour which she now appropriated to her private use. His patience testified strongly to his good humour. End of chapter 22 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 23 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 23 Military Preparations on an Extended Scale Christmas had passed. Dreary winter with dark evenings had given place to more dreary winter with light evenings. Rapid thaws had ended in rain. Rain in wind, wind in dust. Showery days had come, the season of pink dawns and white sunsets, and people hoped that the March weather was over. 
The chief incident that concerned the household of the mill was that the miller, following the example of all his neighbours, had become a volunteer, and duly appeared twice a week in a red, long tailoredry coat, piped clutches, black cloth gaiters, a heel-balled helmet hat with a tuft of green wool, and epaulettes of the same colour and material. Bob still remained neutral. Not being able to decide whether to enrol himself as a sea fencible, a local militia man, or a volunteer, he simply went on dancing attendance upon Anne. Mrs. Loveday had become awake to the fact that the pair of young people stood in a curious attitude towards each other, but as they were never with their heads together or sat even in the same room, she could not be sure what their movements meant. Strangely enough, or perhaps naturally enough, since entering the Loveday family herself, she had gradually grown to think less favourably of Anne doing the same thing, and reverted to her original idea of encouraging Festus. This more particularly because he had of late shown such perseverance in haunting the precincts of the mill, presumably with the intention of lighting upon the young girl. But the weather had kept her mostly indoors. One afternoon it was raining in torrents. Such leaves as there were on trees at this time of year, those of the laurel and other evergreens, staggered beneath the hard blows of the drops which fell upon them, and afterwards could be seen trickling down the stems beneath and silently entering the ground. The surface of the mill-pond leapt up in a thousand spurts under the same downfall, and clucked like a hen in the rat-holes along the banks as it undulated under the wind. The only dry spot visible from the front windows of the mill-house was the inside of a small shed on the opposite side of the courtyard. While Mrs. Loveday was noticing the threads of rain descending across its interior shade, Festus Derriman walked up and entered it for shelter, which, owing to the lumber within, it but scantily afforded to a man who would have been a match for one of Frederick Williams's Patagonians. It was an excellent opportunity for helping on her scheme. Anne was in the back room, and by asking him in till the rain was over, she would bring him face to face with her daughter, whom, as the days went on, she increasingly wished to marry other than a love day, now that the romance of her own alliance with the miller had in some respects worn off. She was better provided for than before, she was not unhappy, but the plain fact was that she had married beneath her. She beckoned to Festus through the window-pane. He instantly complied with her signal, having in fact placed himself there on purpose to be noticed, for he knew that Miss Garland would not be out of doors on such a day. Uh, "'Good afternoon, Mrs. Loveday,' said Festus on entering. "'There now, if I didn't think that's how it would be.' His voice had suddenly warmed to anger, for he had seen a door close in the back part of the room, a lithe figure having previously slipped through. Mrs. Lovedale turned, observed that Anne was gone, and said, "'What is it?' as if she did not know. "'Oh, nothing, nothing,' said Festus crossly. "'You know well enough what it is, ma'am. How do you make pretence otherwise? But I'll bring her to book yet. You shall drop your haughty airs, my charmer. She little thinks I have kept an account of a wall.' "'But you must treat her politely, sir,' said Mrs. Loveday, secretly pleased at these signs of uncontrollable affection. "'Don't tell me of politeness or generosity, ma'am. "'She's more than a match for me. "'She regularly gets over me. "'I've passed by this house five and fifty times since last Martin Mass, "'and this is all my reward for it.' "'But you will stay till the rain is over, sir.' "'No, I don't mind rain. "'I'm off again. "'She's got somebody else in her eye.' "'And the yeoman went out, slamming the door. "'Meanwhile, the slippery object of his hopes "'had gone along the dark passage, "'passed the trap which opened on the wheel, and through the door into the mill, where she was met by Bob, who looked up from the flower shoot inquiringly and said, "'You want me, Miss Garland?' "'Oh, no,' said she. "'I only want to be allowed to stand here for a few minutes.' He looked at her to know if she meant it, and, finding that she did, returned to his post. When the mill had rumbled on a little longer, he came back. "'Bob,' she said, when she saw him move, "'remember that you are at work and have no time to stand close to me.' He bowed, and went to his original post again, and watching from the window till Festus should leave. The mill rumbled on as before, and at last Bob came to her for the third time. "'Now, Bob,' she began, "'on my honour it is only to ask a question. 
Will you walk with me to church next Sunday afternoon? Perhaps I will, she said. But at this moment the yeoman left the house, and Anne, to escape further parley, returned to the dwelling by the way she had come. Sunday afternoon arrived, and the family were standing at the door waiting for the church bells to begin. From that side of the house they could see southward across a paddock to the rising ground further ahead, where there grew a large elm tree, beneath whose boughs footpaths crossed in different directions, like meridians at the pole. The tree was old, and in summer the grass beneath it was quite trodden away by the feet of the many tristers and idlers who haunted the spot. The tree formed a conspicuous object in the surrounding landscape. While they looked, a foot-soldier in red uniform and white breeches came along one of the paths, and stopping beneath the elm, took from his pocket a paper, which he proceeded to nail up by the four corners to the trunk. He drew back, looked at it, and went on his way. Bob got his glass from indoors and levelled it at the placard, but after looking for a long time he could make out nothing but a lion and a unicorn at the top. Anne, who was ready for church, moved away from the door, though it was yet early, and showed her intention of going by way of the elm. The paper had been so impressively nailed up that she was curious to read it, even at this theological time. Bob took the opportunity of following, and reminded her of her promise. "'They're more behind me, not at all close,' she said. "'Yes,' he replied, immediately dropping behind. The ludicrous humility of his manner led her to add playfully over her shoulder, "'It serves you right, you know.' "'I deserve anything, but I must take the liberty to say that I hope my behaviour above Matil, in forgetting you a while, will not make ye wish to keep me always behind.' She replied confidentially, "'Why I am so earnest not to be seen with you is that I may appear to people to be independent of you. Knowing what I do of your weaknesses, I can do no otherwise.' "'You must be schooled into—' "'Oh, Anne,' sighed Bob, "'you hit me hard, too hard. "'If ever I do win you, I am sure I shall have fairly earned you.' "'You are not what you once seemed to be,' she returned softly. "'I don't quite like to let myself love you.' The last words were not very audible, and as Bob was behind he caught nothing of them, nor did he see how sentimental she had become all of a sudden. They walked the rest of the way in silence, and coming to the tree— read as follows. Address to all ranks and descriptions of Englishmen, friends and countrymen. The French are now assembling the largest force that ever was prepared to invade this kingdom with the professed purpose of effecting our complete ruin and destruction. They do not disguise their intentions, as they have often done to other countries, but openly boast that they will come over in such numbers as cannot be resisted. Wherever the French have lately appeared, they have spared neither rich nor poor, old nor young, but, like a destructive pestilence, have laid waste and destroyed everything that before was fair and flourishing. On this occasion no man's service is compelled, but you are invited voluntarily to come forward in defence of everything that is dear to you, by entering your names on the lists which are sent to the tithing man of every parish, and engaging to act either as associated volunteers bearing arms, as pioneers and labourers, or as drivers of wagons. As associated volunteers you will be called up only once a week, unless the actual landing of the enemy shall render your further services necessary. As pioneers or labourers, you will be employed in breaking up roads to hinder the enemy's advance. Those who have pickaxes, spades, shovels, billhooks, or other working implements, are desired to mention them to the constable or tithing man of their parish, in order that they may be entered on the lists opposite their homes to be used if necessary. It is thought desirable to give you this explanation, that you may not be ignorant of the duties to which you may be called. But, if the love of true liberty and honest fame has not ceased to animate the hearts of Englishmen, pay, though necessary, will be the least part of your reward. You will find your best recompense in having done your duty to your king and country by driving back or destroying your old and implacable enemy, envious of your freedom and happiness, and therefore seeking to destroy them, in having protected your wives and children from death or worse than death, which will follow the success of such inveterate foes. Rouse, therefore, 
and unite as one man in the best of causes. United, we may defy the world to conquer us, but victory will never belong to those who are slothful and unprepared. I must go and join at once, said Bob. Anne turned to him, all the playfulness gone from her face. I wish we lived in the north of England, Bob, so as to be further away from where he'll land, she murmured uneasily. Where we are would be paradise to me, if you would only make it so. It is not right to talk so lightly at such a serious time, she thoughtfully returned, going on towards the church. On drawing near, they saw through the boughs of a clump of intervening trees, still leafless, but bursting into buds of amber hue, a glittering which seemed to be reflected from points of steel. In a few moments they heard, above the tender chiming of the church bells, the loud voice of a man giving words of command, at which all the metallic points suddenly shifted like the bristles of a porcupine, and listened anew. "'Tis the drilling,' said Loveday. "'They drill now between the services, you know, because they can't get the men together so readily in the week. It makes me feel that I ought to be doing more than I am.' When they passed round the belt of trees, the company of recruits became visible, consisting of the able-bodied inhabitants of the hamlets thereabout, more or less known to Bob and Anne. They were assembled on the green plot outside the churchyard gate, dressed in their common clothes, and the sergeant, who had been putting them through their drill, was the man who nailed up the proclamation. He was now engaged in untying a canvas money-bag, from which he drew forth a handful of shillings, giving one to each man, in payment for his attendance. "'Men, I dismissed ye too soon. Parade, parade again, I say,' he cried. "'My watch is fast, I find. There's another twenty minutes afore the worship of God commences. Now all of you that ha'n't got farlocks, fall in at the lower end. Eyes right, and dress.' As every man was anxious to see how the rest stood, those at the end of the line pressed forward for that purpose, till the line assumed the form of a bow. "'Look at ye now!' "'Why, you're all crooking in! Dress! Dress!' They dressed forthwith, but impelled by the same motive, they soon resumed their former figure, and so they were despairingly permitted to remain. "'Now, I hope you'll have a little patience,' said the sergeant, as he stood in the centre of the ark, "'and pay strict attention to the word of command, just exactly as I give it out to ye. "'And if I should go wrong, I should be much obliged to any friend who will put me right again.' I have only been in the army three weeks myself, and we are all liable to mistakes. "'So we be! So we be!' said the lion heartily. "'Tension! The hull, then. Boys, forelocks! Very well done!' "'Please, what must we do? There ain't got no forelocks!' said the lower end of the line, in a helpless voice. "'Now, always ever such a question. Why, you must do nothing at all, but think how you'd pose them if you had them.' Uh, you middlemen that are armed with hurdle sticks and cabbage stumps just to make believe must of course use them if they were a real thing. Now then, cock, forelocks, present, fire, uh, pretend to, I mean, and at the same time throw your imagination into the fuel of battle. Very good, very good indeed, except that some of you were a little too soon and the rest a little too late. Please, sergeant, can I fall out? "'as I'm master player in the choir, "'and my bass vile strings don't stand at this time of year, "'unless they be screwed up a little before the parson comes in.' "'How can you think of such trifles as church-going at such a time as this, "'when your own native country is on the point of invasion?' "'said the sergeant sternly. "'And as you know, the drill ends three minutes afore church begins, "'and that's the law, and it wants a quarter of an hour yet. "'Now, at the word prime, shake the powder, "'supposing you've got it, into the priming pan,' Three last fingers behind the rammer, then shut your pans, drawing your right arm nimble-like towards your body. I ought to have told you before this that at hand your cartridge, seize it, and bring it with a quick motion to your mouth, bite the top well off, and don't swallow so much of the powder as to make ye hawk and spet instead of attending to your drill. What's that a man are saying of in the rear rank? Uh, please, sir, it is Anthony Cripplestraw, wanting to know how he's to bite off his cartridge when he hasn't a tooth left in his head. "'Man! Why, what's your genius for war? Hold it up to your right-hand man's mouth, to be sure, and let him nip it off for ye. "'Well, what have you to say, Private Tremlett? Don't ye understand English?' "'Ask your pardon, Sergeant, but what must we infantry of the awkward squad do if Boney comes afore we get our farlocks?' 
"'Take a pike like the rest of the incapables. "'You'll find a straw of them ready in the corner of the church tower. "'Now then, shoulder! "'There they be tinging in the parson!' exclaimed David, Miller Loveday's man, "'who also formed one of the company, "'as the bells changed from chiming all three together "'to a quick beating of one. "'The whole line drew a breath of relief, "'threw down their arms, and began running off. "'Well, then, I must dismiss ye,' said the sergeant. "'Come back! Come back!' "'Next drill is Tuesday afternoon at four. "'And mind, if your masters won't let ye leave work soon enough, "'tell me, and I'll write a line to government. "'Tension. To the right. Left. Wheel. I mean, no, no, right wheel. March!' "'Some wheel to the right, and some to the left, "'and some obliging men, including Cripplestraw, "'tried to wheel both ways. "'Stop! Stop! Try again! "'Croots and comrades, unfortunately when I'm in a hurry "'I can never remember your right hand from your left, "'and never could as a boy. "'You must excuse me, please. "'Practice makes perfect, as the saying is. "'Much as I've learnt since I listed, "'we always find something new. "'Now then. "'Right. Wheel. March. Halt. Stand at. Ease. Dis. Miss. "'I think that's the order it, "'but I'll look in the government book afore Tuesday.' "'Many of the company who had been drilled preferred to go off and spend their shillings instead of entering the church, but Anne and Captain Bob passed in. Even the interior of the sacred edifice was affected by the agitation of the times. The religion of the country had, in fact, changed from love of God to hatred of Napoleon Bonaparte, and as to remind the devout of this alteration, the pikes for the pikemen, all those accepted men who were not otherwise armed, were kept in the church of each parish. There, against the wall, they always stood, a whole sheaf of them formed of new ash stems, with a spike driven in at one end, the stick being preserved from splitting by a ferule. And there they remained, year after year, in the corner of the aisle, till they were removed and placed under the gallery stairs, and thence ultimately to the belfry, where they grew black, rusty, and worm-eaten, and were gradually stolen and carried off by sextons, parish clerks, whitewashers, window-menders, and other church servants, for use at home as rake-stems, benefit-club staves, and pick-handles, in which degraded situations they may still occasionally be found. But in their new and shining state they had a terror for Anne, whose eyes were involuntarily drawn towards them as she sat at Bob's side during the service, filling her with bloody visions of their possible use not far from the very spot on which they were now assembled. The sermon, too, was on the subject of patriotism, so that when they came out she began to harp uneasily upon the probability of their all being driven from their homes. Bob assured her that with the sixty thousand regulars, the militia reserve of a hundred and twenty thousand, and the three hundred thousand volunteers, there was not much to fear. "'But I sometimes have a fear that poor John will be killed,' he continued after a pause. "'He's sure to be among the first that will have to face the invaders, and the trumpeters get picked off.' "'There is the same chance for him as for the others,' said Anne. "'Yes, yes, the same chance, such as it is. "'You have never liked John since that affair of Matilda Johnson, have you?' "'Why?' she quickly asked. "'Well,' said Bob timidly, "'as it is a ticklish time for him, "'would it be not worth while to make up any differences before the crash comes?' "'I have nothing to make up,' said Anne, with some distress. She still fully believed the trumpet-major to have smuggled away Miss Johnson because of his own interest in that lady, which must have made his professions to her a mere pastime. But that very conduct had in it the curious advantage to herself of setting Bob free. "'Since John has been gone,' continued her companion, "'I have found out more of his meaning, and of what he really had to do with that woman's flight. Do you know that he had anything to do with it?' "'Yes.' "'That he got her to go away?' "'She looked at Bob with surprise. "'He was not exasperated with John, "'and yet he knew so much as this. "'Yes,' she said. "'What did it mean?' "'He did not explain to her then. "'But the possibility of John's death, "'which had been newly brought home to him "'by the military events of the day, "'determined him to get poor John's character cleared. "'Reproaching himself for letting her remain so long "'with a mistaken idea of him, Bob went to his father as soon as they got home, and begged him to get Mrs. Loveday to tell Anne the true reason of John's objection to Miss Johnson as a sister-in-law. 
"'She thinks it is because they were old lovers new met, and that he wants to marry her,' he exclaimed to his father in conclusion. "'And that's the meaning of the split between Miss Jones, Nancy, and Jack,' said the miller. "'What? Were there any more than common friends?' asked Bob uneasily. "'Not on her side, perhaps.' "'Well, we must do it,' replied Bob, painfully conscious that common justice to John might bring them into hazardous rivalry, yet determined to be fair. "'Tell it all to Mrs. Loveday, and get her to tell Anne.' End of chapter 23 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 24 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet by Thomas Hardy Chapter 24 A Letter, A Visitor, and a tin box. The result of the explanation upon Anne was bitter self-reproach. She was so sorry at having wronged the kindly soldier, that next morning she went by herself to the down, and stood exactly where his tent had covered the sod on which he had lain so many nights, thinking what sadness he must have suffered because of her at the time of packing up and going away. After that she wiped from her eyes the tears of pity which had come there, descended to the house, and wrote an impulsive letter to him, in which occurred the following passages, indiscreet enough under the circumstances. I find all justice, all rectitude, on your side, John, and all impertinence, all inconsiderateness, on mine. I am much convinced of your honour in the whole transaction, that I shall for the future mistrust myself in everything. And if it be possible, whenever I differ from you on any point, I should take an hour's time for consideration before I say that I differ. If I have lost your friendship, I have only myself to thank for it. But I sincerely hope that you can forgive. After writing this, she went to the garden, where Bob was shearing the spring grass from the paths. "'What is John's direction?' she said, holding the sealed letter in her hand. "'Exembury Barracks.' Bob faltered, his countenance sinking. She thanked him and went indoors. When he came in, later in the day, he passed the door of her empty sitting-room and saw the letter on the mantelpiece. He disliked the sight of it. Hearing voices in the other room, he entered and found Anne and her mother there, talking to Cripplestraw, who had just come in with a message from Squire Derriman, requesting Miss Garland, as she valued the peace of mind of an old and troubled man, to go at once and see him. "'I cannot go,' she said, not liking the risk that such a visit involved. An hour later, Cripplestraw shambled again into the passage on the same errand. "'Maister's very poorly, and he hopes that you'll come, Mrs. Anne. He wants to see you very particular about the French.' Anne would have gone in a moment, but for the fear that someone besides the farmer might encounter her, and she answered as before. Another hour passed and the wheels of a vehicle were heard. Cripplestraw had come for the third time, with a horse and gig. He was dressed in his best clothes, and brought with him on this occasion a basket containing raisins, almonds, oranges, and sweet cakes. Offering them to her as a gift from the old farmer, he repeated his request for her to accompany him, the gig and best mare having been sent as an additional inducement. "'I believe the old gentleman is in love with you, Anne,' said her mother. "'Why couldn't he drive down himself to see me?' Anne inquired of Cripplestraw. "'He wants you at the house, please.' I "'Is Mr. Festus with him?' "'No, he's away to Budmouth.' "'I'll go,' said she. "'And I may come and meet you,' said Bob. "'There's my letter. What shall I do about that?' she said, instead of answering him. "'Take my letter to the post-office, and you may come,' she added. He said yes, and went out, Cripplestraw retreating to the door, till she should be ready. "'What letter is it?' said her mother. "'Only one to John,' said Anne. "'I have asked him to forgive my suspicions. I could do no less.' "'Do you want to marry him?' asked Mrs. Loveday, bluntly. "'Mother!' "'Well, he will take that letter as an encouragement. Can't you see that he will, you foolish girl?' Anne did see instantly. "'Of course,' she said. "'Tell Robert that he need not go.' 
she went to her room to secure the letter. It was gone from the mantelpiece, and on inquiry it was found that the miller, seeing it there, had sent Davy with it to Badmouth hours ago. Anne said nothing, and set out for Oxwell Hall with Cripplestraw. "'William,' said Mrs. Loveday to the miller, when Anne was gone and Bob had resumed his work in the garden, "'did you get that letter sent off on purpose?' "'Well, I did. I wanted to make sure of it. John likes her, and now twill be made up, and why shouldn't he marry her? I'll start him in business, if so be she'll have him.' "'But she is likely to marry Festus Derriman.' "'I don't want her to marry anybody but John,' said the miller, doggedly. "'Not if she is in love with Bob, and as Beer has been for years, and he with her?' asked his wife triumphantly. "'In love with Bob, and he with her?' repeated Loveday. "'Certainly,' said she, going off and leaving him to his reflections. When Anne reached the hall, she found old Mr. Derriman in his customary chair. His complexion was more ashen, but his movement, in rising at her entrance, putting a chair and shutting the door behind her, were much the same as usual. "'Thank God you've come, my dear girl,' he said earnestly. "'Ah, you don't trip across to read to me now. Why did he cost me so much to fetch you? Fie! A horse and gig and a man's time in going three times? And what I sent ye cost a good deal in Budmouth Market. Now everything is so dear there, and twould have cost more if I hadn't bought the raisins and oranges some months ago when they were cheaper. I tell you this because we are old friends, and I have nobody else to tell my troubles to. But I don't begrudge anything to ye since you've come.' "'I am not much pleased to come even now,' said she. "'What can make you so seriously anxious to see me?' "'Will you be a good girl and true, "'and I have been thinking that of all people of the next generation that I can trust, "'you are the best. "'Tis my bonds and my title deeds, such as they be, "'and the leases, you know, and a few guineas in packets, "'and more than these, my will, that I have to speak about. "'Now do ye come this way?' "'Oh, such things as those,' she returned with surprise. "'I don't understand those things at all.' "'There's nothing to understand. "'Tis just this. "'The French will be here within two months, that's certain. "'I have it on the best authority that the army at Boulogne is ready, "'the boats equipped, the plans laid, "'and the First Consul only waits for a tide. "'Heaven knows what will become of the men over these parts. "'But most likely the women will be spared. "'Now I'll show ye.' "'He led her across the hall to a stone staircase of semicircular plan "'which conducted to the cellars. "'Down here,' she said, "'Yes, I must trouble ye to come down here. "'I have thought and thought was the woman that can best keep a secret for six months, "'and I say, Anne Garland. "'You won't be married before then?' "'Oh, no,' murmured the young woman. "'I wouldn't expect ye to keep a close tongue after such a thing as that, "'but it will not be necessary.' "'When they reached the bottom of the steps, "'he struck a light from a tinder-box "'and unlocked the middle one of three doors "'which appeared in the whitewashed wall opposite.' The rays of the candle fell upon the vault and sides of a long, low cellar, littered with decayed woodwork from other parts of the hall, among the rest stair balusters, carved finials, tracery panels, and wainscoting. But what most attracted her eye was a small flagstone turned up in the middle of the floor, a heap of earth beside it, and a measuring tape. Derriman went to the corner of the cellar and pulled out a clamped box from under the straw. "'You be rather heavy, my dear, eh?' he said, affectionately addressing the box as he lifted it. "'But you're going to be put in a safe place, you know, or that rascal will get hold of ye, and he carry ye off and ruin me.' He then with some difficulty lowered the box into the hole, raked in the earth upon it, and lowered the flagstone, which he was a long time in fixing to his satisfaction. Miss Garland, who was romantically interested, helped him to brush away the fragments of loose earth, and when he had scattered over the floor a little of the straw that lay about, they again ascended to upper air. "'Is that all, sir?' said Anne. Oh, "'Just a moment longer, honey. Would you come into the great parlour? She followed him thither. "'If anything happens to me while the fighting is going on, it may be on these very fields. You will know what to do,' he resumed. "'But first, please sit down again, there's a dear, while I write what's in my head.' See, there's the best paper, and a new quill that I've afforded myself for it. What a strange business! I don't think I, I much like it, Mr. Derriman, she said, seating herself. He had by this time begun to write, and murmured as he wrote. Twenty-three and a half from N.W., sixteen and three quarters from N.E. There, that's all. Now I seal it up, and give it to you to keep safe till I ask you for it, or you hear of my being trampled down by the enemy. 
"'What does it mean?' she asked, as she received the paper. "'Ha! <laughs> ha! Why, that's the distance of the box from the two corners of the cellar. I measured it before you came. And my honey, to make sure, if the French soldiery are after ye, tell your mother the meaning on it, or any other friend, in case they should put ye to death and the secret be lost. But that I am sure I hope they won't do, though your pretty face will be a sad bait to the soldiers. I often have wished you was my daughter, honey, and in these times the less cares a man has the better, so I am glad you bain't. Shall my man drive you home? No, 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 she said, much depressed by the words he had uttered. I can find my way. You need not trouble to come down. Then take care of the paper, and if you outlive me, you'll find I have not forgot ye. End of chapter 24 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 25 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 25 Festus Shows His Love Festus Derriman had remained in the royal watering-place all that day, his horse being sick at stables. But, wishing to coax or bully from his uncle a remount for the calming summer, he set off on foot for Oxwell early in the evening. When he drew near to the village, or rather to the hall, which was a mile from the village, he overtook a slim, quick-eyed woman sauntering along at a leisurely place. She was fashionably dressed in a green spencer with marmaluke sleeves, and wore a velvet Spanish hat and feather. "'Good afternoon to ye, ma'am,' said Festus, throwing a sword and pistol air into his greeting. "'You are out for a walk?' "'I am out for a walk, Captain,' said the lady, who had criticised him from the crevice of her eye, without seeming to do much more than continue her demure look forward, and gave the title as a sop to his apparent character. "'From the town? I'd swear it, ma'am, upon my honour I would.' "'Yes, I am from the town, sir,' said she. "'Ah, you are a visitor. I know every one of the regular inhabitants. We soldiers are in and out there continually. Festus Derriman, Yeomanry Cavalry, you know. The fact is, the watering-place is under our charge. The folks will be quite dependent upon us for their deliverance in the coming struggle. We hold our lives in our hands, and theirs, I may say, in our pockets. What made you come here, ma'am, at such a critical time?' "'I don't see that it is such a critical time.' "'Ah, but it is, though. And you'd say if you was as much mixed up with the military affairs of the nation as some of us.' The lady smiled. "'The King is coming this year, anyhow,' said she. "'Never,' said Festus firmly. "'Ah, you're one of the attendants at court, perhaps. Come on ahead to give the King's chambers ready, in case Bernie should not land?' "'No,' she said. "'I am connected with the theatre, though not just at the present moment.' I have been out of luck for the last year or two, but I have fetched up again. I join the company when they arrive for the season. Festus surveyed her with interest. And is it so? Well, ma'am, what part do you play? I am mostly the leading lady, the heroine, she said, drawing herself up with dignity. I'll come and have a look at ye, if all's well, and the landing is put f Hang me if I don't. Hello, hello, what do I see? His eyes were stretched towards a distant field, which Anne Garland was at that moment hastily crossing on her way from the hall to Overcombe. "'I must be off. Good day to ye, dear creature,' he exclaimed, hurrying forward. The lady said, "'Oh, you droll monster!' as she smiled and watched him stride ahead. Festus bounded on over the hedge, across the intervening patch of green, and into the field which Anne was still crossing. In a moment or two she looked back, and seeing the well-known Herculean figure of the yeoman behind her, felt rather alarmed, though she determined to show no difference in her outward carriage. But to maintain her natural gait was beyond her powers. She spasmodically quickened her pace, fruitlessly, however, for he gained upon her, and when the of her exclaimed, "'Well, my darling!' and started off at a run. Festus was already out of breath, and soon found that he was not likely to overtake her. On she went, without turning her head, till an unusual noise behind compelled her to look round. His face was in the act of falling back. He swerved on one side, and dropped like a log upon a convenient hedgerow bank which bordered the path. There he lay, quite still. Anne was somewhat alarmed, 
and after standing at gaze for two or three minutes, drew nearer to him a step and a half at a time, wondering and doubting, as a meek ewe draws near to some strolling vagabond who flings himself on the grass near the flock. "'He's in a swoon,' she murmured. Her heart beat quickly, and she looked around. Nobody was in sight. She advanced a step nearer still, and observed him again. Apparently his face was turning to a livid hue, and his breathing had become obstructed. "'Tis not a swoon, tis apoplexy," she said in deep distress. I-, "'I ought to untie his neck.' But she was afraid to do this, and only drew a little closer still. Miss Garland was now within three feet of him, whereupon the sand, who could hold his breath no longer, sprang to his feet and darted at her, saying, "'Ha-ha! A scheme for a kiss!' She felt his arm slipping round her neck, but twirling about with amazing dexterity, she wriggled from his embrace and ran away along the field. The force with which she had extricated herself was sufficient to throw Festus upon the grass, and by the time that he got upon his legs again, she was many yards off. Uttering a word which was not exactly a blessing, he immediately gave chase, and thus they ran till Anne entered a meadow divided down the middle by a brook about six feet wide. A narrow plank was thrown loosely across at the point where the path traversed this stream, and when Anne reached it, she at once scampered over. At the other side she turned her head to gather the probabilities of the situation, which were that Festus Derriman would overtake her even now. By a sudden forethought she stooped, seized the end of the plank, and endeavoured to drag it away from the opposite bank. But the weight was too great for her to do more than slightly move it, and with a desperate sigh she ran on again, having lost many valuable seconds. But her attempt, though ineffectual in dragging it down, had been enough to unsettle the little bridge, and when Derriman reached the middle, which she did half a minute later, the plank turned over on its edge, tilting him bodily into the river. The water was not remarkably deep, but as the yeoman fell flat on his stomach he was completely immersed, and it was some time before he could drag himself out. When he arose, dripping, on the bank, and looked around, Anne had vanished from the mead. Then Festus's eyes glowed like carbuncles, and he gave voice to fearful imprecations, shaking his fist in the soft summer air towards Anne, in a way that was terrible for any maiden to behold. Wading back through the stream, he walked along its bank with a heavy tread, the water running from his coat-tails, wrists, and the tips of his ears, in silvery dribbles that sparkled pleasantly in the sun. Thus he hastened away, and went round by a by-path to the hall. Meanwhile the author of his troubles was rapidly drawing nearer to the mill, and soon, to her inexpressible delight, she saw Bob coming to meet her. She had heard the flounce, and feeling more secure from her pursuer, had dropped her pace to a quick walk. No sooner did she reach Bob than, overcome by the excitement of the moment, she flung herself into his arms. Bob instantly enclosed her in an embrace so very thorough that there was no possible danger of her falling, whatever degree of exhaustion might have given rise to her somewhat unexpected action. And in this attitude they silently remained, till it was borne in upon Anne that the present was the first time in her life that she had ever been in such a position. Her face then burnt like a sunset, and she did not know how to look up at him. Feeling at length quite safe, she suddenly resolved not to give way to her first impulse to tell him the whole of what had happened, lest there should be a dreadful quarrel and fight between Bob and the yeoman, and great difficulties caused the Lovedale family on her account, the miller having important wheat transactions with the Derrimans. "'You seem frightened, dearest Anne,' said Bob tenderly. "'Yes,' she replied, "'I saw a man I did not like the look of, and he was inclined to follow me, but, worse than that, I am troubled about the French. Oh, Bob, I am afraid you will be killed, and my mother, and John, and your father, and all of us hunted down.' "'Now I have told you, dear little heart, that it cannot be. We shall drive them into the sea after a battle or two, even if they land, which I don't believe they will. We have got ninety sail of the line, and though it is rather unfortunate that we should have declared war against Spain at this ticklish time, there's enough for all. And Bob went into elaborate statistics of the navy, army, militia, and volunteers to prolong the time of holding her. When he had done speaking, he drew rather a heavy sigh. What's the matter, Bob? 
I haven't been yet to offer myself as a sea fencible, and I ought to have done it long ago. You are only one. Surely they can do without you. Bob shook his head. She arose from her restful position, her eye catching his with a shamefaced expression of having given way at last. Loveday drew from his pocket a paper, and said as they slowly walked on, "'Here's something to make us brave and patriotic. I bought it in Budmouth. Isn't it a stirring picture?' It was a hieroglyphic profile of Napoleon. The hat represented a maimed French eagle. The face was ingeniously made up of human carcasses, knotted and writhing together in such directions as to form a physiognomy. A band, or stock, shaped to resemble the English channel, encircled his throat, and seemed to choke him. His epaulette was a hand tearing a cobweb that represented the treaty of peace with England, and his ear was a woman crouching over a dying child. "'It is dreadful,' said Anne. I, "'I don't like to see it.' She had recovered from her emotion, and walked along beside him with a grave, subdued face. Bob did not like to assume the privileges of an accepted lover, and draw her hand through his arm. For, conscious that she naturally belonged to a politer grave than his own, he feared lest her exhibition of tenderness were an impasse which cooler moments might regret. A perfect Paul and Virginia life had not absolutely set in for him as yet, and it was not to be hastened by force. When they had passed over the bridge into the mill-front, they saw the miller standing at the door with a face of concern. "'Since you've been gone,' he said, a government man has been here, and to all the houses, taking down the numbers of the women and children, and their ages, and the numbers of horses and wagons that can be mustered, in case they have to retreat in land out of the way of the invading army. The little family gathered themselves together, all feeling the crisis more seriously than they liked to express. Mrs. Loveday thought how ridiculous a thing social ambition was in such a conjuncture as this, and vowed that she would leave Anne to love where she would. Anne, too, forgot the little peculiarities of speech and manner in Bob and his father, which sometimes jarred for a moment upon her more refined sense, and was thankful for their love and protection in this looming trouble. On going upstairs, she remembered the paper which Farmer Derriman had given her, and searched in her bosom for it. She could not find it there. "'I must have left it on the table,' she said to herself. It did not matter, she remembered every word. She took a pen and wrote a duplicate, which she put safely away. But Anne was wrong. She had, after all, placed the paper where she supposed, and there it ought to have been. But in escaping from Festus, when he feigned apoplexy, it had fallen out upon the grass. Five minutes after that event, when pursuer and pursued were two or three fields ahead, the gaily-dressed woman whom the woman had overtaken, peeped cautiously through the stile into the corner of the field which had been the scene of the scramble, and seeing the paper she climbed over, secured it, loosened the wafer without tearing the sheet, and read the memorandum within. Unable to make anything of its meaning, the saunterer put it in her pocket, and dismissing the matter from her mind, went on by the by-path which led to the back of the mill. Here, behind the hedge, she stood and surveyed the old building for some time, after which she meditatively turned and retraced her steps towards the royal watering place. End of chapter twenty five. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty six of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. THE TRUMPET MAJOR by Thomas Hardy CHAPTER Twenty Six, THE ALARM The night which followed was historic and memorable. Mrs. Loveday was awakened by the boom of a distant gun. She told the miller, and they listened a while. The sound was not repeated, but such was the state of their feelings that Mr. Loveday went to Bob's room and asked if he had heard it. Bob was wide awake looking out of the window. He had heard the ominous sound, and was inclined to investigate the matter. While the father and son were dressing, they fancied that a glare seemed to be rising in the sky in the direction of the Beacon Hill. Not wishing to alarm Anne and her mother, the miller assured them that Bob and himself were merely going out of doors to inquire into the cause of the report, after which 
they plunged into the gloom together. A few steps' progress opened up more of the sky, which, as they had thought, was indeed irradiated by a lurid light. But whether it came from the beacon, or from a more distant point, they were unable to clearly tell. They pushed on rapidly towards higher ground. Their excitement was merely of a piece with that of all men at this critical juncture. Everywhere expectation was at fever heat. For the last year or two, only five and twenty miles of shallow water had divided quiet English homesteads from an enemy's army of a hundred and fifty thousand men. We had taken the matter lightly enough, eating and drinking as in the days of No, and singing satires without end. We punned on Bonaparte and his gumpoats, chalked his effigy on stage-coaches, and published the same in prints. Still, between these bursts of hilarity, it was sometimes recollected that England was the only European country which had not succumbed to the mighty little man who was less than human in feeling and more than human in will, that our spirit for resistance was greater than our strength, and that the channel was often calm. Boats built of wood, which was greenly growing in its native forest three days before it was bent as whales to their sides, were ridiculous enough, but they might be, after all, sufficient for a single trip between two visible shores. The English watched Bonaparte in these preparations, and Bonaparte watched the English. At the distance of Boulogne details were lost, but we were impressed on fine days by the novel sight of a huge army moving and twinkling like a school of mackerel under the rays of the sun. The regular way of passing an afternoon in the coast towns was to stroll up to the signal posts and chat with the lieutenant on duty there about the latest inimical object seen at sea. About once a week there appeared in the newspapers either a paragraph concerning some adventurous English gentleman who'd sailed out in a pleasure boat till he lay near enough to de Boulogne to see Bonaparte standing on the heights among his marshals, or else some lines about a mysterious stranger with a foreign accent who, after collecting a vast deal of information on our resources, had hired a boat at a southern port, and vanished with it towards France, before his intention could be divined. In forecasting his grand venture, Bonaparte postulated the help of Providence to a remarkable degree. Just at the hour when his troops were on board the flat-bottomed boats and ready to sail, there was to be a great fog, that should spread a vast obscurity over the length and breadth of the channel, and keep the English blind to events on the other side. The fog was to last twenty-four hours, after which it might clear away. A dead calm was to prevail simultaneously with the fog, with the twofold object of affording the boats easy transit, and dooming our ships to lie motionless. Thirdly, there was to be a spring tide, which should combine its manoeuvres with those of the fog and calm. Among the many thousands of minor Englishmen whose lives were affected by these tremendous designs, may be numbered our old acquaintance Corporal Tullidge, who sported the crushed arm, and poor old Simon Burden, the dazed veteran who had fought at Minden. Instead of sitting snugly in the settle of the old ship, in the village adjoining Overcombe, they were obliged to keep watch on the hill. They made themselves as comfortable as was possible in the circumstances, dwelling in a hut of clods and turf, with a brick chimney for cooking. Here they observed the nightly progress of the moon and stars, grew familiar with the heaving of moles, the dancing of rabbits on the hillocks, the distant hoot of owls, the bark of foxes from woods further inland but saw not a sign of the enemy. As, night after night, they walked round the two ricks which it was their duty to fire at a signal, one being of furs for a quick flame, the other of turf for a long slow radiance, they thought and talked of old times, and drank patriotically from a large wood flagon that was filled every day. Bob and his father soon became aware that the light was from the beacon, by the time that they reached the top, it was one mass of towering flame from which the sparks fell on the green herbage like a fiery dew. The forms of the two old men being seen passing and repassing in the midst of it. The love days, who came up on the smoky side, regarded the scene for a moment, and then emerged into the light. "'Who goes there?' said Corporal Tullidge, shouldering a pike with his sound arm. "'Oh, tis neighbour love day.' "'Did you get your signal to fire it from the east?' said the Miss Miller hastily. "'No, from Abbot Sea Beach. "'But you're not to go by a coast signal.' "'Chog it all. 
wasn't the Lord Lieutenant's direction, whenever you see Rain Barrel's beacon burn to the nor'easterd, or Haggerton to the nor'westward, or the actual presence of the enemy on the shore? But is he here? No doubt on it. The beach light's only just gone down, and Simon heard the guns even better than I. Hark, hark, I hear em, said Bob. They listened with parted lips, the night wind blowing through Simon Burden's few teeth as through the ruins of Stonehenge. From far down on the lower levels came the noise of wheels and the tramp of horses upon the turnpike road. "'Well, there must be something in it,' said Mother Lilla Loveday, gravely. "'Bob, we'll go home and make the women folk safe, and then I'll don my soldiers' clothes and be off. God knows where our company will assemble.' They hastened down the hill, and on getting into the road waited and listened again. Travellers began to come up and pass them in vehicles of all descriptions. It was difficult to attract their attention in the dim light, but by standing on the top of a wall which fenced the road, Bob was at last seen. "'What's the matter?' he cried to a butcher who was flying past in his cart, his wife sitting behind him without a bonnet. "'French have landed,' said the man without drawing rein. "'Where?' shouted Bob. "'In West Bay, and old Bummoth is in uproar!' replied the voice, now faint in the distance. Bob and his father hastened on till they reached their own house. As they had expected, Anne and her mother, in common with most of the people, were both dressed, and stood at the door bonneted and shawled, listening to the traffic on the neighbouring highway, Mrs. Lovedale having secured what money and small valuables they possessed in a huge pocket which extended all round her waist, and added considerably to her weight and diameter. "'Tis true enough, said the miller. He's come. You and Anne and the maid must be off to Cousin Jim's at Kingsbeer, and when you get there you must do as they do. I must assemble with the company. And I? said Bob. Thou hadst better run to the church and take a pike before they all be gone. The horse was put into the gig, and Mrs. Loveday, Anne, and the servant-maid were hastily packed into the vehicle, the latter taking the reins, David's duties as a fighting man forbidding all thought of his domestic offices now. Then the silver tankard, teapot, pair of candlesticks like ionic columns, and other articles too large to be pocketed, were thrown into a basket and put up behind. Then came the leave-taking, which was as sad as it was hurried. Bob kissed Anne, and there was no affectation in her receiving that mark of affection, as she said through her tears, "'God bless you!' At last they moved off in the dim light of dawn, neither of the three women knowing which road they were to take but trusting to chance to find it. As soon as they were out of sight, Bob went off for a pike, and his father, first new-flinting his firelock, proceeded to don his uniform, pipe claying his breeches with such cursory haste as to bespatter his black gaiters with the same ornamental compound. Finding, when he was ready, that no bugle has as yet sounded, he went with David to the cart-house, dragged out the wagon, and put therein some of the most useful and easily handled goods in case there might be an opportunity for conveying them away. By the time this was done, and the wagon pushed back and locked in, Bob had returned with his weapon, somewhat mortified at being doomed to this low form of defence. The miller gave his son a parting grasp of the hand, and arranged to meet him at Kingsbeer at the first opportunity, if the news were true, if happily false, here at their own house. "'Bother it all!' he exclaimed, looking at his stock of flints. "What? said Bob. "'I've got no ammunition, not a blessed round!' "'Then what's the use of going?' asked his son. The miller paused. "'Oh, I'll go,' he said. "'Perhaps somebody will lend me a little if I get into a hot corner.' <laughs> "'Led ye a little. Father, he was always so simple,' said Bob reproachfully. "'Well, I can bagnet a few anyway,' said the miller. The bugle had been blown ere this, and Loveday the father disappeared towards the place of assembly, his empty cartridge-box behind him. Bob seized a brace of loaded pistols which he had brought home from the ship, and, armed with these and a pike, he locked the door and sallied out again towards the turnpike road. By this time the yeomanry of the district were also on the move, and amongst them Festus Derriman, who was sleeping at his uncle's, and had been awakened by Cripplestraw. About the time when Bob and his father were descending from the beacon, the stalwart yeoman was standing in the table-yard, adjusting his straps, while Cripplestraw saddled the horse. Festus clanked up and down, looked gloomily at the beacon, heard the retreating carts and carriages, 
and called Cripplestraw to him, who came from the stable leading the horse at the same moment that Uncle Benji peeped unobserved from a mullion window above their heads, the distant light of the beacon fire touching up his features to the complexion of an old brass clock-face. I, "'I think that before I start, Cripplestraw,' said Festus, whose lurid visage was undergoing a bleaching process curious to look upon, "'you shall go on to Budmouth and, and, and make a bold inquiry whether the cowardly enemy is on shore as yet, or, or only looming in the bay.' "'I go in a moment, sir,' said the other, "'if I hadn't me bad leg again. I, "'I should have joined me company for all this, "'but they said at last drill that I was too old. "'So I shall wait up in the hayloft for tidings "'as soon as I have packed you off, poor gentleman. Uh, "'Do such alarms as these, Cripplestraw, "'ever happen without foundation? Uh, "'Bonaparte is a wretch, a miserable wretch, "'and this may be only a false alarm "'to disappoint such as me.' "'Oh, no, sir, oh, no!' But, "'But sometimes there are false alarms.' "'Well, yes, sir, yes. There was a pretended Sally O'Gumbolt's last year.' Uh, "'And was there nothing else pretended? Something more like this, for instance?' Cripplestraw shook his head. "'I notice your modesty, Mr. Festus, in making light of things, but there never was, sir. You may depend upon it. He's come. Thank God my duty as a local don't require me to go to the front, but only the valiant men, like my master.' Ah, "'If Bony could only see now, sir, he'd know too well there is nothing to be got from such a determined, skilful officer, but blows and musket-balls.' "'Yes, yes, Cripplestraw. If I ride off to Budmouth and meet them, all my training will be lost. No skill is required as a forlorn hope.' Mm, "'True, there's a point, sir. You'd outshine them all, and be picked off at the very beginning as a too dangerous brave man. But, but if I stay here and urge on the faint-hearted ones—' or get up into the turret-stair by that gateway and pop the invaders through the loophole, I shouldn't be so completely wasted, should I? You would not, Mr. Derriman. But as he was going to say next, the fire in your veins won't let you do that. You are valiant. Very good. You don't want a husband your valiance at home. That argument is plain. If my birth had been more obscure, murmured the yeoman, and I'd only been in the militia, for instance, or among the humble pikemen, so much wouldn't have been expected of me, uh, of my fiery nature. Uh, Cripplestraw, is, is there a drop of brandy to be got at that end of the house? I don't feel very well. "'Dear nephew,' said the old man from above, whom neither of the others had as yet noticed, "'I haven't any spirits open, so unfortunate. But there's a beautiful barrel of crab-apple cider in draught, and there's some cold tea from last night.' Uh, wh "'What, I is he listening?' said Festus, staring up. Now I warrant how glad he is to see me forced to go, called out of bed without breakfast, and he quite safe, and sure to escape because he's an old man. Cripplestraw, I like being in the yeomanry cavalry, but I wish not I hadn't been in the ranks. I wish I had been only the surgeon to stay in the rear while the bodies are brought back to him. I mean, I should have thrown my heart at such a time as this more into the labour of restoring wounded men and joining their shattered limbs together. Ugh, more than I can into causing the wounds— I am too humane, Cripplestraw, for the ranks. Yes, yes, said his companion, depressing his spirits to a kindred level. And yet such is fate, that instead of joining men's limbs together, you have to get your own joined, poor young soldier, all through having such a warlike soul. Yes, murmured Festus, and paused. You can't think how strange I feel here, Cripplestraw, he continued, laying his hand upon the central buttons of his waistcoat, how I do wish I was only the surgeon! He slowly mounted, and Uncle Benji, in the meantime, sang to himself as he looked on. Twenty-three and a half from N. W., sixteen and three quarters from N. E. What's that old mummy singing? said Festus savagely. Oh, only a hymn for preservation from our enemies, dear nephew, meekly replied the farmer, who had heard the remark. Twenty-three and a half from N. W. Festus allowed his horse to move on a few paces, and then turned again, as if struck by a happy invention. Uh, uh, Cripplestraw, he began, with an artificial laugh, I, I am obliged to confess, after all, I, I must see her. It isn't nature that makes me draw back. It is love. I must go and look for her. A woman, sir? I, I didn't want to confess it, but tis a woman. Strange that I should be drawn so entirely against my natural wish to rush at them. 
Cripplestraw, seeing which way the wind blew, found it advisable to blow in harmony. Ah, now at last I see, sir. Spite that few men live that worthy to be command ye, spite that you could rush on, marshal the troops to victory, as I may say, but then what of it? There's the unhappy fate of being smit with the eyes of a woman, and you are unmanned. Meister Derriman, who is himself when he's got a woman round his neck like a millstone? It is something like that. I feel the case. Be you valiant? I know, of course, the words being a matter of form. Be you valiant, I ask? Yes, of course. Then don't you waste it in the open field? Hold it up, I say, sir, for a higher class of war, the defence of your adorable lady. Think what you owe her of this terrible time. Now, Master Derriman, once more I ask ye to cast off that first haughty wish to rush to Budmouth, and to go where your missus is defenceless and alone. I will, Cripplestraw, now you put it like that. Thank ye, thank ye heartily, Master Derriman. Go now and hide with her. But, but, but can I? Oh, now, hang flattery, can a man hide without a stain? Uh, of course, I would not hide in any mean sense. No, not I. If you be in love, tis plain you may, since it is not your own life but another's that you are concerned for, and you only save your own because it can't be helped. Uh, tis true, Cripplestraw, in a sense. But would it be understood that way? Will they see it as a brave hiding? Now, sir, if you've not been in love, I own to ye that hiding would look queer, but being to save the tears, groans, fits, woundings, and perhaps death of a comely young woman, your principle is good. You honourably retreat because you be too gallant to advance. This strands strange, ye may say, sir, but it's plain enough to less fiery minds. Festus did for a moment try to uncover his teeth in a natural smile, but it died away. Uh, Cripplestraw, you, you flatter me, or do you mean it? Well, there's truth in it. I am more gallant in going to her than in marching to the shore. But we cannot be too careful about our good names, we soldiers. I must not be seen. I'm off. Cripplestraw opened the hurdle which closed the arch under the portico gateway, and Festus passed under. Uncle Benjamin singing, Twenty-three and a half from N.W., with a sort of sublime ecstasy, feeling, as Festus had observed, that his money was safe, and that the French would not personally molest an old man in such a ragged, mildewed coat as that he wore, which he had taken the precaution to borrow from a scarecrow in one of his fields for the purpose. Festus rode on, full of his intention to seek out Anne, and under cover of protecting her retreat, accompany her to Kingsbere, where he knew the Lovedays had relatives. In the lane he met Granny Seymour, who, having packed up all her possessions in a small basket, was placidly retreating to the mountains till all should be over. "'Well, Granny, have you seen the French?' asked Festus. "'No,' she said, looking at him through her brazen spectacles. "'If I had, I shouldn't have seen thee.' Oh, replied the yeoman, and rode on. Just as he reached the old road, which he had intended merely to cross and avoid, his countenance fell. Some troops of regulars, who appeared to be dragoons, were rattling along the road. Festus hastened towards an opposite gate, so as to get within the field before they should see him. But, as ill luck would have it, as soon as he got inside, a party of six or seven of his own yeomanry troop were straggling across the same field and making for the spot where he was. The dragoons passed without seeing him, but when he turned out into the road again, it was impossible to retreat towards Overcombe village because of the yeoman. So he rode straight on, and heard them coming at his heels. There was no other gate, and the highway soon became as straight as a bowstring. Unable thus to turn without meeting them, and caught like an eel in a water-pipe, Festus drew nearer and nearer to the fateful shore. But he did not relinquish hope. Just ahead there were crossroads, and he might have a chance of slipping down one of them without being seen. On reaching the spot, he found that he was not alone. A horseman had come up the right-hand lane and drawn rein. It was an officer of the German Legion, and seeing Festus he held up his hand. Festus rode up to him and saluted. "'It is to false report,' said the officer. Festus was a man again. He felt nothing was too much for him. The officer, after some explanation of the cause of alarm, said that he was going across to the road which led by the moor to stop the troops and volunteers converging from that direction, upon which Festus offered to give information along the Casterbridge road. 
the German crossed over and was soon out of sight in the lane, while Festus turned back upon the way by which he had come. The party of yeomanry cavalry was rapidly drawing near, and he soon recognised among them the excited voices of Stubb of Duddle Hole, Noakes of Muckleford, and other comrades of his orgies at the hall. It was a magnificent opportunity, and Festus drew his sword. When they were within speaking distance, he reined round his charger's head to Budmouth and shouted, "'On, comrades, on! I'm waiting for you. You've been a long time getting up with me, seeing the glorious nature of our deeds to-day.' "'Well said, Derriman, well said,' replied the foremost of the riders. "'Have you heard anything new?' "'Only that he's here with his tens of thousands, and that we are to ride to meet him sword in hand as soon as we've assembled in the town ahead here.' "'Oh, Lord!' said Noakes, with a slight falling of the lower jaw. "'The man who quails now is unworthy of the name of Yeoman,' said Festus, still keeping ahead of the other troopers, and holding up his sword to the sun. "'Oh, Noakes, fie, fie! You begin to look pale, man!' "'Faith, perhaps you'd look pale,' said Noakes, with an envious glance upon Festus's daring manner, "'if ye had a wife and family depending upon ye.' "'I'll take three fog-eating Frenchmen single-handed,' rejoined Derriman, still flourishing his sword. "'They have as good swords as you, as you will soon find,' said another of the yeomen. "'If they were three times armed,' said Festus, "'I three times, I would attempt them three to one. "'How do you feel now, my old friend Stubb?' turning to another of the warriors. "'Oh, friend Stubb, no bouncing health to our lady loves in Oxwell Hall this summer at last. "'Eh, hey, Brown John?' "'I'm afraid not,' said Brown John gloomily. "'No rattling dinners at Stacy's Hotel and the King below with his staff? "'No wrenching off door-knockers and sending them to the bakehouse in a pie that nobody calls for? "'Weeks of cut-and-thrust work, rather.' "'I suppose so.' "'Fight how we may. We shan't get rid of the cursed tyrant before autumn, "'and many thousand brave men will lie low before it's done,' "'remarked a young yeoman with a calm face, who meant to do his duty without much talking.' "'No grinning matches at Maiden Castle this summer,' Festus resumed. "'No thread the needle at Greenhill Fair, and going to shows, and driving the showman crazy with cock a doodle doo "'I suppose not.' "'Does it make you seem just a trifle uncomfortable, Noakes? "'Keep up your spirits, old comrade. "'Come, forward. We're only amly on like so many donkey women. "'We have to get into Budmouth, join the rest of the troop, and "'then march along the coast westward, as I imagine.' "'At this rate we shan't be well into the thick of battle before twelve o'clock. "'Spur on, comrades! "'No dancing on the green lock this year in the moonlight. "'He was tender upon that girl. "'Gad, what will become of her in the struggle?' "'Come, come, Derriman,' expostulated Lockham. "'This is all very well, but I don't care for it. "'I am as ready to fight as any man, but... "'Perhaps when you get into battle, Derriman, and see what it's like, "'your courage will cool down a little,' added Noakes on the same side with secret admiration of Festus's reckless bravery. "'I shall be bayoneted first, said Festus. "'Now let's rally, and on.' Since Festus was determined to spur on wildly, the rest of the yeomen did not like to seem behindhand, and they rapidly approached the town. Had they been calm enough to reflect, they might have observed that for the last half-hour no carts or carriages had met them on the way, as they had done further back. It was not till the troopers reached the turnpike that they learnt what Festus had known a quarter of an hour before. At the intelligence, Derriman sheathed his sword with a sigh, and the party soon fell in with comrades who had arrived there before them, whereupon the source and details of the alarm were boisterously discussed. "'Well, didn't you know of the mistake till now?' asked one of these of the newcomers. "'Why, when I was dropping over the hill by the crossroads, I looked back and saw that man talking to the messenger, and he must have told him the truth.' The speaker pointed to Festus. They turned their indignant eyes full upon him. That he had sported with their deepest feelings while knowing the rumour to be baseless was soon apparent to all. "'Beat him black and blue with the fat of our blades!' shouted two or three, turning their horses' heads to drop back upon Derriman, in which move they were followed by most of the party. But Festus, foreseeing danger from the unexpected revelation, had already judiciously placed a few intervening yards between himself and his fellow yeoman, and now, clapping spurs to his horse, rattled like thunder and lightning up the road homeward. His ready flight added hotness to their pursuit, and as he rode and looked fearfully over his shoulder, 
he could see them following with enraged faces and drawn swords, a position which they kept up for a distance of more than a mile. Then he had the satisfaction of seeing them drop off one by one, and soon he and his panting charger remained alone on the highway. End of chapter 26 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 27 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 27 Danger to Anne He stopped and reflected how to turn this rebuff to advantage. Balked in his project of entering the watering place and enjoying congratulations upon his patriotic bearing during the advance, he sulkily considered that he might be able to make some more use of his enforced retirement by riding to Overcombe and glorifying himself in the eyes of Miss Garland before the truth should have reached that hamlet. Having thus decided, he spurred on in a better mood. By this time the volunteers were on the march, and as Derriman ascended the road he met the Overcombe company, in which trudged Miller Loveday, shoulder to shoulder, with the other substantial householders of the place and its neighbourhood, duly equipped with pouches, cross-belts, firelocks, flint-boxes, pickers, worms, magazines, priming horns, heel-ball and pomatum. There was nothing to be gained by further suppression of the truth, and, briefly informing them that the danger was not so immediate as had been supposed, Festus galloped on. At the end of another mile he met a large number of pikemen, including Bob Loveday whom the yeoman resolved to sound upon the whereabouts of Anne. The circumstances were such as to lead Bob to speak more frankly than he might have done on reflection, and he told Festus to the direction in which the women had been sent. Then Festus informed the group that the report of invasion was false, upon which they all turned to go homeward with greatly relieved spirits. Bob walked beside Derriman's horse for some distance. Loveday had instantly made up his mind to go and look for the women, and ease their anxiety by letting them know the good news as soon as possible. But he said nothing of this to Festus during their return together, nor did Festus tell Bob that he also had resolved to seek them out, and by anticipating every one else in that enterprise, make of it a glorious opportunity for bringing Miss Garland to her senses about him. He still resented the ducking that he had received at her hands, and was not disposed to let that insult pass, without obtaining some sort of sweet revenge. As soon as they had parted, Festus cantered on over the hill, meeting on his way the long puddle volunteers, sixty rank and file, under Captain Cunningham, the Casterbridge Company, ninety strong, known as the Consideration Company in those days, under Captain Strickland, and others, all with anxious faces and covered with dust. Just passing the word to them and leaving them at halt, he proceeded rapidly onward in the direction of Kingsbere. Nobody appeared on the road for some time, till, after a ride of several miles, he met a stray corporal of volunteers, who told Festus, in answer to his inquiry, that he had certainly passed no gig full of women of the kind described. Believing that he had missed them by following the highway, Derriman turned back into a lane along which they might have chosen to journey for privacy's sake, notwithstanding the badness and uncertainty of its track. Arriving again within five miles of Overcombe, he at length heard tidings of the wandering vehicle and its precious burden, which, like the ark when sent away from the country of the Philistines, had apparently been left to the instincts of the beast that drew it. A labouring man, just at daybreak, had seen the helpless party going slowly up a distant drive, which he pointed out. No sooner had Festus parted from this informant than he beheld Bob approaching mounted on the miller's second and heavier horse. Bob looked rather surprised, and Festus felt his coming glory in danger. Uh, "'They went down that lane,' he said, signifying precisely the opposite direction to the true one. "'I, too, have been on the lookout for missing friends.' As Festus was riding back, there was no reason to doubt his information, and Loveday rode on as misdirected. Immediately that he was out of sight, Festus reversed his course and followed the track which Anne and her companions were last seen to pursue. This road had been ascended by the gig in question nearly two hours before the present moment. 
Molly, the servant, held the reins. Mrs. Loveday sat beside her, and Anne behind. Their progress was but slow, owing partly to Molly's want of skill, and partly to the steepness of the road, which here passed over downs of some extent, and was rarely or never mended. It was an anxious morning for them all, and the beauties of the early summer day fell upon unheeding eyes. They were too anxious even for conjecture, and each sat thinking her own thoughts, occasionally glancing westward, or stopping the horse to listen to sounds from more frequented roads along which other parties were retreating. Once, while they listened and gazed thus, they saw a glittering in the distance and heard the tramp of many horses. It was a large body of cavalry going in the direction of the King's watering place, the same regiment of dragoons, in fact, which Festus had seen further on in its course. The women in the gig had no doubt that these men were marching at once to engage the enemy. By way of varying the monotony of the journey, Molly occasionally burst into tears of horror, believing Bonaparte to be in countenance and habits precisely what the caricatures represented him. Mrs. Loveday endeavoured to establish cheerfulness by assuring her companions of the natural civility of the French nation, with whom unprotected women were safe from injury, unless through the casual excesses of soldiery beyond control. This was poor consolation to Anne, whose mind was more occupied with Bob than with herself, and a miserable fear that she would never again see him alive so paled her face and saddened her gaze forward, that at last her mother said, "'Who was you thinking of, my dear?' Anne's only reply was a look at her mother, with which a tear mingled. Molly whipped the horse, by which she quickened his pace for five yards, when he again fell into the perverse slowness that showed how fully conscious he was of being the mastermind and chief personage of the four. Whenever there was a pool of water by the road, he turned aside to drink a mouthful, and remained there his own time, in spite of Molly's tug at the reins and futile fly-flapping on his rump. They were now in the chalk district, where there were no hedges, and a rough attempt at mending the way had been made by throwing down huge lumps of that glaring material in heaps, without troubling to spread it or break them abroad. The jolting here was most distressing, and seemed about to snap the springs. "'How that wheel do wamble!' said Molly at last. She had scarcely spoken when the wheel came off, and all three were precipitated over into the road. Fortunately the horse stood still, and they began to gather themselves up. The only one of the three who had suffered in the least from the fall was Anne, and she was only conscious of a severe shaking which had half stupidized her for the time. The wheel lay flat in the road, so that there was no possibility of driving further in their present plight. They looked around for help. The only friendly object near was a lonely cottage, from its situation evidently the home of a shepherd. The horse was unharnessed and tied to the back of the gig, and the three women went across to the house. On getting close, they found that the shutters of all the lower windows were closed, but on trying the door it opened to the hand. Nobody was within. The house appeared to have been abandoned in some confusion, and the probability was that the shepherd had fled on hearing the alarm. Anne now said that she felt the effects of her fall too severely to be able to go on any further just then and it was agreed that she should be left there while Mrs. Loveday and Molly went on for assistance, the elder lady deeming Molly too young and vacant-minded to be trusted to go alone. Molly suggested taking the horse, as the distance might be great, each of them sitting alternately on his back while the other led him by the head. This they did, Anne watching them vanish down the white and lumpy road. She then looked round the room, as well as she could do so by the light from the open door. It was plain, from the shutters being closed, that the shepherd had left his house before daylight, the candle and extinguisher on the table pointing to the same conclusion. Here she remained, her eyes occasionally sweeping the bare, sunny expanse of down that was only relieved from absolute emptiness by the overturned gig hard by. The sheep seemed to have gone away, and scarcely a bird flew across to disturb the solitude. Anne had risen early that morning, and leaning back in the withy chair which she had placed by the door, she soon fell into an uneasy doze, from which she was awakened by the distant tramp 
of a horse. Feeling much recovered from the effects of the overturn, she eagerly rose and looked out. The horse was not Miller Loveday's, but a powerful bay bearing a man in full yeomanry uniform. Anne did not wait to recognise further. Instantly re-entering the house, she shut the door and bolted it. In the dark she sat and listened. Not a sound. At the end of ten minutes, thinking that if the rider, if he were not Festus, had carelessly passed by, or that if he were Festus, he had not seen her, she crept softly upstairs and peeped out of the window. Excepting the spot of shade formed by the gig as before, the down was quite bare. She then opened the casement and stretched out her neck. "'Ha! Ah, young madam, there you are! I knew ye! Now you are caught!' came like a clap of thunder from a point three or four feet beneath her, and turning down her frightened eyes, she beheld Festus Derriman lurking close to the wall. His attention had first been attracted by her shutting the door of the cottage, then by the overturned gig, and after making sure by examining the vehicle that he was not mistaken in her identity, he had dismounted, led his horse round to the side, and crept up to entrap her. Anne started back into the room, and remained still as a stone. Festus went on. "'Come, you must trust me. The French have landed. I've been trying to meet with you every hour since that confounded trick you played me. You threw me into the water. Faith, it was well for you I didn't catch you then. I should have taken a revenge in a better way than I shall now. I mean to have that kiss of ye. Come, Miss Nancy, do you hear? It is no use for you to lurk inside there. You'll have to turn out as soon as Boney comes over the hill.' "'Are you going to open the door, I say, and speak to me in a civil way? "'What do you think I am, then, that you should barricade yourself against me "'as if I was a wild beast or Frenchman? "'Open the door, or put your head out, or, or do something, "'or upon my soul I'll break in the door.' "'It occurred to Anne at this point of the tirade "'that the best policy would be to temporise till somebody should return, "'and she put out her head and face, now grown somewhat pale.' "'That's better,' said Festus. "'Now I can talk to you. "'Come, my dear, will you not open the door? "'Why should you be afraid of me?' "'I am not altogether afraid of you. "'I am safe from the French here,' said Anne, "'not very truthfully, and anxiously casting her eyes over the vacant down. "'Then let me tell you that the alarm is false, "'and that no landing has been attempted. "'Now will you open the door and let me in?' "'I am tired. I have been on horseback ever since daylight, and have come to bring you the good tidings.' Anne looked as if she doubted the news. "'Come,' said Festus. "'No, I cannot let you in,' she murmured, after a pause. "'Dash my wig, then!' he cried, his face flaming up. "'I'll find a way to get in. Now don't you provoke me. You don't know what I am capable of. I ask you again, will you open the door?' "'Why do you wish it?' she said faintly. "'I have told you I want to sit down, and I want to ask you a question.' "'You can ask me from where you are.' "'I, I cannot ask you properly. It's about a serious matter, whether you will accept my heart and hand. I, I, I'm not going to throw myself at your feet, but I ask you to do your duty as a woman, namely, give your solemn word to take my name as soon as the war is over and I have time to attend to you.' I scorn to ask it of a haughty hussy who only speak to me through a window. However, I put it to you for the last time, madam. There was no sign on the down of anybody's return, and she said, I'll think of it, sir. You thought of it long enough. I want to know. Will you or won't you? Very well. I think I will. And then she felt that she might be buying personal safety too dearly by shuffling thus since he would spread the report that she had accepted him, and cause endless complication. Uh, no, she said, I have changed my mind. I cannot accept you, Mr. Derriman. That's how you play with me, he exclaimed, stamping. Yes, one moment, no the next. Come, you don't know what you refuse. That old hall is my uncle's own, and he has nobody else to leave it to. As soon as he's dead, I shall throw up farming and start as a squire. And now, he added with a bitter sneer, what a fool you are to hang back from such a chance. Thank you. I don't value it, said Anne. Because you hate him who would make it yours? It may not lie in your power to do that. What, has the old fellow been telling you his affairs? 
No. Then why do you mistrust me? Now, after this, will you open the door and show that you treat me as a friend if you won't accept me as a lover? I only want to sit and talk to you. Anne thought she would trust him. It seemed almost impossible that he could harm her. She retired from the window and went downstairs. When her hand was upon the bolt of the door, her mind misgave her. Instead of withdrawing it, she remained in silence where she was, and he began again. "'Are you going to unfasten it?' Anne did not speak. "'Now dash my wig, I'll get at you. You tried me beyond endurance. One kiss would have been enough that day in the mead. Now I'll have forty, whether you will or no.' He flung himself against the door, but as it was bolted and had in addition a great wooden bar across it, this produced no effect. He was silent for a moment, and then the terrified girl heard him attempt the shuttered window. She ran upstairs and again scanned the dam. The yellow gig still lay in the blazing sunshine, and the horse of Festus stood by the corner of the garden. Nothing else was to be seen. At this moment there came to her ear the noise of a sword drawn from its scabbard, and peeping over the window-sill she saw her tormentor drive his sword between the joints of the shutters in an attempt to rip them open. The sword snapped off in his hand. With an imprecation he pulled out the piece and returned the two halves to the scabbard. "'Ha-ha!' he cried, catching sight of the top of her head. "'Tis only a joke, you know, but I'll get it all the same, all for a kiss. But never mind, we'll do it yet." He spoke in an affectedly light tone, as if ashamed of his previous resentful temper, but she could see by the livid back of his neck that he was brimful of suppressed passion. "'Only a jest, you know,' he went on. "'How are we going to do it now?' Oh, "'Why, in this way. I go and get a ladder, and enter at the upper window where my love is. And there's the ladder lying under that corn-rick in the first enclosed field. Back in two minutes, dear!' He ran off, and was lost to her view. End of chapter 27 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 28 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 28 Anne Does Wonders Anne fearfully surveyed her position. The upper windows of the cottage were of flimsiest lead-work, and to keep him out would be hopeless. She felt that not a moment was to be lost in getting away. Running downstairs, she opened the door, and then it occurred to her terrified understanding that there would be no chance of escaping him by flight of foot across such an extensive down, since he might mount his horse and easily ride after her. The animal still remained tethered at the corner of the garden. If she could release him and frighten him away before Festus returned, there would not be quite such odds against her. She accordingly unhooked the horse by reaching over the bank, and then, pulling off her muslin neckerchief, flapped it in his eyes to startle him. But the gallant steed did not move or flinch. She tried again, and he seemed rather pleased than otherwise. At this moment she heard a cry from the cottage, and turning, beheld her adversary approaching round the corner of the building. "'I thought I should toll out the mouse by that trick,' cried Festus exultingly. Instead of going for a ladder, he had simply hidden himself at the back to tempt her down. Poor Anne was now desperate. The bank on which she stood was level with the horse's back, and the creature seemed quiet as a lamb. With the determination of which she was capable in emergencies, she seized the rein, flung herself upon the sheepskin, and held on by the mane. The amazed charger lifted his head, sniffed, wrenched his ears hither and thither, and started off at a frightful speed across the down. "'Oh, my hearts and limbs!' said Festus under his breath, as thoroughly alarmed he gazed after her. "'She's on champion! She'll break her neck, and I shall be tried for manslaughter, and disgrace will be brought upon the name of Derriman!' Champion continued to go at a stretch gallop, but he did nothing worse. Had he plunged or reared, Derriman's fears might have been verified, and Anne have come with deadly force to the ground. But the course was good, and in the horse's speed lay a comparative security. She was scarcely shaken in her precarious half-horizontal position, though she was awed to see the grass, loose stones, and other objects pass her eyes like strokes whenever she opened them, which was only just for a second at intervals of half a minute. 
had to feel how wildly the stirrup swung, and that which struck her knee was the bucket of the carbine, and that it was a pistol holster which hurt her arm. They quickly cleared the down, and Anne became conscious that the course of the horse was homeward. As soon as the ground began to rise towards the outer belt of upland which lay between her and the coast, Champion, now panting and reeking with moisture, lessened his speed in sheer wariness, and proceeded at a rapid jolting trot. Anne felt that she could not hold on half so well. The gallop had been child's play compared with this. They were in a lane ascending to a ridge, and she made up her mind for a fall. Over the ridge rose an animated spot, higher and higher. It turned out to be the upper part of a man, and the man to be a soldier. Such was Anne's attitude that she only got an occasional glimpse of him, and though she feared that he might be a Frenchman, she feared the horse more than the enemy, as she had feared Festus more than the horse. Anne had energy enough left to cry, "'Stop him! Stop him!' as the soldier drew near. He, astonished at the sight of a military horse with a bundle of drapery across his back, had already placed himself in the middle of the lane, and he now held out his arms till his figure assumed the form of a Latin cross planted in the roadway. Trampion drew near, swerved, and stood still almost suddenly, a check sufficient to send Anne slipping down his flank to the ground. The timely friend stepped forward and helped her to her feet, when she saw that he was John Loveday. "'Are you hurt?' he said hastily, having turned quite pale at seeing her fall. "'Oh, oh no, not a bit,' said Anne, gathering herself up with forced briskness to make light of the misadventure. "'But how did you get in such a place?' "'There he's gone!' she exclaimed, instead of replying, as Champion swept round John Loveday and cantered off triumphantly in the direction of Oxwell, a performance which she followed with her eyes. "'But how did you come upon his back? And whose horse is it?' "'I will tell you.' "'Well?' "'I, I cannot tell you.' John looked steadily at her, saying nothing. "'How did you come here?' she asked. "'Is it true that the French have not landed at all?' "'Quite true. The alarm was groundless. I'll tell you all about it. You look very tired. You'd better sit down a few minutes. Let us sit on this bank.' He helped her to the slope indicated, and continued, still as if his thoughts were more occupied with the mystery of her recent situation than with what he was saying, "'We arrived at Budmouth Barracks this morning, and are to lie there all the summer. I could not write to tell father we were coming. It was not because of any rumour of the French, for we knew nothing of that till we met the people on the road, and the Colonel said in a moment the news was false.' Bonaparte is not even at Boulogne just now. I was anxious to know you how you had borne the fright, so I hastened to Overcombe at once, as soon as I could get out of barracks. Anne, who had not been at all responsive to his discourse, now swayed heavily against him, and looking quickly down, he found that she had silently fainted. To support her in his arms was, of course, the impasse of a moment. There was no water to be had, and he could think of nothing else but to hold her tender tenderly till she came round again. Certainly he desired nothing more. Again he asked himself, what did it all mean? He waited, looking down upon her tired eyelids and at the row of lashes lying upon each cheek, whose natural roundness showed itself in singular perfection now that the customary pink had given place to a pale luminousness caught from the surrounding atmosphere the dumpy ringlets about her forehead and behind her pole, which were usually as tight as springs, had been partially uncoiled by the wildness of her ride, and hung in split locks over her forehead and neck. John, who during the long months of his absence had lived only to meet her again, was in a state of ecstatic reverence, and bending down, he gently kissed her. Anne was just becoming conscious. "'Oh, Mr. Derriman, never, never!' she murmured, sweeping her face with her hand. "'I thought he was at the bottom of it,' said John. Anne opened her eyes and started back from him. Well, "'What is it?' she said wildly. "'You are ill, my dear Miss Garland,' replied John, in trembling anxiety and taking her hand. I "'I'm not ill. I'm wearied out,' she said. "'Can't we walk on? How far are we from Overcombe?' "'About a mile. But tell me, somebody has been hurting you, frightening you.' I know who it was. It was Derriman, and that was his horse. Now do you tell me all? Anne reflected. Then if I tell you, she said, will you discuss with me what I had better do, and not for the present let my mother and your father know? 
I don't want to alarm them, and I must not let my affairs interrupt the business connection between the mill and the hall that has gone on for so many years. The trumpet major promised, and Anne told of the adventure. His brow reddened as she went on, and when she had done, she said, Now you are angry. Don't do anything dreadful, will you? Remember that this Festus will most likely succeed his uncle at Oxwell, in spite of present appearances, and if Bob succeeds at the mill, there should be no enmity between them. That's true. I won't tell Bob. Leave him to me. Where is Derriman now? On his way home, I suppose. When I have seen you into the house, I will deal with him, quite quietly, so she shall say nothing about it. Yes, appeal to him, do. Perhaps he will be better, then. They walked on together, Loveday seeming to experience much quiet bliss. I came to look for you, he said, because of that dear, sweet letter you wrote. Yes, I did write you a letter, she admitted with misgiving, now beginning to see her mistake. It was because I was sorry I had blamed you. I'm always glad you did blame me, said John cheerfully, since if you had not, the letter would not have come. I read it fifty times a day. This put Anne into an unhappy mood, and they proceeded without much further talk till the mill chimneys were visible below them. John then said that he would leave her to go in by herself. "'Ah, you are going back to get into some danger on my account?' "'I can't get into much danger with such a fellow as he, can I?' said John, smiling. "'Well, no,' she answered, with a sudden carelessness of tone. It was indispensable that he should be undeceived, and to begin the process by taking an affectedly light view of his personal risks was perhaps as good a way to do it as any. Where friendliness was construed as love, an assumed indifference was a necessary expression for friendliness. So she let him go, and bidding him hasten back as soon as he could, went down the hill, while John's feet retraced the upland. The trumpet major spent the whole afternoon and evening in that long and difficult search for Festus Derriman. Crossing the down at the end of the second hour, he met Molly and Mrs. Loveday. The gig had been repaired, they had learnt the groundlessness of the alarm, and they would have been proceeding happily enough but for their anxiety about Anne. John told them shortly that she had got a lift home, and proceeded on his way. The worthy object of his search had in the meantime been plodding homeward on foot, sulky at the loss of his charger, encumbered with his sword, belts, high boots and uniform, and in his own discomfiture careless whether Anne Garland's life had been endangered or not. At length Derriman reached a place where the road ran between high banks, one of which he mounted and paced along as a change from the hard trackway. Ahead of him he saw an old man sitting down, with eyes fixed on the dust of the road, as if resting and meditating at one and the same time. Being pretty sure that he recognised his uncle in that venerable figure, Festus came forward stealthily, till he was immediately above the old man's back. The latter was clothed in faded nankeen breeches, speckled stockings, a drab hat, and a coat which had once been light blue, but from exposure as a scarecrow had assumed the complexion and fibre of a dried pudding cloth. The farmer was, in fact, returning to the hall, which he had left in the morning some time later than his nephew, to seek an asylum in a hollow tree about two miles off. The tree was so situated as to command a view of the building and Uncle Benji had managed to clamber up inside this natural fortification, high enough to watch his residence through a hole in the bark, till, gathering from the words of occasional passers-by that the alarm was at least premature, he had ventured into daylight again. He was now engaged in abstractly tracing a diagram in the wood dust with his walking-stick, and muttered words to himself aloud. Presently he arose and went on his way without turning round. Festus was curious enough to descend and look at the marks. They resembled an oblong, with two semi-diagonals and a little square in the middle. Upon the diagonals were the figures twenty and seventeen, and on each side of the parallelogram stood a letter signifying the point of the compass. "'What crazy thing is running in his head now?' said Festus to himself with supercilious pity recollecting that the farmer had been singing those very numbers earlier in the morning. Being able to make nothing of it, he lengthened his strides, and treading on tiptoe, overtook his relative, saluting him by scratching his back like a hen. The startled old farmer danced round like a top, 
and gasping, said, as he perceived his nephew, "'What, Festy, not thrown for your horse and killed, then, after all?' "'No, Nunc, what made you think that?' "'Champion passed me about an hour ago, when I was in hiding. Poor timid soul of me, for I had nothing to lose by the French coming. And he looked awful, with the stirrups dandling and the saddle empty. "'Tis a gloomy sight, Festy, to see a horse cantering without a rider, and I thought you'd been—' "'Feared you'd been thrown off and killed as dead as a nit. "'Bless your dear old heart for being so anxious. "'And what pretty picture were you drawing just now with your walking-stick?' "'Oh, that. That's only a way I have of amusing myself. "'It showed how the French might have advanced to the attack, you know. "'Such trifles fill the head of a weak old man like me.' "'Or the place where something is hid away, uh, money, for instance?' "'Festy,' said the farmer reproachfully, you always know I use the old glove in the bedroom cupboard for any guinea or two I possess. Of course I do, said Festus ironically. They had now reached a lonely inn about a mile and a half from the hall, and, the farmer not responding to his nephew's kind invitation to come in and treat him, Festus entered alone. He was dusty, draggled, and weary, and he remained at the tavern long. The trumpet major, in the meantime, having searched the roads in vain, heard in the course of the evening of the yeoman's arrival at this place, and that he would probably be found there still. He accordingly approached the door, reaching it just as the dusk of evening changed to darkness. There was no light in the passage, but John pushed on at hazard, inquired for Derriman, and was told that he would be found in the back parlour, alone. When Loveday first entered the apartment he was unable to see anything, but following the guidance of a vigorous snoring, he came to the settle, upon which Festus lay asleep, his position being faintly signified by the shine of his buttons and other parts of his uniform. John laid his hand upon the reclining figure and shook him, and by degrees Derriman stopped his snore and sat up. "'Who are you?' he said, in the accents of a man who has been drinking hard. "'This is you, dear Anne. Let me kiss you. Yes, I will.' "'Shut your mouth, you pitiful blockhead, I'll teach you genteeler manners than to persecute a young woman in that way. And taking Festus by the ear, he gave it a good pull. Festus broke out with an oath, and struck a vague blow in the air with his fist, whereupon the trumpet major dealt him a box on the right ear, and a similar one on the left, to artistically balance the first. Festus jumped up and used his fists wildly, but without any definite result. "'Want to fight, do you, eh?' said John. "'Nonsense! You can't fight, you great baby, and never could. You're only fit to be smacked.' And he dealt Festus a specimen of the same on the cheek with the palm of his hand. "'No, sir, no, you, you are love day. The young man she's going to be married to, I suppose. Dash me, I, I didn't want to hurt her, sir.' "'Yes, my name is love day, and you'll know where to find me, since we can't finish this to-night. Pistols or swords, whichever you like, my boy.' Take that, and that, so that you may not forget to call upon me. And again he smacked the yeoman's ears and cheeks. Do you know what it's for, eh? Uh, no, Mr. Loveday, sir. Yes, I mean I do. What is it for, then? I shall keep smacking until you tell me. Gad, if you weren't drunk, I'd half kill you here tonight, I would. It's because I served her badly. Damned if I care, I'll do it again and be hanged to me. Where's my horse champion? Tell me that! And he hit at the trumpet major. John parried this attack, and taking him firmly by the collar, pushed him down into the seat, saying, Here I hold ye till ye beg pardon for your doings to-day. Do you want any more of it, do you? And he shook the yeoman to a sort of jelly. I do beg pardon. No, I don't. I say this, that you shall not take such liberties with old Squire Derriman's nephew, you dirty miller's son, you flower worm, you, you smut in the corn. I'll call you out tomorrow morning and have my revenge. Of course you will. That's what I came for. And pushing him back into the corner of the settle, Loveday went out of the house, feeling considerable satisfaction at having got himself into the beginning of as nice a quarrel about Anne Garland as the most jealous lover could desire. But of one feature in this curious adventure he had not the least notion— that Festus Derriman, misled by the darkness, the fumes of his potations, and the constant sight of Anne and Bob together, never once supposed his assailant to be any other man than Bob, believing the trumpet-major miles away. 
There was a moon during the early part of John's walk home, but when he had arrived within a mile of Overcombe, the sky clouded over, and rain suddenly began to fall with some violence. Near him was a wooden granary on tall stone staddles, and perceiving that the rain was only a thunderstorm which would soon pass away, he ascended the steps and entered the doorway, where he stood watching the half-obscured moon through the streaming rain. Presently, to his surprise, he beheld a female figure running forward with great rapidity, not towards the granary for shelter, but towards open ground. What could she be running for in that direction? The answer came in the appearance of his brother Bob from that quarter, seated on the back of his father's heavy horse. As soon as the woman met him, Bob dismounted and caught her in his arms. They stood locked together, the rain beating into their unconscious forms, and the horse looking on. The trumpet major fell back inside the granary, and threw himself on a heap of empty sacks which lay in the corner. He had recognised the woman to be Anne. Here he reclined in a stupor till he was aroused by the sound of voices under him, the voices of Anne and his brother, who, having at last discovered that they were getting wet, had taken shelter under the granary floor. "'I have been home,' said she. "'Mother and Molly have both got back long ago. We were all anxious about you, and I came out to look for you. Oh, Bob, I am so glad to see you again!' John might have heard every word of the conversation which was continued in the same strain for a long time, but he stopped his ears, and would not. Still they remained, and still was he determined that they should not see him. With the conserved hope of more than half a year dashed away in a moment, he could yet feel that the cruelty of a protest would be even greater than its inutility. It was absolutely by his own contrivance that the situation had been shaped. Bob, left to himself, would long ere this have been the husband of another woman. The rain decreased, and the lovers went on. John looked after them as they strolled, aqua-tinted by the weak moon and mist. Bob had thrust one of his arms through the rein of the horse, and the other was round Anne's waist. When they were lost behind the declivity, the trumpet-major came out, and walked homeward even more slowly than they. As he went on, his face put off its complexion of despair, for one of serene resolve— for the first time in his dealings with friends, he entered upon a course of counterfeiting, set his features to conceal his thought, and instructed his tongue to do likewise. He threw fictitiousness into his very gate even now, when there was nobody to see him, and struck at stems of wild parsley with his regimental switch, as he had used to do when soldiering was new to him, and life in general a charming experience. Thus cloaking his sickly thought, he descended to the mill as the others had done before him, occasionally looking down upon the wet road to notice how close Anne's little tracks were to Bob's all the way along, and how precisely a curve in his course was followed by a curve in hers. But after this he erected his head, and walked so smartly up to the front door that his spurs rang through the court. They had all reached home, but before any of them could speak he cried gaily, "'Ah, Bob, I've been thinking of you. By God, how are you, my boy? No French cutthroats after you all, you see. Here we are, well and happy together again.' "'A good providence has watched over us,' said Mrs. Loveday, cheerfully. "'Yes, in all times and places we are in God's hand.' "'So we be, so we be,' said the miller, who still shone in all the fierceness of uniform. "'Well, now, we'll have a drop of drink.' "'There's none,' said David, coming forward with a drawn face. "'What?' said the miller. "'Before I went to church for a pike to defend my native country from Boney, "'I pulled up the spigots of all the barrels, maester. "'For thinks I, damn him, since we can't drink it ourselves, "'he shan't have it, nor none of his men.' "'But you shouldn't have done it till you were sure he'd come,' said the miller, aghast. "'I'd chuck it all, I was sure,' said David. "'I'd sooner see churches fall than good drink wasted.' "'But how was I to know better?' "'Well, well, what with one thing and another, "'this day will cost me a pretty penny,' said Loveday, "'bustling off to the cellar, "'which he found to be several inches deep in stagnant liquor. "'John, how can I welcome he?' "'he continued helplessly on his return to the room. "'Only go and see what he's done.' 
"'I've ladled up a drop with a spoon, trumpet major,' said David. "'Tisn't bad drinking, though it do taste a little of the floor, that's true.' John said that he did not require anything at all, and they all sat down to supper, and were very temperately gay with a drop of mild elder wine which Mrs. Loveday found in the bottom of a jar. The trumpet major, adhering to the part he meant to play, gave humorous accounts of his adventures since he had last sat there. He told them that the season was to be a very lively one, that the royal family was coming as usual, and many other interesting things, so that when he left them to return to barracks, few would have supposed the British army to contain a lighter-hearted man. Anne was the only one who doubted the reality of this behaviour. When she had gone up to her bedroom, she stood for some time looking at the wick of the candle as if it were a painful object, the expression of her face being shaped by the conviction that John's afternoon words, when he helped her out of the way of Champion, were not in accordance with his words to-night, and that the dimly realised kiss during her faintness was no imaginary one. But, in the blissful circumstances of having Bob at hand again, she took optimistic views, and persuaded herself that John would soon begin to see her in the light of a sister. End of chapter 28 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 29 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 29 A Dissembler To cursory view, John Loveday seemed to accomplish this with amazing ease. Whenever he came from barracks to Overcombe, which was once or twice a week, he related news of all sorts to her and Bob with infinite zest, and made at the time as happy a one as had ever been known at the mill, save for himself alone. He said nothing of Festus, except so far as to inform Anne that he had expected to see him, and been disappointed. On the evening after the King's arrival at his seaside residence, John appeared again, staying to supper, and describing the royal entry, the many tasteful illuminations and transparencies which had been exhibited, the quantities of tallow candles burnt for that purpose, and the swarms of aristocracy who had followed the King thither. When supper was over, Bob went outside the house to shut the shutters, which had, as was often the case, been left open some time after lights were kindled within. John still sat at the table when his brother approached the window, though the others had risen and retired. Bob was struck by seeing through the pane how John's face had changed. Throughout the supper-time he had been talking to Anne in the gay tone habitual with him now, which gave greater strangeness to the gloom of his present appearance. He remained in thought for a moment, took a letter from his pocket, opened it, and with a tender smile at his weakness, kissed the writing before restoring it to its place. The letter was one that Anne had written to him at Exonbury. Bob stood perplexed, and then a suspicion crossed his mind that John, from brotherly goodness, might be feigning a satisfaction with recent events which he did not feel. Bob now made a noise with the shutters at which the trumpet major rose and went out, Bob at once following him. "'Jack,' said the sailor ingenuously, "'I'm terribly sorry that I've done wrong.' "'How?' asked his brother. "'In courting our little Anne. "'Well, you see, John, she was in the same house with me, "'and somehow or other I made myself her beau. "'But I've been thinking that perhaps you had the first claim on her, "'and if so, Jack, I'll make way for ye. "'I, I don't care for her much, you know.' "'Not so very much, and can give her up very well. "'It's nothing serious between us at all. "'Yes, John, you try to get her. "'I can look elsewhere.' "'Bob never knew how much he loved Anne "'till he found himself making this speech of renunciation. "'Oh, Bob, you are mistaken,' said the trumpet major, "'who was not deceived. "'When I first saw her, I admired her, and I admire her now, and like her. "'I like her so well that I should be glad to see you marry her.' "'But,' replied Bob, with hesitation, 
I thought I saw you looking very sad, as if you were in love. I, I saw you take out a letter, in short. That's what it was disturbed me and made me come to you. Oh, I see your mistake, said John, laughing forcedly. At this minute, Mrs. Loveday and the miller, who were taking a twilight walk in the garden, strolled round to near where the brothers stood. She talked volubly on events in Budmouth, as most people did at this time. "'And they tell me that the theatre has been painted up afresh,' she was saying, "'and that the actors have come for the season with the most lovely actresses that ever were seen.' When they passed by, John continued, "'I am in love, Bob, but not with Anne.' "'Ah, who is it, then?' said the mate, hopefully. "'One of the actresses in the theatre,' John replied, with a concoctive look at the vanishing forms of Mr. and Mrs. Loveday. "'She is a very lovely woman, you know, but we won't say anything more about it. It, it dashes a man's soul.' "'Oh, one of the actresses,' said Bob, with open mouth. "'But don't you say anything about it,' continued the trumpet major heartily. "'I, I don't want it known.' "'No, no, I won't, of course. Uh, may I not know her name?' "'No, not now, Bob. I, I cannot tell ye. John answered, and with truth, for Loveday did not know the name of any actress in the world. When his brother had gone, Captain Bob hastened off in a state of great animation to Anne, whom he found on the top of a neighbouring hillock which the daylight had scarcely as yet deserted. "'You've been a long time coming in, sir,' said she, in sprightly tones of reproach. "'Yes, dearest, and, and you'll be glad to hear why. I've found out the whole mystery. Yes, why, he's queer and everything.' Anne looked startled. "'He's up to the gunwale in love. We must try to help him on it, or I fear he'll go melancholy mad-like.' "'We help him?' she asked faintly. "'He's lost his heart to one of the play-actors at but Budmouth, and I think she slights him.' "'Oh, I'm so glad!' she exclaimed. "'Glad that his venture don't prosper?' "'Oh, no, glad he's so sensible. "'How long is it since that alarm of the French?' Six weeks, honey. Why do you ask?' "'Men can forget in six weeks, can't they, Bob?' The impression that John had really kissed her still remained. "'Well, uh, some men might,' observed Bob judiciously. "'I couldn't.' Perhaps John might. I couldn't forget you in twenty times as long. Do you know, Anne, I half thought it was you John cared about, and it was a weight off my mind when he said he didn't. Did he say he didn't? Yes, he assured me himself that the only person in the whole of his heart was this lovely play-actress and nobody else. How I should like to see her? Yes, so should I. I had rather it had been one of our own neighbours' girls, whose birth and breeding we know of, but still, if that is his taste, I hope it will end well for him. How very quick he has been! I certainly wish we could see her. I don't know so much as her name. He's very close and wouldn't tell a thing about her. Couldn't we get him to go to the theatre with us, and then we could watch him and easily find out the right one? Then we would learn if she is a good young woman, and if she is... Could we not ask her here, and so make it smoother for him? He's been very gay recently. That means budding love. And sometimes between his gaieties he's had melancholy moments. That means there's difficulty. Bob thought her plan a good one, and resolved to put it into practice on the first available evening. Anne was very curious as to whether John did really cherish a new passion, the story having quite surprised her. Possibly it was true, Six weeks had passed since John had shown a single symptom of the old attachment, and what could not that space of time effect in the heart of a soldier whose very profession it was to leave girls behind him? After this, John Loveday did not come in to see them for nearly a month, a neglect which was set down by Bob as an additional proof that his brother's affections were no longer exclusively centred to his old home. When at last he did arrive, and the theatre-going was mentioned to him, the flush of consciousness which Anne expected to see upon his face was unaccountably absent. Uh, "'Yes, Bob, I should very well like to go to the theatre. he replied heartily. Uh, "'Who's going besides?' "'Only Anne,' Bob told him. 
and then it seemed to occur to the trumpet major that something had been expected of him. He rose and said privately to Bob, with some confusion, Oh, oh, oh yes, of course we'll go, as I am connected with one of the... In short, I, I could get you in for nothing, you know. At least let me manage everything. Yes, yes, I wonder you didn't propose to take us before, Jack, and uh, let us have a good look at her. I ought to have. You should go on a king's night. You won't want me to point her out, Bob. I have my reason at present for asking it. <laughs> we'll be content with guessing, said his brother. When the gallant John was gone, Anne observed, Bob, how he is changed. I watched him. He showed no feeling, even when you burst upon him suddenly with the subject nearest his heart. It must be because his suit don't fay, said Captain Bob. End of chapter 29 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 30 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Markman. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 30. At the Theatre Royal. In two or three days, a message arrived asking them to attend at the theatre on the coming evening, with the added request that they would dress in their gayest clothes, to do justice to the places taken. Accordingly, in the course of the afternoon they drove off, Bob having clothed himself in a splendid suit, recently purchased as an attempt to bring himself nearer to Anne's style when they appeared in public together. As finished off by this dashing and really fashionable attire, he was the perfection of a beau in the dog days, pantaloons and boots of the newest make, yards and yards of muslin wound round his neck, forming a sort of asylum for the lower part of his face, two fancy waistcoats, and coat buttons like circular shaving glasses. The absurd ex extreme of female fashion, which was to wear muslin dresses in January, was at this time equal by that of the men, who wore clothes enough in August to melt them. Nobody would have guessed from Bob's presentation, now that he had ever been aloft on a dark night in the Atlantic, or knew the hundred ingenuities that could be performed with a rope's end and a marline spike, as well as his mother tongue. It was a day of days. Anne wore her celebrated celestial dew, police, her leghorn hat, and her muslin dress with the waist under the arms, the latter being decorated with excellent honiton lace bought of the woman who traveled from that place to Overcombe in its neighborhood with a basket full of her own manufacture, and a cushion on which she worked by the wayside. John met the lovers at the inn outside the town, and after stabling the horse, they entered the town together, the trumpet major informing them that the watering place had never been so full before, that the court, the Prince of Wales, and everybody of consequence was there, and that an attic could scarcely be got for the money. The king had gone for a cruise in his yacht, and they would be in time to see him land. Then drums and fifes were heard, and in a minute or two they saw Sergeant Stanner advancing along the street with a firm countenance, fiery pole, and rigid staring eyes in front of his recruiting party. The sergeant's sword was drawn, and at intervals of two or three inches along its shining blade were impaled fluttering one-pound notes to express the lavish bounty that was offered. He gave a stern, suppressed nod of friendship to our people and passed by. Next they came up to a wagon, bowered over with leaves and flowers so that the men inside could hardly be seen. "'Come to see the king! Hip, hip, hurrah!' cried a voice within, and turning they saw through the leaves the nose and face of Cripplestraw. The wagon contained all Derriman's workpeople. "'Is your master here?' said John. "'No trumpet, Major, sir, but young Maester is coming to fetch us at nine o'clock in case we should be too blind to drive home.' "'Oh, where is he now?' "'Never mind,' said Anne impatiently, in which the trumpet major obediently moved on. By the time they reached the pier, it was six o'clock. The royal yacht was returning, a fact announced by the ships in the harbor firing a salute. The king came ashore with his hat in his hand and returned the salutations of the well-dressed crowd in his old, indiscriminate fashion. While this cheering and waving of handkerchiefs was going on, Anne stood with between the two brothers, who protectingly joined their hands behind the, her rack, as if she were a delicate piece of statuary that a push might damage. Soon the king had passed, and receiving the military salutes of the piquet, joined the queen and princesses at Gloucester Lodge, the homely house of red brick in which he unostentatiously resided. As there was yet some little time before the theatre would open, 
They strayed upon the velvet sands and listened to the songs of the sailors, one of whom extemporized for the occasion. Portland rode the king aboard. The king aboard. Portland rode the king aboard. We weighed and sailed from Portland Road. When they had looked on a while at the combats at Singlestick, which were in progress hard by, and seen the sum of five guineas handed over to the modest gentleman who had broken most heads, they returned to Gloucester Lodge, whence the king and other members of his family now reappeared, and drove at a slow trot round to the theatre in carriages drawn by the Hanoverian white horses that were so well known in the town at this date. When Anne and Bob entered the theater, they found that John had taken excellent places, and concluded that he had got them for nothing through the influence of the lady of his choice. As a matter of fact, he had paid full prices for those two seats, like any other outsider, and even then had a difficulty in getting them, it being a king's night. When they were settled, he himself retired to an obscure part of the pit, from which the stage was scarcely visible. "'We can see beautiful,' said Bob, in an aristocratic voice as he took a delicate pitch of snuff and drew out the magnificent pocket handkerchief brought home from the east for such occasions, but I'm afraid poor John can't see it all. But we can see him, replied Anne, and notice by his face which of them it is he is so charmed with. The light of that corner candle falls right upon his cheek. By this time the king had appeared in his place, which was overhung by a canopy of crimson satin fringed with gold, about twenty places were occupied by the royal family and suite, and beyond them was a crowd of powdered and glittered personages of fashion, completely filling the center of the little building, though the king so frequently patronized the local stage during these years that the crush was not inconvenient. The curtain rose and the play began. Tonight it was one of Coleman's, who at this time enjoyed great popularity, and Mr. Bannister supported the leading character. Anne, with her hand privately clasped in Bob's, and looking as if she did not know it, partly watched the piece, and partly the face of the, the impressionable John, who had so soon transferred his affections elsewhere. She had not long to wait. When a certain one of the subordinate ladies of the comedy entered on the stage, the trumpet major in his corner not only looked conscious, but started and gazed with parted lips. "'This must be the one,' whispered Anne quickly. "'See, he is agitated.' She turned to Bob, but at the same moment his hand convulsively closed upon hers as he, too, strangely fixed his eyes upon the newly entered lady. What is it? Anne looked from one to the other without regarding the stage at all. Her answer came in the voice of the actress who now spoke for the first time. The accents were those of Miss Matilda Johnson. One thought rushed into both of their minds on the instant, and Bob was the first to utter it. What? Is she the woman of his choice after all? "'If so, it is a dreadful thing,' murmured Anne. "'But as may be imagined, the unfortunate John was as much surprised by this re-encounter as the other two. "'Until this moment he had been in utter ignorance of the theatrical company and all that pertained to it. "'Moreover, much as he knew of Miss Johnson, he was not aware that she had ever been trained in her youth as an actress, "'and that, after lapsing into straits and difficulties, for a couple of years she had been so fortunate as to again procure an engagement here.' The trumpet major, though not prominently seated, had been seen by Matilda already, who had observed still more plainly her old betrothed and Anne in the other part of the house. John was not concerned on his own account at being face to face with her, but at the extraordinary suspicion that this conjuncture must revive in the minds of his best beloved friends. After some moments of pained reflection, he tapped his knee. "'Gad, I won't explain. It shall go as it is,' he said." Let them think her mine. Better than that. Better that than the truth, after all. Had personal prominence in the scene been at this moment proportioned to intentness of feeling, the whole audience, regal and otherwise, would have faded into an indistinct mist of background, leaving as the sole emergent and telling figures Bob and Anne at one point, the trumpet major on the left hand, and Matilda at the opposite corner of the stage. But fortunately the deadlock of awkward suspense into which all four had fallen was terminated by an accident. A messenger entered the king's box with dispatches. There was an instant pause in the performance. The dispatch box being opened, the king read for a few moments with great interest. The eyes of the whole house, including those of Anne Garland, being anxiously fixed upon his face, for terrible events fell as unexpectedly as thunderbolts at this critical time of our history. The king at length beckoned to Lord, who was immediately behind him, 
the play was again stopped, and the contents of the dispatch were publicly communicated to the audience. Sir Robert Calder, cruising off Finisterre, had come in sight of Villeneuve, and made the signal for action, which, though checked by the weather, had resulted in the capture of two Spanish line of battle ships, and the retreat of Villeneuve into Ferrol. The news was received with truly national feeling, if noise might be taken as an index of patriotism. Rule Britannia was called for and sung by the whole house, but the importance of the event was far from being recognized at this time, and Bob Loveday, as he sat there and heard it, had very little conception how it would bear upon his destiny. This parenthetic excitement diverted for a few minutes the eyes of Bob and Anne from the trumpet major, and when the play proceeded and they looked back to his corner, he was gone. He's just slipped around to talk to her behind the scenes, said Bob knowingly. Shall we go to and tease him for a sly dog? No, I would rather not. Shall we go home then? Not unless her presence is too much for you. Oh, not at all. We'll stay here. Ah, there she is again. They sat on and listened to Matilda's speeches, which she delivered with such delightful coolness that they soon began to considerably interest one of the party. "'Well, what a nerve the young woman has,' he said at last in tones of admiration and gazing at Miss Johnson with all his might. "'After all, Jack's taste is not so bad. She's really deuced clever.' "'Bob, I'll go home if you wish to,' said Anne quickly. "'Oh, no, let us see how she fleets herself off that bit of a scrape she's playing at now. "'Well, what a hand she is at it, to be sure.' Anne said no more, but waited on, supremely uncomfortable and almost tearful. She began to feel that she did not like life particularly well. It was too complicated. She saw nothing of the scene and only longed to get away and to get Bob away with her. At last a curtain fell on the final act and then began this farce of No Song, No Supper. Matilda did not appear in this piece and Anne again inquired if they should go home. This time Bob agreed and taking her under his care with redoubled affection to make up for the species of coma which had seized upon his heart for a time, he quietly accompanied her out of the house. When they emerged upon the esplanade, the August moon was shining across the sea from the direction of St. Altam's head. Bob unconsciously loitered and turned towards the pier. Reaching the end of the promenade, they surveyed the quivering waters in silence for some time, until a long, dark line shot from behind the promontory of the Nauf and swept forward into the harbor. "'What boat is that?' said Anne. It seems to be some frigate lying in the roads, said Bob carelessly, as he brought Anne round with a gentle pressure of his arm and bent his steps toward the homeward end of the town. Meanwhile, Miss Johnson, having finished her duties for that evening, rapidly changed her dress and went out likewise. The prominent position which Anne and Captain Bob had occupied side by side in the theater left her no alternative but to suppose that the situation was arranged by Bob as a species of defiance to herself and her heart, such as it was, became proportionately embittered against him. In spite of the rise in her fortune, Miss Johnson still remembered, and always would remember, her humiliating departure from Overcombe, and it had been to her even a more grievous thing that Bob had acquiesced in his brother's ruling than that John had determined it. At the time of setting out, she was sustained by a firm faith that Bob would follow her, and nullify his brother's scheme. But though she waited, Bob never came. She passed along by the houses facing the sea and scanned the shore, the footway, and the open road close to her, which illuminated by the slanting moon to a great brightness, sparkled with minute facets of crystallized salts from the water sprinkled there during the day. The promenaders at the further edge appeared in the dark profiles, and beyond them was the gray sea, parted into two masses by the tapering braid of moonlight across the waves. Two forms crossed this line at a startling nearness to her, she marked them at once as Anne and Bob Loveday. They were walking slowly, and in the earnestness of their discourse were oblivious of the presence of any human being save themselves. Matilda stood motionless till they had passed. How I love them, she said, treading the initial step of her walk onwards with a vehemence that walking did not demand. So do I, especially one, said a voice at her elbow, and looked in her face, which had been fully exposed to the moon. "'You? Who are you?' she asked. "'Don't you remember, ma'am? "'We walked some way together towards Overcombe early in the summer.' "'Matilda looked more closely "'and perceived that the speaker was Derriman in plain clothes. "'He continued, "'You are one of the ladies of the theatre, I know. "'May I ask why you said in such a queer way "'that you love that couple?' "'In a queer way? 
Well, as if you hated them. I don't mind your knowing that I have good reason to hate them. You do too, it seems. That man, said Festa savagely, came to me one night about that very woman, insulted me before I could put myself on my guard, and ran away before I could come up with him and avenge myself. The woman tricks me at every turn. I want to part him. Then why don't you? There's a splendid opportunity. Do you see that soldier walking along? He's a Marine. He looks into the gallery of the theater every night, and he's in connection with the press gang that came ashore just now from the frigate lying in the Portland roads. They are often here for men. Yes, our boatmen dread him. Well, we have only to tell him that Loveday is a seaman to be clear of him this very night. Done, said Festus. Take my arm and come this way. They walked across to the footway. Fine night, Sergeant. It is, sir. Looking for hands, I suppose? It is not to be known, sir. We don't begin till half past ten. It is a pity you don't begin now. I could show you an excellent game. What, that little nest of fellows at the old rooms in Cove Row? I have just heard of him. No, come here. Festus, with Miss Johnson on his arm, led the sergeant quickly along the parade, and by the time they reached the Narrows, the lovers who walked but slowly were visible in front of them. There's your man, he said. That buck in pantaloons and half boots, a looking like a squire? Twelve months ago he was mate of the brig Pewet, but his father has made money and keeps him at home. Faith, now you tell of it, there's a hint of sea legs about him. What's the young beau's name? Don't tell, whispered Matilda, impulsively clutching, impulsively clutching Festus's arm. But Festus had already said, Robert Loveday, son of the miller at Overcombe. You may find several likely fellows in that neighborhood. The Marines said that he would bear it in mind, and they left him. I wish you had not told, said Matilda tearfully. She's the worst. Dash my eyes now, listen to that. Why, you chicken-hearted old stager, you was as well agreed as I. Come now, hasn't he used you badly? Matilda's acrimony returned. I was down to my luck, or he wouldn't have had the chance, she said. Well then, let things be. End of chapter 30. Recording by Markman. Chapter 31 of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Markman. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 31. Midnight Visitors. Miss Garland and Loveday walked leisurely to the inn and called for horse and gig. While the hostler was bringing it round, the landlord, who knew Bob and his family well, spoke to him quietly in the passage. "'Is this then because you want to throw dust in the eyes of the black diamond chaps?' with an admiring glance at Bob's costume. "'The black diamond?' said Bob, and Anne turned pale. She hove in sight just after dark, and at nine o'clock a boat having more than a dozen marines on board with cloaks on rowed into harbor. Bob reflected. "'Then there'll be a press tonight. Depend on it,' he said. "'They won't know you, will they, Bob?' said Anne anxiously. They certainly won't know him for a seaman now, remarked the landlord, laughing, and again surveying Bob up and down. But if I was you two, I should drive home along straight and quiet, and be very busy in the mill all tomorrow, Mr. Loveday. They drove away, and when they had got onward out of the town, and strained her eyes wistfully toward Portland, its dark contour, lying like a whale on the sea, was just perceptible in the gloom as the background to half a dozen ships, lights near at hand. They can't make you go, now you are a gentleman tradesman, can they? she asked. If they want me, they can have me, dearest. I have often said I ought to volunteer. And not care about me at all? It is just that that keeps me at home. I won't leave you if I can help it. It cannot make such a vast difference to the country whether one man goes or stays. But if you want to go, you had better, and not mind us at all. Bob put a period to her speech by a mark of affection to which history affords many parallels in every age. She said no more about the Black Diamond, but whenever they ascended the hill, she turned her head to look at the lights in Portland Roads and the gray expanse of intervening sea. Though Captain Bob had stated he did not wish to volunteer and would not leave her if he could not help it, 
the remark required some qualification. That Anne was charming and loving enough to chain him anywhere was true, but he had begun to find the millwork terribly irksome at times, often during the last month, when standing among the rumbling cogs in his new miller's suit, which ill became him. He had yawned, thought wistfully of the old pea-jacket and the waters of the deep blue sea. His dread of displeasing his father by showing anything of this change of sentiment was great, yet he might have braved it just for knowing that his marriage with Anne, which he'd hoped might take place the next year, was dependent entirely upon his adherence to the mill business. Even were his father indifferent, Mrs. Loveday would never entrust her only daughter to the hands of a husband who would be away from home five-sixths of his time. But though, apart from Anne, he was not averse to seafaring in itself, to be smuggled thither by the machinery of a press gang was intolerable, and the process of seizing, stunning, pinioning, and carrying off unwilling hands was one which Bob as a man had always determined to hold out against to the utmost of his power. Hence, as they went towards home, he frequently listened for sounds behind him, but hearing none, he assured his sweetheart that they were safe for that night at least. The mill was still going when they arrived. Though old Mr. Loveday was not to be seen, he had retired as soon as he had heard the horse hooves in the lane, leaving Bob to watch the grinding mill till three o'clock, when the elder would rise and Bob withdraw to bed, a frequent arrangement between them since Bob had taken the place of grinder. Having reached the privacy of her own room, Anne threw open the window, for she had not the slightest intention of going to bed just yet. The tale of the black diamond had disturbed her by a slow, insidious process that was worse than sudden fright. Her window looked into the court before the house, now wrapped in the shadow of the trees and the hill, and she leaned upon its sill, listening intently. She could have heard any strange sound distinctly enough in one direction, but in the other all low noises were absorbed in the patter of the mill and the rush of the water down the race. However, what she heard came from hitherto silent side, and was intelligible in a moment as being the footsteps of men. She tried to think they were some late stragglers from Budmouth, Alas, no, the tramp was too regular for that of villagers. She hastily turned, extinguished a candle, and listened again. As they were on the main road, there was, after all, every probability that the party would pass the bridge, which gave access to the mill court, without turning in upon it, or even noticing that such an entrance existed. In this again, she was disappointed. They crossed into the front without a pause. The pulsations of her heart became a turmoil now. For why would these men, if they were the press gang and strangers to the locality, have supposed that a sailor was to be found here, the younger of the two millers, Loveday, being never seen now in any garb which could suggest that he was other than a miller pure like his father? One of the men spoke. I am not sure that we are in the right place, he said. This is a mill, anyhow, said another. There's lots about here. Then come this way a moment with your light. Two of the group went towards the cart house on the opposite side of the yard, and when they reached it a dark lantern was opened, the rays being directed upon the front of the miller's wagon. Loveday and son, overcombe mill, continued the man, reading from the wagon. Son, you see, is lately painted in. That's our man. He moved to turn off the light, but before he had done so it flashed over the forms of the speakers and revealed a sergeant, a naval officer, and a file of marines, and waited to see no more. When Bob stayed up to grind, as he was going tonight, he often sat in his room instead of remaining all the time in the mill, and this room was an isolated chamber over the bakehouse, which could not be reached without going downstairs and ascending the stepladder that served for his staircase. Anne descended in the dark, clambered up the ladder, and saw that light strayed through the chink below the floor. His window faced towards the garden, and hence the light could not as yet have been seen by the press gang. "'Bob, dear Bob,' she said through the keyhole. "'Put out your light and run out by the back door.' "'Why?' said Bob, leisurely knocking the ashes from the pipe he had been smoking. "'The press gang. They have come by God. "'Who can have blown up upon me? "'All right, dearest, I'm game.' "'Anne, scarcely knowing what she did, descended the ladder and ran to the back door, "'hastily unbolting it to save Bob's time and gently opening it in readiness for him. "'She had no sooner done this than she felt hands laid upon her shoulder from without.' and a voice exclaiming, "'That's how he does it. Quite an obliging young man.' Though the hands held her rather roughly, Anne did not mind for herself, and turning she cried desperately, in tones intended to reach Bob's ears, "'They are at the back door. Try the front.' But inexperienced Miss Garland, 
little knew the shrewd habits of the gentlemen she had to deal with, who, well used to this sort of pastime, had already posted themselves at every outlet from the premises. "'Bring the lantern,' shouted the fellow who held her. "'Why, tis a girl. I half thought so. Here is a way in,' he continued to his comrades, hastening to the foot of the ladder which led to Bob's room. "'What do you want?' said Bob, quietly opening the door and showing himself still radiant in the full dress that he had worn with such effect at the Theatre Royal, which he had been about to change for his mill suit when Anne gave the alarm. "'This gentleman can't be the right one,' observed the Marine, rather impressed by Bob's appearance. "'Yes, yes, that's the man,' said the sergeant. "'Now take it quietly, my young cock o' wax. "'You look as if you meant to, and tis wise of ye.' "'Where are you going to take me?' said Bob. "'Only aboard the Black Diamond. "'If you choose to take the bounty and come voluntarily, "'you'll be allowed to go ashore whenever your ship's in port. "'If you don't, and we've got to pinion ye, "'you will not have your liberty at all. "'As you must come, willy-nilly, "'you'll do the first if you've any brains whatever.' Bob's temper began to rise. Don't you talk so large about your pinioning, my man, when I've settled. Now or never, young blowhard, interrupted his informant. Come what jabber is this going on, said the lieutenant, stepping forward. Bring your man. One of the marines set foot on the ladder, but at the same moment a shoe from Bob's hand hit the lantern with a well-aimed directness, knocking it clean out of the grasp of the man who held it. In spite of the darkness, they began to scramble up the ladder. Bob thereupon shut the door, which being but of slight construction, was, as he knew, only a momentary defense, but it gained him time enough to open the window, gather up his legs on the sill, and spring across into the apple tree growing without. He alighted without much hurt beyond a few scratches from the bows, a shower of falling apples testifying to the force of his leap. "'Here he is!' shouted several below, who had seen Bob's figure flying like a raven's across the sky." There was a stillness for a moment in the tree. Then the fugitive made haste to climb out upon a low-hanging branch towards the garden, at which the men beneath all rushed in that direction to catch him as he dropped, saying, "'You may as well come down, old boy. "'Twas a spry jump, and we give you credit for it.' The latter movement of Loveday had been a mere feint. Partly hidden by the leaves, he glided back to the other part of the tree from whence it was easy to jump upon a thatch-covered outhouse. This intention they did not appear to suspect, which gave him the opportunity of sliding down the slope and entering the back door of the mill. "'Here's he! Here's he!' the man exclaimed, running back from the tree. By this time they had obtained another light and pursued him closely along the back quarters of the mill. Bob had entered the lower room, seized hold of the chain by which the flour sacks were hoisted from story to story by connection with the mill wheel, and pulled the rope that hung alongside for the purpose of throwing it into gear. The foremost pursuers arrived just in time to see Captain Bob's legs and shoe buckles vanishing through the trap door in the joist overhead, his person having been whirled up by the machinery like any bag of flour, and the trap falling to behind him. "'He's gone up by the hoist,' said the sergeant, running up the ladder in the corner to the next floor, and elevating the light just in time to see Bob's suspended figure ascending in the same way through the same sort of trap in the second floor." The second trap also fell together behind him, and he was lost to view as before. It was more difficult to follow now. There was only a flimsy little ladder, and the men ascended cautiously. When they stepped out upon the loft, it was empty. "'He must have let go here,' said one of the Marines, who knew more about Mills than the others. "'If he had held fast a moment longer, he would have been dashed against that beam.' They looked up, the hook by which Bob had held on, had ascended to the roof and was winding down the cylinder. Nothing was visible elsewhere but the boarded divisions like the stalls of a stable on each side of the stage they stood upon, these compartments being more or less heaped up with wheat and barley in the grain. Perhaps he's buried himself in the corn. The whole crew jumped into the corn bins and stirred about their yellow contents, but neither arm, leg, nor coattail was uncovered. They removed sacks, peeked among the rafters of the roof, but to no purpose. The lieutenant began to fume at the loss of time. "'What cursed fools to let the man go! Why, look here, what's this?' He had opened the door by which sacks were taken in from wagons without, and dangling from the cat head projecting above it was the rope used in lifting them. "'There's the way he went down,' the officer continued. "'The man's gone.' Amidst mumblings and curses, the gang descended the pair of ladders and came into the open air, but Captain Bob was nowhere to be seen. When they reached the front door of the house, the miller was standing on the threshold, half-dressed. "'Your son is a clever fellow, Miller. 
said the lieutenant, but it would have been much better for him if he had come quiet. That's a matter of opinion, said Loveday. I have no doubt that he's in the house. He may be, and he may not. Do you know where he is? I do not, and if I did, I shouldn't tell. Naturally. I heard steps beating up the road, sir, said the sergeant. They turned from the door, and leaving four of the marines to keep watch around the house, the remainder of the party watched into the lane as far as where the other road branched off. While they were pausing to decide which course to take, one of the soldiers held up the light. A black object was discernible upon the ground before them, and they found it to be a hat, the hat of Bob Loveday. We are on the track, cried the sergeant, deciding for this direction. They tore on rapidly, and the footsteps previously heard became audible again, increasing in clearness, which told that they gained upon the fugitive, who in another five minutes stopped and turned. The rays of the candle fell upon Anne. What do you want, she said, showing her frightened face. They made no reply, but wheeled round and left her. She sank down on the bank to rest, having done all she could. It was she who had taken down Bob's hat from a nail and dropped it at the turning with the view of misleading them till he should have got clear off. End of chapter 31 Recording by Mark Mann Chapter 32 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mark Mann The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy, Chapter 32 Deliverance But Anne Garland was too anxious to remain long away from the center of operations. When she got back, she found that the press gang were standing in the court discussing their next move. Waste no more time here, the lieutenant said. Two more villages to visit tonight and the nearest three miles off. There's nobody else in this place and we can't come back again. When they were moving away, one of the private marines, who had kept his eye on Anne and noticed her distress, contrived to say, in a whisper as he passed her, We're coming back again as soon as it begins to get light. That's only said to deceive E. Keep your young men out of the way. They went as they had come, and a little household then met together, Mrs. Loveday having by this time dressed herself and come down. A long and anxious discussion followed. Somebody must have told upon the chap, Loveday remarked. How should they have found out about him else, now he's been home from sea this twelve-month? Anne then mentioned what the friendly marine had told her, and fearing lest Bob was in the house, and would be discovered there when daylight came, they searched and called for him everywhere. What clothes has he got on, said the miller. His lovely new suit, said his wife. I warn it is quite spoiled. He's got no hat, said Anne. Well, said Loveday, you two go and lie down and I'll bide up. And as soon as he comes in, which he'll do most likely in the course of the night, I'll let him know that they are coming again. Anne and Mrs. Loveday went to their bedrooms, and the miller entered the mill as if he were simply staying up to grind. But he continually left the floor chute to go outside and walk around. Each time he could see no living being near the spot. Anne, meanwhile, had laid down dressed upon her bed, the window still open, her ears intent upon the sound of footsteps, and dreading the reappearance of daylight and the gang's return. Three or four times during the night she descended to the mill to inquire of her stepfather if Bob had shown himself, but the answer was always in the negative. At length the curtains of her bed began to reveal their pattern. The brass handles of the drawers gleamed forth and day dawned. While the light was yet no more than a suffusion of pallor, she arose, put on her hat, and determined to explore the surrounding premises before the men arrived. Emerging into the raw loneliness of the daybreak, she went upon the bridge and looked up and down the road. It was as she had left it, empty, and the solitude was rendered yet more insistent by the silence of the mill wheel, which was now stopped, the miller having given up, expecting Bob, and retired to bed about three o'clock. The footprints of the marine still remained in the dust on the bridge, all the heel marks toward the house, showing that the party had not as yet returned. While she lingered, she heard a slight noise in the other direction, and turning, saw a woman approaching. The woman came up quickly, and to her amazement, Anne recognized Matilda. Her walk was convulsive, face pale, almost haggard, and the cold light upon the morning invested it with all the ghostliness of death. She had plainly walked all the way from Budmouth, for her shoes were covered with dust. "'Has the press gang been here?' she gasped. "'If not, they are coming.' "'They have been.' "'And got him? I am too late.' 
No, they are coming back again. Why did you... I came to try to save him. Can we save him? Where is he? Anne looked the woman in the face, and it was impossible to doubt that she was in earnest. I don't know, she answered. I am trying to find him before they come. Will you not let me help you? cried the repentant Matilda. Without either objecting or assenting, Anne turned and led the way to the back part of the homestead. Matilda, too, had suffered that night. From the moment of parting with Festus Derriman, a sentiment of revulsion from the act to which she had been a party set in and increased, till at length it reached an intensity of remorse which she could not passively bear. She had risen before day and hastened to the toward, to the worst, and if possible hinder consequences that she had been the first to set in train. After going hither and thither in the adjoining field, Anne entered the garden. The walks were bathed in gray dew, and as she passed observantly along them, it appeared as if they had been brushed by some foot at a much earlier hour. At the end of the garden, bushes of broom, laurel, and yew formed a constantly encroaching shrubbery that had come there almost by chance, and was never trimmed. Behind these bushes was a garden seat, and upon it lay Bob sound asleep. The ends of his hair were clothed with damp and there was a foggy film upon the mirror-like buttons of his coat, and upon the buckles of his shoes. His bunches of new gold seals was dimmed by the same insidious dampness. His shirt frill and muslin neckcloth were limp as seaweed. It was plain that he had been there a long time. Anne shook him, but he did not awake, his breathing being slow and stertorous. "'Bob, wake till your own Anne,' she said with innocent earnestness, and then, fearfully turning her head, she saw that Matilda was close behind her. "'You needn't mind me,' said Matilda bitterly. "'I am on your side now. Shake him again.' Anne shook him again, but he slept on. Then she noticed that his forehead bore the mark of a heavy wound. "'I fancy I hear something,' said her companion, starting forward, endeavoring to wake Bob herself. "'He is stunned, or drugged,' she said. "'There is no rousing him.' Anne raised her head and listened. From the direction of the eastern road came the sound of a steady tramp. "'They are coming back,' she said, clasping her hands. They will take him, ill as he is. He won't open his eyes. No, it is no use. Oh, what shall we do? Matilda did not reply, but running to the end of the seat on which Bob lay, tried its weight in her arms. It is not too heavy, she said. You take that end and I'll take this. We'll carry him away to some place of hiding. Anne instantly seized the other end, and they proceeded with their burden at a slow pace to the lower garden gate, which they reached as the tread of the press gang resounded over the bridge that gave access to the mill court now hidden from view by the hedge and the trees of the garden. "'We will go down inside this field,' said Anne faintly. "'No,' said the other. "'They will see our foot-tracks in the dew. "'We must go into the road. "'It is the very road they will come down when they leave the mill. "'It cannot be helped. "'It is neck or nothing with us now.' "'So they emerged upon the road and staggered along without speaking, "'occasionally resting for a moment to ease their arms, "'then shaking him to arouse him and finding it useless, seizing the seat again. When they had gone about two hundred yards, Matilda betrayed signs of exhaustion, and she asked, Is there no shelter near? When we get to that little field of corn, said Anne, surely there is some place near. She pointed to a few scrubby bushes overhanging a little stream which passed under the road near this point. They are not thick enough, said Anne. Let us take him under the bridge, said Matilda. I can go no further. Entering the opening by which Catalyst descended to drink, they waded into the weedy water, which here rose a few inches above their ankles. To ascend the stream, stoop onto the arch, and reach the center of the roadway was the work of a few minutes. If they look under the arch, we are lost, murmured Anne. There is no parapet to the bridge, and they may pass over without heeding. They waded their heads almost in contact with the reeking arch, and their feet encircled by the stream, which was at its summer lowness now. For some minutes they could hear nothing but the babble of the water over their ankles and round the legs of the, of the seat on which Bob slumbered, the sounds being reflected in a musical tinkle from the hollow sides of the arch. Anne's anxiety now was lest he should not continue sleeping till the search was over, but start up with his habitual imprudence and scorning such means of safety rush out into their arms. A quarter of an hour dragged by and then indications reached their ears that the re-examination of the mill had begun and ended. The well-known tramp drew nearer, and reverberated through the ground over their heads, where its volume signified to the listeners that the party had been largely augmented by pressed men since the night preceding. 
the gang passed the arch, and the noise regularly diminished, as if no man among them had thought of looking aside for a moment. Matilda broke the silence. I wonder if they have left the watch behind, she said doubtfully. I will go and see, said Anne. Wait until I return. No, I can do no more. When you come back, I shall be gone. I ask one thing of you. If all goes well with you and him, and he marries you, don't be alarmed. My plans lie elsewhere. When you are his wife, tell him who helped to carry him away. But don't mention my name to the rest of your family, either now or at any time. Anne regarded the speaker for a moment and promised, after which she waited out from the archway. Matilda stood looking at Bob for a moment, as if preparing to go, till moved by some impulse she bent and lightly kissed him once. "'How can you?' cried Anne reproachfully, when leaving the mouth of the arch she had bent back and seen the act. Matilda flushed. "'You jealous baby,' she said scornfully. Anne hesitated for a moment, then went out from the water and hastened toward the mill. She entered by the garden, and seeing no one, advanced and peeped in at the window. Her mother and Mr. Loveday were sitting within as usual. "'Are they all gone?' said Anne softly. "'Yes, they did not trouble us much, beyond going into every room and searching about the garden where they saw steps. They have been lucky tonight. They have caught fifteen or twenty men at places further on, so the loss of Bob was no hurt to their feelings. I wonder where in the world the poor fellow is.' "'I will show you,' said Anne.' and explaining in a few words what had happened, she was promptly followed by David and Loveday along the road. She lifted her dress and entered the arch with some anxiety on account of Matilda, but the actress was gone, and Bob lay on the seat as she had left him. Bob was brought out and water thrown upon his face, but though he moved, he did not rouse himself until some time after he had been born into the house. Here he opened his eyes and saw them standing round and gathered a little consciousness. "'You are all all right, my boy,' said his father. "'What have happened to ye? "'Where did ye get that terrible blow?' "'Ah, I can mind now,' murmured Bob, "'with a stupefied gaze around. "'I fell in slipping down the topsail halyard. "'The rope, that is, was too short, "'and I fell upon my head. "'And then I went away. "'When I came back, I thought I wouldn't disturb ye, "'so I lay down out there to sleep out the watch. "'But the pain in my head was so great "'that I couldn't get to sleep.' So I picked some of the poppy heads in the border, which I once heard was a good thing for sending folks to sleep when they are in pain. So I munched up all I could find and dropped off quite nicely. I wondered who had picked them, said Molly. I noticed they were gone. Why, you might never have woke again, said Mrs. Loveday, holding up her hands. How is your head now? I hardly know, replied the young man, putting his hand to his forehead and beginning to doze again. Where be those fellows that boarded us? With this... Smooth water and fine breeze, we ought to get away from them. Haul in the larboard braces and bring her to the wind. You are at home, dear Bob, said Anne, bending over him, and the men are gone. Come along upstairs. The beast hardly awake now, said his father, and Bob was assisted to bed. End of chapter 32. Recording by Mark Mann. Chapter 33 of The Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 33. A Discovery Turns the Scale. In four and twenty hours, Bob had recovered. But though physically himself again, he was not at all sure of his position as a patriot. He had that practical knowledge of seamanship, of which the country stood much in need, and it was humiliating to find that impressment seemed to be necessary to teach him to use it for her advantage. Many neighboring young men, less fortunate than himself, had been pressed and taken, and their absence seemed a reproach to him. He went away by himself into the mill roof, and surrounded by the corn heaps, gave vent to self-condemnation. Certainly I am no man to lie here so long for the pleasure of sighting that young girl forty times a day, and letting her sight me bless her eyes, till I must needs want a press gang to teach me what I've forgot. And is it then all over with me as a British sailor? We'll see. And when he was thrown under the influence of Anne's eyes again, which were more tantalizingly beautiful than ever just now, so it seemed to him, his intention of offering his services to the government would wax weaker, and he would put off his final decision till the next day. Anne saw these fluctuations of his mind between love and patriotism, and being terrified by what she had heard of sea fights, 
used the utmost art of which she was capable to seduce him from his forming purpose. She came to him in the mill, wearing the very prettiest of her morning jackets, the one that only just passed the waist, and was laced so tastefully round the collar and bosom. There she would appear in her new hat, with a bouquet of primroses on one side, and on the following Sunday she walked before him in lemon-colored boots, so that her feet looked like a pair of yellow hammers flitting under her dress. But dress was the least of the means she adopted for chaining him down. She talked more tenderly than ever, asked him to begin small undertakings in the garden on her account. She sang about the house, that the place might seem cheerful when he came in. This singing for a purpose required great effort on her part, leaving her afterwards very sad. When Bob asked her what was the matter, she would say, Nothing, only I am thinking how you will grieve your father and cross his purposes if you carry out your unkind notion of going to sea and forsaking your place in the mill. Yes, Bob would say uneasily. It will trouble him, I know. Being also quite unaware how it would trouble her, he would again postpone, and thus another week passed by. All this time John had not come once to the mill. It appeared as if Miss Johnson absorbed all his time and thoughts. Bob was often seen chuckling over the circumstance. A sly rascal, he said pretending on the day she came to be married that she was not good enough for me, when it was only that he wanted her for himself. How he could have persuaded her to go away is beyond me to say. Anne could not contest this belief of her lover's, and remained silent. But there had more than once occurred to her mind a doubt of its probability. Yet she had only abandoned her opinion that John had schemed for Matilda, to embrace the opposite error, that, finding he had wronged the young lady, he had pitied and grown to love her. And yet Jack, when he was a boy, was the simplest fellow alive, resumed Bob. By George, though, I should have been hot against him for such a trick, if in losing her I hadn't found a better. But she'll never come down to him in the world. She has high notions now. I'm afraid he's doomed to sigh in vain. Though Bob regretted this possibility, the feeling was not reciprocated by Anne. It was true that she knew nothing of Matilda's temporary treachery, and that she disbelieved the story of her lack of virtue. But she did not like the woman. Perhaps it would not matter if he is doomed to sigh in vain, she said. But I owe him no ill will. I have profited by his doings, incomprehensible as they are. And she bent her fair eyes on Bob and smiled. Bob looked dubious. He thinks he has affronted me. Now I have seen through him, and that I shall be against meeting him. But of course I am not so touchy. I can stand a practical joke, as can any man who has been afloat. I'll call and see him, and tell him so. Before he started, Bob bethought him of something which would still further prove to the misapprehending John that he was entirely forgiven. He went to his room and, and took from his chest a packet containing a lock of Miss Johnson's hair, which she had given him during their brief acquaintance, and which till now he had quite forgotten. When at starting, he wished Anne goodbye. It was accompanied by such a beaming face that she knew he was full of an idea and asked him what it might be that pleased him so. Why this, he said, smacking his breast pocket, a lock of hair that Matilda gave me. Anne sank back with parted lips. I'm going to give it to Jack. He'll jump for joy to get it. And it will show him how willing I am to give her up to him, fine piece as she is. Will you see her today, Bob? Anne asked with an uncertain smile. Oh, no, unless it is by accident. On reaching the outskirts of the town, he went straight to the barracks, and was lucky enough to find John in his room, at the left-hand corner of the quadrangle. John was glad to see him, but to Bob's surprise he showed no immediate contrition, and thus afforded no room for the brotherly speech of forgiveness which Bob had been going to deliver. As the trumpet major did not open the subject, Bob felt it desirable to begin himself. I have brought ye something that you will value, Jack, he said, as they sat at the window overlooking the large square barrack yard. I have got no further use for it, and you should have had it before if it had entered my head. Thank you, Bob. What is it? said John, looking absently at an awkward squad of young men who were drilling in the enclosure. Tis a young woman's lock of hair. Ah, said John, quite recovering from his abstraction and slightly flushing. Could Bob and Anne have quarreled? Bob drew the paper from his pocket and opened it. Black, said John. Yes, black enough. Whose? Why, Matilda's. Oh, Matilda's. Whose did you think, then? Instead of replying, the trumpet major's face became as red as a sunset, 
and he turned to the window to hide his confusion. Bob was silent, and then he, too, looked into the court. At length he arose, walked to his brother, and laid his hand upon his shoulder. Jack, he said in an altered voice, you are a good fellow. Now I see it all. Oh, no, that's nothing, said John hastily. You've been pretending that you care for this woman, that I mightn't blame myself for heaving you out from the other, which is what I've done without knowing it. What does it matter? But it does matter. I've been making you unhappy all these weeks and weeks through my thoughtlessness. They seem to think at home. You know, John, that you had grown not to care for her, or I wouldn't have done it all for the world. You stick to her, Bob, and never mind me. She belongs to you. She loves you. I have no claim upon her and she thinks nothing of me. She likes you, John, thoroughly well. So does everybody. And if I hadn't come home putting my foot in it, that coming home of mine has been a regular blight upon the family. I ought never to have stayed. The sea is my home, and why couldn't I bide there? The trumpet major drew Bob's discourse off the subject as soon as he could, and Bob, after some unconsidered replies and remarks, seemed willing to avoid it for the present. He did not ask John to accompany him home, as he had intended, and on leaving the barracks, turned southward and entered the town to wander about till he could decide what to do. It was the 3rd of September, but the king's watering place still retained its summer aspect. The royal bathing machine had been drawn out just as Bob reached Gloucester Buildings, and he waited a minute in the lack of other distraction to look on. Immediately that the king's machine had entered the water, a group of floored men with fiddles, violoncellos, a trombone, and a drum came forward packed themselves into another machine that was in waiting, and were drawn out into the waves in the king's rear. All that was to be heard for a few minutes were the slow pulsations of the sea, and then a deafening noise burst from the interior of the second machine with, with power enough to split the boards asunder. It was the condensed mass of musicians inside, striking up the strains of God Save the King as His Majesty's head rose from the water. Bob took off his hat and waited till the end of the performance, which, intended as a pleasant surprise to George III by the loyal burghers, was possibly in the watery circumstances tolerated rather than desired by the dripping monarch. Loveday then passed on to the harbor, where he remained a while, looking at the busy scene of loading and unloading craft and swabbing the decks of yachts, at the boats and barges rubbing against the quay wall, and at the houses of the merchants, some ancient structures of solid stone. Others green shuttered with heavy wooden bow windows, which appeared as if about to drop into the harbor by their own weight. All these things he gazed upon, and thought of one thing, that he had caused great misery to his brother John. The town clock struck, and Bob retraced his steps, till he again approached the Esplanade and Gloucester Lodge, where the morning sun blazed in upon the house fronts, and not a spot of shade seemed to be attainable. A huzzang attracted his attention, and he observed that a number of people had gathered before the king's residence, where a brown curricle had stopped, out of which stepped a hale man in the prime of life, wearing a blue uniform, gilt epaulets, cocked hat and sword, who crossed the pavement and went in. Bob went up and joined the group. "'What's going on?' he said. "'Captain Hardy,' replied a bystander. "'What of him? Just gone in, waiting to see the king.' But the captain is in the West Indies. No, the fleet has come home. They can't find the French anywhere. Will they go and look for them again? asked Bob. Oh, yes. Nelson is determined to find him. As soon as he's refitted, he'll put to sea again. Ah, here's the king coming in. Bob was so interested in what he had just heard that he scarcely noticed the arrival of the king and a body of attendant gentlemen. He went on thinking of his new knowledge. Captain Hardy was come. He was doubtless staying with his family at their small manor house at Possum, a few miles from Overcombe, where he usually spent the intervals between his different cruises. Loveday returned to the mill without further delay, and shortly explaining that John was very well and would come soon, went on to talk of the arrival of Nelson's captain. "'And has he come at last?' said the mother, throwing his thoughts years backward. "'Well, I can mind when he first left home to go on board the Helena as a midshipman.' "'That's not much to remember. I can remember it, too,' said Mrs. Loveday. "'Tis more than twenty years ago, anyhow. And more than that, I can mind when he was born. I was a lad, serving my apprenticeship at the time. He had been in this house often when I was young. When he came home after his first voyage, he stayed about here a long time, and went to look in at the mill whenever he went past. "'What will you be next, sir?' said Mother to him one day, as he stood with his back to the doorpost. "'A lieutenant, Dame Loveday,' says he.' 
And what next? Says she. A commander. And next? Next post captain. And then? Then it will be almost time to die. I'd warrant that he'd mind it to this very day if you were to ask him. Bob heard all this with a manner of preoccupation, and soon retired to the mill. Thence he went to his room by the back passage, and taking his old seafaring garment from a dark closet in the wall, conveyed them to the loft at the top of the mill, where he occupied the remaining spare moments of the day in brushing the mildew from their folds, and hanging each article by the window to get aired. In the evening he returned to the loft, and dressing himself in the old salt suit, went out of the house unobserved by anybody, and ascended the road towards Captain Hardy's native village and present temporary home. The shadeless downs were now brown with the droughts of the passing summer, and few living things met his view, the natural rotundity of the elevation being only occasionally disturbed by the presence of a barrow, a thorn bush, or a piece of drywall, which remained from some attempted enclosure. By the time that he reached the village it was dark, and the larger stars had begun to shine when he walked up to the door of the old-fashioned house, which was the family residence of this branch of the South Wessex Hardys. "'Will the captain allow me to wait on him tonight?' inquired Loveday, explaining who and what he was. The servant went away for a few minutes, and then told Bob that he might see the captain in the morning. "'If that's the case, I'll come again,' replied Bob, quite cheerful that failure was not absolute. He had left the door but a few steps— when he was called back and asked if he had walked all the way from Overcombe Mill on purpose. Loveday replied modestly that he had done so. Then will you come in? He followed the speaker into a small study or office, and in a minute or two Captain Hardy entered. The captain at this time was a bachelor of thirty-five, rather stout in build with light eyes, bushy eyebrows, a square broad face, plenty of chin, and a mouth whose corners played between humor and grimness. He surveyed Loveday from top to toe. Robert Loveday, sir, son of the miller at Overcombe, said Bob, making a low bow. Ah, I remember your father, Loveday, the gallant seaman replied. Well, what do you want to say to me? Seeing that Bob found it rather difficult to begin, he leant leisurely against the mantelpiece and went on. Is your father well and hearty? I have not seen him for many, many years. Quite well, thank ye. You. you used to have a brother in the army, I think. What was his name, John? A very fine fellow, if I recollect. Yes, Captain. He's there still. And you are in the merchant service? Late first mate of the brig Pewit. How is it you're not on board a man of war? Aye, sir, that's the thing I've come about, said Bob, recovering confidence. I should have been, but tis womankind has hampered me. I've waited and waited on at home because of a young woman, lady, I might have said, for she's sprung from a higher class of society than I. Her father was a landscape painter. Maybe you've heard of him, sir. The name is Garland. He painted that view of our village here, said Captain Hardy, looking towards a dark little picture in the corner of the room. Bob looked and went on as if to the picture. Well, sir, I have found that. However, the press gang came a week or two ago and didn't get hold of me. I didn't care to go aboard as a pressed man. There has been a severe impressment. It is, of course, a disagreeable necessity, but it can't be helped. Since then, sir, something has happened that makes me wish they had found me, and I have come tonight to ask if I could enter on board your ship, the Victory. The captain shook his head severely and presently observed, I am glad to find that you think of entering the service, Loveday. Smart men are badly wanted, but it will not be in your power to choose your ship. Well, well, sir, then I must take my chance elsewhere, said Bob, his face indicating the disappointment he would not fully express. "'Twas only that I felt I would much rather serve under you than anybody else, "'my father and all of us being known to ye, Captain Hardy, "'and our families belonging to the same parts. "'Captain Hardy took Bob's altitude more carefully. "'Are you a good practical seaman?' he asked musingly. "'Aye, sir, I believe I am. "'Active? Fond of skylarking? "'Well, I don't know about the last. "'I think I can say I am active enough. "'I could walk the yard arm if required, "'cross from mast to mast by the stays, and do what most fellows do who call themselves spry. The captain then put some questions about the details of navigation, which Loveday, having luckily been used to square rigs, answered satisfactorily. As to reefing topsails, he added, if I don't do it like a flash of lightning, I can do it so that they will stand blowing weather. The Pooet was not a dull vessel, and when we were convoyed home for Lisbon, she could keep well in sight of the frigate, scudding at a distance by putting on full sail. 
We had enough hands on board to reef topsails man o' war fashion, which is a rare thing in these days, sir, now that able seamen are so scarce on trading craft. And I hear that men from square rigged vessels are liked much the best in the navy, as being more ready for use. So that I shouldn't be altogether so raw, said Bob earnestly. If I could enter on your ship, sir. Still, if I can't, I can't. I might ask for you, Loveday, said the captain thoughtfully. And so you get there that way. In short, I think I may say I will ask for you. So consider it settled. My thanks to you, sir, said Loveday. You are aware that the Victory is a smart ship, and that cleanliness and order are, of necessity, more strictly insisted upon there than in some others. Yes, I quite see it. Well, I hope you will do your duty as well on a line of battleship as when you did when made of the brig, for it is a duty that may be serious. Bob replied that it should be his one endeavor, and receiving a few instructions for getting on board the guard ship and being conveyed to Portsmouth, he turned to go away. "'You'll have a stiff walk before you fetch Overcombe Mill this dark night, Loveday,' concluded the captain, peering out of the window. "'I'll send you in a glass of grog to, to help ye on your way.' The captain then left Bob to himself, and when he had drunk the grog that was brought in, he started homeward, with a heart not exactly light, but large with a patriotic cheerfulness, which had not diminished when, after walking so fast in his excitement as to be beaded with perspiration, he entered his father's door. They were all sitting up for him, and at his approach anxiously raised their sleepy eyes, for it was nearly eleven o'clock. There! I knew he'd not be much longer, cried Anne, jumping up and laughing in her relief. They had been thinking you were very strange and silent today, Bob. You were not, were you? "'What's the matter, Bob?' said the miller, for Bob's countenance was sublime by his recent interview, like that of a priest just come from the penetralia of the temple. "'He's in his mate's clothes, just as when he came home,' observed Mrs. Loveday. "'They all saw now that he had something to tell. "'I'm going away,' he said, when he had sat down. "'I'm going to enter on board a man-of-war, and perhaps it will be the victory.' "'Going,' said Anne faintly. "'Now don't you mind it, there's a dear.' He went on solemnly, taking her hand in his own. And you, father, don't you begin to take it to heart. The miller was looking grave. The press gang has been here, and though I showed them that I was a free man, I'm going to show everybody that I can do my duty. Neither of the other three answered, Anne and the miller having their eyes bent upon the ground, and the former trying to repress her tears. Now don't you grieve, either of you, he continued, nor vex yourselves that this has happened. Please not to be angry with me, father for deserting you in the mill, where you will want me, for I must go. For these three years, we and the rest of the country have been in fear of the enemy. Trade has been hindered, poor folk made hungry, and many rich folk made poor. There must be a deliverance, and it must be done by sea. I have seen Captain Hardy, and I shall serve under him, if so be I can. Captain Hardy? Yes, I have been to his house at Possum, where he's staying with his sisters. Walked here and back. I wouldn't have missed it for fifty guineas. I hardly thought he would see me, but he did see me, and he hasn't forgot you. Bob then opened his tale in order, relating graphically the conversation to which he had been a party, and they listened with breathless attention. Well, if you must go, you must, said the miller with emotion, but I think it's somewhat hard that, of my two sons, neither of them can be got to stay and help me in my business as I get old. "'Don't trouble and vex about it,' said Miss Loveday, soothingly. "'They're both instruments in the hands of Providence, "'chosen to chastise that Corsican ogre "'and do what they can for the country in these trying years. "'That's just the shape of it, Mrs. Loveday,' said Bob. "'And he'll come back soon,' she continued, turning to Anne, "'and then he'll tell us all he has seen and the glory that he's won "'and how he has helped to sweep that scourge Bonaparte off the earth.' "'When be you going, Bob?' his father inquired. "'Tomorrow, if I can. "'I shall call at the barracks and tell John as I go by. "'When I get to Portsmouth.' "'A burst of sobs, in quick succession, interrupted his words. "'They came from Anne, who till that moment had been sitting as before "'with her hand in that of Bob, and apparently quite calm. "'Mrs. Loveday jumped up, but before she could say anything to soothe the agitated girl, "'she had calmed herself with the same singular suddenness that had marked her giving way.' I don't mind Bob's going, she said. I think he ought to go. Don't suppose, Bob, that I want you to stay. After this, she left the apartment and went into the little side room where she and her mother usually worked, 
In a few moments, Bob followed her. When he came back, he was in a very sad and emotional mood. Anybody could see that there had been a parting of profound anguish to both. She is not coming back tonight, he said. You will see her tomorrow before you go, said her mother. I may or may not, he replied. Father and Mrs. Loveday, do you go to bed now? I have got to look over my things and get ready, and it will take me some little time. If you should hear noises, you will know it is only myself moving about. When Bob was left alone, he suddenly became brisk and set himself to overhaul his clothes and other possessions in a businesslike manner. By the time his chest was packed, such things as he meant to leave at home folded into cupboards, and what was useless destroyed, it was past two o'clock. Then he went to bed so softly that only the creak of one weak stair revealed his passage upward. At the moment that he passed Anne's chamber door, her mother was bending over her as she lay in bed and saying to her, "'Won't you see him in the morning?' "'No, no,' said Anne. "'I would rather not see him. "'I have said that I may, but I shall not. "'I cannot see him again.' When the family got up next day, Bob had vanished. It was his way to disappear like this, to avoid affecting scenes at parting. By the time that they had sat down to a gloomy breakfast, Bob was in the boat of a budmouth waterman, who pulled him alongside the guard ship in the roads, where he had laid hold of the man rope, mounted, and disappeared from external view. In the course of the day, the ship moved off, set her royals, and made sail for Portsmouth, with five hundred new hands for the service on board consisting partly of press men and partly of volunteers, among the latter being Robert Loveday. End of chapter 33 The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy A Speck on the Sea Chapter 34 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jack Farrell The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 34 In parting from John, who accompanied him to the quay, Bob had said, Now, Jack, these be my last words to you. I give her up. I go away on purpose, and I shall be away a long time. If in that time she should list over towards ye ever so little, mind you take her. You have more right to her than I. You chose her when my mind was elsewhere, and you best deserve her, for I have never known you to forget one woman while I have forgot a dozen. Take her, then, if she will come, and God bless both of ye. Another person besides John saw Bob go. That was Derriman, who was standing by a bollard at a little further up the quay. He did not repress his satisfaction at the sight. John looked towards him with an open gaze of contempt, for the cuffs administered to the yeoman at the inn had not, so far as the trumpet major was aware, produced any desire to avenge that insult, John being, of course, quite ignorant that Festus had erroneously retaliated upon Bob in his peculiar, though scarcely soldierly way. Finding that he did not even now approach him, John went on his way, and thought over his intention of preserving intact the love between Anne and his brother. He was surprised when he next went to the mill to find how glad they were all to see him. From the moment of Bob's return to the bosom of the deep, Anne had had no existence on land. People might have looked at her human body and said that she had flitted thence. The sea, and all that belonged to the sea, was her daily thought and her nightly dream. She had the whole two and thirty winds under her eye, each passing gale that ushered in returning autumn being mentally registered, and she acquired a precise knowledge of the direction in which Portsmouth, Brest, Ferro, Cadiz, and other such likely places lay. Instead of saying her own familiar prayers at night, she substituted, with some confusion of thought, the forms of prayer to be used at sea. John at once noticed her lorn, abstracted looks, pitied her, how much he pitied her, and asked, when they were alone, if there was anything he could do. There are two things, she said, with almost childish eagerness in her tired eyes. They shall be done. The first is to find out if Captain Hardy has gone back to his ship, and the other is, oh, if you will do it, John, to get me newspapers whenever possible. 
After this duologue John was absent for a space of three hours, and they thought he had gone back to barracks. He entered, however, at the end of that time, took off his forage cap, and wiped his forehead. "'You look tired, John,' said his father. "'Oh, no.' He went through the house till he had found Anne Garland. "'I have only done one of those things,' he said to her. "'What? Already? I didn't hope for or mean to-day. Captain Hardy is gone from Possum. He left some days ago. We shall soon hear that the fleet has sailed.' "'You have been all the way to Possum on purpose? How good of you!' "'Well, I was anxious to know myself when Bob is likely to leave. I expect now that we shall soon hear from him.' Two days later he came again. He brought a newspaper, and what was better, a letter for Anne, franked by the first lieutenant of the victory. "'Then he's aboard her,' said Anne, as she eagerly took the letter. It was short, but as much as she could expect in the circumstances, and informed them that the captain had been as good as his word, and had gratified Bob's earnest wish to serve unto him. The ship, with Admiral Lord Nelson on board, and accompanied by the frigate Euryalus, was to sail in two days for Plymouth, where they would be joined by others, and thence proceed to the coast of Spain. Anne lay awake that night thinking of the victory, and of those who floated in her, to the best of Anne's calculation that ship of war would, during the next twenty-four hours, pass within a few miles of where she herself then lay. Next to seeing Bob, the thing that would give her more pleasure than any other in the world was to see the vessel that contained him, his floating city, his sole dependence in battle and storm, upon whose safety, from winds and enemies, hung all her hope. The morrow was market-day at the seaport, and in this she saw her opportunity. A carrier went from Overcombe at six o'clock thither, and having to do a little shopping for herself, she gave it as a reason for her intended day's absence, and took a place in the van. When she reached the town it was still early morning, but the borough was already in the zenith of its daily bustle and show. The king was already out of doors by six o'clock, and such cock-crow hours at Gloucester Large produced an equally forward stir among her population. She alighted and passed down the esplanade as fully thronged by persons of fashion at this time of mist and level sunlight as a watering-place in the present day is at four in the afternoon. Dashing bucks and bow, in cocked hats, black feathers, ruffles, and frills, stared at her as she hurried along. The beach was swarming with bathing women, wearing waistbands that bore the national refrain, God save the King, in gilt letters. The shops were all open, and Sergeant Stanner, with his sword-struck banknotes and heroic gaze, was beating up at two guineas and a crown, the crown to drink His Majesty's health. She soon finished her shopping, and then, crossing over into the old town, pursued her way along the coast road to Portland. At the end of an hour she had been rowed across the fleet, which then lacked the convenience of a bridge, and reached the base of Portland Hill. The steep incline before her was dotted with houses, showing the pleasant peculiarity of one man's doorstep being behind his neighbor's chimney, and slabs of stone as the common material for walls, roof, floor, pigsty, stable manger, door scraper, and garden style. Anne gained the summit, and followed along the central track over the large lump of freestone which forms the peninsula, the wide sea prospect extending as she went on. Weary with her journey, she approached the extreme southerly peak of rock, and gazed from the cliff at Portland Bill, or Beale, as it was in those days, more correctly called. The wild, herbless, weather-worn promontory was quite a solitude, and saving the one old lighthouse about fifty yards up the slope, scarce a mark was visible to show that humanity had ever been near the spot. Anne found herself a seat on a stone, and swept with her eyes the tremulous expanse of water around her that seemed to utter a ceaseless, unintelligible incantation. Out of the three hundred and sixty degrees of her complete horizon, two hundred and fifty were covered by waves, the coulis including the area of troubled waters known as the race, 
where two seas met to effect the destruction of such vessels as could not be mastered by one. She counted the craft within her view. There were five? No. There were only four? No. There were seven, some of the specks having resolved themselves into two. They were all small coasters and kept well within sight of land. Anne sank into a reverie. Then she heard a slight noise on her left hand, and turning beheld an old sailor who had approached with a glass. He was leveling it over the sea in a direction to the southeast, and somewhat removed from that in which her own eyes had been wandering. Anne moved a few steps thitherward so as to unclose to her view a deeper sweep on that side and by this discovered a ship of far larger size than any which had yet dotted the main before her. Its sails were for the most part new and clean, and in comparison with its rapid progress before the wind the small brigs and catches seemed standing still. Upon this striking object the old man's glass was bent. "'What do you see, sailor?' she asked. "'Almost nothing,' he answered. My sight is so gone off lately that things, one and all, be but a November mist to me, and yet I fain would see to-day. I am looking for the victory. Why? she said quickly. I have a son aboard her. He's one of three from these parts. There's the captain, there's my son Jim, and there's young Love Day of Overcombe, he that lately joined. "'Shall I look for you?' said Anne, after a pause. "'Certainly, missus, if so be you please.' Anne took the glass, and he supported it by his arm. "'It is a large ship,' she said, with three masts, three rows of guns along one side, and all her sails set. "'I guessed as much. There is a little flag in front, over her bowsprit. The jack?' and there's a large one flying at her stern, the ensign, and a white one on her foretopmast. That's the admiral's flag, the flag of my lord Nelson. What is her figurehead, my dear? A coat of arms, supported on this side by a sailor. Her companion nodded with satisfaction. On the other side of that figurehead is a marine. She is twisting round in a curious way, and her sails sink in like old cheeks, and she shivers like a leaf upon a tree. She is in stays for the larboard tack. I can see what she's been doing. She's been retching close in to avoid the flood tide, as the wind is to the sou'west, and she's bound down. But as soon as the ebb made, do you see, they made sail to the westward. Captain Hardy may be depended upon for that. He knows every current about here, being a native. And now I can see the other side. It is a soldier where a sailor was before. You are sure it is the victory? I am sure. After this a frigate came into view, the Euryalus, sailing in the same direction. Anne sat down, and her eyes never left the ships. "'Tell me more about the victory,' she said. "'She is the best sailor in the service, and she carries a hundred guns. The heaviest be on the lower deck, and the next size on the middle deck, the next on the main and upper decks. My son Jim's place is on the lower deck, because he's short, and they put the short men below.' Bob, though not tall, was not likely to be specially selected for shortness, she pictured him on the upper deck, in his snow-white trousers and jacket of navy blue, looking perhaps towards the very point of land where she then was. The great silent ship, with her population of blue jackets, marines, officers, captain, and the admiral, who was not to return alive, passed like a phantom the meridian of the bill. Sometimes her aspect was that of a large white bat sometimes that of a grey one. In the course of time the watching girl saw that the ship had passed her nearest point, the breadth of her sails diminished by foreshortening, till she assumed the form of an egg on end. After this something seemed to twinkle, 
and Anne, who had previously withdrawn from the old sailor, went back to him, and looking again through the glass, the twinkling was the light falling upon the cabin windows of the ship's stern. She explained it to the old man. Then we see now what the enemy have seen but once. That was in seventy-nine, when she sighted the French and Spanish fleet off Scilly, and she retreated because she feared a landing. Well, tis a brave ship, and she carries brave men. Anne's tender bosom heaved, but she said nothing, and again became absorbed in contemplation. The victory was fast dropping away. She was on the horizon and soon appeared hull down. That seemed to be like the beginning of a greater end than her present vanishing. Anne Garland could not stay by the sailor any longer, and went about a stone's throw off, where she was hidden by the inequality of the cliff from his view. The vessel was now exactly end on, and stood out in the direction of the start, her width having contracted to the proportion of a feather. She sat down again, and mechanically took out some biscuits that she had brought, foreseeing that her waiting might be long. But she could not eat one of them. Eating seemed to jar with the mental tenseness of the moment, and her undeviating gaze continued to follow the lessened ship with the fidelity of a balanced needle to a magnet stone, all else in her being motionless. The courses of the victory were absorbed into the main. Then her topsails went, and then her top gallants. She was now no more than a dead fly's wing on a sheet of spider's web, and even this fragment diminished. Anne could hardly bear to see the end, and yet she resolved not to flinch. The admiral's flag sank beneath the watery line, and in a minute the very truck of the last topmost stole away. The victory was gone. Anne's lip quivered as she murmured without removing her wet eyes from the vacant and solemn horizon, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep, was returned by a man's voice behind her. Looking round quickly she saw a soldier standing there, and the grave eyes of John Loveday bent on her. "'Tis what I was thinking,' she said, trying to be composed. "'You were saying it,' he answered gently. "'Was I? I did not know it. How came you here?' she presently added. "'I have been behind you a good while, but you never turned round.' "'I was deeply occupied,' she said in an undertone. "'Yes, I too came to see him pass. I heard this morning that Lord Nelson had embarked, and I knew at once that they would sail immediately. The Victory and Euryalus are to join the rest of the fleet at Plymouth. There was a great crowd of people assembled to see the Admiral off. They cheered him and the ship as she dropped down. He took his coffin on board with him, they say. His coffin, said Anne, turning deadly pale. Something terrible, then, is meant by that. Oh, why would Bob go in that ship? doomed to destruction from the very beginning like this. It was his determination to sail under Captain Hardy and under no one else, said John. There may be hot work, but we must hope for the best. And observing how wretched she looked, he added, But won't you let me help you back? If you can walk as far as Hope Cove, it will be enough. A Laird is going from there across the bay homeward to the harbour in the course of an hour. It belongs to a man I know, and they can take one passenger, I am sure." She turned her back upon the channel, and by his help soon reached the place indicated. The boat was lying there, as he had said. She found it to belong to the old man who had been with her at the bill, and was in charge of his two younger sons. The trumpet major helped her into it over the slippery blocks of stone. One of the young men spread his jacket for her to sit on and as soon as they pulled from shore, John climbed to the blue-gray cliff and disappeared over the top to return to the mainland by road. Anne was in the town by three o'clock. 
The trip in the stern of the Lerret had quite refreshed her, with the help of the biscuits which she had at last been able to eat. The van from the port to Overcombe did not start till four o'clock, and feeling no further interest in the gaieties of the place, she strolled on past the King's house to the outskirts, her mind settling down again upon the possibly sad fate of the victory, when she found herself alone. She did not hurry on, and finding that even now there wanted another half-hour to the carrier's time, she turned into a little lane to escape the inspection of the numerous passers-by. Here all was quite lonely and still, and she sat down under a willow tree, absently regarding the landscape which had begun to put on the rich tones of declining summer, but which to her was as hollow and faded as a theatre by day. She could hold out no longer, burying her face in her hands. She wept without restraint. Some yards behind her was a little spring of water having a stone margin round it to prevent the cattle from treading in the sides and filling it up with dirt. While she wept, Two elderly gentlemen entered unperceived upon the scene, and walked on to the spring's brink. Here they paused and looked in, afterwards moving round it, and then stooping as if to smell or taste its waters. The spring was, in fact, a sulphurous one, then recently discovered by a physician who lived in the neighbourhood, and it was beginning to attract some attention, having by common report contributed to effect such wonderful cures as almost past belief. After a considerable discussion, apparently on how the pool might be improved for better use, one of the two elderly gentlemen turned away, leaving the other still probing the spring with his cane. The first stranger, who wore a blue coat with gilt buttons, came on in the direction of Anne Garland, and seeing her sad posture, went quickly up to her, and said abruptly, "'What is the matter?' Anne, who in her grief had observed nothing of the gentleman's presence, withdrew her handkerchief from her eyes, and started to her feet. She instantly recognized her interrogator as the king. "'What? What? Crying?' his majesty inquired kindly. "'How is this?' "'I have seen a dear friend go away, sir,' she faltered with downcast eyes. "'Ah! Partings are sad, very sad, for us all.' You must hope your friend will return soon. Where is he or she gone? I don't know, Your Majesty. Don't know? How is that? He is a sailor on board the Victory. Then he has reason to be proud, said the King, with interest. He is your brother? Anne tried to explain what he was, but could not, and blushed with painful heat. Well, 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 what is his name? In spite of Anne's confusion and low spirits, her womanly shrewdness told her at once that no harm could be done by revealing Bob's name, and she answered, "'His name is Robert Loveday, sir.' "'Loveday, a good name. I shall not forget it. Now dry your cheeks, and don't cry any more. Loveday, Robert Loveday.' Anne curtsied, the King smiled good-humouredly, and turned to rejoin his companion who was afterwards heard to be Dr. the physician in attendance at Gloucester Lodge. This gentleman had in the meantime filled a small phial with the medicinal water which he carefully placed in his pocket, and on the king coming up they retired together and disappeared. Thereupon Anne, now thoroughly aroused, followed the same way with a gingerly tread, just in time to see them get into a carriage which was waiting at the turning of the lane. She quite forgot the carrier and everything else in connection with riding home, flying along the road rapidly and unconsciously, when she awoke to a sense of her whereabouts she was so near to overcome as to make the carrier not worth waiting for. She had been borne up in this hasty spurt at the end of a weary day, by visions of Bob promoted to the rank of admiral, or something equally wonderful, by the king's special command the chief result of the promotion being, in her arrangement of the peace, that he would stay at home and go to sea no more. But she was not a girl who indulged in extravagant fancies long, and before she reached home she thought that the king had probably forgotten her by that time, 
and her troubles, and her lover's name. End of chapter 34「Thirty five of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jack Farrell. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter thirty five. A Sailor Enters. The remaining fortnight of the month of September passed away with a general decline from the summer's excitements. The royal family left the watering-place the first week in October, the German legion with their artillery about the same time. The dragoon still remained at the barracks just out of the town, and John Loveday brought to Anne every newspaper that he could lay hands on, especially such as contained any fragment of shipping news. This threw them much together and at these times John was often awkward and confused, on account of the unwanted stress of concealing his great love for her. Her interests had grandly developed from the limits of overcome and the town life hard by to an extensiveness truly European. During the whole month of October, however, not a single grain of information reached her or anybody else concerning Nelson and his blockading squadron off Cadiz. There were the customary bad jokes about Bonaparte, especially when it was found that the whole French army had turned its back upon Boulogne and set out for the Rhine. Then came accounts of his march through Germany and into Austria, but not a word about the victory. At the beginning of autumn John brought news which fearfully depressed her. The Austrian General Mack had capitulated with his whole army. Then were revived the old misgivings as to invasion. Instead of having to cope with him, weary with waiting, we shall have to encounter this man fresh from the fields of victory," ran the newspaper article. But the week which had led off with such a dreary piping was to end in another key. On the very day when Mac's army was piling arms at the feet of its conqueror, a blow had been struck by Bob Loveday and his comrades, which eternally shattered the enemy's force by sea. Four days after the receipt of the Austrian news, Corporal Tullidge ran into the miller's house to inform him that on the previous Monday, at eleven in the morning, the pickled schooner, Lieutenant La Pentier, had arrived at Falmouth with dispatches from the fleet, that the stage-coaches on the highway through Wessex to London were chalked with the words, Great Victory, Glorious Triumph, and so on and that all the country people were wild to know particulars. On Friday afternoon John arrived with authentic news of the battle off Cape Trafalgar and the death of Nelson. Captain Hardy was alive, though his escape had been narrow enough, his shoe-buckle having been carried away by a shot. It was feared that the victory had been the scene of the heaviest slaughter among all the ships engaged, but as yet no returns of killed and wounded had been issued beyond a rough list of the numbers in some of the ships. The suspense of the little household in Overcombe Mill was great in the extreme. John came thither daily for more than a week, but no further particulars reached England till the end of that time, and then only the meagre intelligence that there had been a gale immediately after the battle, and that many of the prizes had been lost. Anne said little to all these things, and preserved a superstratum of calmness on her countenance, but some inner voice seemed to whisper to her that Bob was no more. Miller Loveday drove to Possum several times to learn if the captain's sisters had received any more definite tidings than these flying reports, but that family had heard nothing which could in any way relieve the miller's anxiety. When at last, at the end of November, there appeared a final and revised list of killed and wounded as issued by Admiral Collingwood, it was a useless sheet to the loved days. To their great pain it contained no names but those of officers, the friends of ordinary seamen and marines being in those good old days left to discover their losses as best they might. Anne's conviction of her loss increased with the darkening of the early winter time. Bob was not a cautious man, 
who would avoid needless exposure, and a hundred and fifty of the Victory's crew had been disabled or slain. Anybody who had looked into her room at this time would have seen that her favorite reading was the office for the burial of the dead at sea, beginning, We therefore commit his body to the deep. In these first days of December several of the victorious fleet came into port, but not the victory. Many supposed that that noble ship, disabled by the battle, had gone to the bottom in the subsequent tempestuous weather, and the belief was persevered in till it was told in the town and port that she had been seen passing up the channel. Two days later the victory arrived at Portsmouth. Then letters from survivors began to appear in the public prints which John so regularly brought to Anne, but though he watched the mails with unceasing vigilance there was never a letter from Bob. It sometimes crossed John's mind that his brother might still be alive and well, and that in his wish to abide by his expressed intention of giving up Anne and home life he was deliberately lax in writing. If so, Bob was carrying out the idea too thoughtlessly by half as could be seen by watching the effects of suspense upon the fair face of the victim and the anxiety of the rest of the family. It was a clear day in December. The first slight snow of the season had been sifted over the earth, and one side of the apple-tree branches in the miller's garden was touched with white, though a few leaves were still lingering on the tops of the younger trees. A short sailor of the Royal Navy, who was not Bob, nor anything like him, crossed the mill-court and came to the door. The miller hastened out and brought him into the room, where John, Mrs. Loveday, and Anne Garland were all present. "'I'm come aboard the victory,' said the sailor. "'My name's Jim Cornick, and your lad is alive and well.' They breathed rather than spoke their thankfulness and relief, the miller's eyes being moist as he turned aside to calm himself while Anne, having first jumped up wildly from her seat, sank back again under the almost insupportable joy that trembled through her limbs to her utmost finger. "'I've come from Spithead to Possum,' the sailor continued, "'and now I'm going on to father at Budmouth.' "'Ah, I know your father,' cried the trumpet-major, "'old James Cornick.' It was the man who had brought Anne in his lyric from Portland Bill. "'And Bob hasn't got a scratch?' said the miller. "'Not a scratch,' said Cornick. Loveday then bustled off to draw the visitor something to drink. Anne Garland, with the glowing blush on her face, had gone to the back part of the room, where she was the very embodiment of sweet content, as she slightly swayed herself without speaking. A little tide of happiness seemed to ebb and flow through her in listening to the sailor's words, moving her figure with it. The seaman and John went on conversing. Bob had a good deal to do with the barricading of horseholds afore we were in action, and the Admiral and Captain both were very much pleased at how it was done. When the Admiral went up the quarter-deck ladder, Captain Hardy said a word or two to Bob, but what it was I don't know, for I was quartered at the gun some ways off. However, Bob saw the Admiral stagger when I was wounded, and was one of the men who carried him to the cockpit. After that he and some other lads jumped aboard the French ship, and I believe they was in her when she struck her flag. What it did next I can't say, for the wind had dropped and the smoke was like a cloud, but I got a good deal talked about, and they say there's promotion in store for in. At this point in the story Jim Cornick stopped to drink, and a low, unconscious humming came from Anne in her distant corner. The faint melody continued more or less when the conversation between the sailor and the love days was renewed. "'We heard afore that the victory was near knocked to pieces,' said the miller. "'Knocked to pieces? You'd say so if so be you could see her. Gad her sides be battered like an old penny piece.' the shot be still sticking in her whales, and her sails be like so many clap-nets. We have run all the way home under jury topmasts, and as for her decks, you may swab with hot water, and you may swab with cold, but there's blood-stains, and there they'll bide. The captain had a narrow escape, like many of the rest. A shot shaved his ankle like a razor. 
You should have seen that man's face in the head of battle. His features were as if they had been cast in steel. We rather expected a letter from Bob before this. Well, said Jim Cornick with a smile of toleration, you must make allowances. The truth of it is, he's engaged just now at Portsmouth, like a good many of the rest from our ship. "'Tis a very nice young woman that he's courting of, and I make no doubt that she'll be an excellent wife for him." "'Ah,' said Mrs. Loveday, in a warning tone. "'Courting? Wife?' said the miller. They instinctively looked towards Anne. Anne had started as if shaken by an invisible hand, and a thick mist of doubt seemed to obscure the intelligence of her eyes. This was but for two or three moments. Very pale, she arose and went right up to the seaman. John gently tried to intercept her, but she passed him by. "'Do you speak of Robert Loveday as courting a wife?' she asked, without the least betrayal of emotion. "'I didn't see you, miss,' replied Cornick, turning. "'Yes, your brother have his eye on a wife, and he deserves one. I hope you don't mind.' "'Not in the least,' she said with a stage laugh. "'I am interested, naturally.' "'And what is she?' "'A very nice young Master Baker's daughter, honey, a very wise choice of the young man's. "'Is she fair or dark? Her hair is rather light. I like light hair. And her name?' "'Her name is Caroline. But can it be that my story hurts ye? If so—' "'Yes, yes,' said John, interposing anxiously. "'We don't care for more just at this moment.' "'We do care for more,' said Anne, vehemently. "'Tell it all, sailor. That is a very pretty name, Caroline. When are they going to be married?' "'I don't know as how the day is settled,' answered Jim, even now scarcely conscious of the devastation he was causing in one fair breast. "'But from the rate the courting is scudding along at, I should say it won't be long first. "'If you see him when you go back, give him my best wishes,' she lightly said as she moved away. "'And,' she added with solemn bitterness, "'say that I am glad to hear he is making such good use of the first days of his escape from the valley of the shadow of death.' She went away, expressing indifference by audibly singing in the distance, "'Shall we go dance the round, the round? Shall we go dance the round?' "'Your sister is lively at the news,' observed Jim Cornick. "'Yes,' murmured John gloomily, as he gnawed his lower lip and kept his eyes fixed on the fire. "'Well,' continued the man from the victory, "'I won't say that your brother's intended hadn't got some ballast, which is very lucky for in, as he might have picked up with a girl without a single copper nail. To be sure, there was a time we had when we got into port. It was open house for us all.' and after mentally regarding the scene for a few seconds, Jim emptied his cup and rose to go. The miller was saying some last words to him outside the house. Anne's voice had hardly ceased singing upstairs. John was standing by the fireplace, and Mrs. Loveday was crossing the room to join her daughter, whose manner had given her some uneasiness, when a noise came from above the ceiling, as of some heavy body falling. Mrs. Loveday rushed to the staircase, saying, "'Ah, I feared something,' and she was followed by John. When they entered Anne's room, which they both did almost at one moment, they found her lying insensible upon the floor. The trumpet major, his lips tightly closed, lifted her in his arms and laid her upon the bed, after which he went back to the door to give room to her mother, who was bending over the girl with some hartshorn. Presently Mrs. Loveday looked up and said to him, she is only in a faint, John, and her colour is coming back. Now leave her to me. I'll be downstairs in a few minutes, and will tell you how she is. John left the room. When he gained the lower apartment, his father was standing by the chimney-piece, the sailor having gone. The trumpet-major went up to the fire, and grasping the edge of the high chimney-shelf, stood silent. "'Did I hear a noise when I went out?' asked the elder in a tone of misgiving. "'Yes, you did,' said John. It was she, but her mother says she is better now. Father, he added impetuously, Bob is a worthless blockhead. If there had been any good in him, he would have been drowned years ago. John, John, not too fast, said the miller. 
That's a hard thing to say of your brother, and you ought to be ashamed of it. Well, he tries me more than I can bear. Good God! What can a man be made of to go on as he does? Why didn't he come home? Or if he couldn't get leave, why didn't he write? Tis scandalous of him to serve a woman like that. Gently, gently. The chap have done his duty as a sailor, and though there might have been something between him and Anne, her mother, in talking it over with me, has said many times that she couldn't think of their marrying till Bob had settled down in business at home. Folks that gain victories must have a little liberty allowed them. Look at the Admiral himself, for that matter." John continued looking at the red coals, till hearing Mrs. Loveday's foot on the staircase he went to meet her. "'She is better,' said Mrs. Loveday, "'but she won't come down again to-day. Could John have heard what the poor girl was moaning to herself at that moment that she lay writhing on the bed, he would have doubted her mother's assurance. If he had been dead, I could have borne it, but this I cannot bear. End of chapter 35